Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Niles Pearson, Johnny, at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, how are you, Niles? Worried at the moment. Can you help me out? I don't know. What's on your mind? $65,000 worth of horse flesh. Ever hear of Duke Red? Yeah, I think so. The Futurity last year? That's the horse. Johnny, Columbia Indemnity is going to have to settle a claim on him. Why? Duke Red was seriously injured and had to be destroyed. Did you say 65000 Yeah. No wonder you're worried, Niles. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. Expense account item one, $197.80. Airfare and incidentals getting me from Hartford to San Francisco and a town about 40 miles south of there called San Pietro. At the San Pietro Hotel, I learned that the Abbott Ranch was some five miles outside of town but that the Abbott Stables maintain offices in San Pietro. Hello. Hello. I'd like to get in touch with Mr. Abbott. My name's Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Abbott's never here. He's mostly out at the ranch. You'll have to see him there. Oh. Well, uh, is there any place in town I can rent a car? Not that I know of. Bus? Afraid not. What's your business with Mr. Abbott? Insurance. I'm here to adjust a claim of his. Oh, yes, Duke Red. Could I see Mr. Abbott's business manager? Uh, Mr. Monroe. Mr. Monroe isn't with Mr. Abbott's office any longer. Oh, now, that's funny. He was with Mr. Abbott's office three days ago when he notified us that a claim was being filed in this manner. I got it right here on paper. Oh. Well, you might as well know. Mr. Abbott and Mr. Monroe... Ended things. Mr. Abbott let him go. Mm, I see. Who's in charge now? No one at the moment. Maybe I can put you in touch with Mr. Abbott at the ranch. Good. 9433, please. Smoke? No, thanks. Hello, Cully. This is Judy at the office. Is Mr. Abbott there? When do you expect him? Thanks. Out for the day, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> I'm not doing very well, am I? I wish I could be more helpful. Well, maybe you can. Uh, this man, Monroe, if you could tell me where I can get in touch with him, I'd appreciate it. Didn't you understand? He doesn't work for Mr. Abbott any longer. Yeah, I know, I know, but uh, he did notify us about the claim. Evidently, he's aware of the circumstances in the matter, and that's what I'm here to talk about. I see. Well... Mr. Monroe isn't in San Pietro any longer. He moved out of town on Tuesday. But where? He didn't leave a forwarding address, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Where's the laundry going to send their bills? How about the finance company? He just left, and that's it. You want to know something? I don't get it. She dropped her eyes, mumbled something about having work to do, and uh, we left it at that. I put it in the back of my mind and asked someone else about this, Mr. Monroe. Then I got busy solving one of my immediate problems. Expense account item two, fifty dollars Deposit on a 1940 Terraplane station wagon I managed to rent from a man who ran a filling station. Idea was $10 a day plus gas. Item three, $5.08, a tank full of gas. The terraplane bucked a little, but it got me outside of town about four miles to the office of a tall, lanky man who never took his hat off. Dr. James Gorey, veterinarian. All the way from Hartford, Connecticut, huh? Yes, that's right. And having sunshine like this back there now, I'll bet you you're here about the Duke, huh? Duke Red, yes. The people who wrote the policy want me to look into the matter. Hope there's nothing wrong. Is there? No, a matter of procedure, Doctor. Mr. Abbott's filed a claim for $65,000 indemnity, the loss of his racehorse. Mr. Monroe, who handled these matters for Mr. Abbott, is no longer around. Uh, yes, I understood they quarreled. Yeah. Mr. Abbott isn't around at the moment either, so I came to you. 
I don't believe I understand this. If Ben Abbott's bought that much insurance, he's sure got a right to file a claim for damages. Well, it's just good business to get the facts, Dr. Gorey, that's all. Quite a bit of money involved here. Yes. Fred was worth lots more than that, though. Oh? That horse would have won over $500,000, in my opinion. Full racing terminal. Yeah, well, it's too bad about all this. I understand from Mr. Monroe's correspondence that uh, you treated the animal, Doctor. Yeah. Um, yes. I take care of most of Ben's stock when they're here. When he's not on the road racing. Uh-huh. I'd like to know exactly how the accident happened, Doctor. There was uh, something about a piece of machinery? A tractor with the blades up. Huh? Uh, Duke Red stumbled back into it hard. Cut through his right hamstring all the way to the bone. I see. Do you make out a report in a case like this? In any case, Mr. Dollar. An animal is just like a human. This one more valuable than most, I guess. Any of them liable to get sick or hurt sometimes. Here's the report. Thanks. They're pretty careful out there with all those animals. Naturally, they constitute a considerable investment on Ben Abbott's part. Yeah, sure. Uh, Most of the tendons cut, huh? Yes. Them as wasn't severed were ruptured. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-oh. What? Well, there's a notation about the carcass. Cremated on the premises? Yeah. Let's see. The accident happened Sunday night. Cremated same night. Why so fast, Doctor? Ben Abbott wanted it that way. Can't blame him, I guess. Maybe not. But it'll make my job a little more complicated. Unless some x-rays were taken of the injury. There was no need for me to go into x-rays. Paralysis had already set in by the time I got there. Yeah, but that doesn't help me much, does it? Hmm? What do you mean? No carcass, no proof of the extent of injury to the animal. Lord, man, the animal was in a bad way. It was a mortal injury. How was he destroyed? Shotgun. Could he have lived? I mean, long enough for me to... You don't understand, Mr. Dahl. It had been wrong not to destroy him with injuries like that. Mr. Abbott called you in right after the accident happened, did he? Yes. I got out there maybe 15 minutes later. Ben was alone with the horse. The minute I laid eyes on that animal, I knew he was finished, that he'd have to be destroyed. You advised Mr. Abbott that the horse had to be destroyed? I didn't have to. He knew it. He knows horse flesh as good as any vet alive. Well, did you consider calling in someone else? What? Another doctor for consultation. I tell you, man, there was no use in going into anything like that. Did Mr. Abbott ask you to call in another vet? No, he did not. Who else was there? Nobody. No stable hand? No member of Mr. Abbott's family? No. Well, who saw the accident? Mr. Abbott. Who else? I don't know, Mr. Dollar. Like I said, just Ben was there when I got there. I haven't any proof that the animal was injured. You just read my report. I've got $65,000 to worry about, Dr. Gorey. I'll need more than just a report. Young man, I've been in business here over 30 years. I've done business with Ben Abbott over 20 years. You come here asking me if I called in another vet. If I did this, if I did that. There isn't a man around here who won't take my word. Why don't you? Part of my job, Dr. Gorey. Huh? I can't take anybody's word for anything. Mr. Dollar, I'd be obliged if you'd get out of here. I obliged, Dr. Gorey. I got out of there. Driving back to San Pietro on my terraplane, it struck me as odd that Gorey, certainly aware of the value of the injured horse, had not taken so much as a photograph to verify the story of the accident. For that reason, I decided to verify Dr. Gorey himself. Well, hello. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you can help me. All right, try me. Well, it's Dr. Gorey. Is he new around here? <laughs> You're joking. No, I'm not. He's a fixture. He's been in this part of the country 30 or 40 years. They say he's the best vet this side of Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> that takes in quite a bit of real estate. Is he loaded? I think he could retire and give advice over the phone. These horse racing people make new parents look like indifferent vegetables. They do? You don't know. A horse sneezes once and they're ready to call the Mayo brothers. <laughs> Dr. Gorey's practically the whole Mayo clinic in horsey circles. Say, how did you know about him? The insurance report. <laughs> of course. Well, I suppose you'd want to talk to him. Look, I'm driving out that way. I'd be glad to give you a lift. Oh, that's mine out there. 
<laughs> that? Yeah, rented it from a filling station man down the street. Oh. Well, you just drive right on past the filling station for about three miles and you'll see Dr. Gorey's place. Oh, thanks, but I've already been there. Huh? Yeah, just left him. Well, then why are you asking me about him? Heavens. Just asking. <laughs> You're a funny one. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Judy Brown. About finished here for the day? As a matter of fact, yes. Well, Judy Brown, let you and I go get something to eat and drink. How do you know I haven't got a husband? I don't. Have you? No. Well, how about it? Give me five minutes. Judy, I'm going to get right to the point. How long have you worked for Mr. Evans? A year and a half. Why? You're from San Pietro? No, San Francisco. I answered an ad. I wanted to get out in the country for a while, away from the city life. Mm-hmm. All right. What happened between Monroe and Abbott? They had a quarrel. A loud, loud quarrel. Mr. Abbott's very good with a quarrel. Oh, is he? Yes. You know, even I've wondered about that. What? Mr. Monroe quarreling with Mr. Abbott and then just leaving all of a sudden. Probably went to San Francisco. I don't know where else he... Oh. What's the matter, Judy? That looks like Mr. Monroe now. Monroe? Yes, end of the bar. I thought he was away. It's him, all right. Oh, I'd like to talk to him. You'll have to hurry. Looks like he's getting ready to leave. Yeah. Excuse me. Sure. Hey. Hey, just a minute. You calling me? Yes. Mr. Monroe? Yes? Johnny Dollar, Universal Adjustment Bureau. I'm in town about the claim on Duke Red. But I heard you'd left town. I had. You talked to Mr. Abbott about that claim. Well, you had power of attorney for him and signed the claim. I wonder if I could talk to you. I'm leaving town again. Right away. Well, look, can I just have a minute of your time? It wasn't my horse. It belonged to Ben Abbott. Talk to him. Now, get out of my way. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Let him handle his own dirty business. Look, Mr. Monroe. Get out of my way. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there's proof that things are just about as wrong in this case and as dangerous as they can get. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Mr. Pearson in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, thanks, operator. Hold on, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Johnny? Yeah. I got your wire. Hold up payment on the Abbott claim? That's right. 
Anything wrong? I haven't talked to Abbott yet. The people I have talked to are all wrong. The veterinarian who handled a horse, a secretary in Abbott's office, and an office manager he fired. There's something cockeyed around here. Any ideas? Not yet. Okay. We'll hold up the claim on your say-so, and if there was anything wrong about that horse's death, you better find out about it. No. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red Matter in San Pietro, California. Expense account item three, 48 cents, postage. I sent a registered letter containing a copy of Dr. Gorey's injury report on the racehorse Duke Red to a veterinarian service in Cleveland, asking them to verify the extent of injuries to the animal. Item 4, 25 cents, toll call to the Abbott's branch outside of San Pietro. Whoever answered the phone told me that Mr. Abbott was busy somewhere in the grounds. I didn't bother to leave my name. Instead, I drove right on out. The Abbott breeding farm was complete with white fences, rolling green hills, bluegrass, and a stately old colonial residence set at the end of a long roadway among towering trees. From the porch of the house, I was able to see the stables and a trainer working with a horse out on the ranch track. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'd like to see Mr. Abbott, please. Uh, yes, sir. Come in, please, sir. I'll try to find Mr. Dollar. You want to wait here, sir? Thank you. He left me standing in one of the biggest living rooms I'd ever seen in my life. I took a plant in front of the fireplace, lit up a cigarette, and began to look at the pictures and statues of racing horses lining the mantelpiece. Pretty soon, things started. A blonde girl in a yellow suit walked in, having an argument with a gray-haired man in Jotford's. They didn't see me as they entered, or they just didn't pay any attention to me. You aren't old Pardon. enough, strong enough, or have brains enough to live as you please. I forbid oh, you to... Oh, I know what you're going to say. Oh, mm-hmm. let's talk about how you forbid it and it can't go on. Well, let me tell you, it can go on just as long as I want it to go on, and I don't care what you do. Now, you listen to me, young lady. As long as you're in this house and under this roof, you will conduct yourself according to the way I dictate. Dictate? Yes. Who are you, Hitler or somebody? Don't whatever you do interfere with me again. Ever. Terry. I'm sick of it. Do you hear me? Sick of it. That was as much as I heard. But then it didn't last long. I saw them go out and walk around the garden once, shake fists at each other, finally part. He disappeared up a narrow stairway. And then, about a minute later... Wait a minute. Hello. Hello. How long have you been here? Uh, too long. Oh. Why didn't you speak up? <laughs> well, I cleared my throat a couple of times, but no good. Then I I tried to look like I didn't hear anything. Nothing seemed to work. If it helps any, I'll keep it all under my hat. I won't tell a soul. He doesn't like the company I keep. What do you think of that? I don't know anything about it. Give me a general viewpoint at least. Well, I've run into a lot of parents who don't approve of the kind of company their sons or daughters keep. In my court of human relations, parents don't always know what kind of company their daughters and sons need. When those daughters and sons reach the age when they need company. Good. You're on my side. I didn't finish. On the other hand, daughters and sons have the same problem. They don't seem to know either. You're a coward. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. I'm here to see Mr. Abbott about insurance. Was that Mr. Abbott? Yes, You're not an insurance salesman. You're here about Duke Red, about what happened to him, aren't you? That's right. I'm Terry Abbott. Glad to know you. How much money did Daddy have Red insured for? $65,000. $65,000. I don't suppose you have a cigarette. Sure. Thank you. Has the claim been paid yet? No, not yet. If Red had made the tracks this year, he would have doubled that. Tripled it, probably. 
There's not enough money in the world to replace that horse. He was a great running horse. I've heard that before. Dr. Gorey mentioned it. Look, I, I'm sorry all this happened. Dad shouldn't have shot Red. We understand he was injured beyond hope. That's a lie. That's a what? Dad shouldn't have shot him. He just shouldn't have done it. Red was the only horse in the whole stables worth anything. The only thing around here worth anything. Wasn't the horse injured? Injured? Oh, that's what you'll hear. They'll all tell you that. But I can tell you something else. Terry, what are you talking about, anyhow? He's an insurance man, Dad, and I can tell him the whole thing, and I will. Go to your room, Terry. It was a terrible thing to do, shooting Reddit. It was just like murder, and you know it. Be quiet and go to your room. It was murder. 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 Stop it. (laughs) Now go to your room. Thank you for the cigarette, Mr. Dollar. She's been terrible about all this. Very upset. Any time I've had to destroy an animal around here, she gets like that. Been that way ever since she was a little girl. I see. I knew I'd have to put up with her acting like this, but I'm reluctant to apologize to you for her actions or for mine. Jim Gorey told me you were in to see him yesterday afternoon. I wish Dr. Gorey hadn't told you that. I intended to tell you myself, Mr. Abbott. If I've offended you, I'm sorry for it. Makes me look I'm doing, doing something shady. You could have come right to me instead of going to Dr. Gorey. I tried to. You were out. Then you could have waited till I came in. If this is the way that insurance company operates, I might have to find a different one. Look, Mr. Rabbit, there's quite a bit of money at stake here. We have to go to everybody during an investigation. Dr. Gorey ordered the horse destroyed. It seemed very reasonable to go to him and ask why he took that action. We want to know all the circumstances. If you talk to Gorey, you know them. Why are you bothering me? What do you want? I want all the information you can give me about the accident. The time, date, people who saw it, exactly what happened, where it happened. Do you always handle a case this way? It's the way I'm handling this one. I don't like it very much, sneaking around behind my back. No matter what you think of me or my methods, Mr. Abbott, I'm the man assigned to handle this claim. My report has to be completed before the matter can be settled. They don't know what they're doing, sending a man like you out here. You filed a claim. What did you expect? A little decency and respect and courtesy. That's what I expected. That fool Monroe filed the claim. I understand he had power of attorney as your office manager to do that. Well, he did it too soon. I would have waited until things calmed down around here a bit. What do you mean? Well, you saw how my daughter acts. Losing a fine racing animal like Red can have a bad moral effect on the entire ranch. That's what I mean. Monroe didn't use his head. So you fired him? Well, that's one of the reasons, yes. Another reason is I don't like him. Never did like him. But what business is that of yours? Are you here to accuse me of something? (sighs) Mr. Abbott, we'll pay off your claim when we're satisfied the circumstances were proper. We're not satisfied now. Let's discuss those circumstances. I'm not afraid of you, Dollar, or your insurance company. I don't like you snooping around my office in town, talking to my friends about me, talking to my daughter about me. No man would. If I don't get my information from you, Mr. Abbott, I'll get it somewhere else. That'll drag this whole matter out. What I've seen of you so far and what information I do have isn't exactly in your favor. I don't like that kind of talk. You don't seem to like anything about this. Now, how about it? Do we keep this up or do we get down to business? The trainer was bringing Red back from his afternoon exercise. Outside the stall, Red got scared. A mouse or something. He reared back and jammed into the blade of the tractor we use out on the track. It cut into his Achilles tendon, hamstrung him. When Dr. Gorey got here, he said that Red didn't have a chance, so I shot him. I'd like to talk to the trainer. What's his name? Tom Warner. Where can I find him? He isn't around anymore. I fired him right then and there. Told him to get off my property and stay off. Where'd he go, Mr. Evan? I don't know. He took his things and cleared out as fast as he could. He knew better than to hang around here. Now, what do you mean by that? What I said. He knew better. That's what I mean. Well, I'll have to find him and talk to him. Who else was there when it happened? No one. Just me. The rest of them were up at the house having dinner. No stable hand, sure boy. I just told you, no one. How about right afterwards? I went to the office in the stable and called Dr. Gorey. Before or after you fired Tom Warner? After I fired him. You were there alone with an injured horse? You didn't call up to the house for help, send for anyone up there? You went in and called Dr. Gorey? Yes, we handled it together. Any objections? It would have been better... Perhaps we could have avoided all this unpleasantness... if you'd left the remains for us to examine. Dollar... 
I've got maybe 150 head on this farm. Now and then accidents happen. If one of my stock is dead, I get rid of it as fast as I can with as few people as involved as possible. I do that for a number of reasons. That's the way I operate. Nevertheless, you were aware the insurance company would ask you for proof of loss in this matter, and if the you... The insurance only... company does not run my farm. I run a dollar, and I take orders from no one. Look, I'm trying to tell you the problem we face. We have no carcass to examine. Therefore, we have to ascertain the facts from other sources. Did your daughter see any of this? The accident or destroying the horse? Terry. Yeah. Of course not. You mean those crazy things she was saying when I walked into the room? Well, in view of the crazy circumstances, what she was saying might be worth listening to, Mr. Abbott. Huh. I had the impression that she saw the accident. Pipe dreams. She wasn't even around. I'd like to talk to her just the same. Cully. Cully? You talk to anybody you like, Donna. I don't care. But I hope you made notes today because you've already got all the information you're going to get from me. Yes, sir, Mr. Abbott. Yes, sir. Cully? I want you to look at this man. Yes, sir. His name's Johnny Dollar. Yes, sir. If he comes knocking at this door again, if he even comes to the front gate, if you see him on the grounds ever again, throw him out. I don't want him around here. Yes, sir, Mr. Abbott. And right now, Cully, you can just show him out. You're being foolish about this, Mr. Abbott. Show him out, Cully. This way, Mr. Dollar, sir. Never mind. I can find my own way. Dollar, sir. Mr. Dollar. Huh? Uh, just a minute, sir, if you please, sir. Yeah. Sorry about that in there, sir. I, I don't believe Mr. Abbott really meant it. Sounded that way to me, Cully. I know how it sounds. He's just, well, not himself. You understand, sir. Not quite, no. Uh, losing the horse and all. Sounds to me more like he's losing his mind. Does it, sir? Huh? Do you think Mr. Abbott's losing his mind? Do you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, sometimes I do. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the whole case starts to fall apart like a man full of bullet wounds. Which is just about the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Who? Johnny Dollar, the insurance investigator. This is Miss Abbott, isn't it? Y yes. What are you doing in the stable office? Waiting for you to call me. Your father threw me off the farm a few minutes ago. A man named Cully, who works for your dad, said he really didn't mean it. Said he'd fix it up for me to talk to you. Cully? I guess that's why he asked me to phone the stable office. You told me the horse wasn't injured, shouldn't have been destroyed. Oh, I hope you didn't believe all that, Mr. Dollar. Well, now, look, I've got to settle a $65,000 claim on the death of a racehorse. The carcass was cremated, and I have no evidence that the horse was destroyed or even injured. 
I don't know what to believe yet, but I can tell you this. Don't ever talk to an insurance investigator the way you did earlier today, not unless you can back it up. My, you sound grim. You sound like it's a laughing matter. Hardly anything's a laughing matter. I'll be right down. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Pietro, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. Fifteen minutes after I spoke with Terry Abbott on the phone, I looked out the window of the stable office and saw her starting down toward the stables. She'd changed clothes. This time, she was wearing blue jeans and riding boots. She carried a quirt in one hand, a cigarette in the other. There was a scarf or some such tied around her hair. All in all, it was a classic impression. Rich girl, racing horses, and fast cars. She wore a disdainful pout, also classic. Hi. I do. Father asked me where I was going, and I told him I was going for a ride. Why'd he throw you out? He didn't like questions I asked him, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I won't like the questions you asked me. Possibly. Probably. <laughs> you don't really work very hard trying to please anyone, do you? Industrial hazard in my business. Hope it doesn't bother you too much, Miss Abbott. Nope, I like it. You're so darn sure of yourself, and you know so darn little, and you look like you might be thinking all kinds of things. How tall are you? No, 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 let me guess. Six one? Not quite. Well, you're tall enough, I suppose. Do you like this office? I suppose you've been opening the files and going through all of Father's papers. That's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? Nope. Well, unless you know something about horses, the papers around here wouldn't mean much to you. Times, weights, whole schedule and chart for every bit of stock on the place. Do you know anything about horses? Just one. Duke Red. Oh. He was insured for $65,000. And he's dead now. You know... I didn't think I'd ever see you again. I wanted to talk to you before I left. What about? I didn't insure Duke Red. My father insured him. Your business is with my dad, not me, Mr. Dollar. Pardon me if I seem a little confused, but earlier today you were very anxious to tell me something about all that. Was I? Yes, you were. Hey, what is this anyway? I wish we hadn't met. But we did, and you mentioned there was no need to destroy Duke Red after he'd been injured. Now, did you say something like that to me because you were angry at your father? Or did you say it because there was some truth to it? Well, now, what's that supposed to mean? Do you just stand around and pout when people ask you questions? Did you mean that horse wasn't injured or that he was injured but that he could have been saved? Well, did you have any reason at all for saying the things you did? I... I've been very upset lately. All of us around here have been very upset. Yeah, I'm getting that way myself. Duke Red was the best horse we've had around these stables in five years. His father was a real champion, Earl Red, and maybe you've heard of him. He earned $190,000. We've all been counting on Duke Red since he was a colt. He had it then. This was going to be his big year. When this stupid accident happened, it, it just turned all of us upside down. Uh-huh. Is that your explanation for the things you said to me? Yes, for the moment. Now, please, don't ask me any more questions right now. One more. What? Your father fired a couple of people I wanted to talk with. One of them was a Howard Monroe. Dad's office manager? Yes, I met him a couple of nights ago. He wouldn't talk. He was too mad. Said something about letting your father handle his own dirty business. What? Now, I don't know what that meant, and I don't think I care just now. But the other man who was fired was a horse trainer named Warner, Tom Warner. According to your father, it was Warner's neglect that caused the horse to stumble and back into the tractor blades. What? Warner isn't around here now, but he must be somewhere, and I want to talk to him. Now, where can I find out his address? He's from Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore. What about his address? Well, it'd be in the personnel files. You can get those at the office in town in San Pietro. Okay. Do you think he went there? I don't know. I don't know. And what's more, I don't care.
The Abbots, father and daughter, were turning out to be a real peachy pair to deal with. I left them in their racing farm and drove back into San Pietro in the offices where I obtained the Baltimore address on Thomas Warner. Expense account item four, one dollar and five cents, one telegram. To Hartford in the office of Niles Pearson, requesting a complete record of Benjamin Abbott's financial status. Item five, one dollar and sixty cents, another telegram. To Thomas Warner, horse trainer, requesting him to contact me as soon as possible at the San Pietro Hotel. Meanwhile, I did what I could to establish Abbott's local credit standing. I started with a bank. Dollar? That's right. What's it about? I'm an insurance investigator. I'm working for Universal Adjustment Bureau. We have a claim in on a property of Benjamin Abbott. Duke Red? That's right. $65,000. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a load. What can the bank do for you? Tell me about Abbott's credit situation, for one thing. Oh. He does bank here, I presume. Yeah, for years. My name's Dale Ryan. We better go in my office. Sure. And grab a chair, Dollar. Thanks. Miss White? Yes, Mr. O'Ryan. Bring in Mr. Abbott's file, please. Up to date. Yes, sir. It'll take a few minutes, Dollar. All right. Maybe you can give me a rundown on how things are generally. Maybe. This is all confidential, I suppose. Absolutely, Mr. O'Ryan. I have no axe to grind. You must have something to grind or you wouldn't be here. People usually try to cheat insurance companies for money reasons, don't they? Well, usually, yes. Have you been cheated? I don't know. I don't know if there's any reason for us to be cheated. Look, maybe it'll put your mind at ease if I just tell you that a man with a $65 claim has his financial situation checked as a matter of course. You're a careful bunch of cut-ups, aren't you? Well, business being the way it is, yeah. Well, I don't think you'll find too much to raise an eyebrow about with old Ben. He's got one of the largest balances in town. Roughly, it'd be in the $100,000 area. Yeah, racing horses is quite a business, and he knows what he's doing. I doubt very much if he'd try to bamboozle you people out of a tiny little 65000 Well, that's small change to Ben Abbott. That ranch, the stock, his investment there must come to well over a million dollars. He meets a weekly payroll in the $10,000 class. Terry must run him a couple of thousand a month or so. You mean his daughter? Yeah. You met her? Yeah. Well... Yeah, when Terry wants a new car, she just parks the old one she's been driving and takes a plane to San Francisco and buys a new one. She might even feel like having a vacation and fly over to Honolulu. She's very expensive that way. <laughs> if what you say is true, she must be. No doubt about it. Well, she'll probably be marrying somebody one of these days as soon as she can find a guy who can stand the freight charges. I figure it'll be one of that Los Angeles oil gang or somebody from Texas. Oil's her best bet, don't you think? Well, that is, if she wants to stay in her social circle isn't very wide, naturally. Naturally. Oh, yes? Mr. O'Ryan. Oh, come in, come in. Mr. Abbott's folder. Oh, thanks. Well, here it is. See for yourself. Yeah. There's a lot to it. You want to take that office over there and look this over, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I think I'd better. I spent the rest of the afternoon going over Benjamin Abbott's local bank standing. It confirmed in detail what Mr. Orion had said in general. His assets were many, his cash on hand plentiful. Also, and this has a bearing, the activities of his daughter Terry were indicated in some of the expenditures. There was only one item I had to question Orion about when I'd finished looking it all over. Yes, Dollar? I, uh, I noticed a check was drawn five days ago payable to Howard T. Monroe, $5,500. Yes? It's marked bonus. Monroe handled business affairs for Abbott a year or two, and Monroe left a few days ago. Probably severance and things like that. Yeah. Uh, anything wrong? I don't know. For all I can gather, they didn't part company under the best of terms. As a matter of fact, they had kind of a row. It seems strange he'd pay Monroe a balance after he kicked him out. He's a strange guy. Check cleared all right. No question on it. Oh, yeah, I noticed. Something else, then. Hmm? Monroe was fired last Tuesday. Monday, a man named Thomas Warner was fired, too. Tom Warner? The trainer? Yeah. Abbott told me Warner was responsible for the accident with Duke Red. Huh. Funny. What? Well, according to these books, Abbott should still owe Thomas Warner a month's salary, $700. Well, let me see. Mm. Oh, yes. No bonus, no salary, no severance. Seems to me Tom Warner's got a kick coming. Why doesn't he kick, Mr. O'Ryan? I don't know. I would. 
Most anybody would. I rechecked Abbott's local office in San Pietro and learned that Warner had not left any kind of forwarding address. As a matter of fact, he told no one he was leaving. Expense account item six, dollar ninety-eight, dinner alone in the dining room adjacent to the lobby of the San Pietro Hotel. I wasn't enjoying my chef's special with a limp green salad when the clerk came in. Mister Dollar, hmm? I uh, thought you might be in here. A long distance call for you, Baltimore, Maryland. Oh yeah, fine. Where can I take you? Use the lobby phone, Mister Dollar. I'll plug you in from the switchboard. Go ahead, they're on the line now. Good, thanks. Thanks very much. Hello? Hello? Hello. Is this Johnny Dollar, the man who sent the telegram? Yes, who's this? Uh, this is Thomas Warner's father. Uh, the wire I opened it, it said it was important for Thomas to get in touch with you. I thought I'd better call and tell you where you could reach him, Mr. Dollar. Well, that's very kind of you, sir. I come home from work, I think this is best... Uh, you call him in San Pietro. He worked near there for a man named Benjamin Abbott. Uh, ben Abbott, training horses. You you get in touch with Thomas Oh, Mr. wait a minute. I'm in San Pietro now, Mr. Warner. Your son left here four days ago. Didn't he come home? No. Are you sure Thomas is not at Mr. Benjamin Abbott's farm? Positive. Do you have any other ideas where he could be? No. Not sound like Thomas, though, Mr. Dollar. He would not go off away with, without letting his mother and me know. Are you sure? I am sure, certain. Thomas, my son, he always let my wife and I know where he is so we don't worry. Something is wrong, Mr. Dollar? What? Is something wrong? Yeah. Maybe there is. Yeah. Plenty. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, sometimes a dead man can answer a lot of questions. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You placed a call to the Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford, Connecticut? Yes, I did. We have Mr. Pearson on the line now. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Hello? Johnny? Niles. Ben Abbott's rating with Dunn and Bradstreet is very good. He doesn't need any money. I still haven't determined if there was really an accident. Oh, and uh, no one seems to know what happened to Thomas Warner. Who's that? The trainer who was supposed to be with a horse when Abbott destroyed it. One his father called me from Baltimore. He doesn't know where he is either. Is that so? Something just occurred to me, Niles. What? Abbott's claim was filed over a week ago, yet he hasn't threatened to sue us or go to the insurance commission. I uh, no. And that's usually pretty standard procedure with a man like Abbott. It is. If he has a just claim. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Pietro, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. I had a strong suspicion that the death of Duke Red, a racehorse, had not happened as reported. The one man who could possibly answer my questions was missing. He had left the Abbott Ranch in San Pietro without collecting a month's back pay and without telling anybody about his forwarding address. Just a minute there, sir. Hi. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Kelly. Mr. Dollar, you can make this pretty hard for me. Mr. Abbott told me I shouldn't let you on the ground. Well, no, you didn't strike me as the kind of fellow who took that order too seriously. What do you want, sir? I want Thomas Warner, wherever he is. Well, he isn't here. I know that, Kelly. I want to find out where he is. Probably went home. I talked to his father in Baltimore. His father hasn't heard from him. Oh. Wouldn't you like to know where he is? Men come and go, Mr. Dollar. You're friends with them for a little while, and you never hear from them again. I reckon that's the way we have to look at it. Now, maybe you better go now, Mr. Dahl. Suppose he didn't want to go without saying goodbye. Suppose he didn't have a choice. What do you mean? I mean a man doesn't pass up a month's pay just to make a fancy exit. We can't talk here, sir. Where did Thomas want to stay? He had a room off the stables, his own place. How about there? All right, Mr. Dahl. You wait for me, sir. <laughs> I walked on down to the stables again and found the little apartment Thomas Warner had used for living quarters. The door was locked and I waited outside, looking over the workout tracks and the acres of rolling green turf that made Abbott Farms. A little while, Cully appeared. I shouldn't be doing this, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Abbott would skin me alive if he knew I was having any truck with you after that big row you had with him yesterday. Well, I'm not about to tell, Mr. Abbott, Cully. I appreciate your help. This is where Mr. Warner stayed all the time he worked for Mr. Abbott. Uh-huh. You can see for yourself, it's all cleaned out, not a stitch left. Yeah. Did you happen to see Warner leave here that night? Right after the accident, he was gone. Mr. Abbott came up to the house about 9 o'clock. He told us all that Duke Red had been hurt, he had to shoot him, and that he had taken care of the rest. You mean destroying the carcass? Yes, sir. That's a pretty big job for one man. Well, I believe Dr. Gorey helped him with it, sir. He, he was with Mr. Abbott. Oh, then Mr. Abbott told us that Mr. Warner was to blame for the accident and that Mr. Warner wasn't with us anymore. I wonder if any of the others saw him actually leave the premises. Well, now, we talked about that amongst ourselves. Nobody saw him go, Mr. Dollar. We thought it was kind of funny. Tom was a friendly, quiet sort of man, but he had a lot of friends here. Mm-hmm. It kind of disappointed us all, I guess. Do you have many things in this room? Clothes, mostly. He was a light traveler, Mr. Dollar. Horse training was just one thing. He worked on ships and in mining camps and lumber mills. I know that much. And he read a lot. Always seemed to be studying, finding himself. Did he have a temper? No, sir. No, sir. That's one thing Mr. Tom didn't have. Good horse trainer can't afford to have a temper. Even Mr. Abbott he could handle. All except that night, I guess. Mr. Abbott got powerful mad, I'm sure. Mr. Mr. Abbott is not an easy man to work for. How long have you been with him, Cully? Twenty-three years, sir. We were together in Maryland before he moved the stables to California. His bad temper hasn't bothered you? Mr. Abbott was different than he is now. I mean, when Ms. Abbott was alive. But then when she died and raising Miss Terry, he hasn't had it so easy. I mean, easy with himself. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think so. I worry about Mr. Abbott, Mr. Dollar. He don't seem to run himself well sometimes. You know what I mean. Yeah. Maybe Duke Red being gone now will help. Mr. Abbott counted on that animal a lot. Counting on a racehorse is not just being anxious overnight or for a week, but being anxious for years, from the time they're colts to when they first step out. Now he don't have that worry at all. Maybe it'll do him some good. What about his other horses? Them? Well... None of them like Duke Red. Not the same at all. They'll race and make money, but nothing like Duke Red. Yeah. Mr. Warner said he was a fine horse. Tell me, what kind of a car did Mr. Warner drive? Well, he didn't have a car, Mr. Dollar. 
Well, how do you suppose he left here? He must have been carrying luggage. I reckon so. He could have lugged him out the highway and flagged himself a ride or waited for the bus. They come by all the time. Think he might have called a cab in town? Didn't use the house phone. Maybe the one down in the stable office. Maybe someone drove him in, Cully. Miss Terry might have, sir. Huh? Miss Terry drove Mr. Warren around now and then. Did Mr. Rabbit approve of that? No, sir. He did not. After my talk with Cully, I took a chance and hung around the stables trying to get a line on Thomas Warner. Ben Abbott's belligerent attitude seemed to permeate the whole farm. The horse handlers I talked with were grumbling and complaining. I was able to learn nothing from them. I decided to tackle Abbott himself again. He wasn't in, but his daughter was. Well, you came around just the right time, Mr. Dollar. We haven't had too much excitement around here all day long. I think they're supposed to toss you out on your ear when you show up. That should be interesting. Would you like a drink? No, not right now, thanks. Not right now, thanks. Now, isn't that the end, the bitter end? So precise, so efficient, so determined, so anxious to do a good job. To be a sober, steady, substantial expert bore. Now, what is it? Who are you mad at, Terry? Tom Warner? Why should I be mad at him? Horse trainer. Because he left and didn't say goodbye? Maybe. You know, when I first came in this house two days ago, you were arguing with your father. I couldn't help overhearing it. Was that about Tom Warner? Yes. Dad said he wasn't good enough for me. I'm all right now. Something else that day. That business you were telling me about before. It'll have to be looked into. Why, for heaven's sake? Because you intimated that your father and Dr. Gorey might be lying about the whole thing. Do you realize that if there's any truth to it, your father'd be liable for criminal charges? I know. I was just trying to put Dad in a bad light with you. It was just for good old-fashioned first-class spite. Him telling me about not seeing Tom and all. We, we've been arguing for weeks about it. When I saw you the other day, I thought it was a good chance to get back at Dad. I see. Tell me about the trouble over Warner. Why well, tell you? Well, let's say I'm an interested party. I like you, Terry. Well, Tom and I saw quite a bit of each other, and Dad never liked it. I suppose because I'm all he has left. Mother and Bob, he was my older brother, were killed in an airplane accident a few years ago. Dad's always expected me to marry one of the Long Island horses, said the turf, something, I don't know. Anything but a horse trainer. He's been looking for an excuse to get rid of Tom. Your father doesn't strike me as the kind of man who would have to give an excuse to fire someone he didn't want around. Well, he found an excuse. He blamed the accident on Tom. Do you think he's mad? What's that? Nothing. Do you suppose your father will ever calm down so I can talk to him? I don't know. The Abbots have always been a terribly angry group of people, very emotional. There doesn't seem to be much of a let-up these days. Terry, is that what you meant when you asked me if I thought your father was mad? I suppose so. It's almost as if he's been on the verge of, of something lately, something desperate. His moods frighten me sometimes. They didn't used to. I, I don't easily frighten. But looking back, two years ago, Daddy bought a new car. We were out driving one day right after he bought it, and something went wrong. The gear shifter, some little thing. Well, Daddy was so angry, he, he just backed the car up and smashed it into a cement wall and left it. That was when he first frightened me. The first time that I can remember. Have you been frightened much? Since then? Oh, yes, many times. That's why Tom was so nice to have around. He, he never became angry. Never did things like that. Like the men... The men I know. Tom sat quietly and he let me sit beside him, reading, talking. I'm not that kind, really, of course, but I, I liked it with Tom. I liked it very much. You asked me about him, Johnny. Well, I'll tell you. If he'd come to say goodbye to me... There would have been no goodbye. I would have gone away with him anywhere. I was in love with him from the first day he came to work here. I still am. I always will be. Well, that's all there is to tell. Did he know this, Terry? Yes. 
And he knew I meant it. I do. Hi. What can I do for you? Constable in. I'm in. Now I'm the constable. Tad Polk. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. Mm-hmm. What's your trouble, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm worried, I guess, Mr. Polk. I, I walked around for a long time before I came in here. Yeah. Sit down. And hardly anybody dropped in this time of night, unless they're drunk. How about you? No. No, didn't think so. Mr. Polk, I'm an insurance investigator. I've been in San Pietro three days now, trying to get the facts about a claim filed by Benjamin Abbott. Mm Mm-hmm. I suppose about his horse, Duke Red. That's right, Mr. Polk. I can't seem to locate a man named Warner, Thomas Warner. Worked as a trainer for Abbott up until the day of the accident. Go ahead, sir. Warner and Abbott had an argument over the accident. Warner left. He was fired. His folks in Baltimore haven't heard from him, and they're worried. I can't seem to get a line on him myself, and I need to talk to him. Yes, well, what exactly do you want me to do for you, son? Help me find him. You sure he's missing? He isn't around. You want to make out a missing persons complaint, that it? I suppose so, yes. Yes, all right. Now, we just sign here. All right. There. You guarantee results? I might surprise you, mister. I'll let you know what happens. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Well, it all hinges on a decent man who knows he's loved and never said goodbye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Dr. Gorey. You left word for me to call? Yes. Wonder if I could see you sometime today, Doctor. What about? About the Abbott matter. No. I'm kind of busy today. I talked to you once, Mr. Dollar. What else can I say to you? That's up to you, Doctor. Entirely up to you. I can tell you this. I have reason not to believe what you said before. Now, look here, young man. I have reason to believe that Duke Red wasn't destroyed exactly the way it was reported. I'm not going to listen to any tall tales about a horse. Then maybe you'll listen to one about a man. What? Thomas Warner, Duke Red's trainer, is missing. I've turned the matter over to the police. Oh. Oh. Yeah. How about it, Dr. Gorey? Do we talk? All right, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Pietro, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. Expense account item 8, 90 cents. Breakfast for me and coffee for Constable Tad Polk, San Pietro Police Department. 
Yes, sir. I'm glad we could get together this morning, Mr. Dollar. You know, I thought a long time about you reporting Tom Warner missing. Well, maybe I'm worried for nothing. But I do know I don't like the circumstances of his disappearance. You using me, Mr. Dollar? What? You know I got a police force of four men. We can't conduct any sizable investigation into a disappearance. Just aren't equipped for it. I thought it might be something like that. I don't want to be spending civic money to satisfy some doubts in the mind of your organization. It's not my province, Mr. Dollar. Look, the man's missing. Nobody knows where he is. He didn't leave a trace. He did leave a month's pay behind him. He left after an argument with Abbott. Nobody saw him leave that farm, Constable. No one knows where he is now. Now, just hold on to your britches, boy. I didn't say I wouldn't do anything about it. Huh? I'm going out and have a talk with Ben Abbott, Mr. Dollar. I've known him for a long time. I think maybe I can find out something about this. We'll see what happens there first, then make some plans. That sounds fair enough, Constable. Where can I get in touch with you in case I have to? I'm going over to see Dr. Gorey this morning. After that, I'll be at my hotel. Fine. Dollar? Yeah? You think something might have happened to Tom Warner? Yeah, Constable. I sure do. Expense account item nine, $2.50. One long-distance phone call to Hartford. I explained the matter of Tom Warner and requested Niles Pearson to have a man in Baltimore start checking with Warner's parents there in the event some lead as to his whereabouts might turn up there. After that, I drove out to see Dr. Gorey, veterinarian. You know, you have a way of not being very nice on the telephone. What is it now, Mr. Dollar? I just talked to my home office in Hartford, Dr. Gorey. They aren't very happy with the way this case has been going. They're too bad about them in Hartford. How does it affect me? Well, they're just about at the point where they might close it and call me back home. All this fuss, and they're going to pay the claim? No, no, not at all. I don't mean they're going to pay at all. What? They can do one of two things. They can appeal to the insurance commission for a judgment. They'd have a point. No reliable or cooperative witnesses saw the accident to the horse or the circumstances of it. What's more, there's no carcass. For all we know, the horse may be down in Mexico. Now, look, here. They can institute proceedings against Abbott, charge him with attempt to defraud. That's ridiculous. Why would a man worth almost a million dollars worry about an insurance policy? Well, of course, it's ridiculous to you and me, Doctor. But then legally, it's not ridiculous at all. I can pretty well put some things together. Abbott didn't even want to file a claim for the loss of that horse. As a matter of fact, he fired his office manager, Monroe, for filing the claim. Fired him and paid him a bonus to get out and stay out so Monroe wouldn't have to answer any questions, true? Possibly. Abbott blamed the accident on Thomas Warner and fired him, too. Warner hasn't been seen or heard of since. Now, you said on the phone... I didn't say it, but I'll say it now. Abbott hated Warner because Warner was seeing his daughter. I'll also say Abbott never struck me as a man who could control his hates. Tom Warner's nothing to me. I don't know anything about him. But Ben Abbott is something to you. Now, look, Doctor. I spent some time checking you out because you're one of the parties who can help settle this thing. You've been in practice around here for a good long time. People seem to think a lot of you. I hate to see a nice guy like you get the book. I think I can stop that if you cooperate. Now, look here. Forget I'm an insurance investigator. I'm just a guy giving you some information. When I said my company's ready to turn the matter over to the insurance commission or file charges, it means that Abbott will have to sue for settlement. And that's just what we'd want him to do. In court, he'd have to produce Thomas Warner and prove his story of the accident. I don't think he can produce Thomas Warner. With what we have so far, Abbott would lose the suit and the insurance company wouldn't fool around then. There's no outfit tougher than an insurance company when somebody's trying to cheat them, whether it's inadvertent or not. You'd have to be in court too, Doctor. Oh. Do you see what I mean? Uh, Yes. Well, how about it? Can you give me the real story now? I've been Ben Abbott's friend for 20 years. And he asked you to lie for him. That's understandable to me. In a court, though, it's perjury. What did it do to him? That's up to the company. I'll have to hear your part of it first. Duke Red was dead when I got out there that night. Ben had shot him. Duke Red hadn't had any accident. Ben made me promise to tell you that he had. Ben had just shot him. Shot him? But why? Duke Red wasn't the horse Ben counted on or thought he was. He had good confirmation, but he just wouldn't run. Couldn't run, I think. Ben got mad about that and shot him. And Tom Warner saw it happen, is that it? Yeah. Ben told me 
Warner saw him shoot the horse. He gave Warner some money and told him to go away. Uh, I don't know. Ben's losing his mind, I think. I've heard that about him before. From who? His daughter. Terry, yeah. Poor Terry. Yes, she'd have reason to say that. Huh? Now what? I'll have to talk to Abbott. Sure. One thing still worries me. What's that? I went over his bank record. He paid out money to Monroe, but he didn't pay out anything to Thomas Warner. He told me that he did. Okay, then. I'll ask him about that, too. Expense account item 10, 35 cents. I lost it in a payphone trying to get in touch with Ben Abbott. No one answered, so I drove on out to the farm. The short winter day was over when I got there. Darkness had already come over the fields. Darkness and loneliness. Hey. Hey in there, open up. Open up. Open up, somebody, open up. Mr. Dollar, sir. Good evening. Hello, Cully. Didn't you hear me? Mr. Dollar, sir, maybe this isn't such a good time to be coming around. Is Mr. Abbott here? Yes, sir, he is. But Constable Polk was out here this afternoon asking him questions, and he got powerful mad. There's no telling what he might do. He's awful mad. Well, I'm a little mad myself. I'd like to see him. Tell him I'm here. Mr. Dollar, please. Okay, all right, Cully. You go ahead. All right, Miss Terry. I'll find Mr. Abbott, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Johnny. Hi. Oh, don't. Don't come any closer. Well, what is it? Why is it so dark in here? I'd rather you didn't see me just now. Huh? Terry. Vanity. A woman always has that first, they say. Oh, John. Who did this to you? Dad. He's crazy. I just don't seem to do anything to here, please him. Here, here now. Oh, Johnny, I think it's the end. Yeah, yeah, no. Take your hands off her. What? I said take your hands off her. I'll kill you with this. Oh, Johnny, be careful. Wait a minute. I'll show you. I'll no. show you. I yes. killed the man. The man trying to be. Please stop it. Stop it. Terry. Terry, baby. No. No, don't touch me. Oh, Johnny. Johnny. Oh. Oh, it's... That's a pretty heavy cane he uses. Oh, lie still. I'll, I'll phone a doctor. No, no. Where'd he go? I don't know. Out that way. Johnny, did you hear? About killing someone else? He was talking about Tom Warner. Johnny, I know it. He was talking about Tom. I placed a call to Constable Polk's office, told him what happened. He said he'd start right away. After that, I took a walk around the grounds. All the cars were still in the garages. Then I heard some sort of disturbance down by the stables. Father! Don't come any closer. I've got a shotgun this time. I have a gun, too, Mr. Abbott. Go away from here. Get in your car and go away from here. The police will be here in a few minutes. Look, this won't do you any good. Abbott, did you hear me? It'll be better for you if you're in the house ready to make a statement for them when they come. I know that Dr. Corey lied for you, Abbott. I know that you killed that horse deliberately. Abbott! I told you to get away from here! You said you'd kill someone. You were talking about Tom Warner, weren't you? You killed him because of Terry. Last warning. Go away. I won't go away. But you'd better throw that gun away and come on out here. I'm not afraid of you. The whole bunch of you! You're just being foolish, Abbott. Like you were the day you smashed up a new car because some little thing on it didn't work. The way you killed that valuable horse because you didn't like his running. The way you killed Tom Warner without reason. You're smashing your whole life now this way. Put down that gun and come out. Abbott! That's enough! Abbott. Abbott. Oh, you didn't have to do it this way, Abbott. Lie still. Warner's body. Under this floor. All his things with it. You know about Duke Red. I know. Don't try to talk. Warner tried to stop me from killing him. 
He said I was crazy, darling. Easy. I'm not crazy. Am I, darling? Don't know. Am I? Am I? No. You're not crazy. Not anymore. They found the body of Thomas Warner where Abbott had said it was. He'd been shot to death. Terry was still in the hospital when I packed up and left San Pietro. Expense account item 11, $65.30. Hotel and board at the San Pietro Hotel. Item 12, $175. Airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Item 13, $43 even. Miscellaneous. Expense account total, $802.65. No remarks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Flight 6 matter. A story involving a girl so beautiful that men were willing to kill for her. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Barbara Fuller, Barbara Eiler, Herb Butterfield, John Stevenson, Parley Bear, Will Wright, Robert Bruce, and Forrest Lewis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pete Codley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line, Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do, find out why it crashed? No, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. Item 1, $173.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries, and more inquiries, and then some more. And after the 14th, Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, 
I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for the... you found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. (laughs) Is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. (sighs) Mac Macklin. One time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Or what were you expecting? <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt, a black silk tie, and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side make with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of it you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Oh, I've got a good man in charge up there, Gino Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes, and you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job. But this one's different. You know, it's detective work, your kind of job. And Gino Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope at about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. Pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? You had so far, nothing. We're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out... Who might benefit by having any one of them dead? Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued, and the names are in the reports here. Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. There's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo. Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Worth destroying for the insurance, you mean... No, it was done by somebody who had deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. And who didn't mind killing nine others to get that one? It was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General of the Departamento... De yes, that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, anything. Who are you? And what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here... De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the... Yes. Look, uh, are you related to... Maria de Lagos? My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance... I'm sorry, there were no survivors... No. Oh, no. Hey, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. Ted, I, I didn't know you were here in the city, or I'd have, I'd have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks. Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No? I know, it's, it's a rough deal. I, I, I am sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Later, sir. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. That is the use, senor. It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital. And I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, senor. No, no, let's see, I... 
I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Regis. Yes, he is. But I am at the Monte Cassino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Cassino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Well, I, I'm sorry. I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. Know anything about a Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban. Residence and business address, Havana. In the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming a brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary. I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Now, look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. I'll let Gino know you're coming. And you check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who had been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail, cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile-and-a-half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching, with the age-old sadness in their eyes. Uh, you are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, not of importance, but it's certain now this. It was caused by one explosion which has occurred in the baggage compartimento. Uh, venga, uh, Come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified. Uh, can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Uh, toward the front, these pieces are more large. But in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here. Uh, you look. These are pieces of the baggage. Uh, muy pequeño. Hmm? Uh, very tiny. Oh, yeah. The crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. And uh, look. It's burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. Uh, here, uh, you smell these ones. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Or oh, dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Was dynamite. Any idea how much, how big a charge? One of the soldados, uh, Pascual, who have used most explosive, is think maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, you know. Plenty tough to... They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge. And one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery, death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Madre de Dios, may they find peace. Then, for the first time, I noticed the girl, standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. Uh, you are observing the senorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quien sabe? She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. But it's like she always has the charm. Death has never found her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see... She's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her, all right. 
and I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men, both of whom had named as beneficiary Marble Terrence. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break. And then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. McMacklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean, strange? Uh, They say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane himself just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the flight six matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her. A kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool, detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? 
You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I've not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes on some jobs. Other times it's only dirty and disgusting. Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look, beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke. Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now get going. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problem. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, and that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies and that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I I wasn't with them exactly. At least not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. It's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. And sometimes you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. How many partners? Just the three of you? Yes, yeah, just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like I that. Bill, I said I've... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Suit yourself. Dollar, just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. Yeah. You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. Nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence, beside play the game? That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play too, huh? No, I meant it. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. Well, that's a very attractive offer. Outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. And call me at my hotel. The Monte Cassino. That's where Delagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed in that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name Delagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. 
Another, just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here. To see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. Could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl with an air of aloneness about her. An air that I felt would be with her even in the crowd. Strange, but also compelling. Exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plane, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. <laughs> Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, senor, playing the game. Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under a spell. Que dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I did not It's all right, that... forget it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not a thing she will do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. Yes. Possibly, but I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Bla uh, Blakely. I see he will look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. Gino dropped me in my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. At about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see all shy again. The snow piling up along the loop. And the wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. And two of them, McMacklin was flying in them. On one side or the other. Oh, what of it? Well, you know, Uncle Sam frowns on that kind of thing, Johnny, so... We've got a sort of an understanding. I stay the heck away, and he forgets about me. I see. <laughs> I've got no complaints, actually. I'm I, I'm doing all right here, but, but sometimes I sure do get homesick for the old town. Of course, it's probably changed so much that I... Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, Come permission the telephone, uh, Senor Martin. Oh, thanks. I uh, plug it in. Hello, yeah? What? 
All right. Well, well, have you told the federal police? Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Adios. Well, we just lost our best angle, Johnny. What do you mean? That baggage handler, the one I figured slipped the dynamite on board the plane. The boys just now located him. His throat has been cut. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bereaved relative lies, a frustrated lover comes up fighting, and a lovely lady in the case just vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Oh? We have not met, Senor Dollar. No, all right, I've been sure to remember the name, Don Serrano. Oh, wait a minute, you're Maria Delago's brother. That is correct. I was planning to call on you this morning, Don Serrano. Well, that will not be necessary, Senor, since I am taking the liberty of calling on you. I am downstairs in your hotel at this moment. Oh, I see. I believe I may be able to cast some light on the unfortunate tragedy which overtook my poor sister and the other passengers of that ill-fated airplane. Do you know something that hasn't come out? Rather a great deal, senor. I know the crash which resulted in the deaths of ten innocent people was the evil work of a diabolical maniac. Yes, well... A product of the warped mind of a scheming, worthless, unspeakable dog, a sneaking, money-hungry snake, a scurrilous, unprincipled... Don Serrano! Si, senor. Come on up! <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the flight six matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $3.90, room service. Breakfast for myself and a pot of coffee for my visitor. Don Serrano de Almeido y Pico, I think. He was a thin, straight man with a small goatee and the face of a hawk. Stiff, formal, unbending. A classy grande type from an old school long out of business. And a man of much suppressed violence and hate. Once upon a time, senor, there existed a gentleman's code for the settlement of such matters as this. The duelo, as it was called. But we are living now in lesser and more decadent times. A man is no longer permitted to kill his enemies. He must suffer interference by the police, the civil air transport department, the government. And even special investigators from the States, huh? Is that what you mean? I was not speaking personally, senor Dollar. You are as much a victim of the times as I am. Well, it doesn't seem to be irritating me as much. More coffee, Don Serrano? Uh, gracias, no. Perhaps it is because uh, you have not lost your dearly beloved sister, senor. Oh, maybe. In that, at least, you have my sympathy. But let's get to the point. 
You've done quite a lot of talking about wanting to kill somebody, but I'm still not too sure who or why or what. It is very simple, senor. Not to me. Suppose we start at the beginning. As you like. But who can ever say what is the beginning of anything? All right, then let's be arbitrary about it. Let's start three weeks ago when your sister Maria came here from Havana to join her husband, Ramon de Lagos. I believe you said Ramon had been here for a month at that time on uh, some kind of a business deal. A business deal? <laughs> Do I look like a fool, senor? Oh, now, let's stick to the point. Women. That is his business, senor. Women with money. Then a week ago, Maria wired you, said she was terribly unhappy, and asked you to come at once. And when you got here, she told you what was the matter. She said Ramon was carrying on with an American girl named Marvel Terrence. A Jezebel, senor. So you took over. You got Maria an airline reservation back to Havana on flight six, the one that crashed, and told her you'd handle Ramon. Oh, she was putty in his hands. He lied to her every day since they were married. And she always ended up by believing him. I told her in the beginning he was interested only in her wealth. Which amounts to how much? Oh, much. Even after Raymond's foolish dissipation over the last few years. What happens to her estate now? Half of it she was permitted to dispose of as she wished. She made a will some time ago in favor of Raymond. Against my advice, I may say. What about the other half? Now that reverts to me, senor. Oh? It is a matter of family tradition. Who managed your sister's estate before Ramon came into the picture? I did, senor. And quite profitably. I did not waste my energies on illicit follies and ludicrous intrigue. All right, all right. Night before last, then, you took Maria to the airport and saw her off on the plane. See, si. What was she planning to do when she got back to Havana? Was she going to divorce Ramon? My sister was a very pious woman. May she rest in peace. A religion would never permit such an act. I see. And, of course, there was the matter of family tradition. Oh, naturally. Did Ramon go to the airport with you? I had not seen Ramon since the night before, nor had Maria. We had uh, quarreled violently over his disgraceful conduct. Did Ramon know that his wife was taking Flight 6? I informed him the night before. Did you or Maria see him at the airport? Oh, no, senor. He was much too clever. He managed to keep out of sight. Then how can you be sure he was there? Senor Dollar, who else would be so vile as to place an explosive on board the plane? Oh, well, now I can follow your reasoning, but... The matter is self-evident. Well, look, I'm afraid we need more than self-evidence, Don Serrano. Uh, the problem of evidence is your responsibility, senor. I have told you who committed the deed. No, you've told me who you suspect. Do you doubt my word? Not as far as it goes. Sure you won't have some more coffee? No, gracias. Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, by sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, si, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane. But after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes. To some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35? See, si, he would fit that description. Blakely... Did you see her talking to anyone else? Uh, any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. Well, I considered it a, a mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Ramon wasn't the only one with a motive. Wasn't the only one who'll profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. Expense account item six, $12.60. Taxi fares in and around Mexico City. 
I checked with the federal police first. They had their best men working on the murder of the baggage handler at the airport. And so far, they'd turned up nothing. They didn't have a single lead. I went through their files on the other seven people who died on the plane. Nothing. The two pilots and the stewardess were Cuban and apparently had no close friends or enemies in Mexico City. Two of the passengers were Brazilians and were only traveling through en route from the States. And as far as the other two were concerned, there seemed to be no motive. So it came right back again to the three I was already working on. Maria Delagos and the two business partners, Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke. The three people who'd bought flight insurance policies. And that left me with four possible suspects. Ramon Delagos, Maria's husband, Don Serrano, her brother, Marvel Terrence, and Bill Blakely, the partner of Palmer and Rourke. I checked with Inspector Mocklin, but he'd made no progress. With Gina Romero, no progress. I tried to reach Blakely, but he hadn't shown up at his office. I phoned Marvel Terrence and got a reluctant agreement from her to meet me for lunch. I waited for her at the Vendome for an hour. She didn't show up. Finally, at one o'clock, I went to her hotel. Si, senor. What can I do for you? I'd like to see Miss Marvel Terrence. I wonder if Ah, you'll... Miss Terrence. Que señorita tan bonita, tan hermosa. Yeah, well, if you'll... She's the most beautiful woman where I ever stay at this hotel. Yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, all right. Would you mind uh, Sometimes telling... I think everybody in the world is in love with this señorita. All day long, it is one man after another which call up to talk to Miss Terrence. Well, would you ring her and tell her I'm Two waiting? Two times so many calls we get on the switchboard while the señorita is living. That's very interesting. And now would you uh, You please... must forgive me, amigo. When I think of Miss Terrence, I lose all sense in my head. All right, all right. You're forgiven. Now, if you... What is it you wish, senor? Will you ring Miss Terrence and tell her I'm waiting down here in the lobby? Immediately, senor. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. Johnny... Leo L... Leo... How do you spell it, please? D-O-L-L-A-R. L-A-R. Gracias. I will tell her at once that you... Sacre nombre. I had forgot. Forgot what? She's not here no more, senor. What? She has checked out of hotel at 11 o'clock this morning. Expense account item 7, $2.10. Lunch at the Monte Casino Hotel, alone. I was sorry she'd skipped. I guess I was secretly hoping Marvel would turn out to be in the clear. But if she were, then why run out? It didn't add up. I paid my check and started to leave the dining room. And at the entrance, I ran square into a man I was planning to see later in the day. He didn't seem very happy about it. Senor Dollar. How are you, Ramon? It is a pleasure to see you again, senor. And I'd like to talk to you a couple of minutes. Come on, uh, let's step into the bar. But I have a most important engagement, senor. Well, this is important, too. I understand you're a friend of Marvel Terrence's. I see. It is my honor and pleasure. Well, she's checked out of the hotel here. Do you know where she went? Senor, I do not discuss the private affairs of my friends. Oh, knock it off, Ramon. This isn't a tea party. Ten people have been murdered by an explosion aboard a plane. One of them was your wife, remember? I cannot help you. I know nothing of Miss Terrence's plans. And now... I talked to your brother-in-law this morning, Ramon, Don Serrano. He tells me you're the one who put the explosive on board the plane. It is a lie. He seemed pretty certain of it. He tells me you stand to inherit half of your wife's estate. Then he is better informed as to the details of the matter than I am. I do not know what happens to the estate, senor. He seems to think you wanted to get your wife out of the way in order to have a free hand with Miss Terrence. Don Serrano, as you may have noticed, is a bigoted and jealous old fool who thinks only of money. He knows better than that. What do you mean? Maria was different from the women of your country, senor. She understood such matters as my friendship with Miss Terrence. And accepted them? Except such times as Don Serrano goaded her into being foolish, yes. It is a difference of the Latin temperament, senor. I see. Then there was no trouble between you and Maria. None of importance. The trouble was Don Serrano. He has hated me from the day of our marriage, because from that moment on he no longer had any control over Maria's fortune. If you wish to discuss this further, senor, I will be happy to do so later, but I must leave now. Con su permiso. I watched him hurry out of the hotel. I had no real reason to stop him and no authority to. On sudden impulse, I crossed the lobby to the public phones, called the Hotel Regis, and asked for Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Don Serrano had checked out. No forwarding address. I called the Del Prado and asked for Bill Blakely. Mr. Blakely had checked out. No forwarding address. I left the phone booth and hurried back to the desk. The clerk was very sorry. Ramon de Lagos had checked out earlier in the day. No forwarding address. (laughs) 
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a rendezvous in a tropic port. And a lot of things come together. Things like romance, desire, and death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Monklin's office. Gino Romero. Oh, Gino. What did you find out? Did you locate any of them? Beneficiaries of the crash of Flight 6? Si, senor. It was an affair most simple. A matter of making a telephone call to the airport. Then they've left Mexico City. Si, senor. The senorita Marvel Terrence has taken the 10 o'clock plane this morning to Acapulco. Oh. Senor Blakely has taken the 11.30 plane to Acapulco. Senor Ramon de Lagos has taken the 2 o'clock... Plane to Acapulco. And what about Don Serrano? Oh, with him, he's different. At 2.45, he's departs from Mexico City in a special charter plane. Look, Gino, is there another flight to Acapulco this afternoon? But, of course, at 4.30. Already, I have two reservations. Good. I'll meet you at the airport. What's the flight number? Gino. I'm uh, scared to think of it. This one is also called Flight 6. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 9, $63.45. Incidentals in Mexico City and plane fare to Acapulco. One more of the sharp contrasts of Mexico. We left the stiff formality of the city behind us, the cool, thin air of the high plateau... And 50 minutes later, we stepped off the plane and into the steaming heat of the tropics. Barefoot tourists in shorts and barefoot natives in white cotton dungarees. Soft brown skins and flashing teeth. Mangoes, papayas, and the heady scent of tropical flowers. Blue sky, blue Pacific, and a burning sun. And a bay so bright and beautiful it breaks your heart. Acapulco. Gino Romero of the Department of Civil Air Transport knew his way around. So I waited for him while he checked his contacts. Airport police, custom agents, limousine drivers. And in a few minutes, he'd made his rounds and rejoined me in front of the terminal. It is an affair most simple, senor. A merely matter of ask the question and listen to the answer. What did you find out, Gino? The senorita Miss Terrence is there at the Hotel Los Flamingos. So? Senor Blakely is also stay there. Ramon de Lagos is go to the Hotel Caleta. And Don Serrano is stay at the Club de Pesca. So you see? Yeah, I see. All right, Gino, let's get going. And where we are going is to the... Uh... We'll put up at the Los Flamingos. That is what I expect. Oh, she's very beautiful, senor. True, but there are even better reasons for staying there. ¿Qué dice? Well, in some way, I mean, I'm not sure how. I think this whole thing centers right around Marvel Terrence. 
you think it's possible she are guilty of the crash of the flight six to collect the insurance? Maybe. Or she might have been used. Or maybe... Oh, I don't know, Gino. But it's about time we found out. <laughs> Expense account, item 10, a dollar and fifty cents. Limousine fare from the airport to the hotel. The Flamingos is built on a point near the far end of the peninsula, set on a headland high above the white smother of surf below. And there, just before dusk, with the western sky, a yellow blaze of glory beyond the far rim of the Pacific, I found her. She was sitting on the open terrace by the edge of the cliff. And once again, she was alone. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. I suppose I should be surprised, but I'm not, really. I guess I rather expected you. Well, then wasn't it a waste of time to run away from Mexico City? I've always run away, I guess. And most of the time, I imagine you've been followed. Or maybe I wanted to face you here, where it's so beautiful. Where perhaps you'd be able to understand me a little better. Is that what you want, Marble? To be understood? Doesn't every woman? I thought it was more often the man. And usually it's his wife who doesn't understand him, isn't it? I see this isn't going to be just a social chat. <laughs> Oh, I doubt if it could ever be just a social chat. Not with you. Now, you've got too much impact for that. A compliment? That's a fact. There's no place else in the world with sunsets like the ones here. Every evening. It's like there's another land way off there in the west. It's a strange, bright, golden land. And it keeps calling, coaxing... Only in a little while, it'll disappear. And everything will be dark off there in the West. Maybe you do understand me, Johnny. Maybe that's why I'm half afraid of you. <laughs> Another reason I ran, maybe. I can be a fool, easy. Sort of hereditary defect, you might say. Well, that's a common affliction. Rarely fatal. Rarely doesn't help. Once is enough. You know something... When I die, I want to be buried up there in the middle of a sunset. It'd be kind of lonely, wouldn't it? I think I've always been lonely. Do you know I haven't a single living relative in the world, not one? I was 14 when my parents were killed in an auto accident. I stayed in a boarding school, and the bank handled the estate. When I was 21, they turned it over to me. And since then, I've... I guess that's not what you want to know, though, is it? Not exactly... Want to tell me about it, Marvel? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It would be better if you would. For whom? For me? I doubt it. I feel dirty, Johnny. Telling wouldn't change that. It might. Anything I'd tell you would be only suspicion, not fact. Wouldn't? Unless, of course, you're expecting a confession. Do you have one to make? No. But you know who caused Flight 6 to blow up and why, don't you? No. I can make a guess, that's all. Like to tell me that guess? You'll find out soon enough, Johnny, and I'd rather it didn't come from me. Eleven people have died, Marvel. I know. Ten on the plane that crashed and the baggage handler who was murdered later and whoever... You don't have to remind me of it. I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. I told you how I felt and I'd drop it, Johnny. All right, all right. I didn't know. That's all I can claim. I just didn't know. What do you mean? Nothing. Look. It's dark out there now. And sunset's gone. There's always another one. I wonder. Have you ever met Don Serrano, brother-in-law of Ramon de Lagos? No, but he was pointed out to me. Did you see him at the airport the night Flight 6 was blown up? I don't remember. I don't think so. Did you see Ramon? No. Did he know you'd canceled your reservation that night? He didn't even know I had one. Have Ramon and Bill Blakely ever met? Yes, they met. And detested each other on sight. Well, that's understandable in view of the circumstances. Oh, I guess, but... Why are people like they are? Did you arrange for Blakely to follow you here? I didn't tell anybody I was coming. And he was a good guesser. So was Ramon and Don Serrano. I know. They're all here. Why? They don't even know me. They don't want to know me. Not in any real way, but they're here. Oh, yeah, they're here. And I think you ought to tell me what you know, Marvel. Tomorrow, maybe. Not tonight. Let me have just one night, Johnny. All right. Take me to dinner. Dance with me. Laugh with me. 
Give me just one evening. Will you, Johnny? Sure. And thank my lucky star for the chance. You're sweet. I'm saying it now. Without any strings. No matter how things work out. I'll still mean it. You're a sweet guy, Johnny. Give me time to change. I went to my room and made two phone calls while I waited for her. The operator at the club, De Pesca, informed me that Don Serrano was not in. The clerk at the hotel, Caleta, said the same thing about Ramon de Lagos. I didn't leave my name with either of them. Bill Blakely was staying in room 23, a few doors on down the terrace, so I decided to go have a talk with him before I went out to dinner with Marvel Terrence. But as it happened, I didn't have to go to that much trouble. Yeah, who is it? Blakely, I'd like to talk to you. Come on in. Do you always cover your visitors with a gun? Only when I spot them listening outside my door. I don't know I what I saw you're... your shadow against the shutter there. You've been standing outside for the last five minutes, Blakely. You listened to me make a couple of phone calls. Did you learn anything you wanted to know? Dollar, suppose you were suspected of sabotaging an airliner and killing ten people. Wouldn't you want to know what kind of a case was being built up against you? What makes you think you're under suspicion, Blakely? I know I am. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were my partners. When they died on that plane, I became sole owner of the firm. There's the motive. I've got a warehouse full of dynamite in Mexico City. There's the method. I can go even farther than that. What do you mean? You mentioned one motive. Why didn't you mention the other one? What other one? Marvel Terrence. That crash not only eliminated a pair of business partners, it wiped out a couple of rivals. <laughs> Just one thing wrong with that dollar. Marvel had a reservation on that plane herself. She only decided at the last minute not to go. I wouldn't have been gaining much if I'd killed her along with my rivals, as you call them. Uh-huh. Maybe that's why you cornered her at the airport and argued her out of going. Yes, I... I did talk her out of the trip. But not because I'd planted an explosive on board. How do you feel about her, Blakely? I'd give my left arm. I wouldn't do any good. I'm just not the guy. I never have been and never will be. Maybe you are... She says she's having dinner with you tonight. That's right. She is. How do you feel about her, Dollar? I don't know. Expense account item 11, $26.40. Taxis, dinner, drinks, and dancing for two. The Copacabana with its blue lights and the surf right at your feet and a million stars low enough to touch the warm water of the bay lapping softly at the pilings. The Las Americas, the Casablanca, music, champagne, and the tropic night. And then finally, much later. Good night, Johnny, and thank you. Tonight, for the first time I can remember, I wasn't alone. And then, only an hour afterward, I was wakened out of a sound sleep. Senor Dollar. Right with you, Gino. What was it? It's a senorita, I think. She's a number eight. Come on. But she wasn't a number eight. Her door was standing open and the room was empty. We searched the terrace out toward the edge of the cliff where I talked with her at sunset. We saw the broken section of railing and found one of her slippers and a pack of her cigarettes lying nearby. In pitch darkness, we slid and scrambled down the steep path to the beach. And there by the edge of the surf, we found her. The warm foam reached out for her, as though to carry her away to that last sunset she'd loved so much. She looked very beautiful, but very much alone. As alone and as lonely as death. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a desperate killer is cornered and strikes back in a deadly counterattack. Final showdown. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here is your call to Mexico City, senor. Oh, thanks. Hello? Macklin, Department of Civil Air Transport. Hi, Mac. Dollar, what have you learned in Acapulco? Uh, not very much, I'm afraid. But you said you were following the girl down there. Marvel Terrence. Yeah, and a few others who might have had a hand in the explosion aboard Flight 6. Beneficiaries of the insured on that flight. What others? Ramon de Lagos, whose wife died in the crash. Don Serrano, her brother. Bill Blakely, whose business partners were aboard. Well, have you and Gino learned anything from them? From the girl? Not yet. But you said she might know who caused that explosion aboard the plane. Right, and she promised to talk. Well? Your little helper, Gino, and I just pulled her body out of the surf down below the hotel here. Johnny. Murder? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Acapulco, Mexico, to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for the phone call to Mac Macklin in Mexico City. I had to get Mac out of bed to tell him what had happened. That Marvel Terrence had been murdered. That somebody had silenced the girl around whom the whole case had seemed to center since Flight 6 had exploded in midair three nights before and carried the passengers and crew to their deaths. Mac was shocked and offered any additional help I might need. But he had no new information at his end, and it was obvious now that any answers would have to be found right here in Acapulco. As I hung up the phone, Gino Romero came rushing in from the hotel terrace. Senor Dollar. What is it, Gino? A prowler is out on the hotel grounds. The police cars go to block off the road at the bottom of the slope. Good, come on. The stairs are over this way, senor. Right with you. A little light wouldn't hurt anything down here. It's no time. This way, into the brush is a footpath. All right, lead the way. Over there is only 100 feet to the cliff. The other side is the road for the hotel. Here is the only place anybody can go. It's down this slope. Yeah, but there are plenty of places to hide. This is in your boat. It's a matter... Oh, wait. Huh? Listen. We could hear someone moving through the jungle growth a few yards away, moving swiftly but cautiously. Then a sudden silence. Whoever it was, it also stopped and was listening for Gino and me. We waited for the fugitive to move again, straining our ears, trying to tag the location. Seconds passed. Then a slight rustle ahead of us. Gino nudged me and we slipped quietly toward the sound. Get your hands up. Well, well. Well, it's not just Senor Dollar. 
You seem to be quite a night owl, Don Serrano. Not ordinarily, senor. The circumstances which place me in this rather awkward position are not usual ones, I assure you. You were up there prowling around the hotel. Why? I was looking for my unmentionable brother-in-law. Ramon de Lagos? Why? What made you think he'd be here? I went to his hotel. He was not in his room. I knew he had not been able to see Miss Terrence since she had spent the evening with you. So I assumed he might be waiting for her here, at her hotel. And my assumption has, of course, been proven correct. Did you see him? No, but I heard the police discussing the murder of Miss Terrence. It was obviously Ramon's handiwork. Still after him, huh? My feeling about Ramon is not a secret, senor. Nor his about you. So why did you go to his hotel? To kill him. Why else? Time was running out, so we took Don Serrano back to the hotel to the police. One very important person hadn't put in an appearance. Gina went down to Bill Blakely's room, knocked on the door, then opened it with a passkey and went in. Blakely wasn't there. We searched the room. The bed has been sleeping, senor. Yeah. Yeah, I notice. But for how long, that's the question. It's possible he was wake up when the senorita screams before she is killed. He might have been... He must have dressed. His pajamas are there on the floor. I wonder. Sorry if it was a quarrel of lovers, the jealousy. He did not like it when the senorita would go with you tonight. I don't think it's that simple, Gino. Let's get this bag open. Have a look inside. Maybe we can... It's not even locked. He seems to have been traveling light. He... There on the top, senor. Yeah, I see. What is it? A box of thirty-eight caliber cartridges spilled open. And that piece of oilcloth. He had a gun packed in here. No, it's gone. He got up, loaded a gun, and left. Took the gun with him. If it was before the scream, that's one thing. But if it was afterward, then... What are you thinking, senor? I think we'd better take the police with us. Get over to the Hotel Caleta and check up on our third suspect. Ramon? But Don Serrano said he is not there. Don Serrano could say anything. I think we'd better get over there, Gino, and do it fast. Clerk said room 34. That's the second door down. Let's see. Let's go. Ramon. Ramon. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Open up. Watch yourself, Gino. See. Si. Come on in, Dollar. You're Blakely. Yeah. Better hand over the gun, Blakely. You won't get a chance to use it now. The police are out in the lobby. Okay. All right, thanks. Ramon didn't show up, huh? I wish he had. That's all I was asking, just one clear shot at him. Are you sure he's the one who killed her? Sure enough. Did you see him? No, but he's the one. She was scared of him, Dollar. She told me earlier in the afternoon, before you got down here to Acapulco. Told you what? She said Ramon had followed her here from Mexico City. That he'd been acting strange. She said she was glad I was staying at the same hotel. That she didn't want to see him or talk to him. Yeah, it figures all right. It checks with what she said to me last night. If she'd only given me a little more to go on. She was a real great kid, Dollar. The greatest as far as I was concerned. Yeah. As soon as I realized what had happened, I loaded my gun and came here to wait for him. I figured he'd try to get back to his room. But he didn't show. It's too bad. She was a real great kid. And I'd have died for her if she asked me to. I loved her. She was the... I hear you saw it, idiot! Come on, Gino. Si, senor. Ramon had been spotted. He started to enter the hotel, saw the police, turned and ran. He was armed with a pistol. He'd fired a shot at one of the police officers and then jumped over the balustrade and disappeared into the dark curve of Caleta Beach. The police cars quickly threw a cordon along the Bayfront Street and blocked off both ends of the stretch of shoreline. For the moment, Ramon was trapped somewhere on that beach. He tipped his hand now, and he was desperate and dangerous, and he had a gun. Gino and I went out on the beach after him. There's many place to hide here. Not for long. They'll have some more police here within a few minutes. Come on. It's maybe better we wait, senor. I do not think Ramon is planned to be taken alive. I can still see that girl, Gino, lying at the foot of the cliff. Si, senor. I remember. I... I swear it. Oh, what is it? There, by the water, is... Oh, no, I am wrong, senor. It's only a boat pulled up on the sand. Yeah, it's a paddle boat. Well, I think it's better maybe we separate, senor. 
I look in the pavilion, the cabanas, you stay close by the water. In this way, we are have him between us. Good idea, Chino. But you've got the rough end of it. Take care of yourself. Yes, sir. Well. Not much cover along the shoreline here. Yes. Do not move, senor. Do not make a sound. Well, Roman. So you were hiding behind that boat. I have nothing to lose now, senor. If you make one move or try to call out, I will kill you. Yeah, I think you would. All right, then, what comes next? This boat. You will push it into the water. But be very careful. If you make any noise, even by accident, I will kill you. Quickly now. Hurry. Relax, Ramon. You don't have a chance anyway. We will see. Careful now. Be quiet. Good. Now get in, quickly. Sure. Take the paddle. Head out across the bay and be very quiet, or I will kill you. All right, Ramon. They're just wasting your time. They'll have a police launch out here within ten minutes. I do not think so. They will not know. Quiet! Quiet! One more sound from that paddle and I will shoot. Marvel Terrence. Why did you kill her, Ramon? He made me crazy. So beautiful. And with so very much money. I thought she would be most easy once Maria, my wife, was dead. Then it was you who blew up the airliner in order to kill your wife and have a clear field to go after Marvel. Marvel did not know I was married and Maria was going to tell her. So you sabotaged a plane and killed her along with ten other innocent people. And what happened tonight? Did Marvel turn you down? He said she was suspicious of me. And she was going to tell you about it in the morning. And she said she was falling in love with you. She made me crazy. I wish you had got back into that hotel, Ramon. I wish you'd got there before I did, while Bill Blakely was still waiting for you with a loaded gun in his hand. Be quiet and paddle faster. We must get farther up the coast in order... What is that? Police launch. What did you think? I told you you didn't have a chance. No, they could not get here so soon. Well, I forgot to mention the fact that they'd already phoned for one. Then they do not know yet we are out here. Good. Keep paddling. Quickly. He half turned his head to look back toward the launch. I took a chance and swung the paddle. His shot went wild and he didn't get a second try. I caught him back in the air and he dropped like a log. The police located our boat a few minutes later and hauled him over the gunnel and into the launch. And that should have been the end of it. But none of us realized Ramon's insane desperation. He'd only been pretending unconsciousness. On board the launch, he snatched a gun from one of the officers and tried to take over the boat. He didn't have a chance. He took a full volley of shots from three police pistols square in the chest. Expense account item 13, $312.20. Hotel and incidentals in Acapulco and Mexico City and plane fare back to the States. Expense account total, $608.10. End of expense account, end of report. Remarks? I'll never see another sunset now without thinking of her somewhere out beyond it. I hope she doesn't feel alone anymore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a dead girl comes to life in a case that's packed with lies. Yet every one of them comes true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, Russ Thorson, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story 
of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Taylor down at Tri-State, Johnny. Hello, Don. Happy New Year. Belated, of course. Same to you, Johnny. Listen, would you like to come over to my office and meet a pretty girl? Sure. Is she interesting? Very. As a matter of fact, she just told me the most interesting thing I've ever heard. Oh, what's that? She just told me that she was dead. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item one, one buck. Cab fare to the international building and Don Taylor's office. He was sitting behind his desk when I walked in, talking to a tall, dark-haired girl in her late 20s who was standing casually looking out the window at the street below. She was pretty, she was quiet, and she was well-dressed. Hello, Johnny. Thanks for coming right over. I'd like to have you meet Mrs. McLean. How do you do? Hello. Sit down, Johnny. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, take my desk. Uh, how are you going? I'm going to let Mrs. McLean talk to you alone. She has a most unusual story. Yeah, something about being dead. Isn't that what you said? Yes, yes. Something about being dead. Mrs. McLean, Mr. Dollar will be handling this matter for Tri-State. I wish you'd tell him exactly what you've just told me. Uh, ring the buzzer when you're through, Johnny. Oh, sure. sure. Um... <clears throat> Would you like to sit down? He thinks I'm crazy. That's what he thinks. Well, isn't it? <laughs> well, I doubt that. Well, uh, sit down. Let's talk it over. Of course he does. It's the first I've told it to anybody. It's fantastic. What did he say your name was? Johnny Dollar. Dollar. What do you do? I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. For him? For anybody who hires me. Here. Try one of these, Mrs. McLean. Oh, thank you. I suppose I'll be put in jail, don't you? Look, Mrs. McLean, why don't you try to tell me some of the facts about, uh, well, about whatever it is. The facts are, I'm legally dead, Mr. Dollar, and my husband collected on my insurance policy. Mm -hmm. When did all this happen? Two years ago in Los Angeles. How much money did your husband collect on your insurance policy? Ten thousand dollars. Where is your husband? In Los Angeles. I suppose you tell me how it worked, Mrs. McLean. My husband's a doctor, Mr. Dollar. His name's Dave McLean. One night he had a patient come in, a girl. Well, she was in pretty bad shape. She'd been drinking somewhere, and she just came in off the street. Saw his shingle outside the office. I was there helping Dave as a receptionist. Oh. Dave took her into one of the examining rooms to see what the matter was. She had a heart attack. She died on the table. Well, there was nothing he could do for her. Nothing anybody could do for her. Mm -hmm. She died on the table, and then what? Well, Dave came out and told me what had happened. We looked in her purse to find out who she was and where she lived. There wasn't anything but an address in Jersey City. No Los Angeles address? No. Her name was Teresa Corbett. She was from Jersey City, and that's all. Then what? Well, 
Dave called long distance to the place in Jersey City. It was an apartment. He talked to the manager there. I see. Go on. Well, uh, well, Dave didn't say anything about Teresa Corbett being dead. He, well, he didn't have a chance, really. The, the manager was very upset. He told Dave that Teresa's mother had died very suddenly two days before. He said he'd been trying to locate her there in Los Angeles. Well, he was very frantic. Go well, on. It, it was just one of those crazy things. The, the apartment house manager was just about out of his mind. Teresa's mother had died in one of his apartments on his premises. He himself had, had assumed responsibility for the body. He didn't know what to do about a funeral or, or anything else. He told Dave that Teresa was all the old woman had in the world. Nobody else. And Teresa Corbett was dead in your office at the time? Yes. Well, Dave hung up. I, I didn't know what he was thinking at first. And, and then he said to me, we're in luck. Hmm. I asked him what he meant by that. And, and he said that the girl who had died in our office didn't have anyone in the world and no one would know the difference. Then he told me we'd use her body. Just like that, huh? Yeah, just like that. He said it was the chance of a lifetime. Well, go on. Well, Dave called up Dr. Reed. He had an office across the hall from Dave. He waited a while, and, and then I hid when Dr. Reed came in. Dave told him that I had had a heart attack. He took him back in the examining room and showed him the body of Teresa Corbett and told Dr. Reed it was me. It was awful. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I, I hid there in the back office and listened to them talk. They tried oxygen on the girl and shots and everything else. But it was too late. Dave knew it was too late. But, well, Dr. Reed signed my death certificate. Two days later, they buried Teresa Corbett under my name. And then what did you do? Well, I, I took a hotel room that first night, and then I went down to Palm Springs. Dave said he'd meet oh, me there. Oh, wait a minute. Dr. Reed had the office across from your husband's? Yes. Well, didn't this Dr. Reed know you? Hadn't he seen you around? You said you were acting as a receptionist for your husband. I, I'd never met Dr. Reed. He, he was just new. Okay. So you went to Palm Springs? Yes. After the funeral, Dave came down and he said I'd have to disappear for a while. To give him the time to collect the insurance money and straighten out some things. He collected the money? Yes. Yes, he did. All of it. Then what happened? I came to New York to live. Dave was going to close his practice in Los Angeles and come to New York and we'd be together again. He... He never met me in New York. Do you know why he never met you in New York? No. Did he write to you? Yes, for a while. For about three months after I left, he wrote me once or twice a week and, and said that he'd be in New York any day. And then he stopped writing. Do you have any of those letters? No. No, I'm sorry, I, I don't. Do you know why he stopped writing to you? No. I have no way of finding out. I, I couldn't call anyone in Los Angeles and ask them to look into it for me, could I? Tell me, uh, what is it you feel now, Mrs. McLean? What? Well, just what is it you want us to do? What? Well, I don't know. What do you do in, in a case like this? I've never had a case like this. Why did you come to us? Well, I... I've had this thing on my mind almost two years. It was wrong to begin with. It's wrong now. I suppose it's because this insurance company was wronged mostly. My... My husband and I cheated them out of $10,000. At least my husband did. What about this Dr. He, Reed? Well, he didn't have anything to do with it. I, I mean, he just signed the death certificate, but he didn't know the difference. You sure about that? Quite sure about that. I don't want to get anyone into trouble. I, I mean anyone. Including Dr. Reed. Yes. Well, I... I know how, how fantastic all of this must sound, but... But it's the truth. Do you think I'm crazy? You don't look crazy to me, What's the saying? What saying? Oh, something about how you can leave home, but eventually you have to come back to count the spoons. I guess that's what I'm doing now, telling you all this. Mm -hmm. It's good to tell it to someone after all this time. Did you get any of the insurance money, Mrs. McLean? Not a dime. Were you supposed to? I suppose so, yes. If Dave had met me... Would you say the whole thing was his idea? Yes. 
Yes, I would. I didn't know what he had in mind that night after he hung up the phone. You've been living in New York for the last couple of years since it happened, is that right? Yes, 2257 Street, apartment 23. What have you been doing? How do you live? I've been working. I took a job in a medical lab. Under your own name? No, I used the name of Patricia Kennedy. Is there any way you can prove you're actually Doris McLean? I could in Los Angeles. How? Well, people there know me. Friends I've had all my life. Were you ever fingerprinted there? No, I... I don't think so. During the war, did you work in a defense plant, maybe? No. How about a California driver's license? I don't drive, no. Would you be willing to furnish me with a list of names of people who might be able to identify you? People in... in Los Angeles? Yeah, sure, anywhere. Well, yes. Yes, I would, if... if it's necessary. It's necessary. Don't you believe me? All of this has to be checked, Mrs. McLean. Now, what was the reason for trying to cheat the insurance company? Oh, well, Dave was badly in debt. He, oh, he needed so many things that... Well, it, it seemed a good way to, to get them without too much trouble. You mean burying a girl named Teresa Corbett under your name? Yes. A girl without any family anywhere, with a mother who died two days before. Yes. Very few people in this world are without somebody somewhere, Mrs. McLean. Teresa Corbett didn't have anybody, Mr. Dollar. I know that. Do you know any more about her than what the apartment house manager said on the telephone to your husband? No. Do you remember the name of the apartment house manager in Jersey City? No. The address? No. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me about all this? Well, I... I can't think of anything. No. Before I ask Mr. Taylor to come back in here, I want to ask you again. Why did you come to the insurance company? What? Why did you come here to Hartford to the insurance company? You asked me that once, and I told you. The insurance company were the people that were wrong. Now look, and... obviously you've been living and working in New York and getting along. No one knows anything about this. There was no need for anyone to know anything about it. No need for us to know about it. Now, you'll pardon me, but you don't seem like the type of person who wakes up one morning with a big pain in the conscience. Not at all. Now, you sat here and told me about your husband, how your husband thought of the idea, how your husband hung up the phone, how your husband called in a Dr. Reed to sign a death certificate, how, how your Dollar, husband handled every detail, all of it. Not you, Mrs. McLean, your husband. He's the one you want us to get, isn't he? Yes. He, he didn't have to meet me in New York once he got his hands on that money. He didn't have to do anything about me. I was dead on paper. And I couldn't go back. I... I buy a Los Angeles newspaper now and then, and I saw a notice yesterday that he's going to get married again. I see. But I'm still his wife. He tricked me. You helped him to do it. Who's he going to marry there? I didn't recognize her How name. How are you? I'll be 30 next June. I'm going to ask you something else, Mrs. McLean. Have you ever been in trouble before? No. Well, you're in trouble now, if all this is true. Well, it is true. Now, Would I just told you... Would you be willing to sign that... a statement in front of witnesses containing all the information you've given me here today? Yes. Yes, I would. Okay. Yeah, Johnny? You can phone your legal department, Don. Mrs. McLean is willing to make a statement regarding this whole matter. All right. Mrs. Right. McLean, you can make your statement in front of Mr. Taylor and whatever witnesses he wants to use. I'll see you in about an hour or so, Don. Good. You're, you're all through with me? No, there's one more thing, Mrs. McLean. You realize that if what you've told me is true, both you and your husband will be criminally charged? Well, yes. Yes, I realize that. Oh, I... <gasps> Johnny, for heaven's sake, oh, you're trying to scare me. I just something. wanted that part understood. I'll see you. Hey, Johnny, wait a minute. Don't worry. I'll be around. Plenty. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some well-thought-out lies. Well, believe it or not, they come true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Don Taylor. What do we do about Doris McLean? Find out if she's telling the truth about being legally dead and having her husband collect her insurance, Don? No, no, Johnny. I mean right now. You can't press any charges against her or him until we get some facts. Well, she gave us a statement admitting everything. Can't we file charges on that? Uh, I'd rather not. Huh? Why? Oh, just a feeling. Call it a hunch if you like. Now, wait a minute. Don, I don't think she's told us the truth. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. A dead girl who was very much alive. Expense account, item two, five dollars. Lunch at a little place called the Copper Kettle for myself and Don Taylor. I think we should act, Johnny. Yeah, well, I don't. Not yet. Look, I listened to her whole story. You listen only a part of it, so get this. She was married to a doctor in Los Angeles, Dr. David McLean. Yeah, yeah. One night, two years ago, a girl named Teresa Corbett walked into his office, a little drunk and a little sick. She had a heart attack. She died. The doctor found a name and a Jersey City address in the girl's purse. He called up the New Jersey address, and an apartment house manager told him the girl's mother, her only living relative, died two days before. Dr. McLean hangs up and tells his wife he'll bury the other girl under her name and collect the insurance. No sense in going into all this, Johnny. Now, wait a minute. Doris McLean agreed to this. Her husband calls in another doctor and has the death certified. Doris McLean goes to New York. Her husband collects the insurance. But didn't meet her in New York, as he said he would. Two years ago, this happened, Don. Today, she comes in and says, I'm tired of waiting for him. We cheated you. Do something to us. She also said she'd rather notice that her husband's going to marry some other girl. Makes sense to me. Yeah, well, not to me, Don. At least not all of it. Why? Why not? What are you looking for? The holes, the holes, and there are plenty of them, Don. Look, for one reason, she told it the same way both times. For the second reason, if all this happened on the spur of the moment in Los Angeles, that is, the girl came into the doctor's office off the street and died suddenly, why would the doctor bother to call New Jersey? Why wouldn't he call the Los Angeles police, for instance? Because he had the insurance thing in mind? Well, what do you think? Now, look, Johnny, I think you're pushing too hard in here. I'm trying to tell you what we're up against. All we have to do is verify her story. Yeah, well, there's something cockeyed in the way it comes out. According to Mrs. McLean's statement, the doctor thought of the insurance trick as he went along. That is, after he called Jersey City and found out the dead girl in his office had no one else in the world because her mother had died a couple of days before. After he saw he had a good chance. Yeah, he wouldn't have known he had a chance to pull the trick if he'd done what he was supposed to do and called the Los Angeles police. Yes, but... Now, that's important. And look, here's another thing. Mrs. McLean says she was acting as receptionist in his office when this strange girl came in. Now, I don't know about you, but every receptionist I've ever seen in a doctor's office will ask you your name and address before you see the doctor. Mrs. McLean didn't do that uh, at all. But... They'll get your name and address unless they already know it. Where's Mrs. McLean now? Over at the New Hartford Hotel. I asked Sam Benson to keep an eye on her until we file charges and take her into custody. Well, then you can call him off. Now, look here, Johnny. Every word she has told us will have to be verified before we can take any action like that. Every word. I don't know whether I want you to handle this or not. It's okay with me. Either way, Johnny. Now, now, wait, Johnny. You want some more coffee? No, thanks. Let's not argue anymore. Okay, let's not. Mrs. McLean admitted she helped her husband cheat us out of $10,000. We've got that on paper. Look here. I made a check on the policy. We issued a straight-life policy in Doris, Mary McLean in Los Angeles, April 23rd, 1945. According to our records, Mrs. McLean passed away February 1st, 1954. Yeah, yeah. Claim was filed by the beneficiary, husband, David Earl McLean, M.D., February 4th, and paid off on the 10th. $10,000 full claim. Here you are. Uh-huh. Uh, that's a photo stand of the death certificate attached. Yeah. Cause... Coronary thrombosis. And look at that signature. 
Dr. Willis Reed. And that's the same doctor she said her husband called in. I know, I know. What else? A business about her living and working in New York in a medical lab. And this is the name of the place. Mm-hmm. She said she'd use the name of Patricia Kennedy. Well, I put in a call to their personnel manager. I described Mrs. McLean to him, and he said that sounded like her. Checked out. He'd been with him almost two years. Well, that's about it. Well, I call the airport, and they'll get me out to Los Angeles by tomorrow morning. Thought it'd take a few hours in New York to check some other things out. Joe, that looks pretty definite to me, especially with her statement and all the things she said. So what have you got to worry about, Johnny? All the things she didn't say. Expense account item three, $38.14. Transportation, Hartford, Connecticut, to New York, New York. I checked my bag at Idlewild and took the limousine in as far as the Waldorf. Expense account item four, $3. Cab fare and tip. Number 22, 57th Street. Doris McLean's residence, where she'd lived as Patricia Kennedy. Apartment 23. I talked to the manager. This is her apartment, Mr. Dollar. I see. How long has she lived here? Moved in, uh, two years ago next month, uh, March 1954. Good tenant? Very. Quiet. Ever talk to her? Not much. Christmas time, we had a drink together down in my apartment uh, with my wife. First time I knew she worked in a medical laboratory. Mm Mm-hmm. Does she have any friends in the building that I could talk to? Not that I know about. She keeps to herself, minds her own business. May I ask where she is now? In Hartford, Connecticut, at the New Hartford Hotel, if you want to talk to her about anything. I might want to talk to her about you. So? You knock on my door and say you're an insurance investigator and you want to look at her apartment. I saw your credentials and all that, but I don't know about you now. She asked me to investigate a matter. This is part of the investigation. Well, if you feel any better, why don't you telephone her long distance, tell her I'm here. I'll pay the charges. Oh, that's okay. Do you mind if I look around? I'll have to stay with you, Mr. Dollar. An hour later, I located a Mr. Platt at the Hyde Park Laboratories where Doris McLean had been working using the name Patricia Kennedy. His answers concerning her conduct, habits, and attitude were identical with those of the apartment house manager. I talked to three people who had been working with her in the lab. Same result. Expense account item five, $2.25. Long-distance phone call to Don Taylor in Hartford. Yeah? What'd you find out, Johnny? All clear here. Her story checks out about living in New York. I talked to the coroner's office in Jersey City. Oh? According to their records, a Constance May Corbett, age 61, died there January 27th, 1954. Body unclaimed. County buried her. Coroner's office unable to locate the next of kin, a daughter, Teresa Mary Corbett, believed living in Los Angeles. Well? Well, what do you want me to say? Coincidence or not, this part of it all checks out. Yeah, I'll admit that. Thank you. You're welcome. Expense account item six, $113.65. Transportation, New York to Los Angeles. We landed at International Airport in a heavy fog at 8.35 in the morning. By 9.35, I was in my room at the Statler Hotel sleeping. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I got up and showered and shaved and had something to eat. There was a special delivery airmail folder for me at the desk from Don Taylor. It contained a flash picture of Doris McLean, a sample of her fingerprints and handwriting, along with the names and addresses of several people in Los Angeles Mrs. McLean thought might be able to identify her. Expense account item seven, 50 bucks. Deposit on a rented car to get around Los Angeles. The first three addresses furnished by Mrs. McLean were blanks. No one home or whoever had been there had moved a long time ago. It was beginning to get dark by the time I got to the fourth one, an address on Berendo Street in Hollywood. Hello? Hello. I'm looking for Pauline Henderson. What do you want? I want to talk to her for a minute. My name's Johnny Dollar. Well, I'm Pauline Henderson. Oh, may I come in? What's your business? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, I don't have any insurance, and I don't want any. Well, it's about a case. Uh, wait a minute. I'll put on a roll. Yeah, sure. Hope you aren't going to try to talk me into buying an annuity or something like that. No, no, nothing like that, Miss Henderson. Oh, all right. Johnny Dollar, huh? Yeah, that's right. Insurance investigated, you say? Yes. Uh, Come in. I thought maybe you could help me. 
Well, I'll try. I'm in something of a hurry. Only take a minute, Miss Henderson. I'd like to have you look at this. Hmm. Have you ever seen the woman in that picture before, Miss Henderson? It looks terribly familiar. Is the light all right? Yeah, I can see it. My Lord, yes, I know her. Who is she? Well, that was Doris McLean. You're positive. Yeah, she was married to Dave McLean. He's a doctor here in Los Angeles. She died a year or so ago, very suddenly. Yes, so I understand. How well did you know Mrs. McLean, Miss Henderson? Oh, we were friends. I mean, we worked together in a medical lab here before she married Dave. How long did you know her? Five or six years. What is all this? Just wanted to make sure this was Mrs. McLean. My pictures of her are all right. Yes. You know, I don't think you've been exactly telling me the truth. <laughs> Well, I just had your name on a list, Miss Henderson. I was told that you might be able to recognize a picture of Doris McLean if you saw one. Who told you that? I'd rather not say. Nice. So mysterious. Well, I don't mean to be. You look nice enough. Is that all you want to know? Yes. Uh, well, one more thing. When did you hear about Mrs. McLean's death? The day after it happened. I read about it in the paper. It was quite a shock. Doris was always so healthy. How, uh... How did Dr. McLean take it? What? How did her husband take her death? Looking at a picture and saying yes or no is one thing. I, I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. Let's say I wanted to make sure this was Doris McLean, and I wanted to make sure she died two years ago. If I'm any authority, you can be sure of it. How about the other part? Dave McLean? Yeah. Well, he got over it, I suppose. Don't you know? Well, I haven't seen him since the funeral. What's your name again? Johnny Dollar. Where do you live? Hartford, Connecticut. I'm at the Stapler Hotel here right now. Why? It just occurred to me... If you wanted someone to look at the picture and identify it, you'd go to Dave McLean and ask him. After all, he was married to her. You'd go to him. I would. Yeah. you go to him before anybody else. I think I'll call him and tell him about you. What do you think of that? That's all right with me, Miss Henderson. <laughs> Expense account item eight, three dollars and fifteen cents. Long distance phone call, Los Angeles to Hartford. Don Taylor. Hi, Johnny Dollar. Doris McLean still at the New Hartford Hotel? Yeah, why? Better call your private eye pal, Sam Benson, and tell him to keep an eye on her 24 hours a day. Huh? What are you talking about? The cat's getting out of the bag here. What? I could be wrong, Don. But if I'm right, somebody might want to kill her. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bit of information about a girl who had a date to die. That's right. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the desk, Mr. Dollar. Your number's ringing now. Good. Hello. 
Hello. I want to talk to Dr. McLean. Who's calling, please? I'm not a patient. I just want to talk to him. This is Dr. McLean. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I want to see you. What about? About life and death, Doctor. You must be drunk, whoever you are. Do I come to your office or do I meet you? You come to my office, I'll call the police. Get busy, then. I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 10, $4, gasoline for my rented car. I was in the filling station at the Stadler Hotel having it filled up when George Riley stepped out from the lobby entrance. Hey, Dollar. Huh, Riley. I came down here to see you. What about what do you think what about? All right, get in. I got to thinking after you left me today about my girl, Terry. And you know what happened? No. The police came to see me. They told me practically the same thing you did. They said they were getting up a court order to exhume the body. Her body, they don't know for sure yet. They'll have a job making the identification. My girl, Dollar. Yeah, you mentioned that. We both know it'll be her, don't we? Sure we do. They have to go through with all this legal stuff, huh? This has to be right. That has to be right before they can do anything. That's right. Yeah. Hey, where are you driving? Around the block. Dollar, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get my hands on the bird or put it down on the ground that way with somebody else's name. He was a doctor, wasn't he? That's what it looks like. Doctor who? You'll find out soon enough. Uh, let me ask you something. How would you feel if you got the kind of news I got today, huh? You'd feel pretty lousy. Well, I feel pretty lousy. I was going to marry Teresa Corbett a couple of years ago. I built her a nice house on a hill, and she disappeared. Just walked out. Yesterday, you come in, and you say she didn't walk out. She walked into a doctor's office one night and had a heart attack. You say this doctor gave her another name, his wife's name. He buried her and collected some insurance. And that's how she disappeared. Now, what about me? Huh? They came around to see me after she disappeared. They came around a lot asking questions. And now they think they found her. You and me know they found her, don't we? Yeah, I guess we do. I spent two years waiting to find her, and now she's dead. Why is she dead? I can't answer that yet. But this doctor, he can't answer it, can he? He took her and buried her under another name. Just took her like she was some sort of clay doll, something used and something no one wanted anymore. Took her and buried her, and that was supposed to be that. Now, what's his name? Riley, you better go home for a while. Yeah, sure. I'll phone you later. Dollar. She wasn't any clay doll. She wasn't something you give a phony name to and put in the ground. She was what I loved and wanted and needed. Did she walk into his office and die with her heart trouble, or did it happen another way? I don't know. You got ideas? I don't know, I don't know. Dollar, you gonna find out? Yes. If you don't find out, I will. I stayed right there and watched George Riley lurch across the street and hail a cab. Then I turned back and found the freeway, rode it out to Sunset and all the way to the Pacific Palisades in the office of David E. McLean, M.D. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, sit down. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man in his early 30s. I shook hands with him and sat down. Well, 
That was a pretty startling telephone call, Mr. Dollar. I confess I was intrigued by it. You said you'd call the police. Well, I didn't. I don't know why I said that, really. Well, tell me, what is on your mind? I'm an insurance investigator, Doctor. Or didn't a woman named Pauline Henderson call you and tell you I was in town? Pauline Henderson? Pauline Henderson. I don't believe that A I... friend of your wife's, Doctor. An old friend who worked with her once. The kind of a woman who would recognize a picture if she saw it. I don't believe I remember. Then she didn't call you and tell you I was in town. Well, that's all right, too. She said she might do that, though. Don't you want to know why, Doctor? Well, I suppose so. Yes. Why? Because I went over to see this Pauline Henderson the night I got in. She was one on a list of names of people who might know your wife on sight. Oh? She got kind of upset about my going there and asking her questions. I don't blame her. I'm a stranger to her. She finally said she'd tell you about it. I said, go ahead and tell you. And so? You just don't have any questions about anything, do you? <laughs> I'm completely baffled by this whole thing. What's your point? Don't you really know why I'm here, Dr. McLean? I haven't the least idea, but I can tell you we're wasting a lot of time. This is a nice office, Doctor. How long have you been here? A year or so. Why? Starting out, it costs quite a bit of money for equipment like this. Rental in a building like this, doesn't it? I don't think that's any concern of yours, Mr. Dollar. I do wish that you'd say what you have to say or do what you have to do and get it over with. Hmm? I don't know whether you're so anxious at that. Try me. I've been pretty patient with you. You come here and talk about a lot of vague things that I have no connection with at all. You make a strange phone call. You appear as though you're trying to intimidate me. You mention an old friend of my wife's. Pauline and... Henderson. Yes. What has she got to do with it? Nothing, really, except possibly as a witness. Oh? Witness to what? To an identification. She said she might call you. She was worried about an investigation I'm handling. What investigation is that? I understand you once treated a patient named Teresa Corbett. Teresa Corbett? Last treatment two years ago, February 1954. I had offices over in Hollywood in 1954. Are you quite sure that you have the right doctor? I am. Well, I don't remember a patient by that name. What did I treat her for? A heart condition. Oh? Well, we'll soon find out. Corbett, eh? Teresa Corbett. Uh, when was this now? February 1954. Mm -hmm. well, I don't have anyone by that name in my files, Mr. Dollar, but it must be important if you came all the way to Hartford to ask about it. It's pretty important. Well, she might have come in for some little thing. In, in that case, I wouldn't necessarily have a history on her. I understand she came to see you quite a few times. Could it have been another, Dr. McLean? It was you. Well, that's funny. Oh, now, wait a minute. Two years ago, my wife was my receptionist then. She wasn't too good at keeping records. Do you suppose I could talk to her and ask her? My wife is dead, Mr. Della. Oh. I'm sorry I can't be of more help. I thought every doctor kept a record of all his patients if they just came in with a nosebleed. Well... Now you see that you're wrong. Now that we've gone through all this, let's get down to business. What do you mean by that? I'll come right out and say it, Doctor. You should have kept a file on Teresa Corbett. You should have kept that one above all things. The fact that you don't have one is going to make me believe a lot of things I haven't really believed up until now. What things? What are you talking I'm about? I'm talking to you about your wife, who isn't dead at all. What? Four days ago, she came to me in Hartford, Connecticut. She said that Teresa Corbett died in your office one night and that you identified the body as your wife's. What and what's you... more, you collected $10,000 worth of life insurance on her. Here's a picture of the woman who gave me that statement. Is this your wife? Well? All right, I'll tell you. It is your wife, Doris McLean. And she's still very much alive. And the story she told me in Hartford is pretty much the truth. I've never seen the woman in that picture in my life. I ran into one person here in Los Angeles who recognized her right away. I've got a list of eight more people who'd probably recognize her. I can go to every one of them and get their statements to that effect, but I don't think I need to. I've got a pretty long statement from Doris McLean herself. It tells the whole story. Would you like to read it? No. Then maybe you'd like to make a statement yourself. I have nothing to say, Mr. Dollar. I didn't think you would, Doctor. <laughs> On the strength of the evidence already assembled, I preferred charges against Dr. David McLean. He was taken into custody and arraigned for defrauding an insurance company. He refused to talk at the arraignment and afterwards when he was held in the city jail. 
Expense account item 11, $2.20 telegram. I wired Hartford advising Don Taylor of the events in Los Angeles. The following morning, I received an answer from him to the effect that he was bringing Doris McLean to Los Angeles. That should have made the case complete. That and the fact that the coroner's office had exhumed the body and it had been identified as Teresa Corbin. Well. Hello, McLean. What now? Oh, I thought we could talk. We can't, so that's that. We have your wife's statement how the whole thing worked. The coroner's man identified the body of Teresa Corbin. So? Your wife will be here tomorrow sometime. Her testimony will cinch it. Will it? You know it will. I want a statement from you. <laughs> Look, we aren't in a courtroom now, McLean, but we will be. It'll be a tough case from top to bottom, but we'll get you, and we'll get you good. A statement from you right now might save you some trouble, save you two years in your sentence. Oh, you're here to give me a break. No, I'm here because my job says I'm supposed to be here. I wouldn't want to save you anything, brother. The longer they send you up, the better I'm going to like it. But I'm not going to push too hard for a statement from you. I'm just giving you the chance to have your say-so right now and suggest that you go into court with a guilty plea. It's up to you. You know something? You'll never get me into a courtroom. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, one morning newspaper, which carried a complete story of the McLean case as well as the information that Dr. McLean had denied all charges and was freed on bail. That, along with his remark about not appearing in court, worried me. An hour later, I was out in the Palisades looking for a San Vincent home address. It happened to be a two-story building, but I didn't get up to his apartment soon enough. Hold it! Stop! Riley! You don't have to worry about your doctor friend anymore. You fool, you crazy fool. The court would have taken care of him. No. I wanted to do it personally. Oh, Riley. For my girl, Johnny. <laughs> For my girl. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a brand new, a rather startling statement from Mrs. McLean, without lies. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Johnny Don Taylor. Are you here in L.A.? With Mrs. McLean. Why didn't you meet my plane? Dr. McLean's been shot. What? Teresa Corbett's boyfriend, a guy named Riley, pumped three slugs in him this afternoon. He was afraid McLean might get off. McLean's still alive? He's hanging on, but they don't give him much of a chance. I'm on my way to the hospital right now, L.A. General. Meet you there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Tri-State Insurance Underwriters International Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the McLean matter. Expense account item 13, $10, rental, for a tape recording machine, which I took with me to the hospital room of Dave McLean. Don Taylor met me in the hall. Hi. Hi. Where's Mrs. McLean? I turned her over to the police. Do you know about this? No. Who's this man, Riley? Oh, just a lonely guy who lost his girlfriend. Let's go. Wait a minute. There's something else, isn't there, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. I think there is, Don. I'm going to try to get it from McLean now. That's why I brought this thing. What'll happen to Riley? He's being held for assault with a deadly weapon intent to kill. If McLean dies, it'll be changed to murder. Mr. Dollar? Yes? You can go in now. This is Mr. Taylor. I'd like him to come in, too. It's all right. This way, please. The nurse led us down to the end of the hallway and into McLean's room. Transfusion equipment was rigged up on one side of him and intravenous on the other. He watched us walk in without a word until he saw me set up the recording equipment. What do you think that's for? You, McLean. That statement we were talking about. What statement? You know how bad off you are. It doesn't make any difference now. <laughs> Who's this man? My name's Taylor. Police. I'm with Tri-State Underwriters. Oh. <laughs> you must be a close friend of Doris. Isn't she it? came out here with him, McLean. <laughs> how is Doris these days? She's made her statement. <laughs> Squeeze play. How about you? No. I'm not going to say a thing. Oh, no, McLean. T- tell you what I'll do. We'll talk about it later. Huh? There may not be a later. I think there will be. <coughs> I'm going to bet on it that way. It's tough, Del. You struck out again. There's always your wife. She won't tell you anymore. She's... Got her own troubles. I think you'd better leave now, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. McLean's chances for recovery were one in ten. That isn't very good odds. But as he said, he was going to bet on himself. And he won. Three days later, he took a turn for the better. Within a week, he was walking around the hospital. The trial date was set for him to answer charges of defrauding an insurance company. Mrs. McLean was named co-defendant. All set. When do you take off, Don? About five minutes. Good night for flying. Yeah. Now, what's the matter, John? Oh, I don't know. This whole case, the people in it, I I just don't know. You ought to be satisfied. You've certainly done your job. McLean's are going to stand trial, and there's no doubt they'll be convicted. You testify in court, and that's about it. I know. Don. Yeah? There's more to it. Why? I know there is. There has to be. McLean's slick enough not to open his mouth. He hasn't admitted anything. His wife's done all the talking. Sure, that's true. But what she said was enough for us. Was it? Well, wasn't it? Not for me, Don. Johnny, what is it? (sighs) Riley, I suppose, and that poor girl, Teresa Corbett. A couple of little people walked into it. Riley's suffering worse than the McLean's. Then they'll suffer. He lost somebody he loved. She died naturally. He would have lost her sooner or later. McLean's had nothing to do with that. Didn't they? No. Well, I've been thinking about it. Just go in and testify in court and come home and try to forget about it, will you? Maybe you're right. Flight 913, Chicago, New York, and well, Boston now boarding. See you in a few days, Johnny. Okay. Bye. One thing, Don. Yeah? Suppose Go Teresa boarding. Corbett had been my girl. So long, kid. <laughs> John Taylor went back to Hartford and left me to wrap up the details and testify in court. The day before the trial, I went over to the county jail to interview Mrs. McLean just once more. Hello. Hello. The uniform isn't too attractive, but they say it's a very healthy life in here. I mean, the regular hours and all. I suppose I should try to get used to it. Yeah. How... How long will I have to go to prison? Well, that's hard to say exactly, Mrs. McLean. Um, My lawyer said not over three years if they convict us. Three years isn't too long. No. Sit down. Where's my husband? Where's Dave? He was transferred to the county jail today. Is he all right? Seems to be getting along fine. I haven't seen him, you know. You'll see him in court. Oh, I wish it were all over. So do I. But it isn't, is it? Practically. Not at all. Well, what do you mean? 
So far, we have enough evidence to prove conspiracy against you and your husband, and we'll prosecute to the limit on that. There'll be some other charges against him, the business with the body and so on. Let's not go into that now. But there's something else here I want to get straightened out. This is your statement. Yes. Let me read you this. A girl, whom we later found out to be Teresa Corbett, walked into the office on the night of February 1st, 1954, and complained of feeling ill. She had been drinking. My husband took her into the examining room where she died a few minutes later of a heart condition. Those are your own words on this sworn statement, Mrs. McLean. Yes. Let me go on. I had never seen or heard of Teresa Corbett until that night. I was with my husband when he placed a call to her residence in Jersey City. He spoke with a man there who managed an apartment house and so on. Mrs. McLean, that call was never made. I was in the room when Dave made it. The phone company has no record of it, no bill for it. I mention this to you because we are going to mention it at the trial tomorrow. You have my statement. Are you trying to make a liar out of me? The fact remains that call wasn't made. Were you in the examining room when Teresa Corbett died? No, I was in the front office. Isn't it a fact that she was a patient of your husband's before that night? No. I found out, I'll tell you. Teresa Corbett was one of your husband's patients. Why, she... She came here to live in Los Angeles because of a heart condition she had. He was the doctor she went to see. She just didn't walk in that night and drop dead. If that's true, I didn't know it. That night you said you were acting as a receptionist in your husband's office. When Teresa Corbett walked in, she must have given you her name when she asked to see the doctor. Well, she didn't. Frankly, I, I thought she was just a little drunk. She, she'd been drinking. I, I could smell it. And you just took her right on back to your husband without asking a name where she lived, anything about her? Yes. Now, look, Mrs. McLean, a lot of things you've told me and put into this statement are true. They've all been checked and rechecked. That's my job. But some of them just don't make sense. What are you trying to do? You wouldn't have known anything about it if I hadn't come to the insurance company. Maybe that's so. Maybe it would have just gotten by. But you did come to us. And whether you knew it or not, we have to know everything now. Everything, Mrs. McLean. Why do you think we've gone to all the trouble and expense of checking all this? I'll tell you. Because your story was too good to be real. It couldn't happen that way, even though the facts seem to say it could. Why, a girl alone and friendless in Los Angeles, dying of a heart attack in a doctor's office. A doctor who needs money and has a wife who's heavily insured. That's too much for me to take. Teresa Corbett was a patient of your husband. She had been for several months. She came in like anybody else. You or your husband took her personal history. And you noticed that she had only one living relative, a mother in Jersey City. Will you please tell me what you're talking about? I'm talking about premeditated, carefully planned murder. That's what I'm talking about. When Teresa Corbett's mother died suddenly, there was nobody left to worry about her. Nobody to ask questions about her anymore, right? That's what you thought, anyhow. But there was a man, George Riley. But he didn't know where to go or who to ask. He didn't know about him. All right. Teresa came in several times, and you and your husband got to know more about her. She was the patsy right from the beginning. Wasn't she? Wasn't she? Yes. Do you want to tell me about it? She had been in to see Dave several times. He knew all about her, where she was from, what family she had. That night, when she came in the office, she wasn't drunk. She hadn't even been drinking. She'd had a telegram. She, she'd just received word that her mother had died suddenly. She was terribly upset about it. She, she asked Dave for something to help her sleep. Go on. Well, he took her in the examination room, and he came out a few minutes later to get some drugs, and, and he said something about her case being a terminal. Terminal? You mean it was hopeless? Well, that's what he said. He said he didn't give her more than six months. It wasn't true, Mr. Dollar. She wasn't that sick. Then what? Well, Dave went back to the examination room. I, I just sat there and waited. I guess I knew what he had in mind. Had you talked about it? Well, we talked... Oh, no, not about what happened then. A few minutes later, he, he buzzed me to come back to the room. I went back there, and... Teresa was lying on the table. She was dead. <sighs> I knew it when I walked in there. Dave looked very strange. He said that she had had a sudden heart attack and died before he could do anything to help her. You know it wasn't so. Well, there was a hypodermic on the stand. He'd given her something. Well, I just didn't think he'd go that far. Are you sure you hadn't discussed this before? Oh, I swear he hadn't said a word to me before that night. But he had it all planned. That is what to do and everything when I came back to the room. 
He called Dr. Reed. Dave showed him Teresa and said it was me. Reed signed the death certificates? Yes. When did you leave town? The same night. Dave made me. He said he'd handle everything. I accused him of killing her, and, and he said that she just died there. Well, I guess I was kind of hysterical, but, but then he said, all right, I did kill her. She didn't have long anyhow. I killed her, and you helped me kill her. Now get out of here and stay out of here. If you ever open your mouth about it, you'll go to the gas chamber with me. Do you want a cigarette? Yes, please. Here you go. Thanks. I told you that story. I mean, about the phone call and all. To get back at him. I never thought that I'd tell you this part, too. Oh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad it's all over. <laughs> Expense account item 14, $85.40, hotel and board while in Los Angeles. Item 15, $205, plane fare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $798.60. Remarks, murder charges have been filed against the McLeans, and they stand trial next month. George Riley received three years and a suspended sentence for assault with a deadly weapon. I was wrong about practically everything in this case. All the lies came true, but so did the facts. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, cui bono. That's Latin for who benefits. And believe me, it isn't the killer in the case. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lucille Meredith, Betty Lou Gerson, John Stevenson, Bob Bruce, Victor Perrin, Tony Barrett, and Herb Ellis. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Don Hancock, Johnny. Surety Mutual. Hi, Don. What's on your mind? Qui bono. Qui who? It's Latin, kiddo. Qui bono. Who benefits? All right, I'll bite. Who does? A little doll named Luann Parker down in Green Pass, Virginia. A hundred thousand dollars worth, Johnny. Double indemnity. Wow. What did she do? Answer the question? She sure did. With a thirty-eight. Two bullseyes right in her foster papa's heart. Well, and if it's an open and shut case, you don't oh, need... Oh, it's that all right. She's the gal what done it. She admits it. But the coroner is about to call it an unavoidable accident. Seems little old Magnolia Blossom thought papa was a prowler. And what do you think? Just what I said. Qui bono. So? I think you'd better put yourself on the payroll. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Ex 
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Cui Bono matter. Item 1, $78.45, Transportation and Incidentals, Hartford to Green Pass, which was a village of some 12,000 people hidden among quiet wooded hills and located, as I discovered on arrival, some three miles from the railroad station. Nice weather we're having. Yeah, it's fine. You from New York? Well, near there, Hartford. Bet you ain't been having weather like this up there. No, no, it's been pretty cold. You say your name was Dollar? Yeah, Johnny Dollar. I'm Jake Deagley. You here on business? That's right. Well, I wouldn't count on finding much here. Green Pass is what you might call a one-horse town. One hotel, one bank, one taxi, that's me. One newspaper. And one county attorney. Yep, just one... Oh, and you've heard about our tragedy, about Dan Parker getting shot. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm an investigator for an insurance company. I see. Well, it was a terrible thing. It was... Oh, doggone it, doggone it. If old man Hawley don't fix up them fences, he's going to be short a cow one of these days. That's the third time this week they've been out the road. How do people around here feel about Dan Parker? Was he well-liked? Well, he'd been re-elected for five straight terms. No personal enemies? Not a one. There ain't a man in Green Pass that... Hey, what difference does it make whether he was well-liked? You know how he was killed, don't you? Yeah, I understand he was shot accidentally by his stepdaughter. That's right. And what difference does it make whether he had any enemies? Well, none, probably. But when an insurance company holds a policy as large as the one they carried on Dan Parker, they want to know the full circumstances surrounding the death. Well, there ain't no mystery about it, Mr. Dollar. That poor girl took him for a burglar and shot him, that's all. And it mighty near broke her up. Say, what about her, Jake? Is she well-liked? Well, let me put it this way. I'm 52 years old. I got a grandson, 17. And we're both in love with Lou Ann Parker. I see. And there's 5,000 other males in Green Pass that feel the same way. She get along all right with her stepfather? They worshipped each other. She was all Dan had since Mrs. Parker died nine years ago. They was thicker than thieves, them two. Rode horseback together, went fishing, took trips together. Well, then it's understandable that she'd be pretty broken up. It was terrible for her. She went clean out of her mind when she realized what she'd done. So tell me, was Dan Parker a wealthy man? No, fairly well to do for these parts, but no way as wealthy the way you'd think of it in New York, for instance. Then I imagine the Parker girl would think of $100,000 as being a pretty sizable fortune. Mr. Dollar, let me give you a little advice. Oh? You got a job to do, fine. But if I was you, I'd be mighty careful how I went about doing it. Why so? Well, people up here in the hills are kind of standoffish at best. And if you go around hitting what you seem to be hitting at, you're going to get yourself a mess of trouble. (laughs) I don't deal in hints, Jake. All I'm trying to do is dig up all the information possible. Let the company know exactly what happened. That sounds fair enough, Mr. Dollar. But you take my advice. Dig easy. Jake Digley's one-man taxi service dropped me off at the town's one-man hotel. I signed in, left my bags, and did a quick resume of the case which Don Hancock had given me in New York. I tried pumping the hotel proprietor. But when he found out who I was, he frosted up like a mint julep on a sultry day. But he did tell me I could find the sheriff across the square at the town's one pool room. It turned out to be a one-man place, too. And at the moment, Sheriff Jim Peterson was the one man. Huh? Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, just a second now. Uh, watch me get that uh, three-ball down there. Good shot. No, that was a setup. You couldn't miss one like that if you wanted to. Uh, got something on your mind, sir? Yes. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm here in connection with the Parker case. I'll see. Oh, God. Well, I don't think I'd call it a case exactly. It was an accident. Ain't no mystery about it, as far as I can see. I didn't mean to imply that there was, Sheriff. 
As it stands now, this is a routine investigation, nothing more. I just like to get the facts, find out exactly what happened, in order to furnish my company with the report they need to pay the claim. I'd uh, appreciate your cooperation if you've got the time. Oh, I got the time, all right, sir. Yeah, well, how much you know about it? Well, uh, not much. Dan Parker, as I understand it, was your county attorney here. His stepdaughter, Lou Ann Parker, who is the beneficiary under our policy, mistook him for a prowler, shot him, and killed him. Now, that's about it. Uh, well, the thing happened three nights ago. Dan been up to Richmond on business. He come back in on a midnight train. He walked down from the station. Walked three miles at that time of night? Well, it's a little over two to his place. It's outside of town a ways. Well, that's still quite a walk. Why didn't he call this uh, taxi driver, Jake Digley? Yeah, well, he probably did try to, but Jake wasn't expecting any business, so he took a night off. He was out at Happy Hollow. See, that's a kind of a roadhouse about five miles up the highway. Does Dan's daughter have a car? Yeah, she does. But I figure he didn't want to bother her at that time of night. See, he wasn't due in till the next afternoon. But it appears like he finished up his business and decided to come on back at night without letting Lou Ann know or anybody else. Now, let me see here. Was he in the habit of coming back unexpectedly from trips? Mm, no, I wouldn't say he would. Go on. Huh? Oh. Well, uh, Dan didn't take many trips. And when he did, he most always made arrangements with Jake or Lou Ann to meet him at the station. I see. So, anyway, he walked home that night, and he took a shortcut through the lane and come on in the back way across the terrace. And right there was his fatal act. Oh, what do you mean? He bumped against the lawn chair. And the sound woke up Lou Ann. And then she heard him fumbling with the lock of the back door and heard him come on in the house. She took a thirty-eight pistol from a drawer of her night table and went to the head of the stairs. When she heard him start up, she fired twice and killed him. Mm-hmm. Were there any lights on in the house? No, she was afraid to turn on any light. And I reckon Dan was trying to keep from waking her up. Two shots, two bullets in the heart, firing down a stairway in pitch darkness. <laughs> That's pretty good shooting, Sheriff. Oh. Well, she can out, out shoot me, Mr. Dollar. And I'm known as one of the best in these here parts. Uh, who taught her? Well, Dane taught her himself. He figured the girl ought to be able to protect herself. So tell me something, Sheriff. Did she have any reason to think it might be a prowler? Have you have you had any trouble of that kind around town? Oh, three weeks ago, it was a house broke into over on the south side. And twice since then, Dan called me in the night to come out and take a look around his place. Oh, why? Well, see, Lou Ann thought she had somebody trying to break in. And did you find anybody? Nope. Was Lou Ann alone in the house the night of the shooting? Well, Mary Jackson was there. Who, uh... Well, she'd been housekeeper for the Parkers for the last 15 years. Uh-huh. What's her version? Same as I told you. She heard the shots, saw the lights in the hall come on, and heard Lou Ann scream, Father! How did the girl and her father get along? Well, it couldn't have been any closer. She pretty broke up about it. Uh, you talked to her yet, Miss Dollar? No, not yet. No, I didn't think so. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I mean, if you had, you wouldn't be asking a lot of these questions. Or at least you wouldn't be asking them in the way that you are. What way, Sheriff? Well, like you figured the Parker girl was actually guilty of something. Well, she did pull the trigger, didn't she? And with sufficient reason. She was nervous. She'd heard prowlers around before, or at least thought she did, which adds up the same thing. She thought she heard somebody break in. She knew she couldn't count on Mary for any help. She had a gun, knew how to use it, so she got up her courage and done a natural and normal thing. She used it. And she'll regret her mistake the rest of her life. Yeah. And yeah, that's the way the picture seems to work out. At the moment, at least. You got any reason to doubt it? I get paid to doubt things, Sheriff. Until I satisfy myself that there's no reason to doubt them. And that's all I'm trying to do. It's all the insurance company expects me to do. I'm not out to pin anything on this girl or to get out of paying her claim, provided it's legitimate. It is. Well, then she's got nothing to worry about. If the thing happened as you just told me it did, then I have as much sympathy for her as you do. It'll be a pretty rough memory to live with. I just want to be sure, that's all. All right, Miss Dollar. You look around. You talk to people. Ask any questions you have a mind to, but you're going to come out right back where you started at. You're probably right. Dan and me have been friends for years. Good friends. 
Now, if I thought there was the slightest doubt about this, I would be the first one to kick up a fuss and go after the truth. Even if the evidence pointed toward Luann Parker? No matter where it pointed to. Well, now, look, I want to talk to the housekeeper and to Miss Parker herself, and I'd like to attend the coroner's inquest, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. But you're a little late. Huh? It was hailed this morning. What was the verdict? Death by misadventure, unavoidable accident, with no recommendation for prosecution. I see. Would it be possible for me to see a copy of the transcript? It would. I'll ring the coroner and tell him to expect you. But let me give you a little piece of advice, Mr. Dollar. All right. Folks in these here parts love that girl. So when you start walking around asking questions, walk easy. I went over the coroner's report and found nothing. Lou Ann had been called as a witness and appeared to have answered all questions in a frank and a straightforward manner. I checked her school record. She was regarded as an unusually bright girl and had stood at the head of a class all through high school. She'd been elected cheerleader in her junior year, won the lead in the class play, had been chosen queen of the senior prom. She was the town's darling. They worshipped her. And I could see that casting any aspersions on her would be like an attack on the crown jewels. I began to feel like a peeping Tom, like a louse, like I was wrong. And yet, qui bono? Who benefits? Two bullets in a man's heart and a hundred thousand dollar payoff. I had to be sure. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, beauty is as beauty does, and an idol is found to be made of flesh and blood. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Bates, Mr. Dollar. Tom... I'm acting county attorney since Dan Parker's death. Oh, yes. I was looking for you earlier. So Sheriff Peterson said. What was it you wanted to see me about? Didn't Peterson tell you why I'm in town? Yes, of course. You're an insurance investigator. You're here in connection with Parker's accident. Accident, did you say? I thought the sheriff straightened you out on that. He tried his best. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you any Mr. more. Mr. Bates, than... are you in your office at the moment? Yes, I am. Stay there, then. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the Home Office Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment the Qui Bono matter. Expense account continued. Item four, five cents for a copy of the Green Pass Weekly Sentinel. I glanced through it as I walked across the square from the hotel of the courthouse. The big news, of course, was the tragic death of longtime county attorney Dan Parker. 
and two columns of the editorial page were devoted to eulogy and sympathy for the dead man's adopted daughter, Luann, who had mistaken her father for a prowler and shot him to death with his own gun. But neither the editorial nor the front page mentioned the fact that Luann, because of her mistake, stood to collect $100,000 worth of insurance. Are you Tom Bates? That's right. My name is Dollar. I just talked to you on the phone. And I told you I had nothing to say. Uh, mind if I sit down? Now, look here. You look, Mr. Bates. I've been in the business of insurance investigation for quite a while. And I probably know the legal rules and responsibilities of your office about as well as you do. Get out, Dollar. Well, for two cents, that's exactly what I'd do. And if I did, you'd find yourself in a real tight spot. What are you talking about? The company would have a battery of high-powered legal eagles in town by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And they'd have a subpoena, a restraining order, an order to show cause so quick it'd make your eyes bug out. And that's where it would start to get embarrassing, Mr. Bates. When you tried to explain to the court why you were withholding evidence and refusing to cooperate. What do you mean, refusing to cooperate? I haven't refused a thing. It sounded that way to me. I don't care how it sounded. I... Look, I know what you're up to. Peterson told me why you're here. Oh, you're out to muddy this thing up. You're trying to pin something on Miss Parker so you can get out of paying the insurance claim. And subpoena or no subpoena, you'll get no help from my office on a crooked deal like that. Any reason for you to think something could be pinned on her, Mr. Bates? Of course there's no reason. You saw the transcript of the coroner's inquiry, didn't you? I did. Well, did you find one single hint of suspicion anywhere in it? No, no. Not much of anything else for that matter. Are you always as gentle with your witnesses as you were with Miss Parker? The girl was half out of her mind with grief, on the verge of a breakdown. We got the facts. What more do you want? Maybe we should have thrown her in jail, beat her up with a rubber hose, starved her till she thought of something to confess. Is that the way you'd have done it? Oh, relax, Mr. Bates. You're not in a courtroom. No, and by heaven, I'm not going to be. Not on this case. Because there's no reason. How long have you been in love with the Parker girl? Ever since I... What difference that make? It might help to account for your attitude about this. What is it you're thinking? That I'm helping her get away with something? Covering something up for her? Or that all of us are, maybe? Everybody at the inquest? <laughs> well, it wouldn't surprise me too much, the way this whole town gets up on its high horse the minute you ask a simple question about the girl. Well, what do you expect when you go around insinuating... Insinuating she... nothing, Mr. Bates. I haven't accused Miss Parker of a thing. I have no reason to. And regardless of what you think or Sheriff Peterson thinks, I didn't come here to frame her, to pin something on her. I want just one thing. The complete, detailed story of Dan Parker's death. And I'm going to get it, one way or another. Well, nobody's trying to prevent you. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Then how about some cooperation? What do you want to know? How long have you been Mr. Parker's assistant? Almost three years. And now you automatically become county attorney, is that it? Yes, until the next general election. Do you intend to run for the office at that time? Possibly. I don't see... How did you I... and Parker get along? Fine. Why? Well, did he approve of your interest in his daughter? Well, he certainly preferred me to... Well, anybody else in the run. Who else is in the running? Nobody, actually. Are you engaged to her? Not officially. She doesn't think she's quite ready to settle down. Uh -huh. But if she had been ready, you... You think Mr. Parker would have welcomed you as a son-in-law, huh? I think so. I didn't kill him, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Ever have any arguments with him? No. None of any importance. Who were his enemies, Mr. Bates? He didn't have any. A county attorney without a single enemy? That's a little remarkable, don't you think? That was the type of man he was. He'd usually let sleeping dogs lie. Easy going. Too much so, maybe. That was half the... Half the reason the two of you argued? Is that what you started to say? There were times when he should have gotten tough, or at least let me do it. Well, you'll have your chance now. And I'm going to take advantage of it. In one case, at least. Oh, what case is that? The Happy Hollow Roadhouse. That place should have been closed two years ago. But Mr. Parker wouldn't hear of it. And the sheriff wouldn't touch it without Parker's okay. Who runs it? A dirty little... His name's Sammy Drake. A cheap 30-cent crook. Why should the place be closed, Mr. Bates? Because it's a menace to the community. Drake's got everything going out there, wide open. He ought to be run out of town. And before the month's up, he will be. Was Drake a friend of Mr. Parker's? Hmm. Hardly. Is Miss Parker acquainted with him? 
She knows him, of course. In a town this small, everybody knows everybody else. Doesn't mean anything. I see. You see what? What are you driving at, anyway? The complete detailed story, that's all. Fine. But what bearing does this stuff have on the story? Oh, none, probably. The sheriff tells me Miss Parker is a dead shot with a pistol. Do you know if that's true? Yeah, absolutely. She can outshoot me any day of the week, along with most of the other men in the county. That's one of the tragic... One of the ironies of the thing. It was her own father who taught her to shoot. Was she given a paraffin test the night of the accident to determine whether she'd fired a gun? Of course not. In the first place, we're not set up for it. And in the second place, there was no doubt but what she had. The housekeeper heard the shots and ran out in the hall and saw her standing there with a gun in her hand. And she admits she fired him. What more do you want? I guess that ought to satisfy any reasonable person. Well, thanks a lot for your cooperation, Mr. Bates. You're welcome. And I'll frankly admit I don't have the slightest idea what line of thought it is you're trying to follow. It's the same one I've been following ever since I left Hartford. Do you know the Latin phrase, qui bono? Sure. Means who benefits. It was an old principle of Roman law. And it's still a good one. Who benefits here? Well, Luann Parker, of course, to the tune of $100,000. But maybe she's not the only one. There are different ways of benefiting, you know. It still comes back to the same thing. She's the one who mistook her father for Prowler that night. She's the one who pulled the trigger and fired the shots that killed him. Apparently so. But it's possible that somebody might have used her, Mr. Bates. Expense account item five, six dollars even. Flat rate payment to Jake Deagley for a couple of hours' use of his battered old taxi. I stopped at the telephone office and I talked with the supervisor. I talked with the editor of the local paper and with a waitress who'd gone to school with Luann Parker, with a boy in a service station who'd dated her in high school. And all of their remarks fit the same picture, a sweet, fresh, all-American girl with an adored father who'd showered her with gifts and attention. And now her own personal tragedy was the town's public one, and they all wept for her. Not a fact out of line. So finally I decided I'd filled in the background enough for the moment, and it was high time I met the little princess face to face. Yes, sir? Good afternoon. I'd like to see Miss Parker, please. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but she ain't here. Oh? She's been staying in with Dr. Praley and his wife. Seems like she just couldn't face this place after what happened here. Are you the housekeeper, Mary Jackson? That's right, sir. Well, I'd like to talk to you too, Mary, if you don't mind. What about, sir? Just a routine question or two. I'm with the insurance company that carries the policy on Mr. Parker's life. Well, I don't think I ought to go around talking Well, it's quite all right. Sheriff Peterson and Tom Bates are both cooperating with me, so you can be sure there's nothing wrong about it. Well, if them two say it's all right... They do. Then I reckon it is. Won't you come in, sir? In a few minutes' conversation, I learned that Mary Jackson had practically raised the Parker girl and worshipped both her and her father. She showed me the terrace where Dan Parker had bumped into the chair and wakened both his daughter and Mary, the back door where he'd entered the house that night, and then finally the main stairway where the shooting had taken place. When I heard the shots, all I could think was, oh, my poor baby, and I come running out in the hall. Hmm. Your room is the third door there, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, just then Miss Lou Ann turned on the lights, that switch right there beside you, and I saw her standing here at the top of the stairs with a gun in her hand. Then we both looked, saw it was Mr. Parker. We run down there. Miss Lou Ann tore off his tie and pulled his shirt open. But he'd already passed on. Yeah, it must have been a terrible thing for both of you. Yes, sir. It was. Mr. Parker seems to have been a very generous man, especially with his daughter. Oh, he always give her anything she wanted. Bought her another new car just last month. Yeah, I saw it in the driveway. Well, this is a very attractive house. Must be worth twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Mr. Parker bought it just two years ago. He thought with Miss Lou Ann growing up, she ought to have a better place to live. What's your salary here, Mary? Ninety-five a month, sir. And my keep, of course. I wonder how he did it. Sir? Well, Dan Parker made $5,000 a year as county attorney. 
There's less than 600 in his bank account, and the manager said it's never been much higher. And yet, this house, new cars, those clothes of Miss Parker's that you showed me, a $50,000 life insurance policy. How about that, Mary? I don't know nothing about it, sir. And still, with all this, they were always quarreling. How'd you find that out? Why, Mary? What did they quarrel about? Well, it... It's only been the last six months, and it wasn't her fault. It wasn't like her. It was that Sammy that put those ideas in her head. Sammy Drake, the fellow who owns the Happy Hollow? And she was a restless one with nothing to do, and he took advantage of it. Filled a head full of crazy notions. I know it was him. What crazy notions, Mary? Oh, going off to New York, getting on the stage, or dancing in some nightclub. It's the only thing Mr. Parker ever refused her. But he sure put his foot down on that. He said the only way she'd do it would be over... <laughs> over his dead body. <laughs> oh, sir. Thanks, Mary. You've been a lot of help. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the net tightens. A rat runs for cover. Then the whole thing blows wide open. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Tom Bates. Oh, how are you? Dr. Praley just called me, Mr. Dollar. He says you've been threatening him. Oh, I wouldn't call it a threat, Mr. Bates. I simply told him that if he won't let me question Miss Parker, then I'll have to get a court order to do it anyway. Well, as acting county attorney here, I think I could block that order, Mr. Dollar. Maybe, but I doubt if it would be a very smart move. Now, you look here. She's in no shape to answer questions. She's under doctor's care. It's been five days now since the shooting. She's still very upset, nervous. She might say things that could be misconstrued, that she didn't mean. Oh, what things? How would I know? I just thought you might. Since you've already questioned her once, right after she killed her father, wasn't she upset then? Did she say anything you misconstrued? I'm warning you, darling. And I'm warning you. I'm going to talk to that girl one way or another. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the qui bono matter. Qui bono, Latin for who benefits. Item eight, one dollar. Transportation out to Sammy Drake's Happy Hollow Roadhouse on the highway north of town. On the way there, I thought over what I'd learned so far, and I realized it wasn't much. 
On the face of it, the thing was simple enough. No mystery at all. Five nights ago, Dan Parker, the local county attorney, had returned from a business trip and entered his sleeping house. His adopted daughter, Luann, mistaking him for a prowler, had shot him to death in the darkness. There it was. An accident, pure and simple. The coroner said so, the sheriff agreed, and the whole town was determined to keep it that way. But I still couldn't buy it quite that easily. Not when there was a $100,000 life insurance policy payable to Lou Ann Parker, the girl who'd pulled the trigger. Maybe I'd find some answers at the roadhouse. <laughs> the Happy Hollow was like a thousand other places of its kind. A neon-lighted barn set 50 yards off the road. Inside, a jukebox, a raucous bar, and a scattering of tables around a splintery dance floor. Saturday night's a four-piece band. Probably a game or two going on in the back room, and whatever else the local sports might demand. It was early yet, and the joint hadn't started to jump. What's the word, Mac? Save your money and buy booze. Yeah, man. Out of town, huh? Depends on which town. Any town but this one, man. Here it's for the birds. Oh, I don't know. Looks to me like you got a good setup here. I'm eating. But it ain't easy, man. It's rough. Oh, it'll be rougher, Sammy, with a new county attorney. What's the pitch, Mitch? That's your name, isn't it? Sammy Drake? That's a crime, maybe? Oh, it might be. I don't know yet. You with the feds? No. Syndicate man? No, I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance? You mean protection? <laughs> Not the kind you're talking about, Sammy. I'm here in connection with Dan Parker's death. You mean you're legit? That's right. Well, tie me up and mail me off. I thought you were somebody putting a bite on me. I am. Yeah? Yeah. I got some questions, Sammy. And I want some answers. About that Parker rubber? Right. Well, you're out of luck, Chuck. I don't know nothing from nothing about nothing. See what I mean? I got reason to think different. How so? Somebody been passing the word? Maybe. Two get you five. It was that Bates character. Am I in? I couldn't say. <laughs> Sure it was. The new county attorney. He's got a big deal now. And he'd give his left eyeball to put the finger on me. Why so? Why has he got it in for you, Sammy? Because he thinks his doll has been... You mean the Parker girl? I forget. You want to do it the hard way, Sammy? No speaking English. I can get Tom Bates to wish you a warrant, you know. He'd love to have that chance. So you can either talk to me here and now, or you can talk to him and the sheriff in the basement of the courthouse. Rough and tough, huh? If that's what it takes, yes. Come on back to the office. All right. What'd you say your name was, Buzz? I didn't. It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, huh? Yeah, it rhymes with collar. I always like to be wise to who's putting the slug on me. Come on in. Thanks. How about a drink? No, uh, no, no, thanks. Well, I guess I'll have a short one for my health. You hungry? Like a steak? Later, maybe. They're the most. This is a crummy joint, strictly for the sticks. But the food's good. Well, here's a go. Yeah. Maybe you think I'm trying to stall. <laughs> I know you are, Sammy. No, no, not really. Not now, anyway. Because when I stop and think about it, I can't see where I got anything to worry about. You see what I mean? You haven't. Unless you had something to do with Dan Parker's death. Now, now, let's relax, Max. The, word, the way I get the word, nobody had anything to do with it except that doll. Could be. Could be nothing. Did she blast him or didn't she? Apparently she did. <laughs> Thought he was a burglar. <laughs> That's a rich one. And she's halfway right at that. Meaning? Look, Dollar, I'm on a level with you. If you got any idea that I wanted Dan Parker knocked off, you're way out there. You want to know why? I can probably, yes. I'll tell you why. He was my fix in this town. Three years I've had this place open, and I've never been touched. So why would I want to put myself out of business? Oh. How much was the payoff? Grand and a half a month. Maybe you figured you could make a better deal with somebody else. Yeah? Who? Not with that stuffed shirt Bates. He's just been itching to get at me. But Parker kept the lid on him. How about the sheriff? Who knows? I'm going to give him a pitch, of course. It's my only chance now to stay in business. But I don't know if he'll play. See what I mean? <laughs> All right, Sammy. Let's go back to the question I asked you outside there. Why does Bates have it in for you? Because he's got the drooling goose for that Parker kid. And he didn't like it much when she kept hanging around me. How'd you feel about it? 
You want the truth? I didn't like it much either. Why not? She was too wired up and spoiled. Used to get in her own way. Oh, this town's treated her like a queen or something. She figured she could do as she pleased. Well, that don't go in a joint like this. What do you mean? Well, these lads come in here, get a few shots under their belt. Dame like that starts to mean trouble. I didn't want her hanging around. I had a good thing going here, and I wasn't about to get it lost up. But it was no use. I couldn't keep her out. What did her father think about it? He didn't like the idea, but he couldn't do much about it. She got her own way with him, the same as with everybody else. Except when she wanted to go to New York. Well, nobody can win them all. I understand you put that idea in her head, Sammy. Then you better take a different understand. Yeah? Yeah. She was bugged up on that idea before I ever met her. That's why she started coming in here. She wanted me to put her hep on how it was in the big, wild city. She wanted to know how to get in. What was the names of all the spots, including the rough ones? How the rackets worked. <laughs> how would I know how the rackets worked? <laughs> I didn't say a word, Sammy. You know some. In some ways, that kid's as smart as a mink. But underneath, she's a regular hick, just like the rest of them around here. She thinks that stuff is glamour, the big time, hot stuff. And she was busting her braces to get at it. Even this place, this, this crummy clip joint. The herd was wicked and exciting. Oh, man, how square can you get? I suppose you're trying to talk her out of going to New York. Do I look crazy or something? I was all for it anywhere. As long as it got her off my neck. Oh, a beautiful girl like Luann Parker on your neck and you were trying to shake her off? Oh, Sammy, I'm losing you. Oh, luck, Dollar, when it comes to dames, I've got as fast an eye as the next guy. But with that chick, oh, man, I unpack my toothbrush and I stay home. Why? Why? She's got this whole town fooled, everybody but me. A sweet little thing in ruffled rompers, bucking for a halo. Well, I got news for you, brother. She ain't. And you're the only one who really knows her. Is that what you're claiming, Sammy? Sure. It's a big laugh. But that kid's smart. And inside, she's colder than a fish. I'm a fairly tough baby, Dollar, but I'll tell you something straight. I'm scared of that girl. Expense account out of nine, $6.90. Steak and incidentals at the Happy Hollow Roadhouse. And Sammy Drake was right. The steak was good. Item 10, $1.75. Transportation out to the Green Pass Railroad Depot, three miles east of town. I tried to see that night station agent earlier in the day, but he was sleeping then. But it was nearly midnight now, and I figured he'd be on duty. He was. Good evening, sir. I... Uh... Hold it, son. Got a message come in here. Yes, sir. Old number eight's going to be right on time. I'm glad to hear it. I <laughs> want to... Hold uh... it, son. Got to answer it, you know. Mighty important business getting these here trains through. Yes, I imagine it is. I... Yeah, hold it! Yes, sir. Right on time. Be here in about two minutes now. Well, son, what's on your mind? I wondered if you were on duty the night Dan Parker got back in from Richmond. The night he was killed. Oh, yes, indeedy, I... Uh, you must be that fella Sheriff Jim Peterson was telling me about. That fella from the insurance company. Yes, that's right. Well, then I guess it's all right to talk to you. At least, why, that's what Jim said. Nice of him. It's a mighty terrible thing. A downright tragedy for that poor motherless girl. Making a mistake like that, shooting her own father. Yeah, a rough deal. Did you notice Mr. Parker when he got off the train that night? Why, of course I did. I always notice anybody getting off. It's part of my job, son. Yeah, well, I, uh... It was right about this same time of night. He come in on number eight at the same one it's doing now. Did you talk with him? Of course I talked with him. I know Dan Parker since we both pups. <laughs> he, said, he said, hi, Willie. I said, fine. And he said, how's the family? And I said, fine. And he said, well, you know, we, we talked. We had to talk more, too, but there, there's some fellow with him. Oh, well, I didn't I... know that. I reckon it was just some passenger he struck up the time of day with. Dan was all... There. You hear that, son? She's uh, coming across the Briar Creek Bridge right now. Right on time. Well, uh, look, what happened to this stranger? Did he and Dan Parker leave the station together? Oh, no. No, they just talked while the engine was taking on water. The fella got back on the train before it pulled out. He's just going through. Did you hear what they were talking about? No, can't say that it did, son. Most likely didn't amount to nothing, though. No, I suppose not. By golly, I did hear one thing. Oh, what? Just when the train was starting up, the fellow leaned out and yelled, Thanks a lot, I'll be seeing you. Dan just grinned, waved back, and went on down the platform to the telephone booth. You uh, don't know what he meant by that remark. Oh, nothing, more than likely. Just one of them things you say, you know. But that's life for you, because he won't be seeing him after all. See, she's coming around the bend there, son. i got to get the meal sack out. 
You got any more questions? You're going to have to ask him on a run. The mail's got to get through. Oh, I wouldn't think of stopping it. Hey, look, uh, you said Dan Parker made a call from that telephone booth over there. You know who he talked to? Nobody, son. What do you mean? Well, he come back and said he had a busy signal. I guess he'd have to walk home. And that's what he done. That was his mistake. That was one of them anyway. Mm, you got any more questions? I reckon they'll have to wait. I haven't got any more. How's that, son? I said thanks a lot. Uh, what were? Well, there you got me. I don't know. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a tense interview, a subtle attack by a shrewd and dangerous opponent, and complete surrender. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Bates, Mr. Dollar. Oh, good morning, Mr. Bates. There's nothing like starting the day with a good fight. That is not my intention at all. Good. I was beginning to think you went around in a permanent state of belligerency. Only when I see a so-called insurance investigator out to frame an innocent girl. Anybody I know? Look, Dollar... Will you be available at two this afternoon to interview Miss Parker? I've been available for two days. She's the one who hasn't been. She was in no condition to see anyone. However, Dr. Praley is releasing her in an hour, and she's going on home. All right. Tell her I'll see her at two. It won't be necessary to tell her. You'll go out there with me, and you'll talk to her in my presence. Like that, huh? You can take it or leave it. Oh, I'll take it, Mr. Bates. And you know something? I think I'll still be able to tag her. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cui Bono matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for a late and leisurely breakfast in the hotel coffee shop. Leisurely because I had nothing to do but kill time. I'd covered every possible lead I could think of, and the result, zero. The simple facts of the case were that Dan Parker, the local county attorney, had returned unexpectedly from a business trip late at night entered his darkened home and had been shot to death as a prowler by his daughter, Luann. Coroner's verdict, accidental death. Amount of insurance, $100,000. Beneficiary, Luann Parker. Why don't you give up, Dollar? Admit you're wrong. Wrong about what? 
About thinking you've got a chance of beating Miss Parker out of her insurance money? Oh, so that's what I'm trying to do, huh? That's what your company pays you for, isn't it? To find some angle, some technicality that they can use to break the claim? No, they pay me for the unpleasantness of having to put up with bullheaded acting county attorneys, Mr. Bates. Sure. You'd a lot rather question that girl without me being around. Bates, I'd rather do anything without you being around. Well, the feeling is mutual. I just can't quite figure you. Usually, I get complete cooperation from the local prosecutor's office. But you've tried to block every move I've made here. I'm protecting Miss Parker's rights, that's all. Her rights haven't been challenged. I'm not out to get her. If I'm convinced that she's innocent and that her claim is legitimate, I'll report it that way. All the company wants is the facts. Look, I'm not hired as a claim breaker. And of course you know that. You've dealt with insurance cases before. So I wonder what the real reason is for your attitude. Suppose you tell me. Well, you're in love with her, of course, and that itself could be the explanation. Or maybe it's only part of it. Meaning what? Maybe you know more about it than you've admitted. Maybe you know she's guilty and are trying to cover up for her. I know she's innocent, sir. Or, uh, it's possible your motives are a little more selfish. Maybe she's covering up for you. What do you mean by that? <laughs> it's that old Latin phrase, qui bono, who benefits. Who gains through Parker's death? His daughter does, of course, she gets the insurance. But so do you, Bates. In what way? Well, you got Parker's job, didn't you? And along with it, the chance to run Sammy Drake out of town without Parker stopping you. And in the long run, if Luann marries you, you'll get a good part of the insurance. Are you accusing me of murder? No, just speculating. But it's an interesting possibility. Don't you think so? Any particular subjects I should avoid, Mr. Bates? Ask anything you want. As long as I'm here to advise her. Oh, hello, Tom. Luann, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. How do you do, Miss Parker? Mr. Dollar, won't you come in? Thank you. I guess we better go in the study. Mary's clean in the living room. In here. Just sit down anywhere. How do you feel, Luann? Oh, I'm all right now. For a few days after it happened, I I couldn't feel anything but horror, self loathing. I wanted to kill myself. But the last two days, I've... Well, I've done a lot of thinking about what Daddy'd say if he was still here. He was a wonderful man, Mr. Dollar. Yes, the whole town seems to agree on that. I'd give my life gladly to change what happened. But it can't be changed. Daddy used to say, Luann, remorse is only self-pity in disguise. The future is a question mark. All you have is the present, so live it. He believed in those ideas, Mr. Dollar. And I'm going to try to live my life by those beliefs. Because I loved him very much. <clears throat> uh, Miss Parker, I have a few things I'd like to ask you in order to complete my report. Do you feel up to answering some questions? Yes, of course. Whatever you wish. I insisted, Luann, that I be present during this interview. Why, Tom? His job is to save money for the insurance company. He'll try to trip you up. Lead you into saying things you don't mean. Things that could be misinterpreted. Tom, that's ridiculous. I've nothing to hide. Of course, hon. But he'll make it seem as if you do. I'd say you're making it seem that way, and for no more reason than just a silly kind of suspicion. Luann. Mr. Dollar, would you rather talk to me alone? I think it would work out a little better that way. Tom, it's been nice to see you. I'm not leaving. Yes, you are leaving. Right now. Honey, you do I said now. All right, Dollar. I guess you will. Phone me later, Tom. Sure, Luann. He's nice. He means well, but sometimes he can be an awful idiot. Oh, his actions are fairly normal. For a man in love. Or one who thinks he's in love. It usually adds up to the same thing. Cigarette, Miss Parker? Oh, thank you. Well, what is it you'd like to know, Mr. Dollar? First, let me tell you a few things. I've talked to quite a number of people during the last two days. They all worship you. In fact, only one person in the whole town said anything against you. And he's a man whose word on anything would be a little questionable. Sammy Drake, I suppose. Yes. Well, I don't know what he said, but I imagine he thought he was being honest. You see, Sammy's never understood me at all, and I guess I have given him a kind of a bad time. How do you mean? By pretending to take him seriously. 
Most people seem to think of me as a child, Mr. Dollar, but actually in my attitudes and awareness, I'm quite a lot older than my age. Of course. And I saw right through Sammy the first time I met him. He's just a silly little would-be tough, but he likes to think of himself as a smooth, wicked mobster type. So I pretended to go along with it, even put on an act of my own in return. And what do you think happened? You had another Tom Bates situation on your hands. Sure. Sammy took me seriously. Well, I didn't want any part of that, so of course I ran for cover. And he has never forgiven me. Well, I guess you can stand having one detractor, Miss Parker. You've got a big team on your side. I like people. I guess that's why they usually like me. I've had a wonderful life, Mr. Dollar. And I'm very grateful. Especially to Daddy. He did everything possible to make me happy. I think if I'd asked for the moon, he'd have tried to get it for me. There was one thing, though, that I understand you disagreed on. You mean my wanting to go to New York? That's right. I guess the only arguments we ever had was over that. If I'd only known how short a time he was going to be with me, I... Well, didn't matter that much. I felt I was right that the only reason he was against the idea is because he still thought of me as a child. Parents usually do that. I know. And it just didn't matter enough to... to hurt him when he had so little time. But you can't go back. I wonder if you would try to go back for just a moment, Miss Parker, and tell me in your own words just what did happen that night. Well, Daddy had gone to Richmond on business. None of us expected him back that night. All right, go on. Well, Mary, she's our housekeeper. She went to bed early. I read till about 11, then I went to bed. And shortly after midnight, something woke me, a noise down on the terrace. I looked down from my window, and I saw sort of a dark shape slip across the terrace toward the back of the house. I was scared stiff. I'd heard prowlers outside twice before during the past month. Yes, the sheriff told me you didn't. Yes, well, I realized it was up to me because Mary would have just gone to pieces if I'd waked her. All I could think of was getting to the phone down at the bottom of the stairs. When I started out of my room, I could hear somebody fooling with the lock on the back door. And that's when I thought of the gun. Where was it? In the drawer of the night table beside my bed. Daddy'd put it there himself after the night I heard the prowler, but I'd almost forgotten it. All right. Then what did you do? Well, I took the gun. I went back out into the upstairs hall. All I had in mind even then was to go downstairs and get that phone. But when I reached the stairway, I heard someone moving down below, and I realized that whoever it was had already got in the house, that they were starting up the stairs. And I could see just a vague blur, dark shape against the shadows. I was petrified. I remember thinking, he's probably got a gun. And without even stopping to consider, I fired twice down the stairs. Yes, Miss Parker? I heard him fall. I knew I'd hit him. Mary screamed and came running out of her room. I found the switch and I turned on the lights... And then I saw what I'd done with Daddy. (laughs) I'm sorry, Miss Parker. And I'm sorry it's necessary for you to go back over this. I'll be all right. There was one thing that wasn't brought up at the inquest. Your father apparently tried to make a phone call from the railroad station that night, and he told the agent all he was getting was a busy signal. Could he have been trying to call here? I don't know. I didn't know about it. Would he be likely to call you, coming in unexpectedly that way? Oh, he'd be more likely to call Jake Digley. Jake runs a taxi service here. Yes, I met him. Well, he might have tried that. But Jake was out at Sammy's place that night. Well, the reason I say that is because Daddy would have known that our phone is usually off the hook at night. Was it off that night? Well, I don't remember. Maybe Mary knows. One or the other of us was always taking it off because we had to go clear downstairs to answer it. Yes, Miss Luann. Oh, Mary, the night Daddy was killed, do you remember whether the phone was off the hook or not? Yes, Miss Luann, it was. I remember when I picked it up to phone the doctor. Well, I ain't sure if you left it off that night or I did, but it was off all right. Thank you, Mary. Yes, ma'am. Well, Mr. Dollar, what other questions do you have? None, as a matter of fact. I did have several more, but... You've already answered them indirectly. Thanks for cooperating. You're quite a girl, Miss Parker. Oh, yes, I'm quite a girl. A girl who killed her own father. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. I meant exactly what I said to her. 
One way or another, she was quite a girl. Either she was one of the sweetest, bravest, and most honest kids I'd ever met, or she was one of the smartest, coolest little murderesses who ever walked the face of the earth. And I was very much afraid that I'd never be quite sure which. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, one slip of fate, then the avalanche. And a wind-up that'll raise the hair on the back of your neck. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Peterson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hiya, Sheriff. I uh, understand you talked with Miss Parker this afternoon. That's right, I did. Well, what do you think now? I think I'm going back to Hartford the first thing in the morning. So you finally decided the girl is innocent. I don't know, Sheriff. And I probably never will know. I'm just finishing up my report now. I'll send you a copy of it. I'll be mighty interested in seeing it. On the basis of my investigation, I'm sure the company will pay her claim without question whenever she's ready to file. I'm beat, hands down, and there's no use denying it. Well, you can't win every time, Mr. Dollar. It's not that, Sheriff. But this is the first time I've ever had to end a report with a question mark. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the home office, Shorty Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Qui Bono Matter. Expense account, final page. Item 14, 50 cents. Notary fee on a 20-page report. A report that covered everything and told nothing. But it was the best I could do. I had no more leads, no new ideas. The bare facts of the case still stood. Dan Parker had returned unexpectedly from a trip, entered his darkened home late at night, and had been shot to death as a prowler by his daughter, Luann. A lot of insurance... $100,000. Beneficiary, Luann. I checked through a half a dozen theories and been forced to throw out every one of them. And the whole case finally came down to just one simple question. When Luann pulled that trigger and fired down the dark stairway, did she or did she not know that she was shooting at her father? I couldn't answer it. And I didn't believe anyone else would ever be able to. Except, of course, Luann herself. Item 15, one dollar even. Transportation out to the Happy Hollow Roadhouse, where the steaks were good, the drinks were good, and a beaten-down guy could kill anything. Well, wrap me up and mail me south. Here's that dollar man again. How's it going, Sammy? Business gets any worse, I'll open an artery. 
You here for kicks tonight, or are you going to put the arm on me again? Let joy reign unsuppressed. That's the word, man. That's the word. Come on over. I'll let you buy me a drink. You're riding on a swindle sheet. Oh, better yet, I'll let you buy me one. You own the joint. Okay, okay. Set us up, Joe. Make mine a usual fusel. What do you have, sir? Scotch on the rocks. You ever get through to that Parker chick? Yeah, I talked to her this afternoon. Well, what do you think, man? Was I right or was I right? About what? Is she a cool fool or not? I don't know, Sammy. She's a tough one to figure. She's just a tough one, period. Well, here's to the housekeeper's daughter. Yep. Whew. Ah, this stuff is murder. I don't know why the customers stand for it. So what comes next, Tex? I'm going back to Hartford in the morning. And little Cookie gets her payoff. A hundred G's. Man, it's really going for broke. If she is on the level, it's not enough to pay for the way she'll probably feel for the rest of her life. Feel? That one? <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I know that little fluff. She's got a heart about as big and warm as the olive in a martini. You could be right. <laughs> I know I'm right. She's took you, man. She's took you good. Bang, bang, and the little lady wins a prize. Maybe so. A big, fat hundred G's. And bad old papa in the cold, cold ground. Man, she was really shooting for new shoes that night. Well, if she was, she's got them, Sammy. There's nothing more I can do about it. So that's life. <laughs> what is it? You win a little, lose a little. And taxes take the rest. Why, Parker's got it made, man. Safe and cozy in his little box. No more worries. Oh, sure. But we can't all be lucky. Sometimes it... Well, well. Hmm? Brace yourself, Sammy. It looks like you're rated. What? Oh, it's the sheriff. Right on time. On time? Relax, Max. He's just come to tell the tale and do the deal. Protection? Well, sure. Same setup I had with Parker. <laughs> and the sheriff says he'll keep Bully Boy Bates in line. How about that, huh? Well, life goes on, I guess. Well, I wasn't expecting to run into you out here, Miss Dollar. I don't imagine. Finish your report? Yep. Right down to the last comma, Sheriff. And the last question mark. Oh, no, I don't reckon there's any question mark. You got to the truth, all right. Just wasn't what you'd expected, that's all. Never so. You got a minute, Sammy? Sure thing, pal. Let's go back to the office. Stick around, Dollar. The joint will be jumping. Fine. I can hardly wait. Let's have, let's have another one here, bartender. Coming up. <laughs> Sir, would you do me the honor of having a little drink with me? Well, thanks. I'm having one with you. I've already got it. Well, so you have. So you have. <laughs> well, another little one never hurts, though. <laughs> Later, maybe. Thanks, anyway. Any time, friend. <laughs> what line you in? The insurance record. Insure? Well, well, that's all right, I guess. I... Uh... Oh, thank you. Thank you, bartender. Thank you very much. I'm in ladies ready to wear myself. Must be fascinating. A wholesale. I work out of Baltimore. Cover three whole states. Oh, I've got a great little line of merchandise. <laughs> I uh, really don't need any. Oh, the heck with business. Let's live a little, shall we? <laughs> a Mr. What? Dollar. Oh. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes. Well, well, he's looking at you, Dollar. Yeah. Ah, you know, I always believe in living while I can. Because you never know. Now, that's a very profound thought. No, sir, you just never do. Because it can happen to anybody. Just like it did to a fellow I met last week. Man right here in this town, too. A fellow named Parker. Parker? That's right. He was a fine chap. I met him on the train coming out from Richmond. And I was on my way to Roanoke. Oh, we were laughing and we were joking and everything. And that very night he got killed. And I read about it in the paper. So you just don't never know. Hey, look, tell me something. Are you the man who got off the train with him, talked with him on the platform while the train was standing in the station? That's right. That's right. He wanted me to meet his daughter. And that's all he talked about. It was his daughter. Oh, he was crazy about that kid. Well, uh, did he expect her to be there at the station? Yes, but she wasn't. I, I guess he got the wires crossed. He tried to phone her, but he, he didn't have any luck. So I get back on the train. He walks off down the road. And a half hour later, he's dead. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you just never know. On the train, on the way down, what did he say about his daughter? Oh, you know, the way a guy talks about his kid, he, he worshipped her. Yes, he did, that's all. He, he was telling how they were always kidding each other, and they were... Oh, say, here, here, take a look at this tie I'm wearing. Yeah, sure, it's a nice tie. Sure, it's a nice tie. That's what anybody would think, just to look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice... Come on, come on. 
I want to show you something about this tie. Well, uh, can't you show me without going? No, to... you got to go outside. So come on, come on. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Parker gave me this tie. He was wearing one on the train, and I liked it, so he gave me one. He said he had three of them. His daughter gave them to him the week before. He got them from some novelty house. <laughs> so come on, come on. Well, look, uh, what is it you want to show me about it? Oh, come on, come on. we got to go down there at the corner of the building. Oh, boy, this will knock you out. No, I'm telling you, oh, it's just real crazy. Yeah, it must be. Parker never would have given it to me except he had three of them. He figured he could never wear them all, so... Well, uh, well, come on, let's see the trick. All right, all right. Look, it's just a nice necktie, isn't it? That's all. Yeah, that's all. Nothing out of the ordinary. Now, come on around the corner here, out of the light. Oh, boy, this is going to fracture you. <laughs> now, now, Look. Well, I'll be... Good Lord. How about that, eh? Is it crazy? That daughter of Parker's really must be something, huh? Yeah, she is. Can you imagine a kid thinking up an idea like that? Can you? <laughs> Giving her dad a necktie that, that glows in the dark. Good evening, Miss Parker. Why, well, Mr. Dollar, what are you doing out here this time of night? Mind if I come in? Please do. Thanks. Oh, I brought your gun back. The sheriff was finished with it. I never want to see it again. I know how you feel. I'll put it uh, here on the table. You'd better not leave it there, though. It's loaded. I wish Sheriff Peterson had kept it. Oh, it may come in handy sometime. Again. Mr. Dollar. I was planning to leave town in the morning, Miss Parker. I'd already made out my report and given you a clean bill of health. I didn't even realize I was under suspicion. What was I supposed to have done, Mr. Dollar? Deliberately murdered your father in order to collect $100,000 in life insurance. You've got a pretty horrible mind, haven't you? Maybe, but I wouldn't trade it for yours. Haven't you noticed my necktie, Miss Parker? I thought you'd tag it the first thing. Why should I? Because it belonged to your father. A special gift from his loving daughter. He gave it to a man he met on the train, and I bought it for $10 this evening. So now you know what happened to the third tie. That's probably been bothering you. Because I imagine you carefully destroyed the other two. I think you're a little more than slightly insane. Oh, it was a neat plan. Simple and sweet. You got the idea a month ago when the sheriff caught a prowler over on the south side of town. And suddenly you began to hear prowlers at night. You bought your father a set of ties that glow in the dark. And then you waited. And when he came back from that trip, you got your chance. You've got quite an imagination. Oh, it was a great setup. A dark house and him wearing a tie that glowed in the dark. Just like this one, Miss Parker. It was a perfect target. You couldn't miss. It's almost a shame that you were beaten by one unforeseen accident. Your father talked to a stranger and gave him a tie. And that tie is going to hang you. No, I don't think so, Mr. Dollar. Turn on those lights. You were right, you know. It is a perfect target. You were very clever, Mr. Dollar. But not quite clever enough. Or you'd have known. Sheriff. Yeah, I've been standing out there on the terrace. You... No, no, Luann. You better give me the gun. No use pointing it, honey. It's loaded with blanks. You all right, Miss Dollar? Yeah, I'm all right, Sheriff. A little sick, that's all. That anybody so beautiful could be so right. You faked it. You tricked up the whole thing just to frame me, you filth. You dirty evil... Yeah, that's enough, Luann. No. That's enough. <laughs> Nobody tricked you except yourself. That's yeah, hard for me to believe. <laughs> Dan and me used to take you fishing with us when you wasn't no, no higher than that. You was the prettiest little thing I think I'd ever oh, seen. Oh, shut up, you old fool. Now I got to take you someplace again. Wish I hadn't ever lived to see this day. And I'm mighty glad that Dan ain't here to see it. Come on, honey. We better get started. Expense account item 16, $148.30. Hotel and incidentals in Green Pass and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $382.65. End of account, end of report. Remarks. When you gave me this assignment, Don, you asked a question, a phrase in Latin. Qui bono? Who benefits? So here's your answer. Nobody. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a study in entomology. You know, bugs. And this one's the deadly variety. A firebug. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were D.J. Thompson, Mary Jane Croft, Forrest Lewis, Byron Kane, Russell Thorson, Sam Edwards, Dal McKennon, and Howard McNear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Andrew Court. Johnny, how'd you like to go to San Francisco? What's up, Andy? Well, we've written a lot of insurance for an independent contractor out there, a man named Arnold Bennett. Uh Uh-huh. Last night, his latest project went up in smoke. An office building he completed a month ago. How much is the policy worth? There were five companies involved. They took it on at $100,000 apiece and turned it over to us. Half a million bucks? Yep. I talked with the arson inspector for National Fire Underwriters in San Francisco. He said the fire looked phony. I'll pack my things. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett matter. Expense account item one, $15, flowers for my girl. I wasn't able to keep our date. Instead, I met Four State Fire Investigator Andrew Cord at his office and we made immediate arrangements to fly to California. Item two, $25.06, one raincoat. Item three, $144.15. Air transportation, Hartford, New York, San Francisco. Our route, Andrew Cord, fill me in on the details concerning Arnold Bennett. Oh, Johnny, as things stand now, Bennett hasn't filed claim yet, although I imagine that'll be coming through pretty fast if I know him. I met him once when he was in New York getting money to finance one of his big subdivisions. Yeah, it seems I've heard of him. Oh, he's made time and life a couple of times each. Oh, yeah. When I met him, I said to myself, Andy, look well on this man. He may be the last of his kind. Oh, how's that? Well, Arnold Bennett must be past 60 now. He's been everything in his lifetime. Sailor, soldier, lawyer, financier, bootlegger, gun runner, Lord knows what all. Talked fast, worked hard, and... What he couldn't get one way, he got another. All in all, he's done pretty well. It shows all over him. I didn't like him, Johnny. Well, go on, go on. Well, maybe I was just jealous of his aggressiveness, or maybe it's that I've just heard stories of how he ran roughshod over big and little. It... Well, uh, about this new building of Bennett's that burned down. Yeah, yeah. Well, the man in San Francisco is pretty sure the fire was of incendiary origin. Well, can he prove it? Well, that'll be up to him and you and me. Four state and national fire underwriters are going to handle the investigation. 
Federal, Great Atlantic, and Tri-State underwriters aren't going to send any men at all. They figure it's best not to clutter things up. Yeah, but proving the fire was incendiary may not be too easy, Andy. Well, we'll see when we get there. There's a standoff motive in the whole thing. We can start with that. What's that? Bennett's in financial trouble, big trouble, taxes, so on. The fire was an out. I see. Well, who's the arson man in San Francisco? Billy Underwood. Oh, good, good. Bill Underwood's one of the best arson men in the business. Well, it's going to take all of us to get Bennett, Johnny. Now, we'll split it three ways. We'll let Underwood handle the fire evidence. You can play front for us with Bennett, and I'll comb around in the financial situation. Yeah, well, we sure got our work cut out for us. But listen, Andy, you sound sort of scared of this guy, Bennett. I am, kind of. Why? Nobody's ever beat him. Expense account item four, seven dollars and a half. Incidentals upon arrival in San Francisco. Andy Cord and I checked in at the Fairmont, then went downstairs, rented a car, and drove out to the scene of the fire. Bill Underwood was already there, had been there all day. We all shook hands, and then Underwood broke it down. Bill was a bit of a pedant, had things pretty well organized for us. Now, it's this way... A watchman on duty saw a man loitering in the vicinity of the building when he came to work at 6 o'clock. Uh-huh. Three other witnesses remember the same man. A druggist, a filling station attendant on his way home from work, and a newsboy. Got a description? Mm-hmm. Right in. Male, Caucasian, 25 to 30, medium build, approximately 170. Dark hair, dark complexion. That's it. Have you talked to the police yet? Haven't had a chance, Billy. You know, they got eight men on this? Well, with that much of a description, it might make it easier. I sure hope so. So far, the description hasn't fitted anyone in the files yet. The newsboy swears that he saw this man sneak around the side of the building about six o'clock. The fire broke out about 6.30. Anybody see him leave? Mm Mm-hmm. The newsboy says he saw him catch a bus on the corner right before the fire broke out. Might help us. But the bus driver on the line wasn't any help. He's pretty busy that time of night. Have you had a chance to go over this yet? Well, we started. I'm working with a fire inspector on it. And as soon as we come across anything, I'll let you know. We can't overlook any possibility on this, Billy. Any. Yeah. I know about Bennett. He's been out here asking me who I am, what I'm doing. He doesn't like it. Oh, he doesn't? Yeah. He learned to swear somewhere along the line. Oh, uh, has he filed claim yet? No, we haven't heard. It's a professional firing job, I'm sure of it. You're sure? Well, I, I haven't got what I need in the way of concrete evidence yet, but I'll find it. Somewhere in these ashes. The place burnt too well and too fast to be anything but professional. It was drafted. The fire got hot and going before anybody even spotted it. Well, this is a little out of my league, Billy. Tell me more, will you? Well, you, you see, an amateur will mess it up generally. It'll smoke a lot and somebody will spot it. Now, a bug. You know, a nut. He'll do as good a job as a professional. Oh. But, but he'll stick around and, and, and watch it burn. Stand a good chance of getting caught. He might even call up somebody and tell him how happy he is. But uh, this bird, the one the newsboy saw getting out of here fast, well, he sounds like he knows his business. Mm-hmm. It's business with him. Then it'll be my job to connect him and Bennett somehow. And that's the tough part. Yeah. All I got to do is play around in the ashes. Oh, um, Johnny. Yeah? Watch a step with Bennett. Sure. He doesn't care about anybody. I spent another two hours with Cord and Underwood covering the ruins of the ten-story office building that had been gutted the day before. Underwood acquainted Cord and me with all of the necessary details, all he could. That night, we sat with the three witnesses at a special show-up in the Hall of Justice. Sixty-odd suspects were paraded out. There were no identifications. The next morning, while Cord and Underwood carried on with their part of the investigation, I went out to Arnold Bennett's real estate office near the Presidio. Remember that old saw, how a woman in love is always beautiful? When I walked in, I had no idea Elizabeth Bennett was in love and no idea that she was beautiful. Her sallow face without makeup, framed in a wisp of stringy blonde hair, wasn't flattered by the shapeless black dress and low-heeled shoes she was wearing. Certainly not the going idea of beauty. 
Now, did her conversation reveal anything to indicate love? Yes, sir. May I help you? Mr. Bennett, please. My name's Dollar. Dollar? D-O-L-L-A-R? He's not expecting me. Your business, Mr. Dollar. Four State Fire Insurance Corporation. It's about the fire that destroyed the office building. Oh, yes. Just a moment, please. Well, what is it, Liz? Uh, Mr. Dollar is here, Uncle Arnold. I don't want to see anybody today. I told you that, you idiot. Mr. Dollar's from Four State. It's about the fire. Oh. Well, send him in. And go out to lunch. Yes, sir. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. Straight ahead. He always like that? He's nice today. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Hmm? That's your name, isn't it? Yes. I'm Elizabeth Bennett. Go straight ahead. Dollar? That's right. Mr. Bennett? Come in. Come in. I'm not going to ask you to sit down. I know why you're here. You have insurance investigator written all over your face. Well, in that case, we can get right down to the business at hand. What caused the fire? We don't know yet. It was deliberate. What? Somebody started that fire, that's what. And I know who. Get him and you'll save yourself some work. Tony Midas. Tony Midas? Who's that? The crackpot that set fire to my building. He's out of prison now and he swore he'd get me. Well, now look, maybe you'd better tell me just who he is and why he'd want to get you. Tony Midas worked for me once. I caught him stealing money and I prosecuted him. He was sent to prison for five years. And he's the one you want. You seem pretty certain of that. Of course I'm certain of it. I know what enemies I have, what friends. Don't tell me I'm going to have to pussyfoot around with someone like you and get any place in this whole affair. Well, there are some witnesses who got a look at the man who started the fire, or at least it's a good bet he's the one we're after. So tell me, what does this Tony Midas look like? I don't remember. I hardly ever remember faces. But you remembered his threat. You bet your last nickel I remember his threat. And he's the kind of screwy punk to carry it out. Last week, there was a small story in the newspaper that he was being released from prison. Well, then we'll certainly look him up and have a talk with him. That's very good of you, I'm sure. Oh, now, look, this can be a very difficult thing all the way around, or we can all cooperate, Mr. Bennett. I'll cooperate. I know why you're in town. I know who you came with. I met that glorified fire inspector yesterday. Underwood, you people don't fool me, and I'm not trying to fool you. Get Tony Midas, and you've got your man. Did you tell the police about Midas? No, I was waiting for some bird like you to walk in here with your high-handed attitude. Now I've told you, now you can get out and get busy looking for him. Arnold Bennett lived up to all of his advance notices, and then some. I'm paid very well to stand and take what I have to to find out what I want to find out. Sometimes it's not enough money. A review of the trial and proceedings in which Tony Midas had been convicted of grand theft, his threats at the time of his trial, substantiated Bennett's information. That didn't surprise me. What did surprise me was that one of the three witnesses identified Tony Midas' mug picture as the man seen in the vicinity of the building the night of the fire. An APB went out for Midas. The San Francisco police began to turn the town upside down looking for him. By five o'clock in the afternoon, the other two witnesses had made up their minds that he was the man they had seen after all. The case against Midas became stronger. It was imperative that he be located. Johnny Dollar. This is Elizabeth Bennett, Mr. Dollar. Remember in my uncle's office? I remember. Mr. Dollar, you're looking for Tony Midas, aren't you? You don't have to answer. I know you are. I think I can help you find him, but he's not the one you're looking for. Look, if you turn him in... Let me finish, and then we'll talk about him. I live at 1038 Mirada Drive. I'll be home in an hour. We can talk there. Two minutes later, when I was putting on my coat, I received another phone call. This one from Bennett's lawyer. He advised me that Arnold Bennett had filed claim and would bring suit if his claim was not honored in the prescribed length of time. I thanked him for the information and went downstairs and began to look around for a cab. A police car careened into the driveway and a familiar hat on top of a familiar head leaned out. Hey, Johnny! Go! Yeah, Andy Cord. That's all right, kiddo. Hop in. Okay. It's Inspector Truck and Inspector Kane. Hi. What's up? Somebody shot Arnold Bennett ten minutes ago. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the trail gets so rough, a couple of people just fall off dead. 
Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Billy Underwood, Johnny. They're trying to get you all over town. The hotel said to call you at this Skyline number. I'm out at Arnold Bennett's house. He's been shot. What? That's right. Well, who shot him? Don't know yet. I think I'm a transfusion here before they take him to the hospital. Uh Uh-huh. Look, Johnny, I got something to show you. Now what? Some ashes we just analyzed. The Bennett building was fired by a pro. He used celluloid and a wick made out of paraffin. I can prove it. I hope Bennett lives to hear that. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson fraud. Arnold Bennett was removed to the hospital where he was given a 50-50 chance of recovering from a 38 slug that had entered his chest. There was no weapon lying about and no witnesses in the remote, hilly section of San Francisco where he lived to give any information concerning the attempted murder. The police were more anxious than ever to find Tony Midas, the man Bennett had put the finger on earlier. Their reasoning was that if he could burn down a building worth half a million to get back at Arnold Bennett, he also might shoot him. I told Andy Cord about Underwood's findings when the police car got us to the scene of the shooting. Celluloid and paraffin wick, did you say? Yeah, that's what Bill Underwood said on the phone. Well, then it would point away from Tony Midas. He was an embezzler, not an arsonist. Maybe. Who's that policeman over there? Oh, that's uh, Inspector Dickens. Well, I talked to him about it for a while. He said Midas lived in San Quentin with a man named Hanley, a professional burner. Yeah? Well, Hanley could have taught Midas a few tricks of the trade. Yeah, that's possible, Tony. Uh, I don't know. At least Underwood is sure that he can prove it had an incendiary origin. Well, that's the first hurdle. Maybe we can't tie it to Bennett at that, Johnny, if Midas did it. Now, let's wait and see what Bennett has to say when he can talk. I think I'll get on over to the hospital. Okay. Oh, uh, here's something that came up. Yeah? Now, you said Bennett attributed everything to this Tony Midas. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, there might have been something personal in it, too. Midas is married to Bennett's niece, Elizabeth. His what? Yeah, she married him a month before he was convicted. Well, that might explain some things. Yeah, she called me tonight and said she had some information for me about Midas. I was on my way to see her when this happened. Oh, you you haven't talked to her yet, huh? No, no, let's see. It is 1038 Murata Drive. What if that's far from here? <laughs> no, Johnny, not far at all. This happens to be 1038, right here. Oh, well, we better tell the police about her, Andy. Andy Cord went on over to the hospital to await results on Arnold Bennett. I spoke to the inspector in charge and told him the information about Elizabeth Bennett. The police added the name to the APB already out for Tony Midas. 
And that's the way the case stood at midnight. By morning, the hospital reported that Arnold Bennett would recover from the gunshot wound. Elizabeth Bennett had not been located, nor had her husband, Tony Whitus. I always fix my own dinner. Poached egg and half and half ulcers. Her name's Dollar? Yeah, yeah that's right. Insurance investigator. You want something, do you? Yeah. Coffee, maybe? No, thanks, Mr. Engel. Mind if I finish? Go right ahead. Well, what led you to me? The notation's about the trial, Mr. Engel. You were the defense attorney for Tony Midas. We're anxious to talk to him. I defended him, yes. I don't think I'm going to be much help, Dollar. I haven't seen him since he got out. I've no idea where he is. We'll find him, Mr. Engel. And what's it all about? Well, Tony Midas has been identified as the man who started a fire in the Bennett building. Or at least who was seen in the vicinity of the building when it went up. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you, Mr. Engel? Tony Midas was a nice kid who got in a little trouble. Everything was against him at the trial. Bennett poured it on. He didn't have to, but he did. He could have let him off. You were Midas's lawyer. Did you try to talk Bennett into letting Midas off? No, I didn't. Nobody talks Arnold Bennett into anything. Oh? Uh-huh. Tony never would admit taking the funds. He said he was framed, but he didn't have a prayer with all the evidence against him. Yeah, I read a transcript of the trial. Then you know Tony Midas pleaded not guilty in the face of everything, and he went up. I wanted him to make a guilty plea and rest on the mercy of the court. It was his first offense. Well, he's out now, and it looks like he's trying to get even with Bennett for prosecuting him. All for a lousy ten grand. Yeah. Did he ever get in touch with you? I told you, no. No phone call? No. Do you have any idea where he'd be in town, Mr. Engel? No, I don't. Okay. Then I guess I'll leave you to your eggs. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? If, uh, if you find Tony Midas, I'd like to know about it. Why, Mr. Engel? Oh, just curious. I'd like to see him. I'd like to see what five years in prison does to a kid like that. Mr. Engel, Arnold Bennett was shot in his home last night. No. That's all you have to say? What else is there to say? Well, you could have asked, is he alive or is he dead, for one thing. Suppose I don't care. <sighs> okay, he's still alive. They think he'll pull through. Who do you think shot him, Mr. Engel? I don't know. They're looking for Tony Midas for that, too. Oh? Did you know Bennett's niece? Elizabeth, yes, I met her. Well, they're looking for her, too. She's married to Tony Midas. Yes, yes, I knew. I knew about that. So now, Mr. Engel. Oh, what is this going to be, an inquisition? That egg and that half and half doesn't interest you, no matter how much you look at it. Well, you ought to leave me alone and go find your firebug. Come on, let's have the story. I don't know any story to tell you. Was it spite that sent Tony Midas to prison because of him and Elizabeth Bennett? No, no, they proved him a thief. I'll throw one more thing at you, Engel. Bennett wasn't always too good about paying his taxes. Now, look here, Our accounting don't... man has him pegged. Pegged him for exactly what he is, an opportunist, a dodger... A man out to get what he can for as little as he can, no matter what. Yeah, we cover everything in a case like this. You'll never get Arnold Bennett. He's too good for you, Dollar. Too good for your insurance company, your fire investigators, everybody. No man stronger ever lived. We've already got evidence that proves the building was fired. I'm here to get all the story, and I think you're the man who can tell it. Why me? Because you work for him. I never worked for him, never. <sighs> all right, we'll let that go for now. But you can tell me this. Was Tony Midas the kind of man who'd start that fire? You can tell me if he really was an embezzler. You can tell me if he tried to kill Arnold Bennett. I can't tell you anything for a fact, Dollar. All I have is my own personal opinion. Well, that's what I want. I want that. I'd like your opinion. Now, there's something about Bennett's niece being married to Midas, isn't there? A wife can't testify against her husband. Everyone else in Bennett's office testified against Midas. She didn't. I see. Now the opinion. Oh, come on, Engel, come on. You're right, Dollar, I have got ideas. All of them make me sick inside. Tony might have stood there and told me he was innocent. He said it a million times if he said it once. He said he thought Bennett was framing him. To cover up from for income tax shortages? It's just surmise, but it fits. Midas was a green kid hired into the company by Bennett. He might have been hired to be framed on a phony embezzling charge that would give Bennett a good excuse on his taxes for a while. I've... I've been fooled a lot of times. Did Tony Midas fool you? I don't know. I wish I could have gotten him off. I tried, Dollar. Believe me, I tried to get him off. 
Now, you come here to me and say he's out of prison now and getting even. He's burnt down a building and tried to murder Arnold Bennett. Tony was a nice boy, Dollar. But now his whole life's gone, and for what? I hope you don't find him or her. I hope they go far away and stay away and don't have to talk to anybody ever. They deserve that. I hope nobody ever finds him. But we did find Tony Midas. He was right under our noses all the time. When I got back to the hotel, there was a message for me to get down to the county hospital. Cord was waiting for me there. They took us downstairs, and then we were both standing in a room looking at Tony Midas. Before they took him across the hall to the morgue. It's a funny thing, Johnny. There's been an alarm out on this guy for 36 hours. Everybody's been looking everywhere for him, and he turns up right here. Only he's dead. Yeah. What killed him? TB. He had it awful bad up San Quentin. It's in the sick ward his last two years. When his time was up last week, he made them release him. But he wound up here and died in this hospital. It's rough. He's just a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Up until that time, there had been some kind of a case against Tony Midas. But obviously, since he had been dead almost two days, it was impossible to connect him with the attempt on Arnold Bennett's life and the firing of the building. So we were right back where we started from, trying to make a case against Arnold Bennett, who still lay in his hospital room and refused to talk to anybody who came near him. All right, Johnny, now what? Uh, Bennett's going to be hard. We'll have to work around him. His niece is the best opening I can think of. I don't worry, she... Police haven't located it yet. Huh? Not a trace. Andy, she had some information for me when she called last night. I still want to get Hi, it. If I... Oh, oh Hi. hello, Bill. We got a break. George Foley's in town. Who's that? Best celluloid and wick man in the country. If you happen to want a building burnt down. One of the policemen at the hospital spotted him in the lobby trying to see Arnold Bennett. Not entire, Johnny. Where is he now? They followed him to an address on Barengo Street. They aren't going to move in until we decide something. <laughs> Twelve minutes later, Andy Cord, Bill Underwood, and I were standing in front of a decrepit-looking boarding house on Barango Street talking to the three policemen from the San Francisco Police Department. Dollar? Underwood? Hi. Hey, uh, what's the story, officer? Well, the way we see it, Foley's still trying to get part of his money for burning the building. He took a chance coming to the hospital tonight to see Bennett. No kidding. He'll probably make another try. You boys have more at stake here than anybody. If you want to talk to him, try to make a deal with him to turn on Bennett. Now's the time. Now, what do you say, Johnny? Oh, wait a minute. We aren't sure of anything about him. Well, he fills the bill, Johnny. Paraffin and Wick jobs are few and far between. With nothing more than that, I'd stake my rep on Foley being our boy. For what it's worth, all three witnesses now pick his picture instead of Midas. Oh, well, a good defense attorney get that thrown right out. What do you want to do? Oh, um, well, let's shake him up a bit, okay? Go ahead. We'll be covering the back and front. Come on. Okay, Bill, Andy? Okay. Yeah. All right, tough boy. Get on your feet. Let's get out of here. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, we have an arsonist right in the palm of our hands. With very surprising results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar.
This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Andrew Court, Johnny. How's it going, Andy? Well, the police have been talking to that arsonist, George Foley, all night long. He won't admit a thing. Won't talk about anything. They're wondering now how long they can hold him. He's the man who fired that building, Andy. Well, we've got to have something more for the district attorney, Johnny. We haven't tied Foley to Bennett at all. If we can definitely charge him with firing that building, then we'll have a lever to go after Bennett. I got an idea. What? Meet you in an hour. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson matter. Expense account item six, one dollar, two drinks. Andrew Cord and myself in Cookie's Place, a half a block from San Francisco's Hall of Justice. Andy's a good insurance man, thorough. Well, it's pretty certain they'll have to release Foley unless he admits something, or we can find more evidence against him. How about Bennett? Still no word. Johnny, you can see what we're up against. Yeah. yeah. Want one? No, no thanks, Johnny. Let's go on. Listen, we had this case tied into Tony Midas until he turned up dead. A vengeance motive against Bennett for sending him to prison five years ago. Yeah? All right. Now we know it wasn't Midas, and we're sure it's this George Foley. At least according to Bill Underwood, and Bill certainly knows the arson racket. Yeah, no man better. All right, then. Who shot Bennett? Oh, I don't know, Johnny, but that's not our worry at the think, moment. Think, Andy, think. It might have been Foley. It couldn't have been Midas. But there is someone else. You mean Bennett's niece? Sure, sure, his niece. She had a reason because of what Bennett did to Midas, who was her husband. And she's got a reason to help us. Nobody can find her. Nobody knows where she is. They'll find her. And I want to make a deal. What? Sure. If I find her, I'll ask her what information she can give us about Bennett and Foley. Possibly she has something. She said she did once. Now, look, if she shot her uncle, she'll have to stand for assault and attempt to kill. Can we give her legal help in her case? Johnny, I don't know. I want to know if I can promise her that if I see her. Can I? Well, you can... Tell her that we'll do what we can, the very best that we can. Okay, good. Want another drink? No, thanks, John. All right, I'll try and get in touch with Elizabeth Bennett. How? The police haven't gotten anywhere. Oh, I've been here two days, and I got friends all over this town. Expense account item seven, one dollar and five cents, cab fare. From the Hall of Justice to the apartment house of Marty Engel. Lawyer, philosopher, and egg poacher. Again? Yeah. You better close that door and lock it, Mr. Engel. It's awful late for this. Are you drunk? Nope. Locked? Now what? You asked me if I ever found Tony Midas to tell you about it. Hmm? We found him, Mr. Engel. He's dead. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And he didn't do any of the things we thought he might have done. I'm here to find out what you might have done. How did he die? Tuberculosis. He's had it for two years. Didn't know. 
No, I didn't know. I didn't know about it. I don't know how to figure you, Engel. I haven't been able to ever since I met you. It doesn't make any difference what I think of you, but it does make a difference how you answer one question. A lot of difference to you. What is it? Did you help Arnold Bennett frame Tony Midas and send him up to San Quentin? You say Tony is dead. Now, what difference... Did you help Bennett frame him? No, I told you I defended Tony Midas in court. I tried my best to get him off. That's the truth. You sure of that? I'm an honest man, if not a successful one. I told you the truth. All right, then, if that's the truth, you're not in any trouble and you can unlock that door. But if it's not the truth, you might get yourself killed. Why do you say that? Because somebody took a shot at Arnold Bennett last night. But he was lucky. It didn't kill him, but it came pretty near. You know who that somebody was? Elizabeth? That's a good guess. She hasn't got anything to lose now. She lost her husband. She might be out getting even for him if he was framed. And she thinks you helped frame him. I tell you, I didn't frame him. I defended him. I I think Bennett stacked everything against him. I told you that once. I think Midas was an innocent man, but there was nothing I could do. Wait a minute. What? Shh. What are you expecting? No one. Ask who it is. Go ahead, ask who it is. Who, who is it? Elizabeth Bennett, Mr. Engel. Tell her just a minute. Just a minute, Elizabeth. Okay, over there. Go on, get down fast. Right, go. No, you don't! Engel, call the police. Hold it. Hold it, Elizabeth. Hold it up. Are you hurt? You? Are you hurt? No, I'm all right. Did I kill him? Did I kill him? Oh, Elizabeth, you didn't kill him. He ought to be dead. You don't know what you're talking about. He didn't have anything to do with framing Tony. He just told me. And he was lying. He should be dead. He and my uncle. None of this will bring Tony back to you. Come on now, come on, let's get back. How many tramps have you met in your life, Mr. Dollar? A few. Come on, come on. When you met my uncle Arnold, you met a real one. He stole money from himself and made it look like Tony did it. And that one in there helped him. Why didn't you let me kill him? You're wrong about Engel. He didn't help your uncle. He tried to help Tony, honestly. Then I'm glad I didn't kill him. How's my uncle? He's getting better. Will he go to prison? We have to prove he hired somebody to fire the office building. He hired George Foley. I know that. Would you swear to it? Yes. Can you? Yes. He blamed it on Tony. When I went over to see Tony last month in the prison hospital, he was dying. Oh, I knew it. He had that, that look in his eyes. Helpless. And he knew what my uncle had done to him, and he couldn't do anything about it. But you figured you could. You shot your uncle when you found out Tony was dead. And you came here to kill Engel. I I thought he helped Uncle Arnold send Tony to prison. I thought he helped kill Tony. They did kill him, you know, when they sent him to prison. They killed him as surely as if they'd shot him down. Five years I waited for Tony to get out of that awful place. I waited to hold him in my arms and... Tell him it was all over. Five years I waited to help him forget his hate, my hate. I'm loving him so much every day that. <laughs> now he's dead. <laughs> what can you or I or anybody do about what they've done to Tony? Look at me, Mr. Dollar. I'm. I'm not what you'd call beautiful, I'm not even pretty. Nobody ever looked at me twice until Tony. He looked at me and he loved me. And now he's dead. And I'm dead inside. I'm dead inside. Now be glad when I'm dead outside. <laughs> Shooting in this neighborhood. Wait a minute, officer. Uh, what's that? No one's hurt. Come on, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Bennett made a statement down at the Hall of Justice admitting she fired a shot at Arnold Bennett, hoping to kill him. She also admitted the assault on the lawyer, Marty Engel. 
Charges were immediately filed, and she was held in the woman's section of the city jail. In a separate statement, she told how she had seen Arnold Bennett meet George Foley in a downtown bar. Foley still maintained that he had nothing to do with the fire in the Bennett building and denied any connection with Arnold Bennett. I gave Elizabeth Bennett's statement to Andy Cord, and he took it to the assistant district attorney. I was still in the Hall of Justice when Marty Engel came in. Dollar? Oh, hello, Mr. Engel. How is Elizabeth? They're holding her. I'm not going to press any charges. Well, that's pretty decent of you, Mr. Engel. She's a pretty unhappy girl. I'd like to help her. Her uncle will probably press charges against her. I'd like to defend her. What? She needs a lawyer. I didn't do very well for her husband. Maybe I can do better for her. I hope so. Funny world, isn't it? Not tonight, it isn't. No, I guess not. Yeah. Well, I'll see you, Mr. Dollar. All right. Johnny? Oh, Andy, hi. Well, kid, you ought to pat yourself on the back. They're going to go ahead against George Foley for the arson job. Enough for them now, huh? Uh, that's a pretty good case against him, whether he opens up and talks or not. A statement from him would still be better. Uh, always. But he's been around, Johnny. He hasn't given anybody the time of day yet. Yeah. Oh, about uh, Elizabeth Bennett. I can arrange counsel for her. She's already got a lawyer, Randy. Okay, then we'll pay his fee. He doesn't want any fee. Uh, what's the matter, kid? <sighs> Boy, maybe all this has been a little too much. Hey, what time is it? Uh, 10.15. There's a plane out at midnight. If you don't need me anymore, I think I'll be getting back to Hartford. Sure, Johnny. Sure, I'll look after things here. Expense account item seven, $49.65. Hotel and meals in San Francisco. Item eight, same as item three, transportation back to Hartford. I caught the midnight plane. It was in Hartford at two o'clock the next afternoon. I went directly to my apartment and went to bed. I was awakened the following morning about seven o'clock. What the... Johnny Dollar. San Francisco calling Mr. Dollar. Okay. Is this Mr. Dollar? Yes, yes. Mr. Andrew Cord is calling. One moment, please. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Hi. Can you come back to San Francisco right away? Should I? Well, I just got home. And we need you again. Jake Eggleston is going to defend Foley in court. Eggleston? He's already got him out on a writ. What? This case is worth half a million dollars to us, Johnny. If anything happens that Foley gets off, we won't have a chance to get Bennett. You sound scared. I am. Somehow, Bennett's holding the best cards again. We got a good case against Foley. Once that's settled, we can get Bennett. I want to make sure. <sighs> okay, okay, I'll get the first plane. Thanks, Johnny. Even as I hung up the phone, I was thinking of Marty Engel's words. You'll never get Arnold Bennett. He's too good for you, Dollar. Too good for your insurance company, your fire investigators, everybody. No stronger man ever lived, he said. And somebody had to prove Engel was wrong. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fight against a strong man and one of the cleverest lawyers in the country. Join us in court. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Andrew Cord, Johnny. Did you have a nice trip back here to Frisco? I slept most of the way. How's it going? Uh, good and bad, Johnny. Good that we've got George Foley on trial for setting fire to the building. Bad that we haven't connected him to Bennett yet. And Bennett's the guy we want. No, once you get a conviction on Foley, you can go after Bennett. A lot of expert testimony's been thrown around here, and the jury's been sleeping through most of it. Besides that, Foley's got one of the best defense men in the business, Jake Eggleston. Yeah, I've heard of him. He's pretty slick. He's going to make us lose this case, Johnny. Not if I can help it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett matter. Expense account item 9, $124. Air transportation, Hartford, back to San Francisco again. And the Bennett case, which I thought was finished with. I was at the Hall of Justice by 9.30. I met Andrew Court outside of the Superior Court. This may be the last day of the trial, Johnny. Anything new since I talked to you on the phone, Andy? Well, I may be worrying for nothing since Finley's handled it all pretty well for the state. He's one of the assistant DAs, but Foley's still holding on to a not guilty plea. Well, isn't that just coaching? Oh, well, maybe. But you remember Foley didn't make any statement when we took him, and the police got nothing out of him at all. Foley had something like 28 arrests besides two convictions. He knew the ropes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's okay, yeah? Sure. Just in time. Yeah, it seems to be the, the clerk now. Yeah. Court is now in session. His Honor Judge William J. Bainbridge presiding. Everybody stand. <laughs> be seated. John Dollar. Hey. Well, I didn't think they'd call you first. No. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Be seated. As you know, I'm Charles Finley with the district attorney's office. State your name, please. Johnny Dollar. State your occupation, please. I'm an insurance investigator. How long have you been engaged in your profession as an insurance investigator? Mm, ten years or more. Now tell us, please, prior to that, what kind of work did you do? I was in the United States Marine Corps for four years. Before that, I was Detective Sergeant Second Grade with the New York Police Department. Do you have any papers or letters in your possession that verify your professional status, Mr. Dollar? Yes, I do. I have letters of reliability from 13 insurance companies and adjustment bureaus I've been associated with, and my record as police officer. Thank you. Will the court clerk please hand these papers to counsel for the defense so he may examine them? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, tell us what your connection with this case is, Mr. Dollar. I was employed by the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation of Hartford, Connecticut, to conduct an investigation in regard to one of their policyholders. Arnold Bennett. Yes, Arnold Bennett. Will you please tell the court what the results of that investigation were? The Bennett building was destroyed by fire. I worked with arson experts from my own organization and with the police here to determine the cause of the fire. Go on, please. At the scene of the fire, our expert, William Underwood, located certain items which we recognized as part of the paraphernalia generally used by professional arsonists. Will you please state what those items were? A scrap of celluloid and a paraffin wick. Anything else? Samples of the ashes, which were later analyzed and proved to be celluloid ashes. I wish to remind the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that the public fire adjuster, the gentleman from the Skyline Laboratories, and the two gentlemen from the Fire Inspection Department have previously testified as to the identity and uses of these items. Will you continue, Mr. Dollar? Well, these particular items suggested that the fire was of an incendiary origin. 
The next problem was to establish the exact method used in starting the fire. Were you able to determine that method? Yes, sir. In order to refresh the minds of the jury, would you mind describing what was established? A heavy woolen wick. This one, Mr. Dollar? That one, or one like it. Exhibit C. Please continue. This wick had been soaked in paraffin and then stuffed into a paper sack that was filled with celluloid. It's a simple method. The wick is lit uh, and takes anywhere from three to ten minutes to burn down to the celluloid. Now, once that happens, the celluloid flares up and fires anything combustible in the vicinity. And that is the method you determined caused the fire in the Bennett building? Yes. And I'd like to qualify that by saying the arson experts from my own company and the gentlemen from the police and fire departments here in San Francisco determined it definitely. Mr. Dollar, by this means, you connected the defendant, George Foley, with the fire you were investigating? Yes, we did. How? George Foley improvised the method I have just described. Improvised? You mean it is his method? I object, Your Honor. The prosecution is putting words into the mouth of the witness. I'll rephrase for Mr. Eggleston. Is this method identifiable with the defendant? Yes, sir. Will you explain the identification? The police files here show that Foley has been convicted of setting two other fires in this state. On both occasions, he employed that method of fire. Your Honor, I object. The career of the defendant as a professional arsonist is a matter of public record. The defendant's previous record has no bearing on this case, I object. Mr. Dollar, will you rephrase and delete any reference to the defendant's criminal history? The procedure in locating an arsonist is to first establish the method of operation. In this case, where the Wick celluloid method was used, the defendant's name came up immediately. The defendant made an attempt to call on Arnold Bennett in the hospital. The defendant was positively identified by three witnesses as the man they had seen near the Bennett building prior to the fire. I remind the jury of the testimony of those witnesses. Go on, Mr. Dollar. The police crime laboratory examined all of the clothing Foley was wearing at the time of his arrest and all of the clothing in his room. There was definite evidence that he had been in the Bennett building. Will you tell us what sort of evidence, please? Well, uh, paint smudges on the soles of his shoes and metal filings in cuffs of his trousers, compared with samples that were still available in the building, where certain painting and metal work had been in progress. You connected him with the improvised method of firing. You proved that paint smudges and metal filings came from the Bennett building. The defendant attempted to contact Arnold Bennett. What else? Arnold Bennett's niece, Elizabeth Bennett, informed me that her uncle, Arnold Bennett, hired the defendant to fire the building to collect insurance. I was on the stand all the rest of the morning. When Finley ended his questioning, he turned me over to defense counsel Eggleston. Eggleston contested every bit of established testimony and recommended that my remarks be stricken from the trial records. The summations came right after that, and then the case went to the jury. Expense account item 10, $3, lunch, for Andrew Cord and myself. Foley has to be convicted or we'll be on the defense when Bennett's insurance claim comes to court. And we'll probably get stuck with it. Hey, while the jury's out, why don't I go over to the jail and talk with Foley? Now, what good would that do, John? Well, Foley must know they'll give him the works if he admits something He'll to us. He'll admit nothing. He sits there in court like they were talking about someone else. Oh, Johnny, it's too late. Yeah, but if he did, you could go ahead and file criminal charges against Bennett. Beat him to the punch. Well, I'd like that. Oh, we get Foley and we've beaten Bennett, and I like that. The job of getting to a prisoner who's standing trial isn't an easy one, especially when he's under the surveillance of a smart defense attorney like Eggleston. I talked to Judge Brainbridge in his chambers and told him what I had in mind. I broke down the case against Foley as the insurance company saw it, and the possible case against Arnold Bennett if Foley was found guilty. Judge Brainbridge arranged for me to see Foley. He was sitting on his cot. Eggleston was standing nearby. Hello, Dollar. Hello, Eggleston. Hi, what do you want? Well, I thought we ought to talk about this thing while there's still time. If it's okay with you, Mr. Eggleston. It's okay with me, Dollar. I'll be right here. Still time for what? To get you part of a break, Foley? Oh, that's a real good one, that is. You sit on a witness chair all morning, you tell him what a bad boy I am, and you walk in here and tell him you want to give me a break. I do. 
Go away. Uh, now, wait a minute, George. It won't hurt to listen to oh, him. Oh, you're a great one, you. I'm the guy who's sitting in this cell. Both of you can walk out of here and have a good steak for dinner tonight. All right, George. Mm. Listen to him. This isn't a courtroom. When you were first hauled in, Foley, you could have made a statement telling us Bennett hired you to fire that building, waived a jury trial, and thrown yourself on the mercy of the court. But you didn't do that. You made everybody work hard to give it to you. And that's exactly what they're going to do. That jury will come out pretty soon and throw the book at you. Is that true? I'm not so sure of that, Dollar. Uh, tell us precisely why you're here. You both know my company's after Arnold Bennett. He's filed claim against us for not paying off his fire policy. Fully, we know he hired you to fire that building. Yeah. And if you're smart, you'll send for the guard and make a request for the court to come back in session before the jury returns. You can tell them Bennett hired you. You can change your plea to guilty and throw yourself on the mercy of the court. It'll probably save you five years on your sentence. And so I turn here and make everything nice for you to go after Bennett. Huh? If you do that, his claim will be thrown out by the insurance commission and we'll prefer charges against him. And he'll be right up there with me, huh? Making little ones out of paper. That's right. You're overstepping your province here, Dollar. Oh, now, look, there isn't much time. The dollar, if only I this man can advise you to wait until the jury comes in, and that won't be very long. But then it'll be too late for you to help yourself. I don't like this high-pressure stuff. I don't care what you like or dislike, Mr. Eggleston. Now, listen, Foley. They've got an eight-point case against you in there. Is he right, Eggleston? It doesn't make any difference. The jury decides. You say it saved me five years on my son. Yes. Uh, George. What do you think? Up to you, George. I've told you what I think. Ah, oh, swell spot, swell. Well, come on, come on, what is it? I'll risk it. You're crazy. There's a chance those 12 clunk heads will walk out and tell everybody I'm not guilty. Come on, get out. Those last five years will be pretty hard ones. Guard. Guard. Thank you for the offer just the same, Dollar. You don't use your head much, Foley. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be in here. So don't worry too much about what happens to me. If it weren't for guys like you, I wouldn't be in business. And I'm not worried. Dollar. Yeah? Yeah, I hope they let me loose on this one. For your sake. Don't plan on it. Oh, on a kind of... I'd like to kill you or something. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a verdict in and out of a courtroom. The wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Hi, Johnny. 
Andy, I saw George Foley. I wasn't able to make him change his plea. Well, it was a good try, Johnny. Jury's still out? Yeah. That means they're arguing all the technical evidence. I was just thinking. No one really believes we'll get Arnold Bennett. What do you think? I think we will. I know we will. Well, if we can get Foley, we can get Bennett. We're... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, the uh, jury foreman just sent for the bailiff. I'll be right there. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson fraud. Expense account item 11, 10 cents, one phone call to the hospital. The report on Arnold Bennett substantiated the newspaper story that he was recovering from the gunshot wound inflicted by his niece. Well, one thing, Johnny, he'll be alive for us if we can go after him. Oh, I wish it had worked with Foley. I think I could have made it work if that lawyer Eggleston hadn't been there. Well, it's after four. You know, if that jury doesn't come in with a verdict pretty soon, they'll have to adjourn for the night. Yeah. Want to smoke? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. I would like one. Here you go. Thanks. Hey, they're coming back in. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Come on. Stuffy in this courtroom? Yeah. Excuse me. Court is now in session. <laughs> Be seated. Has the jury reached a verdict in the case of the state versus George Foley? We have, sir. Will you please read the verdict in this court? We... We, the jury, find the defendant, George Foley, guilty as charged. That does it. Dollar! Dollar! See me, Dollar! Come see me! I got some things to tell you now. Who's this with you, Dollar? Andy Cord with the insurance company. Oh. Now, look, I haven't got any deals to offer, Foley. You know that. Yeah, I know. So, so I took a chance. It's a lousy five more years. What about Arnold Bennett? Now, you're a little anxious. I want some information first. They only gave us ten minutes, Foley. Where's Bennett now? He's still in the hospital. He's going to be all right. He's out, my man. It's a break. Oh, come on, Foley. Let's have it if you have anything to say. Can you get Bennett? Can you really get him? I'll tell you frankly, we think we can get him with or without your help now. It doesn't make too much difference. Maybe it'll take longer without your help, but we'll get him. The fact that the court is going to convict you for having set fire to Bennett's office building is the lever we've needed. We can go after him now. Do you want to help us fully? I don't want to help you or your stinking insurance company, but I hate the idea of Bennett. Mr. Nolan do everything, running around eating good food and sleeping in his nice bed while I'm rotting away in prison. Sure, sure, he hired me to fire his building. He paid me 2500 bucks to put the torch to that lousy building of his. He said he could throw all the blame on a guy named Tony Midas if it ever came up. We want the facts, Foley. How did he first contact you? Well, I, I got a friend who knows things, see? And my friend told me to contact him. When? A couple of days before the job. Come on, Foley, who's your friend? I'm not going to tell you everything. Did you talk to Bennett in person about firing the building? I talked to him on the phone after my friend told me about him. Bennett said he wanted the place to go down because he's having money trouble, taxes and all. And he offered me a thousand bucks for the job. Now, wait a minute, Fuller. You just said you got 2500 I did. I did. I I hung up on him when he offered me the thousand. I called him back later on and told him I wanted 4000 Well, we argued about it and then finally hit on the 2500 Did you meet him then? Sure. No. I never met him. I... 
I saw him once, and I walked by the bull and looked it over, but I never met her. Bennett's niece said she saw you two together, Foley, a sworn statement. Yeah, well, she's a liar. How about the money? How'd he pay it to you? He left it for me in the check stand at the bus terminal over on 4th Street. I told him how to do that and when to leave it. Now, let me get this straight, Foley. You made the deal to fire the building over the phone. And you went ahead and looked at the job. You never talked to Bennett in person? That's right. And you made arrangements for him to pay you $2,500 by leaving it in the check stand at the bus terminal. Yeah, yeah. When did you make these arrangements? The day before the job. How'd you work it? I just told you. I mean the money. Oh, uh, half of it the first time, and after the job was over, he, he left the other half for me. And you got it all? Sure, sure, in cash. Why were you trying to see him in the hospital after he was shot? Try and shake him down for another five? Oh, Johnny. brother. Come on, let's start over. Well, what do you mean? Oh, you're trying to sell us a bill of goods here. For what reason, I don't know, but I know this. You had to meet Bennett. You had to see him fully. You had to talk it over with him personally. I just told you I picked up the money in the bus time. I don't believe that. Bennett wouldn't have left the money for you to pick up. You could have just gone away with it. And after the building was burned, if it had been that way, Bennett didn't have to pay you the balance. Now, when did you see him? It's pretty important to know when and where and how many times you and Bennett got together. Thought you said you could get him whether I told you anything or not. We can, we can, brother. Don't ever doubt that. But if you tell us some facts, we can get him faster. All right, now. Where did you first meet him? Was it in a restaurant? Someplace with people around? No, no. Uh, I met him in his car. He was parked on Market Street near Fifth. Uh, that's the way we arranged to meet each other over the phone. See? Did anybody see you meet him? People on the street, I guess. When did this meeting happen? Night I torched his building. He paid you then? Yeah. The whole 2500 Yeah, all of it. All What'd you do with the money? Never mind. Do you still have it? Never mind. Oh, this is a waste of time. You aren't telling us anything. Well, why should I? Well, why'd you call us here if you didn't have anything to say? Well, I'm saying something. You guys aren't listening. We continued questioning Foley about his association with Arnold Bennett. Each time he explained it, it was a different story. The only thing he admitted was that Bennett had hired him to fire the building. As far as the details of it were concerned, they were lost in a jumble of contradictory answers he gave us. Expense account item 12, $5.60, dinner for Andrew Court and myself. The next morning, we returned to the Hall of Justice to question George Foley once more. All right, Foley. Now, how much did you say Arnold Bennett paid you for the job? thousand dollars. You told us twenty five hundred one time. Another time you said five thousand. Now come on, what was it? Thousand dollars. And when did he pay you? Right after I fired the building. I met him right afterwards down on the street in his car. He asked me if it was all set, and I told him to listen for the sirens. And pretty soon somebody put in the alarm and the fire engines come out. He paid me that all right. He place was three quarters gone by that time. He knew I did a good job. <sighs> Where was this you met him now? A couple of blocks in the building. Did anybody see you together? No. Where did you telephone him from? From my place. The same night you started the fire? Yeah, yeah. And he brought you the money that night, and you cased the building that night, and you started the fire. All, all this in one night. Now you got it. Now, that's the ticket, boy. It became increasingly evident that Foley was attempting to convince us that he was mentally deranged. In spite of the fact that he'd already been tried and found guilty and was slated to appear at 10.30 the following morning for sentencing. It's an old trick, and with arsonists, where sanity is questioned from the beginning, a good one. However, Foley had been examined by three psychiatrists appointed by the courts. I waited in the jail cell with Foley while Andy Cord went out to get copies of their findings. When he returned, we showed them to Foley. Okay, good. Here you are, John. Well, what do you show me these things for? To let you know there's no way to get out of it now, Foley. These are from psychiatrists. All of them had a good look at you. You're sane. You're all right. You remember when they looked at you? No. All right, look at the dates on the paper. You can read, can't you? Sure. January 15th, January 16th, January 21st. Witnesses were around for all the examinations. Well? Well? Are you through playing games now? 
Okay, Dolly, you guys win. Come on, give us the story. Uh, I met Arnold Bennett at the Hopkins bar about a month before the fire. I made sure I'd meet him there. Now, what do you mean, Foley? Well, I've been setting fires for a living for a long time now. I always have a list of people like Bennett who could use a fire. They get around. I knew he was in trouble four or five years ago with the income tax people. They sent a guy to prison for cover-up. Tony Midas. Yes, yeah, Tony Midas. I figured he'd be needing another one pretty soon, so we had a drink. I brought it up. Who paid for the drinks? He did. Who saw you together? The bartender. His name is um, Alfred. There was a maid of D there, a couple of people at the table. I put the proposition up to him. How'd he like to have his building burnt down and collect his $500,000 get himself out of trouble? Well, he said he'd like that fine. I told him it cost him 5000 bucks in advance. He said he couldn't raise that much, but he did manage to get 3500 together. I took it, and I, I did the job. What'd you do with the money? I still got it. Where? It's not going to do me any good now. I buried it in a gallon can in a vacant lot over by the tower. I can show you where. Okay. We'll get you to do that. Swell, I'll be glad. Hey. What? I can send Bennett up the same way you're sending me up. Huh? I can testify against him at his trial. The next morning at 10.30, George Foley received the maximum sentence. Two hours later, charges were filed against Arnold Bennett, naming him for conspiracy, arson, attempted defraud, and collusion. A warrant was issued for his immediate arrest, but it was never served. Arnold Bennett died in the hospital that night. In a way, you could still say that no one ever beat him. He beat himself. Expense account item 13, $87.50, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 14, another $125, transportation back to Hartford. Item 15, $35, miscellaneous. Expense account total... $1,440.37. Remarks? Nothing. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Fathom Five matter. Death. On the high seas. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Stacey Harris, Chet Stratton, Will Wright, Marvin Miller, Hans Conried, Edgar Barrier, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Steedler, Johnny. Dollar liability. Oh, hiya, Ralph. What's on your mind? Poetry, you Philistine. Hmm? The bard's immortal words. Which words? 
full fathom five thy father lies. Of his bones are corals made, and those... Those are pearls that were his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> What's the case, Ralph? Robbery? A pearl necklace? Ah, uh, life insurance. $75,000 worth of bones down on the bottom of the deep blue sea, or so they say. So who say? The insured's wife, the insured's best friend. Oh, they're quite positive about it. But you're not, is that it? Johnny, if I'm going to be stuck for 75 Gs, at least I ought to get the straight dope, shouldn't I? All right, I'll get it for you. Give me the who and where. It happened in Miami Beach. Check with the DA's office there. The insured was a man named William Markey. And the beneficiary? His wife, poor wretch. Oh, you're biased, Ralph. Sure, I'm paying alimony. So look it over, Johnny, and keep in touch. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Fathom 5 matter. Item 1, $143.40. Transportation, tips, and incidentals, Hartford to Miami. Purpose of assignment, aside from a chance to get a look at the sun, to check into the death of one William Markey, or to find out if there was a death, and how it happened, and where was the body, and if not, why not, and if so, how. Or rather, to determine... Well, anyway, the deputy investigator from the DA's office, a man named Barney Wilson, was at least as confused as I was. And he'd had a two-day head start. Now, we're going on the assumption, of course, that the man is dead. But legally, you understand, the fact hasn't yet been established. Meaning exactly what, Mr. Wilson? Well, it's pretty strong evidence, but no corpus delicti. Not so far, anyway. Maybe you'd better start at the beginning. And that would be where, Mr. Donner? How much do you know about the case? Well, uh, very little. Mm -hmm. The dead man, if he is dead, was named William Markey. He was uh, 46 years old, yeah. owner of a consulting engineering firm in New York. Mm -hmm. He'd been married to his present wife for three years. Her age is 30, and she's the beneficiary of his insurance. And, I might add, a charming and lovely young woman. They've been on here for about a month. And three days ago, Markey was killed, or allegedly killed, in an accident. That's right. Drowned, as I understand it, when a fishing launch sank a mile or two offshore. And then... Well, you can take it from there, Mr. Wilson. Now, your responsibility in the case is primarily to the insurance company. Is that right, Mr. Donner? Entirely, not primarily. Why, what do you mean? And it would be to the company's advantage if Markey's death were not legally established, huh? <laughs> they wouldn't have to pay the claim, if that's what you mean. Then it's reasonable to suppose, since the whole case is uh, pretty vague at present, that your efforts will be devoted to creating doubts as to whether Markey is really dead. Mr. Wilson, I think it's reasonable to suppose that I can't very well answer your questions without knowing exactly what has happened. Uh -huh. well, all right, then. Briefly, this is it. Apparently, Markey came down here to bid on a construction job, a manufacturing plant. We didn't get the job. But he stayed on, he and his wife, and the young fellow that was with him. What young fellow? Name of Danny Haynes. He worked for Markey, a draftsman, an engineer. Evidently a personal friend of the Markey's. Oh. The three of them took a house down the beach south and spent all the time together, night clubbing, one thing and another. I see. Anyhow, well, three days ago, Markey and young Haynes went out fishing together. Hired a charter boat, a small cabin cruiser named the Fathom Five... And headed south along the coast, working the offshore banks. Whose idea was the trip? Markey's, according to young Haynes. In fact, all the rest of the story is according to Haynes. Nobody else saw what happened. And what did happen? Well, Haynes says they anchored off the reef and both of them fished from the dinghy for a while. Then Markey decided he'd go back to the cruiser and fix some breakfast. Mm -hmm. Haynes put him aboard and took the dinghy out alone. He says he fished along the reef for about 30 minutes before he looked back and saw the cruiser was afire. It was nearly a mile away, according to his story, and by the time he got back, the boat was a pillar of flame. He didn't see any sign of Marky? No, he says not. He couldn't get aboard because of the flames, and uh, a few minutes later, the cruiser sank. Mm -hmm. No one else saw it? 
There were no other boats no, around? No, it was early morning, and there weren't many others out. It had rained during the night, and there was a fairly heavy fog. They were only a mile and a half or so offshore, so Haynes rode in with a dinghy and reported it. Mm-hmm. Tell me, what was the depth of the ocean where the cruiser sank? Oh, it was only about 50 feet. I've got a salvage company working now to raise it. Get a diver down? Yes, but he didn't find out much. He couldn't get inside the hold. That's about the size of it, huh? Mm-hmm, it is. Until they get that cruiser raised so we can take a look at it. And, of course, it may not tell us a thing. Yeah. What about the currents along the reef where that boat went down? Oh, they're pretty bad. Strong and erratic. A body could be carried through the reefs and on out to sea and never be found. Well, I was uh, thinking more of the possibility of a good swimmer getting into shore. You said they were anchored only a mile and a half out. Yes, well, it's possible, but not very probable. He'd have been seen by Haynes or somebody else. There was a heavy fog, wasn't there? Mm Mm-hmm, fairly heavy. And, of course, Haynes could be lying. Maybe he did see him. I said it was possible. But that's not the line I'm planning to take, Mr. Dollar. So I got it. They'll bring that hull to the surface sometime tomorrow. Now, maybe we'll have some evidence then. Or maybe Marky's body will turn up in the next 48 hours. And if not? Then, Mr. Dollar, I will petition the probate court to declare him legally dead. I suppose you've got some reason for all this, Rush. Yes. I want the fact of death established in order to file a murder charge. Danny Haynes? Who else? It's the old, old story, isn't it? Two men go out and only one comes back. Unwitnessed accident. Nothing new about it. No, no. And it's never been an easy one to prove. Well, it'll be a lot tougher a year from now if you people put up a fight and force the decision up to the Superior Court. Suppose Haynes himself fights. I wish he'd try. It'd be the next thing to an admission of guilt. Oh, Mrs. Markey, she has legal status in the case. She could do it, but she won't. Yeah, you're probably right. She wouldn't be likely to throw away $75,000. Well, I can't tell you what we'll do yet, Mr. Wilson. I'll have to look around first, talk to the people involved, get my feet on the ground. Mm-hmm. Fine. Well, you just do that. Here, I'll give you the addresses. Oh, good. Mrs. Markey is still at the beach house. Young Haynes has moved into a hotel near there. All right, thanks. Say, how did the three of them get along during the month they've been here? Like peas in a pod, from all appearances. Of uh, course, what was going on behind the scenes... Might have been another story. (laughs) It usually is. I think that's where we'll find the motive. Not that Mrs. Markey encouraged Haynes at all. She's a fine woman. I know, and she's beautiful. And this is the South. How's that? So long, Mr. Wilson. I'll keep in touch. (laughs) Expense account item two, $3.35. Telegram to Hartford requesting an investigation of the Markey firm's financial status both currently and over the past three years. And a similar check of Markey's personal financial status. Item three, $4.10, taxi to the Pompano Beach Hotel to talk with the DA's prime suspect, Danny Haynes. Look, Mr. Dollar, I've been over the whole thing with the police a half a dozen times. I'd still like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. They've got the whole story, all I know about it. They had a stenographer to take it down. Why don't you go to them with your questions? Well, maybe I got different questions. I told them everything I know about Look, it. Look, Danny, you don't have to talk to me, but if you're smart, you will. Why so? Because the police already have their minds made up. Or at least Barney Wilson has. Sure. He's out to prove I killed Mr. Markey. Well, look, my mind isn't made up yet, so you can't lose anything by talking to me. Unless, of course, you did kill him. It happened exactly the way I told him. All right, what do you want to know? How long did you work for Markey? Two years. Did you get along with him all right? Sure. It was a good job, no complaints. You got to be pretty close personal friends, I understand. Well, I used to go to their apartment in New York once or twice a week for dinner, drinks. And then the three of you came down here together on a vacation. It wasn't a vacation. Mr. Markey came down to bid on a job. Did he need you along for that? Well, he thought there might be some sketches or plans to draw up. And were there? Well, no. As it turned out, they weren't necessary. Hmm. Funny, Markey wouldn't know that ahead of time, being an engineer. Well, actually, it was sort of Edna's suggestion of Mrs. Markey, I mean. I see. Yeah, now I see. Now, look, don't get the idea there's been anything between us. She's been swell to me. She's, well, she's just wonderful, that's all. All right, all right. So the three of you came down on business, and within a few days, the job contract was awarded to another firm, but you still stayed on for three more weeks. That was Marky's idea. I don't know why exactly. I know he'd counted a lot on getting that job, but I was getting a free vacation. Why should I argue? So all of you just relaxed and lived it up, huh? Yeah, that's about it. 
Mr. Markey, too? No apparent worries on his mind? Well, he was moody sometimes. Went off by himself. But that wasn't too unusual. He was like that quite a lot. He and his wife seem to be getting along, all right? Sure. As far as I noticed, why? Well, let's talk about that accident for a minute, Danny. Whose idea was it to go on the fishing trip? Mr. Markey's. He woke me up at five in the morning, said he'd already phoned and hired the boat. The Phantom Five? Yeah, the same one we'd had a couple of times before. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't much for it. It was misting out with a heavy fog, but he was real hot on the idea, and I couldn't very well argue he was the boss. Was Mrs. Markey up when you left? No, but she knew we were going. She'd packed a lunch. I guess they'd talked about it the night before. All right, you took the boat out then and followed the reef south, and what happened? Well, we anchored as close as we could get to the reef and went out in the dinghy for about an hour. No luck at all. Then Mr. Markey decided he'd go back on board and fix something to eat. Uh I let him off and then rowed back along the reef. I figured as long as I'd had to come, I might as well try for a strike or two at least. And a while after that, I looked back and saw the cruiser was on fire. Was it still foggy then? Yeah, about the same. I could just see the glow. I couldn't even be sure what it was until I got close. I tried to get on board, but the flames were too high. I kept yelling, but there was nobody around. And you didn't see or hear any sign of Markey? No, I guess he was already dead. Then, not more than five minutes later, the cruiser sank. Yeah. Danny, do you have any theory as to what caused the fire? Well, it was a hot plate on board. A gasoline pressure rig. It was an old one in pretty bad shape. We'd talked about it before. I think it may have leaked into the bulkheads in the bilge. And when Mr. Markey went to light it to fix breakfast, the whole boat just went up in flames. I see. Tell me something, Danny. Do you think Markey could have committed Suicide? Suicide? Why? For what reason? Oh, maybe l- losing that contract. You said it was pretty important to him. Or maybe he thought he was losing his wife. What do you mean? Well, maybe he misinterpreted your friendship with her, Danny. You're crazy. You're in love with her, aren't you? That's my business. I told you there was nothing between us. All right, all right. But didn't Marky know that? Look, you're the same age she is, and he was 15 years older. A man like that might get to wondering... Knock it off, Dollar. Nobody's private life is going to be dragged into this. You better stop and think, Danny... Well, you've still got time. A defendant in a murder trial doesn't have any private life. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lady weeps... A lover curses, and a strange, grim relic is brought up from the sea. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson, Mr. Dollar, special deputy with the DA's office. I understand you talked to Danny Haynes. You've got a good grave mind, Mr. Wilson. Oh, tolerable. Well, what do you think? Well, I'll go about six to five. He hasn't murdered anybody. Oh, uh-huh. well, that's close to even money. So you're not too sure, huh? No, I'm not too sure. But then I'm not even sure yet that Marky is dead, remember? Well, maybe we can settle that question this evening. What do you mean? 
The salvage boys have finally got grapple lines on that boat. And they figured to bring it up to the surface around 8 o'clock. I'm going out in one of the harbor launches. You'd like to come along? My company's got a 75 grand stake in this. Sure, I'd like to come along. All right. You meet me at Harbor Police Headquarters at 7.30. I'll be there. Good. I'll introduce you to the late William Markey. Somehow, I sort of doubt that, Mr. Wilson. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Phantom Five matter. Location, Miami, Florida. Expense account continued. Item six, $3.85. Taxi fare to the Markey Beach House, occupied for the past three days now by his wife since William Markey's accidental death. According to all reports, a very beautiful woman. The reports were correct. Won't you come in, Mr. Dollar? Thank you. Come this way. I've been practically living in here in the study since... I just haven't had the heart to even look at the rest of the house. Yes, I uh, I imagine it's been quite a shock for you, Mrs. Markey. Yes, terrible. No one knows. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I, uh, I really don't know very much about these matters. If there are papers to sign, maybe I should have a lawyer or something. No, that won't be necessary for the present. There's nothing to sign. But aren't you with the insurance company? I'm working for them at the moment as a special investigator. Oh. I'm to supply them with a full report of your husband's accident. They have to have that before they can do anything about paying off the policy. Well, couldn't the police give you all that? And there's a Mr. Wilson, I think his name is, who's with the district attorney. I've talked to Mr. Wilson. He's cooperating in every way possible. But uh, some of the details I have to get from you. Have you talked with Danny Haynes? Yes. Well, didn't he tell you what happened? He gave me a statement, yes. But only covering the details he actually knew about. Well, I'm sure there's nothing I can add, Mr. Dollar. I, I wasn't even there, as you know, of course. I know, Mrs. Markey. I'll get all of those details elsewhere. But then I don't see why you've well, come out uh, here. Well, I'd, I'd like to know a few things about your husband. Things you'd know better than anybody else. Uh, his actions and behavior during the last few weeks. His uh, mental attitude. I see. You think maybe he committed suicide, is that it? I don't think anything. I'm just trying to find out. But that's what you're driving at. Suicide. It's a possibility, of course. And, of course, your company isn't liable, I suppose, if it's oh, suicide. it'd still be liable, but only to the extent of $25,000 under the particular terms of the policy, not 75000 I see. Is that all, Mr. Dollar? I don't think you do see. Look, I'm not claiming it was suicide. I, I have no reason to think it was. But these questions are going to be raised by the claims board when they meet to consider settlement. And they're not going to pay out any money until they have the answers. So that's why I'm here, Mrs. Markey, to get those answers ahead of time. Now, you can help or you can hinder. But I think you ought to realize that you'll be mainly hindering yourself. It was not suicide. Bill wasn't that kind. You didn't know him. I resent your implication, Mr. Dollar. He'd never do a thing like that. I said I have no reason to believe that he did. Uh, Please forgive me. I guess I'm sort of living in a state of shock. I'm not like this, really. Suspicious, belligerent. Well, sure, I understand, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to bother you this way, but there are certain I questions... I know, I know. These things have to be done. It's all right. Would you like a drink, Mr. Dollar? Mm, not unless you're having one. Yes, I think I would like something. In that case, I'll have a scotch on the rocks, please. Oh, here, let me fix them. Thank you. Make mine the same. I guess it was the mention of suicide that set me off. Bill and I were married for three years. We were completely happy every minute of it. Nobody in the world had less reason than Bill to do a thing like that. What about financial problems? None that I knew about. Did you work before your marriage, Mrs. Markey? I was an entertainer. Chorus? Yes. I suppose that gives you the usual impression. (laughs) Well, do I seem like a visiting fireman? No. No, I just thought you might have been a dancer because you carry yourself so well. Lithe and graceful. Well, I, I've been away from it for quite some time. 
Well, it doesn't show. Here's your drink. Thank you. Maybe it'll help me relax a little. I think it might. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Markey, how did your husband and young Haynes get along? Well, that should be obvious. We brought him down here with us. Had him living here in the house for a month. But I, uh, I understood that was primarily your idea. Who said that? Did you suggest bringing Haynes along, or was it your husband? Well, I, I might have. I don't remember how it came up now, but Bill was all for it. Otherwise, he'd have put his foot down. Any possibility that he resented Haynes' presence but kept it to himself? Of course not. Why should he? I don't know. Well, if you're trying to imply I'm something... Not. I'm just asking. I understood your husband had spells of brooding during the last few weeks, and I was trying to find out the reason for it. If he did, I'm sure I didn't notice it. What are Danny Haynes' feelings towards you? I think you're pretty insulting. I wasn't intending to be. Well, what would you call it? Just another routine question. I wasn't meaning to imply that you encouraged him in any way. I certainly didn't. But he's young, impetuous. You're very attractive. Maybe he cooked up crazy notions without any encouragement. He thought of me as a friend, that's all. No attitudes on his part that your husband might have misinterpreted. I don't believe I care to answer any more questions like these, Mr. Dollar. Look, I'm not just asking them for my own pleasure, Mrs. Markey. I I'd a lot rather not ask them, but... But I've got a job to do. Well, I fail to see why it's necessary to probe into our private lives. All right, I'll tell you why. Your husband supposedly died out there beyond the surf when a cruiser burned and sank. What do you mean, supposedly? His body hasn't been recovered, so at present the evidence of his death is purely circumstantial. In fact, there isn't much evidence one way or another. But who could possibly doubt it? The insurance company will doubt it, Mrs. Markey. And they'll hold up processing any claim for payment until one of two things happens. Until I turn up sufficient proof of death to convince them, or until a court declares your husband legally dead. I didn't realize... Barney Wilson from the DA's office, for reasons of his own, is going to file for an immediate court decision. I'm pretty sure of that. It's... But as things stand now, my company will fight it. And with no more evidence than Wilson has, they'll be able to fight it successfully. But all those questions, what was the point? What were you driving at? Your husband's death had to result from one of three possible causes. One, an accident. Two, suicide. Three, murder. Murder? But the, the, there was there was no one with him except... Do you mean Danny? That's one possibility. One out of three. Oh, no. I have no reason at the moment to give it any more weight than the other two. But there is one thing certain, Mrs. Markey. In view of the circumstances, not one cent of insurance is going to be paid until one of those causes is proved. But what can I do? I don't know anything about it. Maybe you don't. Or maybe there's something you've forgotten, don't think is important... Or something you haven't wanted to talk about. I don't know, of course. But it might be worth thinking about. It was nearly dark when I left the house, and I wouldn't have noticed the man standing under a palm tree by the driveway if he hadn't made a sudden move to get out of sight. Then when I walked toward him, he scurried out of the drive and slipped into a car parked at the street. I could see it was an old model, but I couldn't identify the make. I caught the last three numbers on the license plate before it disappeared around a bend. I couldn't quite figure it. It might have been Haynes, or some ghoulish swindler who was scared off when he saw the widow wasn't alone. The numbers were 642. Expense account item 7, $3.75. Taxi back to my hotel. Item 8, $6 and a quarter. Dinner and incidentals there. And item nine, a dollar and forty cents, taxi again to the waterfront headquarters of the harbor police. Thirty minutes later, I was in a police launch with Deputy Agent Barney Wilson, several miles down the coast, skimming across the water toward a bright cluster of spotlights where a salvage barge was working into the night to raise the burned hulk of the charter cruiser Fathom Five. You still got your mind set the same way, Mr. Dollar? What way was that? That there hasn't been any death or any murder? Oh, come now, Mr. Wilson. You're mistaking an honest scientific skepticism for a set of mine. Well, that's very pretty, Mr. Dollar. What does it mean? Well, I haven't taken any definite position yet. But I've got to see more evidence before I'll consider proof of death to be established without a question. That means you'll file a demur against a declaration by the courts, huh? Not up to me. It's up to the company. But I can tell you right now that if you petition, they'll move to block it. You have no real evidence, Mr. Wilson. I'm getting it, though, piece by piece. The sea is starting to give up its prey, Mr. Dollar. What do you mean? The boys found his shoe late this afternoon, washed up in the surf, just about where you'd expect to find it if it had been carried in by the current. Identifiable? From the same New York shop that Marky's other shoes came from. Same size, same style. Well, it's something, all right. 
but it's still not conclusive. Who would he ask? That Marky walks up and tells you he's dead? No. No, I guess I'd settle for just seeing him that way. Oh, by the way, I wonder if you could have an auto license checked for me. A partial license on a used car. Florida plates. The last three numbers are 642. Well, it might take a while with no more than that to go on. Well, I've got an idea the car may have been purchased within the last three weeks or so. Maybe that'll narrow it down. You got an idea it may mean something? Look, I have no idea at all. I'm just playing the hunches. But it's about time something in this case started meaning something. We edged the launch up the side of the barge, tied up to a stanchion, and climbed on deck. The power winches on the derricks were still grinding away, and the sunken hull of the burned cruiser was nearing the surface. A crew of men waited with salvage pontoons, ready to float the supporting cradle into place as soon as the waterlogged hulk was raised. Wilson and I stood by the rail, watching, not talking, wondering, I suppose, what answers the wreck might supply us with. The taut steel cables inched their way slowly up from the depths, and finally the boat itself broke the surface of the water. Then the men moved in with the pontoons, and other crew members dropped a suction hose into the water-filled hull and started a pump to empty it. Finally, the whole thing was high enough so we could see that the cabin and the deck were badly burned, almost destroyed. But strangely enough, the hull itself seemed to be undamaged. Then Wilson and I both noticed something at the same time, a solid column of water spotting from a round hole near the keel of the boat, and we both realized what it meant. Look, Jolla! Look there. Somebody opened the seacocks. Somebody left them wide open. So one thing is certain. It wasn't an accident. She was sunk deliberately. That's exactly what I've been trying to tell you right from the start. Huh? William Markey was murdered. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a photograph, a silver cup, a harried widow, and the dead begin to stir with life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson, DA's office. Oh, morning, Mr. Wilson. Say, you're on an expense account, aren't you? That's right. Good, I'm not. How about buying me a lunch? You got a deal. Twelve o'clock here at my hotel? Sold. Found any more shoes? No, and no bodies. Not yet, anyway. I'm amazed. Did find one thing you may be interested in, though. What's that? We got a lead on that license number you gave me last night. You were right. The car was bought from a dealer about two weeks ago. By whom? Somebody named John Smith, over on the east side of town. That figures. Well, maybe here's something that won't. I checked the address this morning. And you know what? Sure, a vacant lot. Well, now, how the devil did you know? See you at lunch, Mr. Wilson. (laughs) 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Miami Beach, Florida. To the home office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Phantom Five matter. A sunken cruiser that refused to give up its dead. <laughs> Item 10, $4.80. Lunch with DA Deputy Barney Wilson. A man who'd made up his mind about the case before I'd even arrived in town. Murder, he'd called it. When the hired cruiser Fathom 5 burned and sank mysteriously a mile or two offshore. But nobody had been found yet, and I still doubted very much that one ever would be. Because I wasn't even certain that William Markey was dead. Wilson, of course, had different ideas. Yes, sir, Mr. Dower. It's an old, old story. Two men go out in a boat and only one comes back. No witnesses, nothing. And if that doesn't indicate murder, I... Say, pass the sugar, will you, please? Sure, here. You're convinced it's murder, and you're convinced young Danny Haynes did it. Well, who else? Well, now, that would be a fine argument to advance in court, wouldn't it? Sure, sure. Certain conviction. Simply because you can't produce any other suspect. Wilson, I don't think there's been any murder at all. Now, you can pass me the sugar. All right. Suppose you let me tell you how I figure it. While I'm eating my dessert? Marky and his wife took a liking to this Haynes kid and practically made him one of the family. And right there was their mistake. It usually is. Because Haynes started getting ideas about his boss's wife. You have to admit, Mrs. Marky's a mighty pretty woman. Who could deny it? She's Haynes' own age and her husband was older. So the kid in that bird brain of his figured he had it all tagged. Figured she actually went for him. I think he probably started bothering her, making a nuisance out of himself. And I'll lay you odds she'll admit he did, once she's convinced he's guilty. Well, I got a sneaking hunch you may be right on that. Oh, thank you, thank you. So what happened? Marky finally noticed the kid was getting a little out of line. Probably didn't even take it seriously at first, but eventually he must have decided he'd better get Haynes straightened out. So he took him out on that fishing boat in order to talk to him alone, is that it? Mm-hmm. No, you're with a dollar. But the thing backfired. Haynes probably got mad. Maybe started a fight. Knocked Marky out, and that gave him his big idea. Spur of the moment, huh? Yes, sir. Now, with the boss out of the way, he'd have a clear field with the widow. So he threw Marky overboard, set fire to the cruiser, opened the seacock so it would be sure and sink, and then rode away in a dinghy. And how could he be sure the body wouldn't be found? Washed ashore by the currents. Oh, he couldn't be sure. But what if it was? There was a heavy fog. Nobody saw what happened. He knew it'd be mighty tough to prove anything on him. Oh, brother, that's an understatement. As a matter of fact, it'll be impossible to prove that story. Yeah, well, once he's arrested and interrogated, I figure he'll break down and tell us the whole thing. Not unless he's completely simple-minded. No, you haven't even got the shadow of a case, Mr. Wilson. All you've got is a wild theory that doesn't even fit the facts. You got a better theory, I suppose. I think so. And would it be the kind that would take your company off the hook on that $75,000 life insurance policy? Now, by coincidence, it just so happens that it would. In fact, that insurance policy is the key to the whole thing. Uh huh. I sort of thought you might say that. I didn't have any pet theory at first, but I do now. I'm pretty sure this thing is an out-and-out insurance fraud, and Danny Haynes is being used as the fall guy. Oh, do tell. And what are you finding for evidence, Mr. Dollar? Oh, a lot of little things that are sort of starting to add up. For one thing, I got a long telegram this morning from a firm of confidential investigators in New York. I forwarded a request through Hartford yesterday. And yeah, they turned up quite a lot on Markey. Such as? His financial status for the main thing. Oh, well, go on. Well, when he and Mrs. Markey were married three years ago, the firm was in first-class shape. But they've been living high, living up his capital. If he got that contract he came down here after, it, well, it might have pulled him through, but he didn't get it. Net result, he was flat broke. So what? A lot of people are broke. But not many of them have a $75,000 policy. Uh, I thought that's what you were getting at. What I am getting at is what I think happened. And I think Danny Haynes is telling the truth. I think Marky did send him off alone in that dinghy. Then Marky fired the boat, opened the seacocks, and while she filled up and sank, he swam ashore in the fog. 
And he's waiting it out somewhere now until his widow collects the insurance. Well, I don't see where you've got any more evidence than I have. Well, there's not much, I'll grant you. Not so far. But what there is adds up. I guess I'm just stupid, darling. All right, look. Take Mrs. Markey's attitude, for instance. She's trying hard to play the role, but it doesn't come off. Now, does she act to you like a four-day widow? Well, she's got a lot of self-control. Oh, I'll say she has. I tried to go to her yesterday when I talked to her. Came right out and practically insulted her. And how did she react? Never took her eyes off that main chance, the 75000 Well, you know, it's not exactly unheard of for a widow not to mind too much being a widow. Oh, no, no, that's not the impression she gives. She's tense enough, nervous as a cat. But it's not because of grief or any feeling of relief, either. It's because she's afraid she might say the wrong thing and let her foot slip. Well, everybody's got a right to their own opinion. Another thing is that Marky's body hasn't turned up. Now, I talked to the harbor master this morning. He knows the currents along this coast backwards and forwards. He says it's the only one chance in a hundred that Marky's body would have been carried out through the reef instead of thrown up on the beach about where you found that shoe. So this is the one time in a hundred. Yeah. Well, that was a mighty fine lunch, Mr. Dollar. We're going to fight you, Mr. Wilson. If you petition the court to declare Marky legally dead. Yes, I sort of figured you would. Hensley and Davis phoned me this morning and said you'd retain them as counsel. That's right. Well, I've been fought before. Expense account item 11, 10 cents. Phone call to Edna Markey, widow of the allegedly deceased and beneficiary of his insurance policy. Hello? Mrs. Markey? Yes? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, Oh, I didn't recognize your voice. I wonder if I could ask a favor of you. Well, if it's something I can... I'd like to borrow a photograph of your late husband for a few hours. Well? I'll take good care of it and make sure it gets back to you. Well, the fact is I really don't have one. Oh, well, uh, you must have forgotten. I, I noticed one yesterday afternoon on the mantel in your study. Well, I, I meant not a good one. Well, that one will do fine, and thanks a lot. Uh, has uh, something new come up, Mr. Dollar? Yes, you might say that. I'll send a messenger out to pick it up. Goodbye, Mrs. Markey. <laughs> Item 12, $3.80, messenger service. Item 13, $1.90, taxi fare to the used car lot of one truthful Tom, the dealer who'd sold a car to a man named John Smith. A car that had departed suddenly from the vicinity of the Markey Beach House when its driver saw me come out of the house. I wasn't too sure whether Tom was truthful or not, but one thing was certain, he was typical. I notice you looking at that little gray job, friend, and I say to myself, truthful, Tom, don't you go trying to get the best of that lad, because he's walked right in here and spotted the best dog gone by on the lot before he's even turned around. Well, I, I wasn't really thinking of buying. Friend, with the price I'll make you on that car, you can't afford not to buy it. No, no, I'm not really in the market. It's an economic society, friend. We're all in the market when the price is right. No, I just happened to notice that it looked like the car a friend of mine had stolen a few weeks ago. My dear friend, I'll make you... Uh... Did you say stolen? Oh, it may not be the same one, of course. I've got papers on that car. I've got papers on every last car on this lot. Did you have papers on the one you sold to John Smith two weeks ago? If he says I didn't, he's a liar. Oh, wait a minute, mister. And I can get a dozen witnesses to prove it. You remember him, then? Well, do you? Remember who? Look, I'm a special investigator for the Delta liability. It's a frame-up, that's all it is. Whoever it is says they got a hot car deal on this lot is lying. Truthful Tom never turned a dishonest penny in his whole doggone life. Good, then we'll forget it. And any low-down rat that says I did is a two-legged snake, and I... What'd you say? I don't care anything about your deals. I'm trying to locate a fellow who bought a car from you. Well, friend, uh, that puts a different light on it. Uh, John Smith, you said? That's the name he used. I can't say I recollect anybody by that name. Here's a copy of the title registry on the car. Let's see now. 6842 Dark Green... Oh, 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 that was that old clunker that... Uh, of course, it was well worth the price, I was asking. Do you remember the buyer? You bet your life. You know why? Because he paid cash. Not a check, cash. I mean, the real long green Missoula. Would you recognize a photograph of him? Well, I might if... What was this shit? Well, let's see now. Well? Uh, no doubt of it, friend. That's the lad, all right. Good evening, Mrs. Markey. Mr. Dollar. I brought back the photograph of your husband. Oh, there wasn't that much hurry about it. Did it help any? Quite a bit. Do you mind if I come in? Well, all right, of course. Thank you. 
You know, I've been trying to think all day long what you could possibly want with that picture. I still can't imagine. You can't, huh? Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. It's a terrible picture, of course. That's why I hesitated about giving it to you. It doesn't look a thing like him. It looked enough like him, Mrs. Marquis. Enough like him? I don't think I know what you mean. Did you know your husband bought a second-hand car the week before his so-called death? You must be mistaken. He'd have told me about it. The car dealer positively identifies his photograph. He used the name John Smith, paid for it in cash. What did you mean, so-called death? William Markey isn't dead. I think we're both aware of that. Well, Mrs. Markey, aren't we... Do you mind telling me what you're talking about? It wasn't even a very smart scheme to start with. Your husband must have been really up against the wall, or he'd have known better than to try it. But I suppose he thought he had to in order to hang on to you. I imagine you're pretty expensive to support. I think you'd better leave right now. Actually, it would serve you both right if I did. But I decided to give you a chance. I came here to let you know exactly where you stand. And where is that, if I may ask? One step away from prison. Take that step and you're in up to your necks, you and your husband both. What step? So far, we have no case against you for attempted fraud because you haven't filed a claim yet. But take my advice, Mrs. Markey, don't file one, because the minute you do, we're going to hit you with both barrels. You've got some pretty crazy ideas, haven't you? You've had fair warning. I've had one of the biggest bluffs I've ever heard about. Why, you people would do anything, wouldn't you, to keep from paying off on a policy? Better talk it over with your husband before you do anything foolish. My husband is dead, Mr. Dollar. No one but you even doubts it. I'm a cynic. How much proof does it take to bring you to your senses? Mrs. Markey, as this case stands right now, there's only one way you could convince me that William Markey is not alive. Show me his dead body. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a crazy kid in love, a right decision by a court, and then the whole case smashes wide open. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield... It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar? Yes, just a moment. It's for you, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson here. Your hotel told me where to locate you. I'd rather you located that car. All the police agencies in the state have the license number and description. It'll turn up. Well, the sooner the better. It'll take more than a car to prove William Mark is still alive. The dealer who sold it to him identified his photograph. Oh. Right, but he bought the car two weeks ago. We know he was alive at that time. In case you've forgotten, Mr. Dollar, the Fathom Five sank only four days ago. That's when Marky was murdered. Okay, okay. We're not going to settle it by arguing. That's why I phoned. It's going to be settled tomorrow morning. You've petitioned for a hearing? Ten o'clock in Judge Campbell Chambers. You're making a mistake. See you in court, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> From.
from Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Miami Beach, to the Home Office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Fathom Five matter. The case of a cruiser mysteriously sunk off the Florida coast. I phoned the insurance company's legal counsel and told him that Wilson had petitioned a hearing to have William Markey declared legally dead. Then I rejoined Mrs. Markey in the study. She was tense and on edge, pacing the floor and smoking nervously. I watched her a moment without saying anything, fully aware of her beauty and appeal, and fully convinced also that she and her missing husband were trying to swindle my company out of $75,000 in life insurance. I felt a little sorry for Markey. She must have been a pretty expensive luxury for a man who was going broke. But then I stopped feeling sorry. I remembered that they'd tried to set up young Danny Haynes as the fall guy for murder. Well, why don't you go ahead and say it? Say what? Whatever it is you're thinking. I thought I'd already said it, and pretty bluntly, too. You made some wild accusations. Not so wild. I've got some fairly solid facts to back them up. Apparently the DA's office doesn't agree with you. Wasn't that Mr. Wilson on the phone? That's right. And didn't he say he would ask the court to declare my husband legally dead? He's going to try to, but we'll stop him cold. He hasn't got a leg to stand on. Well, that's what you're hired for, isn't it? To find some technicality so they can get out of paying off on a policy? Attempted fraud isn't exactly a technicality, Mrs. Markey. Now I'll repeat that advice I just gave you. Get in touch with your husband. Tell him the scheme is off. It won't work. And don't file a claim for that life insurance. You'd like that, wouldn't you? You'd just love to bluff me out of $75,000. No, no, I just kind of hate to see you go to prison, that's all. And that's exactly what is going to happen if you file that claim. You keep talking about some scheme. What scheme, Mr. Dollar? You want it laid right on the line, huh? I'd just like to know what you're talking about. And just how much I've figured out, all right. All right, I'll paint it for you in black and white. Your husband was broke, flat broke. I'm not guessing there. I got a report on him from a financial investigator in New York. I knew nothing about his business affairs. That I wouldn't know. Anyway, he thought he saw a chance to pull off a swindle on the basis of the only thing he had left, that $75,000 life insurance policy. So the two of you worked it out together. Did your financial investigator tell you that? Or would you be guessing? Your husband bought a car under an assumed name and probably rented living quarters somewhere in the area under another assumed name. So it was all set... It was just a matter of waiting for a morning when a heavy fog was down. <laughs> you have a fantastic imagination. Meantime, just in case the accident theory didn't go over, you kept playing young Haynes along so it would seem as though he had a motive for murder. And that part was a cinch. He was already halfway in love with you. You also have a rather nasty imagination. So finally, four days ago, conditions were just right. Your husband took Haynes out on that fishing trip in the Fathom Five. He anchored the cruiser and sent Haynes off along the reef in the dinghy. Then he set fire to the boat, opened the seacock so it would be sure to sink. He swam ashore and drove off in the car that he'd bought for exactly that purpose. As I understand it, Mr. Dollar, that cruiser was anchored a mile or two offshore. Are you actually suggesting my husband swam that distance? You mean that's something else you supposedly didn't know about? What? Oh, that report from New York was more complete than you seem to realize. William Markey has been a member of the Greenpoint Athletic Club for years. He won silver cups in the Long Island Sound Marathon swim three different times. Well, I knew he belonged to the club, of course, but I assumed it was more social. Of course he could swim that far. That particular talent was probably what gave him the idea for the whole thing. There's no proof, you know. Not one bit of real proof. There will be, if you try to collect that insurance. We'll turn up enough proof to reach all the way from here to the state prison. So if you try to... Will you excuse me, please? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. I lit a cigarette and waited for her, wondering why I even bothered to come here. I was fed up with it, sick of the whole thing. Fraud cases are like that, messy and dirty. You see people with a mask down and you get a look inside. And you get to wondering if everybody's like that. Wondering if you'd be like that yourself, maybe, if the price were right. And if you are, you hope you never find it out. All I wanted at the moment was to leave the house, wind the thing up, and get out of town. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. It was somebody looking for an address. I mean, they had a wrong address. I see. Well, I think we at least understand each other now. Yeah, I'm sure we do. And I can say only one thing. You're wrong. You're completely and absolutely wrong. Maybe. I wish you weren't. I wish my husband were still alive, even under the circumstances you believe. Maybe I wouldn't be on the verge of a nervous breakdown. 
trying to hold on to my sanity. Maybe I wouldn't be crying alone at night. You have my deepest sympathy, Mrs. Markey, for everything you're going through. There's no use at all in trying to talk to you, is there? Not unless you care to tell me where to find your husband. Good night, Mr. Dollar. I left the house and turned down the dark road toward the Pompano Beach Hotel. I'd planned to pick up a taxi there, but after that unknown visitor came to Mrs. Markey's door, I'd made a slight change in the plans. Whoever it was hadn't been a stranger, that I was sure of. She'd been too nervous when she came back into the room. It was someone she hadn't wanted me to know about. And I was pretty certain I could guess who. Evening, Mr. Haynes. What? Oh, you're Mr. Dollar, the insurance investigator. Mind if I come in? Well, um... All right, sure. You, uh, weren't asleep, were you? No, I was, um, I was just reading. Been here all evening? Yeah, sure, I've been here. Why? You haven't been out in the last half hour? I said I'd been here all evening. You weren't down the road at the Markey place a few minutes ago? No, I wasn't. Now, look, I've answered just about all the questions I'm going to, to you or to anybody else. So what are you trying to get at? What's the point? All right, forget it, Danny. Sure, forget it. It looks like you're out to try the same thing Wilson's doing, trying to tag me on a murder rap. And you're trying to drag Edna into it, Mrs. Markey. Oh, she told me how you talked to her last night. And I suppose you've been over there again this evening. Oh, relax, Danny. I'll tell you one thing right now. You better leave her alone and stop trying to push her around. She doesn't deserve it. She's had too much of that kind of stuff as it is. Oh? From whom, Danny? From Markey, that's from whom. She tell you that? I suppose you'll claim she's lying. You think everybody is lying. But you don't know her like I do. She's a sweet kid, Dollar, and she's had a raw deal out of life. Such as? Marky. The way he treated her, things he made her do. Oh, not when anybody would see it. Pin it on him. He was too smart for that. But she told me about it, and there were plenty of times I could hardly keep from smashing him in the face. Oh, brother, she's got you really set up good. What do you mean by that? If you talk this way to Wilson at the DA's office for two minutes, he'd slap a murder indictment on you so fast it'd make your head swim. I didn't kill Marky. Hating a guy is one thing, but I didn't kill him. Yeah, I know, I know. Because he's still alive. Well, maybe he is. I don't know. All I know is what I saw out there that morning. And you saw only as much as he wanted you to see. Well, maybe so. But I'll tell you one thing. If he is trying to pull something crooked, he's doing it on his own. She's not in on it. It'd be a little hard for him to collect his own insurance, wouldn't it? Hmm. Maybe he figured to get it away from her afterward. I don't know what he might be planning on, but I know she's got nothing to do with it. She's a great girl. I've never known anybody like her before. No, I don't imagine you have. I'd lay down my life for her if it ever came to that. And I imagine that's exactly what they were counting on. Good night, Danny. Expense account item 16, $1.90. Taxi fare the following morning from my hotel to the courthouse. I got there at 9.30 and went over the case with Jim Davis, local counsel for the insurance company. And at 10 o'clock, the hearing on Wilson's petition was open in chamber session, Judge A.G. Campbell presiding. Judge Campbell kept the proceedings informal and the whole thing moved pretty fast. Both sides presented briefs and additional evidence was introduced through verbal interrogation. No witnesses were called. By 10.30, the cases for both sides had been completed. Very well. There is no further evidence of fact or rebuttal. The court will make its decision on the evidence at hand. Now, in cases of this nature, where it is requested that the fact of death be established by legal declaration, it has been generally held that the substantiating evidence for said request must be essentially unchallengeable. The precedents of law are too numerous to bother citing... Now, in the case we are considering here, it seems to the court that the substantiating evidence is far from unchallengeable. In point of fact, it would seem that the bulk of the evidence indicates that William Markey may indeed be still alive. Now, 
The court would be powerless to act even in the face of a reasonable doubt. And the contrary evidence here is a good deal stronger than a reasonable doubt. Therefore, in the matter of the request made herein that William Markey be declared legally dead, it is the court's decision that the petition not be granted. If new evidence becomes available at some future time, the petition may be resubmitted. The court is adjourned. Well, looks like you won, Mr. Dollar. I told you what would happen. I sure do hate to see that kid get away with murder. Oh, forget it. Marky is walking around somewhere just as alive as you or I. Well, we've all got a right to our opinions, Mr. Dollar. I see he's floating around out there in the Atlantic somewhere. That's what he meant for us to think. Maybe so, but I... Pardon me, Mr. Wilson, a message was phoned in for you, but they wouldn't let me in the courtroom. Oh, thank you, old man. Excuse me, Mr. Dollar? Sure. Go ahead and read it. Did I step out of that office, somebody's bound to start calling... Well, well. What's the matter? Mr. Dollar, the Coast Patrol hauled a man's body out of the surf about an hour ago. Been drowned. So? They got a quick check on his prints. It's William Markey. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a dead man tells a tale, but not the tale he was meant to tell. And thereby hangs the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson here. All right, Mr. Wilson, I'm braced. Rub it in. Well, you were a little overconfident. Overconfident? Let's face it, I made a jerk of myself. After I apologize to you, I've got to crawl out there and apologize to Mrs. Markey. Uh, I wouldn't be too hasty about it. I've been putting it off for the last two hours. After the way I talked to her, I'd rather walk into a cage of lions and face her again. But I thought her husband was alive, and I thought she knew it. Then your boys have to go and pull his body out of the surf. Uh, well, that's why I called. I had a tag for an out-and-out insurance fraud. Mr. Dollar, the way it looks right now, I don't know what it is. It was probably murder. What else? Look, if you want to lose your mind, you come on over here to the morgue. Why? What do you mean? Mr. Dollar, I've been a detective for 20 years, but I've never hit one before that was as crazy as this. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Miami Beach, to the home office, Delta Liability, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Fathom 5 matter. It happened to involve a 75,000 insurance policy. 
Item 17, a dollar and 60 cents, taxi from my hotel to the county morgue. I couldn't figure what Wilson meant. When the cruiser Fathom 5 burned and sank and William Markey's body wasn't found, I thought I'd spotted an attempted insurance swindle. I'd even warned Mrs. Markey not to try to file a claim. And then, a few hours ago, Markey's drowned body had been washed up on the beach. Wilson should be happy. He'd been proven right. But instead, he'd sounded more mixed up and uncertain than he'd been before. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. You know, you don't pick the pleasantest places in the world to hold conferences. I thought you might want to take a look at him. Though I'll be eternally blasted if I know what anybody could tell by looking. Well, there's the lad who's given us all the trouble, Mr. Dollar. William Markey, number 423. I never thought I'd see him here. I told Mrs. Markey that the only thing that would convince me he wasn't alive would be to see his body. All right, I'm convinced. And I'll never try to outguess an ocean current again. Everything seemed to add up to... Oh, now, wait a minute. Uh, I wondered how long it'd be before you noticed. Doesn't make sense. Like I said on the phone, this one is crazy. This was pulled out of the surf this morning? Right. And the cruiser sank five days ago. That's when Marky supposedly drowned. You're on the beam, Mr. Dollar. This body hasn't been in the ocean for five days. You win the four-day trip to Bermuda and a complete new wardrobe. Have you had an autopsy? Doc Morgan just finished it 20 minutes ago. That's why I called you. Doc wouldn't stick around himself. You know, I think he went out to get drunk. How long does he think Marky has been dead? Not over 18 hours since sometime last night. Looks like we were both right. For whatever good it is... He was alive after the sinking, just like you claimed, and now he's dead, just like I claimed. What was the cause of death? Drowning. Only you haven't heard the real crazy part yet. Why? What do you mean? You remember we found one of his shoes washed in a couple of days ago? Yeah. The body was wearing two shoes when they pulled it out. They always make one slip, don't they? Uh, A couple in this case. Huh? It's the second one that nearly pushed Doc Morgan off his rocket. What second one? Marky was drowned, all right. But not an ocean. Huh? It was fresh water in his lungs, not seawater. Was Morgan sure? Swore by it, and then at it. That's what threw him. Yeah, I imagine. When you get an 18-hour test on a man who's supposed to have been dead for five days and find fresh water when it ought to be salt. Well, I guess the late Mr. Markey can't tell us much of anything else. So, where do we go from here, Mr. Dollar? Good question. You haven't found the car yet, huh? The one Marky bought under an assumed name? No, no, but I gave the boys an extra pride to bear down on it. Half the town force is out looking for it now. wonder where he was hiding out for those four days. What I want to know is who killed him and how and why. Oh, the why is fairly easy. It's the who and how that carry the question marks. That fingerprint ID was certain, huh? There's not the slightest doubt of what this is, William Marky. Oh, you're looking for an easy way out, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I guess I am at that. Well, then it looks like our number one is the lad you've been after all along. Young Danny Haynes, huh? What do you say we go and have a talk with him? Only one thing was wrong with the idea. It didn't work. Haynes wasn't in, and the clerk at his hotel said he hadn't seen him all day. The night clerk admitted that he'd slept through most of his shift and wasn't sure of anything. We searched Haynes' room and found nothing. So for the moment, we left it at that. Wilson put a stake out in the hotel and went back to his office. I went to my hotel and waited. Johnny Dollar. Barney Wilson. Yeah, what's up? We finally got a break. The boys found that car. Where? Parked at the curb out on the east side of town. It may have been abandoned there, or it may be where Marky was hiding out. It's in front of an apartment house. Have they checked through it yet? No, they haven't touched it. I'm leaving to go out there now. Want me to swing by and pick you up? If you don't, I'll sue you. I'll meet you out in front of the hotel. We stopped a block away and walked up to the apartment house. The car was still parked at the curb, and the plain clothes man watching it said no one had been near it. We went on inside and found the landlady, identified ourselves, and started questioning her. Luck seems to still be with us. 
Well, you see, most of my guests are permanent, as you might say. Or at least as permanent as renters ever are. Yes, we understand. In fact, the only unit I've let in the last two months is number 14. That's up one flight with a pull-down bed. When did you rent that one? Well, let's see now. I think it was um, about ten days ago. He paid a month's rent in advance. He? What was his name? Uh, Mr. Jones, Jones, a very nice, quiet, middle-aged fella. He lived by himself? Oh, yes, and never went out much. After he moved in, that is. He didn't stay here for the first four or five days after he rented it. Until the night the Fathom Five sank. When did you see Mr. Jones last? Well, it's a funny thing. He went out yesterday evening and he didn't come back at all. What kind of a car did he drive? Oh, good heavens, I don't know. But you can look for yourself. It's parked out there at the curb. A friend of his brought it by a while ago. What? What's the friend's name? Why, I didn't ask him. He's an awful nice young fella. He said Mr. Jones was going on a trip and sent him to pick up his belongings. And he had Mr. Jones's key, so I decided it was all right. He's up there packing now. Well, 13... It's the next door down there. Better take it easy. It's hard to tell what to expect. Right. Mm-hmm. He's in there, all right. Try the knob. Easy. It's locked. Then there isn't much choice. Who is it? Open up, Haynes. We want to talk to you. I said open up. Get away from that door. Watch it, Wilson. I'm warning you, don't try to come in. Well, we know now what to expect. I'll cover the door here, Dollar. You go down and tell Dave to cover the outside windows and call in for a couple of squad cars. Right. Hey, he's going out that window. There must be a fire escape. Come on, let's hit the door. <laughs> there he is at the bottom of the fire escape. Hold it, Haynes. Stay back. All right, Haynes, it's up to you. Throw down that gun or I'll drop you. I'm sorry, kid. He's down. Yeah. That second shot was dead center. I know. I tried to hold low on him, but it jumped up on me. Well, he said he'd die for her if it came to that. It came to that. It was after dark when Wilson and I drove out to the Marky Beach House. There were no lights on and nobody answered the doorbell. So Wilson forced entrance and we shook the place down. We found evidence of a struggle in the study and in the bathroom. Water from the bathtub had overflowed behind the tile and was still seeping out along the baseboard. We found a dressing gown of Mrs. Markey stuffed in the back of a closet, soaking wet. Piece by piece, Wilson collected his evidence, and the picture became more and more clear. He phoned in for a fingerprint crew and went on working. I left him there and went back into town to my hotel and took the elevator up to my room. Mr. Dollar. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. They've got extras out. They say the police shot Danny Haynes. I thought maybe you could tell me what it's all about. Sure. And what you mostly want to know is how much he talked before he died. Isn't that it, Mrs. Markey? I don't know what you mean. Then go on out to your house and ask Wilson. He's out there with a fingerprint crew. And I imagine he can tell you anything you want to know by now. I slept up last night. I thought it was Haynes who came to your door, but it wasn't. It was your husband, and you told him to come back later. Then when I left, you called Haynes and had him come over. If he said that, he lied. I even gave you the idea for it myself. When I said the only thing that could convince me your husband wasn't alive would be to see his dead body. So you talked Haynes into helping you provide the evidence I said I'd have to have. My husband's body was found in the ocean. They told me that this evening. Yeah, but he didn't die there. He was drowned in the bathtub at your house, and you and Haynes did it. You're out of your mind. Danny Haynes was lying. Then go tell Wilson. It's his job now, not mine. Maybe you'll be able to convince him, but I doubt it. And I'm pretty sure you won't be able to convince a jury. You think not. I'll get the best lawyer money can buy. Yeah, you do that, Mrs. Markey, but don't plan on using any of that insurance money for it. Why not? Because there won't be any. That policy was already void when you and Haynes killed your husband last night. An attempted fraud cancels a policy the minute it's committed. In other words, Mrs. Markey, five days ago when your husband sank the Fathom Five and tried to play dead. I don't believe it. You've lost out all the way around, Mrs. Markey. Your husband, your boyfriend, your insurance claim. 
And now you stand a pretty good chance of losing your life. A four-time loser. That's really a record. Expense account item 18, $321.60. Hotel and incidentals in Miami and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $684.95. End of account, end of report. Remarks? You quoted a line of Shakespeare at the start of this case, Ralph. Full fathom five, thy father lies. Well, you're wrong. It turns out to be the widow who lies. And lies and lies. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week. Well, if I'd minded my own business, I wouldn't have heard the girl beg for help. And from that point on, I needed help. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Barney Phillips, Carlton Young, Eleanor Audley, Sam Edwards, Shep Menken, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mr. Costello at the Plantagen Hotel in Vicksburg, Virginia. You left word? Oh, yes, Mr. Costello. I'm acting for Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance. You know, investigation. Oh? I understand you had a burglary down there. We sure did, Mr. Dollar. Well, the main reason I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Costello, was to let you know I'm getting the first plane out of Hartford as soon as the weather clears. Uh, You're coming here to Vicksburg? Yes, that's right. Eastern Seaboard Casualties asked me to investigate the burglary for them. Good. Then I'll expect you when I see you. And I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Chief Accountant, Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance Company, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the plant agent matter. Expense account item one, two dollars, cab fare, my apartment to the Hartford airport. Item two, one hundred seventy-three dollars. One airline ticket from Hartford to Vicksburg, Virginia, and back again. We took off in ten below zero weather about one thirty in the afternoon. By five o'clock, we circled into Vicksburg for a landing. Item three, five dollars, cab fare, to the Plantagen Hotel, three miles outside of town. A pleasant, spacious, gentle old building set back among the wintry trees. Fifteen minutes after checking in, Mr. Costello appeared, wrung my hand, and reported that the Vicksburg police had apprehended the burglar who had rifled the hotel safe the night before. All of the loot had been recovered. As a matter of form, I spent two hours with the police itemizing the stolen property, which was all intact. 
Then I returned to the hotel, assured Mr. Costello that everything would be all right, and got busy trying to make return reservations for Hartford. Now, the rest of this report is by way of apology for my tardiness in submitting the expense account. In between phone calls to the airport, I went downstairs to the bar for a drink and then stepped outside for a walk and a breath of fresh air. In the back of the parking lot behind the hotel, a blonde woman, about 30, in a green suit, was talking to a tall, typically dark man who had his back to me. They were arguing about something. As I walked past them, I couldn't help hearing too well. Please, please help me. Are you talking to me? Yes, please. On your way, mister. This is private. You hear me? <laughs> Just keep your hands to yourself, bud. Well, keep rolling, then. We're having a little argument, private. Please, please, I don't know who you are, but I'm... Shut up. She's uh, had a little too much to drink, mister, that's all. Oh, that's so? Well, it doesn't look that way to me. Now, what's this all about? I just told you, Nosy, she's had a little too much to drink. Now, go on, bud. Get on your way. Wait a minute. I told you to keep your hands to yourself. Yeah. You! Honey, you want to keep it up? You hear me? Yes. I hear you. And I... I'll let it go this time, mister. Just this once. Do you want to have him hauled in, miss? Oh, no. No, that's all right. It's all right. Okay, then, okay. Come on, beat it, you. Now, listen, Beat Buster. it, I said. She's tired of you, and so am I. Come on, beat it. Okay. Just remember, Amy, I was only trying to talk some sense into you. So long, hero. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was awfully kind of you. Okay, did he hurt you? Yes. Where it hurts the most, I guess. I'll never get accustomed to being disappointed in people. Oh, well, he didn't look like your type anyhow. So why don't you just... Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, hey, look now. This is just the end of everything. Everything. Yeah, I, I know well, maybe it looks that way, but, but maybe it isn't. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to have caused you all this trouble. Well, that's okay. It must look rather cheap and dingy. I mean... I don't know what I mean. Well, look, uh, let me ask you something. Did you really have too much to drink tonight? No. No, I only had one drink with him. All right, then maybe you'll let me buy you one. How about it? You're very kind. You look like you should be with someone for a little while right now. So what do you say? How about it? You're a very kind man. And that's the way it began. In the parking lot outside of the Plantation Hotel in Vicksburg, Virginia. She trembled a little when I let her back inside to the warmth of the bar and the people and sat her down at a booth. Looking back on it now, I guess we had a rather strained, one-sided conversation. She did all the listening and seemed preoccupied with her problems, whatever they were. Even though I'm not the greatest wit in the world, I did manage to get a faint smile out of her. It was a nice smile from a warm, frank mouth. Item four, two drinks for us. <laughs> That's cute. Hey, see there? Next thing you know, you'll be telling me a joke. Oh, that reminds me. That reminds me of another one. It's uh, it's one of the oldest and most respected jokes in the country. You probably heard it a thousand times. It seems ten men were standing in the rain under an umbrella, and none of them got wet. Well, just about then, a fellow walked up. You, you've been very, very kind to me. Thank you again. Well, I'm. I'm glad you feel better, Miss, uh... Are you, uh, from here in Vicksburg? No, my home's in Hartford, Connecticut. I flew down here this afternoon on business. I'm waiting for a flight out. Oh. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Thank you again, Johnny Dollar. Hmm? Thank you for not asking me my name. For not asking me about the man in the parking lot. For not asking me to explain what my trouble is. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. And thank you for sitting here with me this little while and trying to make me laugh. Hmm. You really feel all right now, huh? Yes, I think so. Good, that's swell. Because I wouldn't want to let you go if I thought you were going to step outside and start crying again. No. No, I won't do that, I promise. You sure? Positive. Okay. Ah, you want one more for the road? Oh, thank you, but I'd better not, Mr. Dollar. I really should be getting home. Well, uh, will everything be all right at home? What? Oh, 
Oh, yes. He wasn't my husband or my boyfriend, even. He won't bother me. Okay, then. Here, let me help you on with your coat. Thank you. There you are. you have a car? No, I'll get a cab. There's always one out in front. Good, I'll help you. Thank you. Say, uh, look, I'm going to tell you something. I'm staying here in Vicksburg at the plantation, and I doubt if I'll be able to get a plane out tonight. Probably not until tomorrow sometime. So, look, if you need me for any reason at all, why don't you just call me? Okay? Yes. Thank you. Good. Cab, taxi. You're still worried about him, aren't you? Why do you say that? The way you looked around when we stepped outside here just now. Would you like me to see you home? Oh, no. No, thank you. You've done enough already. And about him, I made a mistake, that's all. Oh, we all make mistakes, so forget about it. Well, I'm afraid this one can't be corrected very easily. But here's my cab. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night. You and I will probably never meet again. But I shan't forget your kindness. Thank you. Okay, good night. Downtown, please. I hope you have a nice trip home, Mr. Dollar. Hey. Hello, driver, hold it. Hey, anything wrong? What is it? I don't know. I have the strangest feeling. Wait a minute, driver. Hey, look, do you feel all right? You're shivering. Yes, I... I know I... Oh, it hurts. What what hurts? It hurts. I didn't think he... What what is it? What can I do? Help me. Please, Mr. Dollar. Help me. Let's go, driver. She fell back across the seat of the cab, writhing with pain. I took her in my arms and tried to find out what it was, but by that time she wasn't able to speak. In another ten seconds she was unconscious. The cab driver delivered us to an emergency hospital five minutes later. They carried her in through the ambulance entrance. I let the driver go and waited around the desk to see if I could learn what happened. Just waited. Vicksburg emergency. Waited. One moment, please. Go ahead, please. Vicksburg emergency. Not at this time of the night, sir. You'll have to call first thing in the morning. I'd suggest any time after 7.30. Yes, sir. Yes? Hey, uh, look, would it be all right to go back and talk to the doctor now? I'm afraid not, sir. Well, could you bring him out here? I've been waiting for quite... I'm sure he'll be out in a very short while. He knows you're waiting to talk with him. I thought maybe he forgot me. No, sir. I just want to make sure she's all right. The doctor will be out. Vicksburg emergency. Just a moment, I'll connect you. Go ahead, please. Has she had many of these attacks, sir? Hmm. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I just met her. Oh. Well, if you'd like, we could call you at home and let you know how she is. This isn't my home. I'm on my way out of town as soon as I can get a plane. I'll wait. Certainly. Excuse me. Yes, doctor? Yes, he's right here. Yes, sir, thank you. The doctor will see you now, sir. Good, thanks. End of the hall, room 111. Okay, thank you. I don't know what it was or why that hallway looked so long to me. Call it an old-fashioned premonition or what have you. That's what I had walking down the hall to see a doctor about a girl I'd known only a few minutes. There were three people in the room, two doctors in their white clothes and a nurse. I can still see the light burning above their heads, the way they looked tired, exhausted. All three of them had been working very hard. Doctor? Yes? Oh, uh, you're the man who was with her. Yeah, that's right. How is she? When did this happen? About a half hour ago. I put her in a cab at the Plantagen Hotel, and she complained of feeling sick. So I brought her here, but she lost consciousness in the cab. I see. Sit down, please. Oh, why? Some papers we want you to fill out. Just routine. Oh. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. And she is Mrs. Dollar? No. Oh, I see. Uh, You're a friend of hers, Mr. Dollar. Well, yes. Look, what is it, Doctor? What's the matter with her? I can't exactly tell you that right now, Mr. Dollar. What? Well, now, wait a minute. Why can't you... We have to contact her family first, Mr. Dollar. This girl is dead. 
Now, if you're willing to... Picture it. Yourself in my position, I mean. I'd known the girl only a few minutes. I didn't even know her name. Yet somehow I'd become closely involved with her. Too much so, I guess. All I knew about her was that she was someone who had died while asking me to help her. Under the circumstances, what would you do? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, how can you help a dead girl? Somebody had to help her. And guess who? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Are you the Mr. Dollar from Hartford? That's right. Who's this? Jim Akins, Vicksburg Police Department. I'm sending a call over to pick you up, Mr. Dollar. Some questions I want to ask you about that young lady you were with last night. I hope you weren't planning on leaving town. Of course I wasn't. I canceled my plane reservations last night. If you tell me where you're located, I'll come down by myself. No sense getting head up. You aren't in your own backyard now, you know, Dollar. I know where I am, the town where a girl died in my arms. If you can stop getting lazy with me for a minute, maybe you can tell me who she was. Why? Because I'd like to talk to her family. I was the last one to see her alive. Who is she? We haven't identified her yet. To us, she's still Jane Doe. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Vicksburg, Virginia, to... <laughs> to Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the plantation matter. A real mystery about a very mysterious girl who happened to be dead. Expense account item five, ten cents, one morning newspaper, which carried a two-inch story and a half-inch space about an unidentified girl who had died at Vicksburg Emergency Hospital the previous evening. I was reading it over in the lobby of the plantation hotel when one of the Vicksburg police force stepped up to the desk and asked for my room number. He was a swarthy man in a black suit, plain clothes type. Well? I beg pardon? I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh. Jim Akins. We talked on the phone a little while ago. You said you were sending a car. Well, you sounded so huffy about everything, I thought I'd drop over myself to say hello. I got the car outside. Okay, okay, let's go then. Where are you from, Dollar? Hartford, Connecticut. I'm an insurance investigator. Look, I talked to a man in your burglary division yesterday about the burglary they had at the hotel yesterday. I was sent down here by Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance Company. You got any identification on you? Yeah, sure. Here. Okay. Look like who you say you are. 
Now, just what was your connection with that girl who died at the emergency hospital? I met her outside in the parking lot last night, back at this hotel. She was with a man. I don't know who he was. They were having an argument. I stopped when she asked me to help her. I, uh, I got rid of the man and took her inside here and bought her a drink. Then I started to put her in a cab to send her home. But she got sick before the cab could take off, so I took her to the hospital. She died there. And that, Mr. Akins, is it. How long did you know her? About a half hour, all told. She didn't tell you her name? No. Where she lived? No. Hmm. The name of this man she was with in the parking lot, who was he? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, what kind of trouble was she having with him? She didn't tell me that either. I didn't ask her. But you sat in the cocktail lounge over there and you had a drink or two. One. One. No name, no address, no nothing. Well, maybe we better do all our talking downtown. Anything you say, Higgins. Let's go. Higgins turned out to be a lieutenant. And it took him the whole ride downtown to thaw out and make up his mind that I was just as concerned about what had happened to the unidentified girl as he was. He rephrased, but asked me the same questions in front of a stenographer when we got down to his office. He was still asking me questions when he led me and the police stenographer to the basement of the building, the morgue. And she didn't say anything to you about herself before she collapsed, huh? No. All I know is what I've told you. You're sure? Positive. Hey, look, let me ask you one. I've put up with yours for over an hour now. (laughs) Why, sure. What killed her? Yeah. Well, do you know? No, we're still trying to find out. What did you talk about while you were having a drink with her? She asked me for help, that's all. It seems she needed somebody else to do the talking at the time, so I did it. I made jokes and tried to get her to laugh. I was a great big cut-up. Get sawed me if you want it. It won't do much good. Still got some things to find out. Yeah. Lousy, ain't it? It sure is. This is the girl you were with last night? Yes. You're positive? I'm positive. Okay, Dolly, you want to sign this for the records? Well, that's... That's good. All right, Sam, you can send this on upstairs. We'll be up pretty soon. Now, Dolly, did anyone there at the hotel bar seem to know her? I don't know. Cocktail waitress, somebody like that? I don't know. Well, I do. We asked around. No one there had ever seen in the Plantagen Hotel before. Tell me something, Dolly. You ever worked on one like this? No, not quite. Okay, then. I'm going to tell you what we're up against. All the clothes she was wearing was standard brand stuff. Mostly come from stores downtown. Some of them New York. It's going to take us a long time to check them out. We may not be able to trace them at all. We're going to work on the cleaning marks, too, and that'll take time. And from what you say and from what she said, and that wasn't much, she's probably a local girl. Somebody's wondering about her, but nobody come in and make out a report asking for her. I hate to do it. I might have to take a picture, run it in tonight's paper, just to find out who she is. That could be pretty lousy for somebody. It's a lousy business. I thought you could help me, Dollar. How? Well, two things. One, that bird she was with. He was arguing with out in the parking lot, you say. That meant he must have had a car out there. But you didn't bother to take a look at it. No, no, I didn't. And another thing now, where's her purse? I don't know. Well, she must have powdered her nose when she sat down to have that drink with you. Every woman does. She must have reached for a cigarette or something in that purse. So where's that purse? I don't know. Well, now, you see? You see how much help you are to me? Oh, just a second. Morg, Lieutenant Akins. Oh, yeah, put him on. While Lieutenant Akins talked on the telephone, I lit a cigarette. After that, I tried to interest myself in a calendar that was hanging on the wall. After that, I tried tying both shoelaces. But wherever my eyes roved around that white-tiled room, somehow, they always came back to rest on the quiet, still form of the girl who'd asked me for help. By any standard, she was attractive. Fine, golden hair spun out of smooth white skin. I remember her eyes had been very big and very brown. Now they were closed. But she looked more asleep than than what she was. She looked as though she might wake up any minute and answer me if I said out loud what I was saying to myself silently. How can I help you? 
Let's get out of here, Dollar. Okay by me. That was the lab on the phone. Had a little trouble with analysis. What analysis? What kind of trouble? Identifying. They called in a toxicologist from the university. A drug called perimythol killed her. Perimythol? That's a new one on me. Yeah, me too. Petrol-based stuff. Now, they figured it'd been in her stomach an hour or so before she collapsed. Could be a suicide, judging from the way she acted and talked to you. What about the boyfriend? Well, that seems to fit in okay. Told you she was disappointed in him, didn't you? Well, sometimes women want to end it all in front of a guy they're having trouble with. It'll probably turn out that Oh, way. you talk like a cop, Akins. That's what I Everything's am. Everything's so simple. Make it fit into your formula. This girl knocked herself off because she lost her boyfriend. This girl killed herself because she lost a job. Fill it in, fill it in. Get it off the whoa, books. Whoa, Bedala, whoa. What's the matter with you? What are you getting at? Oh, Oh, I don't know. Forget it, will you, Lieutenant? No, now, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. I'm not all cop, Dollar. I saw her laying there, too. And I can see she was a nice girl. And something went awful wrong with her. If I'd been the last one to be with and talk to her live, why, I'd probably be taking it the same way you are. But take it easy. Sorry, Lieutenant. Yeah. I'll buy you some breakfast. He did... But it didn't help much. And after that, we shook hands and parted. Expense account item six, two dollars. Cab fare back to the Plantagen Hotel. I went up to my room, packed my bags, called the airport, and made arrangements to leave on the six o'clock plane. There was nothing more I could do about the case. Nothing more at all. It was police business. I had time before the plane for a quiet drink at the hotel bar. What's your pleasure, sir? Oh, some of that little water. Yes, sir. You, uh, you on duty last night by any chance? Yes, sir. Why you ask? I just wondered if you happen to remember me. No, sir. Uh, uh, were you at the bar? At that table over there with a the lady, a blonde girl in a green suit. Well, I'm sorry. I just don't remember. Well, here you go. Thanks. Here. Keep the change. Well, thank you, sir. Now, I probably waited on you, but, well, uh, so many people, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, why you ask? The lady lost her purse. Thought maybe it might have been turned in here. No, sir. We didn't get any places last night. Uh, a couple of money clips is all. <laughs> yeah, not much in them, either. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're talking about the lady who died later on, ain't you, sir? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Uh, police officers was in here asking the same questions. I thought they would be. You, uh, policeman, too? No, I was a friend of hers. Oh. Well, uh, then you should call the police. They're still trying to find out her name. So am I. Hmm? Well, I thought you said she was a friend of yours. I didn't happen to know her name. It didn't seem important to ask it last night. I just don't understand. I can tell you one thing. I might have saved her life if I'd asked her name. And some other things. Oh. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Expense account item seven, three dollars, three drinks. I sat there for almost an hour talking to the bartender. Once, when he stepped out to the kitchen, I went over to the booth where I'd sat the night before with the unidentified dead girl. I searched down in the cushions behind the table under the chairs, hoping the missing purse might still be around. I found nothing. Then I had another idea. I left, went out to the parking lot where I'd first seen her. Got your car, mister? No, I don't have one. Oh. Well? Hey, look, uh, last night I was out here with a lady. I, I met her and a man here in the parking lot, uh, about over there where that Chevy is. Uh-huh. So what? Well, the lady lost her purse last night. I just wondered if it, it might have been lost out here someplace. Well, it might have been. Nobody turned anything into me. Want to take a look? Sure, good. All right. About what time last night? Oh, around 10, maybe a few minutes after. Uh-huh. A lot of cars in and around that time of night. Did you look last night? No, I didn't know it was missing until this morning. Oh. About here, you say, huh? Here's the Chevy. Yeah. Well, let's take a look. Yeah, make it a good look. Yeah. Huh? Hey! I think you're in luck. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, here's a purse. Hey, <laughs> you're in real luck. Is that hers? It was hers, all right. A green suede purse, the same color as the green suit she'd been wearing. It still carried the faint sweet odor of her perfume as I remembered it. I looked inside, but there was nothing to tell me her name. 
Lipstick, comb, a $10 bill, and some small change. And one other item. A 32 automatic, recently fired. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a dead girl's 38 automatic comes to life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the hotel operator. Ready with your call, Mr. Dollar. Oh, good. Police Department, Sergeant Peters. I want to talk to somebody in the personnel division. Uh, Sorry, I haven't got one. What can I do for you? I want to get some information about a gun, find out who it was licensed to and so on. Uh, Come down to licensing division. I think we can help you there. Where's that? Uh, 220 City Hall. Uh, Do you have the weapon? Uh, yes. Be sure and bring it along with you. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Special Investigator Johnny Dollar for personal reasons. Location, Vicksburg, Virginia. Purpose? Well, it all started as an investigation of a burglary at the Plantagen Hotel. Once that was out of the way, I happened to run across a girl having an argument with a man in the hotel parking lot. She asked me to help her. I did. Girl suddenly gets sick and dies. Poison. I stay around to help find out who she is. I don't know that. But I do know that she had a 38 in her purse. Three bullets recently fired. Expense account item eight, two dollars. Cab fare from the Plantagen Hotel to two miles into Vicksburg City Hall in room 220 as per instructions of Sergeant Peters. I felt more than a little guilty bypassing Lieutenant Jim Akins, who had questioned me earlier about the case. Yes? Sergeant Peters? That's right. Can I help you, sir? I hope so. I'd like to know if this gun's been registered with you people. Well, let's have a look. Hmm. You just buy it? Uh, yeah. Got your bill of sale with you? What, do you have to have one? You should. Who'd you buy it from? Oh, a fellow I met in a bar. Have you a permit to carry this weapon? Well, no, I haven't. Are you going to carry it? Oh, no, no, no. Then why'd you buy it? Oh, I just wanted it, that's all. Is there a law against that? No, no. But there's a law against practically every other thing about a gun. You want to read those numbers off to me? Sure. JJJ-4769-9923. And then there's an X. Okay. Make, Colt, caliber, 38, automatic, 7-shot. Yeah. Here, you'll have to fill this out. Pencil's over there. This will take a minute for me to check... It took 15 minutes. In the meantime, I filled out the form, which 
notify the Vicksburg police that I was in possession of the above described weapon, that I did not wish to apply for a permit to carry it, and so forth and so forth. After that, I stood around and smoked a cigarette and wondered if I should step downstairs and tell Lieutenant Jim Akins that I had found Jane Doe's purse and the gun. But before I had time to make up my mind... Here we go. The gun was purchased in 1950 by the Piedmont Banking Service. That's a local armored truck outfit over on Maple Street. The gun was permitted for carrying to Raymond W. O'Connell, 232 Polk Street, this city. Thanks. Raymond O'Connell? Yeah. Anything else? Well, that's all. Thanks. That was when I could have, but didn't, walk downstairs to Lieutenant Aiken's office. Instead, I walked outside with a gun in my pocket and the slip of paper containing the name and address of the man who had carried it, Raymond O'Connell. Expense account item 9, $25. Deposit on a rented car to get me to 232 Polk Street. Darling, you're early. I'm hardly ready. Hello. Oh, I was expecting someone else. I'm so sorry. You're not Paul, are you? No, I'm afraid not. My name's Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar? That's right. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? I'm looking for Raymond O'Connell. Ray? Yes. Come inside, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I really didn't mean to throw myself at you at the door. I thought you were someone else I'm expecting. Uh, I'm Terry. Terry? Teresa. Terry O'Connell, Mr. Dollar. Oh, his wife? I'm Ray's widow. What? Ray's dead, Mr. Dollar. Passed away over a year ago. It was pneumonia. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Connell. Please call me Terry. You had no way of knowing about him, I'm sure. And please don't be uncomfortable. A great many of Ray's friends from the service come by who have no idea that he's dead. Were you in his company, too? Oh, just a minute, Mrs. O'Connell. I he think you He had you're... so many friends and met so many people while he was in the service, and really there was no way for you to you know. You don't understand, Mrs. O'Connell. I never knew. I'll get knew. you a drink and we'll talk. Where did you serve with Ray? You know, he finally became a pilot. What do you like to drink? She was young and dark and very pretty. And as the widow of a man who died rather suddenly, she was doing her best to put me at my ease. I would have told her I was there checking out the registration on a 38 that had been used by her dead husband. I would have told her I found the gun in the purse of an unidentified dead girl I'd met the night before. But she was trying to be polite, mistaking me for a friend of her dead husband. And then I saw the picture in the frame on the mantel. A broad, smiling face that belonged to a man I'd met in the parking lot of the Plantagen Hotel. An unidentified man who had been arguing with the dead girl. The words on the picture said, To Terry, all my love. Do you know him? Paul? Paul? Yes, Paul Dameron. I think I met him once. I really didn't know his name. Was he a friend of your husband, of Ray's? Oh, no. No, he never knew Ray. He's a darling, Mr. Dollar. Paul is. A real darling. After Ray died, I tried something very foolish. I tried to end my life. And then Paul came into it. He's been very lovely to me. We're... Well, I don't know why I shouldn't tell you. We're going to be married. I think that's fine, Terry. Do you really? Sure. I'm glad you say that. I'm not the most courageous person in the world... I suppose Ray mentioned our lives together. It was perfect with Ray, Mr. Dollar. Perfect. But now Ray's gone. And I've been able to face that. I think I'm going to find a new life with Paul. You must meet him. He'll be here soon. We're dining out tonight. Well, perhaps you'll join us. Well, thank you, Mrs. O'Connell, but I I can't make it tonight. How long will you be in Vicksburg? I don't know exactly. Where are you staying? The Plantagen Hotel. Well, perhaps I could give you a ring and we could make it another night. I know you want to talk about Ray. Of course, Paul understands. I'm sure he does. 
He's truly a wonderful person. He hadn't looked very wonderful the night before, standing in the parking lot arguing with a girl who had died. But then that was my side of the picture, and it wasn't complete. And somebody still had to explain the 38 with the three bullets missing. I left Terry O'Connell, went outside and bought an evening paper, and then sat in my rented car reading it. The photographer at the morgue had done a good job. The unidentified girl's picture was on page one. I was reading the story over a second time when a dark business coupe pulled up behind me and Paul Dameron got out, heading for Terry O'Connell's doorway. Just a minute. What? Just a minute. Hello, Paul. What? You. Yeah, me. Now look, Dameron. What are you doing here? How'd you know my name? Or are you some professional gunsel coming around to sock me again? I still oh, don't... stop th- it, will you, Dameron? My name's Johnny Dollar. I want you to tell me who that girl was last night in the parking lot. The one you had the big argument with. Huh? Oh. Well, you were the big hero there, butting in where it was none of your business. I didn't like it then, and I... All right, simmer down, will you? Who was she? Come on, what's her name? What's it to you? Oh, Dameron. Okay, okay. It's Amy. Amy Duran. Amy Duran. Yeah. We work at the same office. Now, look, Buster, I'm not afraid of you, but I... I don't want any trouble, see? So if you'll just go somewhere else and... Wait a minute, will you? How does Amy Duran tie in with Teresa O'Connell? Look, I don't know who you are or what you're after, but you've certainly got your nerve about... Answer me, Paul. Okay, okay. Terry is Amy's sister. Satisfied? I don't know. Who are you, anyhow? A policeman or something? My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm here because Because of Because if you aren't, I want to know what right you have to ask me all these questions. Cool off, will you? I've been trying to find out who she is. Because last night after you went off, we had a drink together. Then she got sick and I took her to a hospital. She died there. What? She died. She's lying in the morgue right now, unidentified. It was some kind of poison that killed her. Amy. Dead? No, I don't believe it. Here. It's in the paper tonight. The police are trying to identify her right now. I... I can't believe it. Poison. Oh, Dollar, I, I didn't think Amy was that desperate. There was a way out. She could have solved it without this. Way out of what? It... There was no need for her to do this. I told her I'd help her... I had no idea she... Poison. Does Terry know? Not yet. I, I've got to tell her before she sees it like this in the newspaper. It'll be awful for a dollar awful. Look, I apologize for the way I've acted. The way I was last night, I... I was upset. I can see now you're trying to help. Now, let me go in and break this to Terry. Call me later. Here. Here. My card. Call me. I had to admit that Paul Dameron's concern seemed as genuine as his surprise. He rushed up to be admitted to the O'Connell house. After he was inside the door, I went back to my car and took out the 38 automatic that had led me to the sister of Amy O'Connell. Three bullets still missing. I drove downtown to the Vicksburg police station to turn the gun into Lieutenant Akins and tell him the whole story as I knew it. How I'd found the gun in the dead girl's purse. How I'd managed to find out her name. The three missing bullets and other unanswered questions were up to the police. Yeah, well, I... I... Oh, hi, Dollar. Thought you'd left town. Joe? All right, Joe. As soon as they clear that place up, you notify the lab. Hi, Lieutenant. Hi. I'm trying to get to you. I think I have something that better be looked into. Oh, really? Oh, excuse me. Lieutenant Akins. Yeah. On the south side of town. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, in about 15 minutes. Right. I'm sorry, Della. What was it you were saying? Why all the hustle? Something big? A uh, homicide. Happened yesterday sometime. Yeah? Who got it? A guy named Belden. Somebody shot him three times with a 38. Now... Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, information about the gun that blows the whole case sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours 
truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mr. Oldfield calling, sir. You've left word at my office, Mr. Dollar. That's right, Mr. Oldfield. I think I'm going to need an attorney. Divorce, civil suit, what, Mr. Dollar? Withholding evidence, murder. Let's take the murder first. Who did it? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I have the murder weapon in my possession right now. Who was killed? A man named Belden, I think. What do you want me to do, sir? Take my statement, notarize it, give me some legal advice. Where are you? Police station in the pay booth down the hall from Homicide. I'll meet you there in five minutes. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Vicksburg, Virginia. To Special Investigator Johnny Dollar for personal reasons. Attention, Chief Accountant, Eastern Seaboard Casualty Insurance Corporation, Providence, Rhode Island. Dear Jim, I'm attaching my own expense sheet to your bill for clarification purposes. Expense account item 10, 10 cents. One cup of coffee at the counter in the lobby of the Vicksburg Police Station while I waited for Samuel W. Oldfield, attorney at law, to appear. He was there in exactly five minutes. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Sam Oldfield, sir. You're the only one here in the lobby, so I figured you were the right man. Yeah. Cup of coffee, Mr. Oldfield? No, thanks. Gives me heartburn. But now sit down, will you? That was a pretty interesting phone call. Tell me, who are you, sir? Johnny Dollar. I'm a private insurance investigator. Mm -hmm. How'd you get my name? I looked it up in the yellow pages of the telephone directory. You don't live here in Vicksburg? No, I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. All right, sir. Now, tell me about the murder and the withholding of information. (sighs) Maybe I better start from the top. Go right ahead, any way you like. Well, two days ago, I flew down here to investigate a small burglary at the Plantagen Hotel. It was already solved by the time my plane got in. Police? Yeah. I had nothing better to do, so I waited around the hotel bar for my return reservation back to Hartford. And then I happened to walk outside to the parking lot for a breath of fresh air. I saw a woman and a man standing there arguing. When I got close to them, the woman asked me to help her. I did. How do you mean? Well, the, the man she was with started to act like a kid. He got rough. So I shoved him away. Go on. Well, the woman was upset. So I took her inside the hotel and bought her a drink. After that, I put her in a cab and started to send her on her way. She started to act sick about that. Wait. Is this the woman whose picture was in the paper tonight? The one who died of poisoning and the police don't know who she is? Yeah. I don't know who she is, Mr. Oldfield. Except that her name's Amy Duran. I found out her name because I found her purse and there was a gun in it. A thirty-eight Colt registered to a man named O'Connell. I checked on the gun here at headquarters, went out to the address and found out O'Connell was a bank guard and had died about a year ago. I talked to his wife, Teresa O'Connell. While I was there, the man I'd seen the night before showed up. His name's Paul Dameron. Now, I didn't tell him or Mrs. O'Connell about the gun. I came down here to give it to the police and tell them. But when I got here, Lieutenant Akins was pretty busy trying to solve the murder of a man named Belden, who'd been shot with a thirty-eight. 
Three times. There are three slugs missing from the gun I found. You got a light, sir? Yeah. Here you go. When you uh, found Amy Duran's purse, why didn't you turn it over to the police? Oh, I thought I... Well, somehow I thought maybe I could help the girl. I mean, her last words before she died were, help me. And for some reason or other, I, I thought maybe I could. Do you have any cards or letters, anything like that? Something that says you're what you say you are, sir? Yeah, sure. Let's see. Okay, Dollar. Now, as I see it, you probably hooked up with someone who did some shooting. And that's what worries you. I want you to take my statement and notarize it before I turn the gun in. That'll protect you some. If they want to get nasty, they can, though. You know that. Yeah, I know. Well, as I see it, the main job here is to try to keep you out of trouble. And a statement explaining your motive for participation in the whole affair might help. That's why I called you. All right, then. Now, Dollar. Yeah? You didn't shoot anybody, did you? No. Okay, then, sir. Let's go over to my office. We did, and I made the necessary statement, and Mr. Oldfield notarized it. After that, I went back to the Vicksburg police station to talk to Lieutenant Akins. The 38 i I'd found in Amy Duran's purse was still in my pocket, and her words were still in my mind. Help me. Please help me. Thought you was going back to Hartford, Dollar. Oh, I uh, decided to hang around and see what came up. Mm-hmm. Well, nothing so far on the girl. No one's recognized a picture in the paper. Had to turn that over to missing persons. This murder case going to eat up all my time. What happened, Lieutenant? Oh, maid at the apartment house where this man Belden was staying found him late this afternoon. He'd been dead about 24 hours, shot with a thirty-eight. You sure? I'm sure. We did a post-mortem right away. It's a pretty sad case. You, uh, you know who shot him? <laughs> Have a pretty good idea. See, this Belden, he was an auditor working on some books at a firm of textile wholesalers here. Richmond Limited. The papers scattered around his apartment show he'd found a $10,000 shortage going over their books. And the chief accountant for this Richmond company is missing. Yeah, well, that does make it seem pretty clean. Yeah, but... all we have to do is find that accountant. Had an APB out for half an hour now. I think we'll pick her up pretty soon. Her? Who? Well, her, Dollar. The chief accountant for Richmond Limited. She's a woman. Name of, uh, Amy Duran. To all appearances, Amy Duran had been guilty of embezzling money and murdering the auditor Belden who discovered the shortages in her books. I didn't tell Akins that his suspect was the girl lying in the morgue at the moment unidentified. I knew that it was only a matter of minutes before her sister or Paul Dameron would be down to identify her. And for the third time, I didn't tell Lieutenant Akins about the gun. I knew if I turned that over to him, it would be a closed case all around. And somehow I didn't want it closed on Amy Duran. Not that way. For that reason, I went back to my hotel room for a couple of hours and... Then about 9 o'clock that night, I found myself over on Polk Street at Teresa O'Connell's house once more. Oh. Hello, Mrs. O'Connell. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes. Oh, well, Mr. Dollar, I, I had the most awful news tonight. My sister Amy... She's dead. You'll have to excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. May I come in? I'd like to talk to you about your sister, Mrs. O'Connell. Well, I... I... Paul came in with tonight's paper and showed me Amy's picture. He went down the morgue to identify her. I couldn't bear to. Sure. I feel somehow, in some way, that... Your friend, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. O'Connell, I am a friend in a way. But mostly I'm an insurance investigator. What? You thought I was a friend of your dead husband when I came here earlier. I'm not. I never even knew him. But, Mr. Dollar, I don't understand. I met your sister, Amy, last night. I was the last one to speak to her before she died. I took her to the emergency hospital last night. Well, wait, wait. This is all very confusing. 
You say you're insurance investigator? Yes. Now, when... Well, I got your address from a gun I found in your sister's purse. I traced it through the license to carry. This gun, Mrs. O'Connell. Your husband was licensed to carry it when he worked for a banking firm. Do you recognize it? Oh, yes, I suppose I do. I think it's one of Ray's guns. Now, please, but... please, let me find something out first. Believe me, I do want to help. Did you know your sister had this gun? Oh, no, I... What would Amy want with a gun? I mean, well, she could have picked it up here any time she came over and probably did. But why would Amy have a gun in her purse? Sit down, please. Now, Mrs. O'Connell, you better listen to me carefully. Sometime late yesterday afternoon or early evening, a man named Belden was shot and killed. Clarence Belden? Yes. Why, he worked with an auditing firm. Amy spoke of him. Mr. Dollar. Wait now, wait. Listen to the rest of this. Belden had been working on books for Richmond Limited. As I understand it, your sister Amy was responsible for those books. Right now, the police have enough evidence to figure that your sister stole $10,000 from Richmond Limited. Amy? Oh, no. Now, no, Now, hear me out, Mrs. Not... O'Connell. They have that evidence in bulk form. They certainly have reason to assume, and they are assuming, that your sister shot Belden to keep him quiet about the shortage. How can you say those things about Amy when she's not here to defend herself? Please, please, I'm just telling you what's going on downtown, what they've found. This gun they don't have yet. I've withheld it. It has been fired three times recently. Belden was shot three times. By now, your sister's body has no doubt been identified. They've already established that she died of poisoning... And they halfway have the idea that she committed suicide. No. Oh, don't you see? They'll say she shot Belden to cover up and keep it quiet. And then saw how useless it was. Took poison and killed herself to escape punishment. You're horrible. Horrible. Go away. Go away from me. I'm sorry, but in the face of all this, I want to help her if I can. If it isn't too late. I want to help you. But, Mrs. O'Connell, you'll have to help me. Now, why? Why would your sister steal? Why? I don't know. I think you do know. Tell me, please, for her sake, Mrs. O'Connell. Why? What have you got to do with her? I met her only for a few minutes, but in that few minutes, I got the idea that she was a pretty nice person. She didn't strike me as a thief. She didn't look like a killer. And most of all, she didn't look like a woman who'd take the suicide way out of things. Now, that's all I have, except that she asked me to help her. And I'm trying to do that now. Believe me, I want to help her if I can. I've always been an awful child, Mr. Dollar. When Ray died, I tried to kill myself. Amy saved me. I remember then, at the hospital. She was beside my bed, and she said to me, I'll make you want to live again. I'll make you. Amy was always like that, kind and decent. You weren't wrong about her. She was decent, thoughtful, good. She, she did everything for me. She gave me these clothes and a car, introduced me to nice people from her office like Paul, Paul Dameron. Yes. That must be where all the money went to. Not on herself, but on me, for me. I'm the only reason I can think of that she'd take money from the firm. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know she was stealing from me. I didn't know. I wouldn't have let her do it. She didn't have to pamper me that much. I'm not that much of a child. She didn't have to do it. She didn't have to do it. Wait. Wait a minute. She didn't kill herself. She didn't steal. She didn't murder that man. I did all those things because it was all for me. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, all the evidence comes true. A helpless dead girl gets her help. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Paul Dameron, Mr. Dollar. I was afraid you left town and I wanted to talk to you. Mm Mm-hmm. I wanted to thank you for your kindness about Amy and the way you handled Terry. It was darn decent of you. And, of course, I want to apologize for my attitude again. How's Mrs. O'Connell? Terrible. I mean, the papers this morning connected her sister Amy with murdering Belden and committing suicide. I'm curious. How did you get to her? I found Amy's purse and there was a gun in it. I looked up the registration. Oh, the murder gun. I don't know. I haven't turned it over to the police yet. Why? Because I still can't believe Amy Duran was the kind of girl who'd shoot a man and then take poison. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Vicksburg, Virginia. To Special Investigator Johnny Dollar for personal reasons. In connection with the plant agent matter. Expense account item 11, $15, legal fees. For services rented by lawyer Sam Oldfield. Now sign here, Dollar. And here, sir. Okay, I guess that's it. What now, Mr. Oldfield? This statement you've made to me clearly states your intentions in this matter, your motives. You attempted to help a girl who died in your company. You had no idea she might have committed a murder or embezzled $10,000. You withheld evidence, the gun you found in her purse, in the hope of identifying her and saving her family some grief. I hope you don't have to use this stuff. We'll see. I'm going to turn the gun in now, and you're coming with me. It's about time. Hmm? Nothing personal, son. I think you did a lot of dumb things for her. From what they're saying in the papers about her, I don't think she deserved it. But then we all make wrong guesses sometimes, I suppose. Ah, let's get this over with. Lawyer Sam Oldfield accompanied me downtown to police headquarters where we sought out Lieutenant Akins and turned over the thirty-eight automatic. Oldfield handed the statement over to him, and he read it through. Then he called in his ballistics man to make an immediate check of the gun. When he'd done that, Akins asked Oldfield and myself to wait. He left. An hour later, he came back. You are a lucky boy, Dollar. First off, I'm going to tell you, that gun you've been withholding, that's the same weapon that killed the auditor, Clarence Belden. Okay, now, you played it as safe as you could, and you hired this lawyer to protect you when it came to turning it in. Well, you didn't need him. Huh? Any other time, I'd have put you in the poker so fast you'd have thought you was born there. This time, I'm feeling generous. You can go, Mr. Oldfield. Me? It's you. No charges against Mr. Dollar of withholding information? No, not this time. I got my Jane Doe identified. I know her motive for killing the auditor. I know why she took the poison. You generally don't get everything in a neat package like that, so... I feel generous. Then let's get out here, Dollar. You get out. I want to talk to Dollar. Then I'll stay. Listen. It's okay, Mr. Oldfield. I'm going to get a lecture is all. Are you sure? Yeah. Call me later, then. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Yeah. One thing more, Dollar. We found an empty bottle of paramythol in Amy Duran's medicine cabinet, and that cinches that suicide part, in case you had any doubts. It's a closed case. Uh Uh-huh. But you didn't help me close it, Dollar, and you could have. You worked with the police for years. You were an officer yourself once. What makes you think you can come down here and run around doing all these things you've done and get away with? Why didn't you turn that gun in with the purse as soon as you found it? All right, I'll tell you, because I... Oh, it doesn't make any difference now, Lieutenant. You've got your case. And you're lucky, darn lucky boy. I don't have you, too. Because you know just well as I do that... Lieutenant Akins. Okay, right away. Dollar, I got business to take care of. Next time you're in my town, (laughs) you take it easy. I will. But I don't think I'll ever come to your town again. On general principles. 
Well, I guess I know how you felt about that girl. I'm not going to make any fuss about what you did. But I don't think I'd let it pass a second time. She sure didn't look the part, did she? No, she didn't. Well, happens that way sometimes. What you told me about that kid's sister of hers trying suicide and so forth after she lost her husband. Well, Amy Duran had a good motive for stealing that money. If motive can ever be good. Dollar, Lieutenant? Huh? I, uh, I was just on my way to see you, Lieutenant. I'll be back in my office in a couple of minutes. You can go on in and wait, Mr. Dameron. I'm glad I saw you, Mr. Dollar. I think there's something I should explain to you. You'd be interested in this, too, Lieutenant. Mr. Dollar saw me arguing with Amy Duran in a parking lot at the Plant Agent Hotel last night. She just told me about the shortage in accounts. She hadn't told me about killing the auditor. I want you to know that I was racking my brain trying to find a way to get hold of some money to make up the shortage. I was always very fond of Amy. I, uh, wonder, Mr. Dollar, if I could give you a check. Huh? Something for your kindness. Nothing, thanks. Well, I... I'd like to. You did something very decent. No. Oh. Well, I suppose you'll be leaving soon. Goodbye and thanks again. I'll, uh, be in your office, Lieutenant. Right. <laughs> Got to him, too, if it's any comfort. What was that business in the parking lot? Oh, well, I, I hit him. He was arguing with her, that's all. No. You weren't the only one trying to help a dollar. Him. And then there was somebody else. Huh? A bank. We found a certified check for $10,000 in Amy Duran's apartment. What? National Trust in New York, issued three days ago. I wired the head cashier in New York. He said Amy Duran phoned him long distance, requested the loan. Seems her folks, when they were alive, had a good pull. Wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. And this isn't right. She could have covered that shortage. Well, I figure she intended to do that, but the auditor found out too quick. He called her on it, and she shot him. With a $10,000 check in her hand? Well... There isn't an auditor or a bonding company going that wouldn't prefer to turn up the cash than the person who took it. They'd listen to any reasonable story. You know that. Well, the auditor must have scared her, Dollar. She shot him, didn't she? She committed suicide, didn't she? You make a lot of noise, Higgins, but you aren't any happier about this than I am, are you? No. Why let the papers have it the way it is? Well, so that whoever knows Ansel will get careless. Sure, it burns me. Somebody thinking the police are as dumb as this. Burns me. Well, what are you going to do? Wait. Just wait. I found that pretty hard to do. And the more I waited and the more I thought about the matter, the more restless I felt. So I didn't wait. I got out and started interviewing people who had known the murdered auditor. The consensus was that he knew his business. That if he'd found a shortage and someone offered to reimburse the company, he had been the kind of old hand who would have listened to them. Why, I asked myself, if Amy Duran had a $10,000 check to cover her shortages, why did she shoot the auditor and then commit suicide? Why? It didn't make sense. Oh, Dollar. Hello, Dameron. Come in, Dollar. I'm uh, glad you dropped by. I thought you'd left town, gone back to Hartford. Well, I've stayed over so long waiting for all this to get cleared up, I thought I might as well stick around a while longer. Sure. Can I get you a drink? No, thanks. It uh, is finished, isn't it? Not yet. I don't understand. I talked with Lieutenant Aikens today after I saw you with him. He said it was all over as far as he was concerned. You're talking to me now, Dameron. I'm the guy who went out on the limb. And I appreciate that a great deal. A question I want to ask you. You knew Amy Duran. Worked with her at Richmond Limited. You're engaged to marry her sister. Did you know Amy had a $10,000 check in her hand the day she died? Really? That was enough money to cover the shortages in her accounts. Well, I'll be darned. Where do you suppose she shot him? Did what she did then? I've been thinking about that, Dameron. There's only one reason I can think of. Because Amy Duran didn't steal any money, because she didn't shoot any auditor, she didn't commit suicide. I think she borrowed that $10,000 from New York to cover up for somebody else. Somebody else? Who? You. Maybe you better leave here. You're upset. That auditor was a smart guy. He'd been in the business a long time. 
He found out who'd been taking the money. He called you over to ask you about it, ask you if you could repay it. You lost your head and you shot him with a thirty-eight you picked up over at Teresa O'Connell's one day. Now, look. Then you fixed up all the reports to make it look like Amy Duran did the job. You're crazy. That's fantastic. If you think I'm Amy going Amy Duran to... borrowed money to cover for you. She did it not because you were worth it, but because you meant something to her kid sister. You meant something to Teresa O'Connell, who'd lost one husband and tried suicide because of it. A Teresa O'Connell who couldn't afford another major tragedy. A Teresa O'Connell who might try suicide again if the man she was going to marry turned out to be a thief. You counted on that, Dameron. I don't know what you're talking about. One thing you hadn't counted on was the auditor picking it up so fast. And when he called you, you had to kill him to keep him quiet. Then you made a date with Amy out at the plant agent hotel. You slipped poison in her drink and planted the gun in her purse. This is all talk. Just talk. You have nothing to prove. She had one drink with you before you argued with her out in the parking lot. She told me. And the bartender later verified it. Then I came along. Now, look. You're a big guy, Dameron. You could have hit me back in that parking lot, but you didn't have time. You still had to get over to Amy's apartment and plant an empty poison box. You're crazy. You have no proof of this. No proof at all. No, I haven't. But I've been thinking about it all day. And there'll be proof. You had to buy that poison someplace. Lieutenant Akins is a pretty good police officer. He and his men will cover every drugstore in this town and ask questions everywhere. Now, listen, I'm going to tell him what I think, and he'll dust off that box of poison. Maybe your prince will turn up on it. Sooner or later, guys like you make mistakes, and Akins finds them. Get out of here, Dollar. Get out of here. Get out of here. Now, listen, you. A girl, a fine, decent girl, asked me for help. This is the quickest way I know to give her the help. I'll kill you, Dollar. I'll kill you. No, you won't. You're not going to kill me. Okay. Okay, come on, come on, get up, get up. Get up? I've had enough, I've had enough. I want you to tell it now, right now. Over there. Pick it up. Go on, pick it up. Okay, here. And you know who to call. Hello. Hello. Give me the police. Expense account item 12, $55, room and board. Item 13, $55 airfare and miscellaneous getting me back to Hartford. Total expense account, $702.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, beginning next Monday night. Next week, a whole city is aroused by one of the dirtiest rackets of modern times. And I end up right in the middle of things. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Gene Bates, Marvin Miller, Frank Gerstle, Lawrence Dobkin, Jack Crucian, Ken Peters, and Herb Butterfield. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. John Dollar? Yes? Western Union, I have a message for you from New York. Oh? 
please proceed Northern Hotel, Clinton, Colorado, as soon as possible. Yeah? Building irregularities suspected affecting several insurance companies will advise, regards, signed Albert Davies, Chief Investigator, United Adjustment Bureau, New York, New York. Uh Uh-huh. Would you like that mail to you, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, no, don't bother. Can you take an answer? Go ahead. To Albert Davies, Chief Investigator, United Adjustment Bureau, you have the address. Confirming. Exact time of arrival to follow. Sign that, Johnny Dollar. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the United Adjustment Bureau, New York City, New York. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Or maybe racket is a better word. Expense account, first item, $105.63. Transportation by air, Hartford to Denver. Item two, $28.50. Denver to Grand Junction. A place busy and bustling with uranium hopefuls. Third expenditure, $100. Deposit and rental on a car, which I used to drive the 105 miles through the rugged mountains due north of Grand Junction to Clinton, Colorado. A place that the rental agents had described as a sleepy little mountain town. When I got there, everybody was running in the direction of what was very shortly not going to be the new school building. Like everybody else in Clinton, Colorado, I spent the next three hours or so helping to try and get the fire under control. Then finally, I left the scene and located the Northern Hotel, where the clerk was standing by waiting for me. Mr. Dollar? Uh, yeah. Operator 18, New York City, has been calling you for the last four hours. Uh, Mr. Davies, I believe. Oh, yeah. Could you put the call in for me? Certainly, I'd be glad to. I'll take it up to my room. I want to change my clothes. Certainly. Boy, take Mr. Dollar's bags up to 310. I shaved and showered, changed clothes, and unpacked. From my window, I could see the still glowing embers of the fire, red against the winter night. The school building was completely destroyed. Beyond, the snow-covered Rockies rose all about the town of Clinton, which I had yet to see. Johnny Dollar. I, uh, have your call now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, good, thanks. Johnny? Hi, Al. Say, I've been trying to get to you all day. I thought you were going to let me know the minute you got into town. Well, there was a fire here, Al. I had to pitch in and help along with everybody else. Oh, I see. Well, has Osborne contacted you yet about this case? Osborne? Who's that? Julian Osborne. Look, I talked to him in Clinton last night. He said he'd wait around the hotel until you showed up. He lives there, Johnny. He drove into Denver two days ago and told the insurance broker he thought a building that Great Eastern Fidelity covered was in real bad shape. Now, what building? Well, a new school that they just put up there, Johnny. Al, it was in bad shape. Worse shape now. It fell down about four hours ago. That was the fire, Al. Oh. Well, Great Eastern's in for $200,000. Look, Johnny, contact Julian Osborne and see what he has to say. Right. And call me back when you find out what's what. So long. Yes, Mr. Dollar, may I help you? Yeah. Do you have a city directory here in Clinton? (laughs) We aren't that small. Here it is. Right here. Good. After all, we have 14,263 people. Okay, thanks. I know most of them, Mr. Dollar. Who do you want to get in touch with? A man named Julian Osborne. Uh, Julian Osborne? Yeah. Know him? I didn't know him, but it came over the radio a little while ago. They found his body in the fire. He burned to death. A four-block walk down the icy streets of the town took me to the sheriff's office and face-to-face with a heavy-set, owlish-looking man named Doherty. Sheriff Paul Doherty. He smiled professionally until I got around to inquiring about Julian Osborne. Oh. Well, uh, you his family? No, no. I, I made the trip here to Clinton to see him especially, though. I just heard he was killed in the fire. Yes. Yes, too bad about Mr. Osborne. I don't quite understand about it, though. He was school janitor. Oh. What, um... What was your business with him, Mr. Dollar? Insurance investigation. Oh? 
Yeah, Osborne reported the possibility of something wrong with the new school. He, he did? Uh, to who? To our brokers in Denver. That's why they sent me out here. Well, <laughs> your trip was for nothing then. Maybe. Well, you'd think if he had anything like that on his mind, he'd have come to me, wouldn't he? Yes. Did he? No. No, he used to pass him on the street. Never said a word. Uh-huh. Where's the body? Morgue. I, uh, I wouldn't go over there, son. I want to contact some of his family, his friends. Well, that might be hard to do. No family here, no close friends. He used to prospect for a living until he got kind of old. Then he took the job janitoring. Lived right there in the basement of the school. Eh, city will bury him. I see. How long had he worked at the school? Six months since the place was built. Mm -hmm. Who hired him? Principal, Flory Hawkins. Flory Hawkins. Where can I find her? Lives on Pearson Street. That's one block over and two blocks to your left. Number, uh, 326. 326 Pearson, huh? That's right. On son. Hmm? Bad night to go calling on her. I'd like to see Mrs. Hawkins, please. I'm Miss Hawkins. Well, I'm an insurance investigator. My name's Johnny Dollar. Insurance? Yes. Why do you want to talk to me? Well, I'll be frank with you, Miss Hawkins. I came to Clinton to talk to Julian Osborne. Oh. You heard he died in the fire. Yes, I heard. Tragic. I'm so thankful school wasn't in session today. Uh, come in. Thank you. I know this has been a pretty grueling day for you, for everyone in this town, Miss Hawkins, losing your school and all. I wouldn't call on you, except I feel it's important. I... Excuse me, please. Sure. Hello? Who? Yes, Sheriff. Yes, he is right now. Yes. Good night. There's just a couple of questions I'd like you to answer about Julian Osborne so I'm I can get... I'm afraid I can't help you with anything, Mr. Dollar. What? You'll have to go now. Well, look, now, wait a minute. If, if you'd Please. only... I don't want to be impolite, but I'm tired. Very tired. Yeah, sure. That phone call wore you out. Please. All right, all right, I'll go, Miss Hawkins. But I think you should know why I came here. I can assure you, Mr. Dollar, whatever the reason, I'm simply not interested. I was sent here because Julian Osborne advised the insurance company that he suspected certain building irregularities had gone into the new school. Miss Hawkins, did Mr. Osborne ever mention anything like this to you? No. Now, will you Do you please... have an idea to whom he might have confided such information here in Clinton? No. I rather think he was imagining things. You noticed nothing irregular yourself? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. Would that call you just had from Sheriff Doherty cause you not to notice anything? Is that all? I'm dreadfully tired. Thanks for your time. Oh, Miss Hawkins. Yes? If Sheriff Doherty calls again, tell him I'm at the Northern Hotel. Northern Hotel. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item four, $10.80. One long-distance call to New York. I got Al Davies out of bed and told him the fate of Julian Osmond. Davies requested me to stay on in Clinton to see the matter through. About 11 o'clock that night, I walked over to the site where the new school had once stood. A few firemen and policemen were still around, searching the ashes by the light of lanterns and spotlights. One of them told me the cause of the fire had not yet been determined. I started back to my hotel... Turning a corner by an alley, two men in dark clothes were holding a third man in a sheepskin. A fourth man was giving him the works. Hey, just a minute here. Come on, let's get out of here, boy. Yeah. Easy now, easy now. You need some help, mister. Everybody needs help. Let me tell you who I am before you help me. Maybe you won't want to. Easy, just take it easy now. I'm... David Baines. You're from out of town, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> I thought so. I architected that school that isn't anymore. Well, don't you understand, Samaritan? Don't you see? That group of citizens who were working me over just now, 
have kids. The kids could have been in there when the fire broke out. Here is, uh, I, I'm afraid. I'm afraid they feel I don't design especially good buildings. I took David Baines over to my hotel room, still half unconscious from the beating. I sent the bellboy out for bandages, iodine, and something to take off the chill. While I was patching him up, I was thinking how he'd stood there and taken that beating. Stood there in sight of half a dozen policemen and firemen and let them do that to him. <coughs> yeah, try a little more. Thanks. Yeah. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I came here about the school. I see. <laughs> do you want to beat me up, too? company you're working for will be liable. Want some more of this? Uh, what'd you say your name is? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I'm in a curious position. I designed the school. I planned every feature of it. But I had nothing to do with the building. You don't believe me? I wish you'd explain that. A week before they broke ground, a very important thing happened to me, Mr. Dollar. I went to Europe. I couldn't pass it up. It was a chance to study for another year under some men I'd admired all my life. <laughs> Consider it a scholarship, Mr. Baines. That's what he said. Who said? The man who paid my way to Europe. His name was Roy Vickery. So I went to Europe, and I studied. I came back, and my building was all built. Now it's burnt down. I'm a local boy who's made bad. Very bad. Who's Roy Vickery? The contractor who built it. I better talk to him. Yes, talk to him by all means. You represent a rich and powerful company, Mr. Dollar. But in Clinton, you're wasting your time. You'll learn no facts, no information, nothing helpful from anyone here. Particularly Roy Vickery. You're in a tight, hot, mean little burg, Mr. Dollar. All right, let's have it. Was that building fired on purpose? I just told you. You won't find out anything in this town. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, there's a lot of information to be had in a town that won't talk. And there are times when the silence screams all over the place. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. David Baines. Hi. How's it going this morning? I'm staying off the streets. I don't want to be beat up again. I'd advise you to do the same. I can't very well do that. The city of Clinton has filed claim for their school building. I have to make an investigation. You're booking a rough crowd, Mr. Deller. Where will you meet them all? I intend to. I admire you, but I think you're foolish. Good luck. Just a minute. What? Not only did a school building burn down yesterday, but a man died in that fire. If there was something wrong with it, I want to get to the bottom of it. 
I expect help from you, too. I'll stay here until I hear from you. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. That's Clinton, Colorado. Expense account item 5, 80 cents, telegram to Dodd and Company, Denver Insurance Brokers, who would handle the policies covering the new school building in Clinton. I requested them to forward copies of the policies. Item 6, 10 cents, one copy of the Clinton Times and the full story on the fire. It was believed by Fire Chief Hanley that the fire had started because of overheated boilers in the heating system. Dollar, is it? Yeah, that's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Yep. Yeah. Well, what can I do for you? Tell me about the fire yesterday. You sound like you're carrying a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Dollar. We had word that building irregularities were suspected in that school, Chief. The word came from the janitor, Julian Osborne. He burned to death in that fire yesterday, and the building's gone now. You get his head up as you want it, boy. I got my own troubles. I'll tell you what we think, and you can take it, whether you like it or not. We think old Julian Osborne might have passed out, got drunk, or had a heart attack in that building. We think something like that happened, and the boilers kept right on going and built up the pressure. We think the boilers exploded, the fire started, and that was that. And why do you think the whole place went down? Because it spread so fast. Why did it spread? I didn't build the building. I just took care of the fire. You're going to have to change your attitude around here if you want anybody to cooperate, will you? All right, then tell me this. Why, on a day when school wasn't in session, would those boilers be fired up at all? I don't know. Chief... Last night, I talked to Sheriff Doherty, trying to get information about Julian Osborne. He didn't know anything either. I also talked to Flory Hawkins, the school principal. She didn't know. Now you don't know anything. Who does? I've done my job, boy. I've determined cause. You've also given me a chance to look at you, which was about the only reason I came here. Nah. I'll get information elsewhere, Chief. There's some people in this town who want to talk and tell me things. You and your sheriff and whoever else is involved can't keep every mouth in this town shut. And I'll tell you like I told Miss Hawkins. I'm at the Northern Hotel. In case you remember anything. I can't hear you, boy. Not one word. Expense account item 7, dollar eighty. Breakfast in the coffee shop of my hotel for myself and David Baines, who still looked badly battered from the beating he'd taken the night before. You're taking a chance sitting here with me. Hope you realize that. Am I? I'm public enemy number one in this town. I'm the man who built the school that didn't stay up. Look, Baines, I want you to tell me all about it. If you have any information or knowledge that would be helpful in this investigation, then you better give out with it right now. What specifically do you want to know? First, the town. Do you know what this place is? It's a backyard. And only the rich kids can play here. Vickery, Hanley, Doherty, those are the rich kids, Mr. Dollar. The rest of us are, well... We live across the tracks. Let's start with Vickery. He's a builder. Not only here, all over these mountains. Grand Junction, Rifle, Mesa, all over. He's got a million dollars and a million angles. He's the one who sent me to Europe to study for a year after I completed my plans for the new building. Got me out of the way. Okay. Fire Chief Hanley. A friend of Vickery's. And any friend of Vickery's is going to get rich one way or another. Sheriff Doherty. He keeps the law orderly for Vickery. Very necessary. Okay, then. The fire itself. Chief Hanley says the school boilers blew up and caused the fire. There was no reason for those boilers to be fired up. No reason. If they were fired, they were fired to blow up. They had automatic shutoff equipment. What about Julian Osborne? You say he notified the broker in Denver that something was wrong with the building, and that's how you got here. I don't know. They might have fired it for money, too. I told you I was in Europe until they constructed it. I got back in Clinton four days ago. I went over to see my building... They used my outside drawing, Dollar. Wooden beams where I indicated steel girders. Only half the plumbing and heating system, other things. 
It looked like they'd made it up as they went along. Did you talk to anybody about it? Oh, sure. The contractor. Vickery. Vickery. He told me to keep my mouth shut and be a good boy. Do you think he got you out of town during the construction so you wouldn't interfere? I think so. I'm not important, but it was the easiest way. I understand Mr. Vickery's a little unpopular today. What? A delegation went out to his house to hang him or something. Baines was partially right. A delegation had gone out to see Roy Vickery and his polished pine domain at the end of town. They were still there when I drove up in my rented car. Twenty or thirty irate citizens demanding an explanation for the lost school. Ten uniformed men from Sheriff Doherty's office formed a half-moon circle in front of the main entrance, their holsters unbuckled. The sheriff himself was directing the operation. All right, just a minute there. Hello, Sheriff. Huh? Johnny Dollar, I talked to you last night. Oh, yeah. Chief Hanley called me about you. The chief called you, and last night you called Flory Hawkins. That was nice. Keep the wires burning. Chief said you came over to see him. Used abusive language. Tried to cause trouble. The chief was mistaken. I wasn't trying to cause trouble, Sheriff. There's enough of that in this town. I was just trying to find out how the fire started yesterday. The chief told you how it started. I didn't believe him. Now, what do you think of that? You better watch your step around here, Mr. Dollar. You seem to be looking for arguments all the time. Not at all, Sheriff. I'm misunderstood. We understand you all right. How's Mr. Vickery? He's all right, and he's going to stay all right. I'm sure he will. But these people don't like their school burning down. It's expensive. Also, their kids could have been in it. I want to see Mr. Vickery about that. He isn't seeing anyone, Mr. Dollar. And we aren't letting anybody in to see him. Really? Did any of you people hear that? Now, look here. Hey, listen, folks. Listen to me, will you? Look. Now, listen. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm worried about what happened to your school yesterday. Keep quiet. Hey, tell me Mr. Vickery built that school. The architect who designed it said it wasn't built to his specifications. Now, I want to go in and ask Mr. Vickery about that. The sheriff here doesn't want me to do that. I'll get you for this, Dollar. Wait a minute. The sheriff just said, I'll get you for this. All right, hold it. Hold it, please. Please, now listen to me. Listen. I'll put it to the sheriff again so you can all hear. Sheriff, I want to go in and see Mr. Vickery on business. Well? Go ahead. Thank you. At a direction from Sheriff Doherty, the wedge of deputies opened up long enough for me to walk through the wrought iron gate and up the steps to the Vickery mansion. A tall man in a white jacket answered the door and ushered me into a den that was stocked with good liquor and big leather chairs. Finally, a big man in a blue suit walked in. He had lots of good teeth and there wasn't an ounce of fat on his 230 pounds. I'm Roy Vickery. It was quite an act with Sheriff Doherty just now. I watched you from upstairs. That's a good safe place to watch from, Mr. Vickery. Now that you're in, what can I do for you? Tell me everything you can about that school building. Mm Mm-hmm. Has the, uh, the city of Clinton made a claim yet? Yes, $200,000, building and contents. You got in town pretty fast. We heard there might be something wrong with that building before the fire. Apparently there was. Now, who told you a thing like that? Julian Osborne. He's dead now, you know. Oh? Well, two boilers explode and there's something wrong with the building. Is that the way you people figure? Yeah. Well, so do we, and we couldn't find anything wrong. Who's we? Officially, we're the... Civic Construction Department, we just had a meeting. We thought we ought to. Yeah, yeah. I figure those people hanging around outside should be worrying. Well, they don't worry me, and you don't worry me. A drunken janitor goes to sleep and lets the boilers kick up, and the joint blows apart and burns down. That's what we decided in the meeting. It was a a terrible accident. We'll have to use an old garage or something for a school, but... but then we'll get around to building another school with the insurance money we have coming. And that's that? That's that. Mr. Vickery, I'd like a copy of the specifications that went into that building. Sure, anything at all. Uh, There you are. Okay? That'll do for now. Good. Now, you can get out of my house, Dollar. You smell smoky. There were 50 pages of specifications on the building materials used in the construction of that school. They looked all right. They also looked as though they could have been forgery. 
Expense account item eight, six dollars. One bottle of whiskey for David Baines and myself in my hotel room. Baines went over the specifications page by page. Okay, what do you think? These are my specifications, more or less. This is what's on paper that went into the building. How about what actually went into it? Well, the little I saw, they cut corners everywhere. The outside was just a shell of this stuff. You sure? These are my notes. I can remember this much. Can you remember it in front of a notary? I want a sworn statement. I don't know. You what? Well, don't look at me that way. You can get my statement and possibly a half a dozen other statements. And on paper, you'd have a case. Then what would you do? Go to the district attorney? We haven't got a district attorney. We got a county attorney who's elected for a four-year term. All right, I'll go to him. Vickery? Then I'll go to somebody else, the insurance commission. You try to go any farther, they'll kill you, Dollar. Well, let me worry about that. Now, would you make a statement? Sorry. That'd kill me, too. And that's the way matters stood in Clinton, Colorado, 24 hours after their new school building had burned down and a man had died in the flames. Everyone seemed to know it was all wrong, but no one was willing to do anything about it. Johnny Dollar. Hello, Dollar. Roy Vickery. Well. You go over those specifications? Yes, I did. Very thoroughly. Well? I think they're fakes, Mr. Vickery. <laughs> I didn't ask you your opinion, Dollar. But you've got it. Well, I'm sure you're entitled to it. Uh, when, when are you leaving town? Not for a while. Oh, I was kind of hoping you'd be leaving like in about an hour. You'd make good connections then. Sorry. I haven't really gotten around as much as I want to yet. You saw me. I can tell you anything. Oh, I'll get around to you again. Get out of town, Dollar. Now. Vickery, there are times when I don't hear good. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lady who promised to love, honor, and obey a building inspector, but wound up a widow. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Flory Hawkins, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes. You were the principal of the school. I'd like to talk to you if I could. All right. Would you care to meet me for a cocktail? There's a place called the Trader's Inn not far out of town. I could be there in an hour. All right. Miss Hawkins. Yes, Mr. Dollar. What changed your mind about talking to me? Well, I've... I've heard how you've gone about this. I mean, you forced Sheriff Doherty to let you in to see Roy Vickery. You defied Chief Hanley, and, well, you don't seem frightened of any of them. Also, I I suppose I'm a little sick of everything I've seen around here. Okay. I'll see you in an hour. I'll be there. Tonight. 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the racket in Clinton, Colorado. Expense account item 9, 10 bucks, one dinner and four drinks for myself at the Trader's Inn, five miles outside of Clinton, where I waited for Flory Hawkins to appear. I'm sorry, I'm late. Oh, well, that's all right, Miss Hawkins. Uh, sit down, please. Would you, uh, would you like something to eat? A drink, maybe? No, thank you, I, uh, um... What's the matter? What is it? Oh, I can't help looking around. I hope no one sees us together. I mean, that would be difficult to explain. To explain to whom? Your friend, Sheriff Doherty, for one. Oh. Last night when you came to inquire about Julian Osborne, Sheriff Doherty called and told me to get rid of you and not answer any questions. Yeah, I guess that. Did he tell you what would have happened if I had stayed and you had answered some questions? No. I can imagine it would have been something that would have barred me from teaching for the rest of my life. That sounds incredible. No, not too. I've been looking at your little town, Miss Hawkins. A school building can be made of paper, go up in smoke, a man can be killed, and none of the responsible people, the man who built the building, the fire chief, the sheriff, seem to care too much. You asked me about Julian Osborne. I knew he wrote your insurance company, or called them, and told them the school building wasn't right. He told me he was going to do it. I see. I knew it wasn't right, too. Everyone who worked in there, who worked on the building, knew it wasn't up to specifications. Then I'll contact some of those people. Well, that may be difficult. Julian Osborne spoke up, and he burned to death. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you can't speak now, or any of the others. I'm willing to speak about that building now. Now I'm willing to help you. I... I don't know about the others. Will Mr. Baines help you? Well, he's frightened of going up against Vickery and the others. But I think I can talk him into it. That would be two of us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Two people speaking out. And then there'd be others. Once it gets rolling, it won't stop. Unless I've missed my guess about the townspeople of Clinton. You seem to know a lot about people, Mr. Dollar. How to say what will stimulate them at the right time or make them speak out. I have to confess, you did that to me. You looked hurt and bewildered last night when I insisted you leave me alone. I realize, you know... Very deeply, I realized there could have been 1,400 pupils in that school when the fire broke out. I didn't sleep last night thinking of it. Yeah, I guess that was the only good feature of it. No children died. But as you say, Miss Hawkins, it could have happened the other way. Now look, besides yourself and possibly Mr. Baines, can you think of anyone else who might be able to supply information about the construction of the school? I don't know. Let me think. Somebody who'd, who'd have evidence in hand, possibly. Wait. Yes, I can think of someone. Who? The building inspector, the one who approved the building. Oh, well, that doesn't seem likely. If he passed that building, he must have been in with them. What's his name? His name is Richard Hobb. Oh, I've known him for years. Oh, he is in with them in a way, but I know he'd get out of it if he could. He, he was a very decent man when I knew him well. I think he's still decent. Richard Hobb. All right, who else? Well, that's all I can think of. Well, that's a start. Well, what will you do? I'll ask you to take a plane to Denver, register at the Cosmopolitan Hotel, and wait until you hear from me. What? I want a statement from you before you go, but I want you to be safe. I'll get around to Hobb and Baines. All I want are sworn statements to the effect that Vickery built a bad school, that he violated insurance specifications. That'll start it rolling. Oh, when do you want the statement? Tonight, right here. All right. Let's get busy. It took an hour to get the statement. After that, I drove her to Grand Junction to catch a plane. Expense account item 10, dollar and a half, telegram, to a friend of mine in the private detective business in Denver. 
I asked him to meet Flory Hawkins' plane, see that she was safe and comfortable, and keep an eye on her during her stay in Denver. Then I drove back to Clinton. Item 11, 10 cents, another phone call. This one to David Baines. Yeah, Dollar? Baines, Flory Hawkins made a statement about the school building and the fire. She's tired of being scared and shoved around. Now, how about you? You want a statement from me? Yes. Comparing your specifications with what you saw that actually went into the building. Will you make it out and take it before a notary? All right. If she can, I can. Then what? Then go down to Denver and wait to hear from me. I'll make the statement, but I won't leave town. You'll help me a lot if you do. Sorry. You'll be in danger here. I feel brave. If you're going to play it so broad, I'll do it too. I took his statement directly to the post office and mailed it to myself at the Northern Hotel. Expense account item 12, 40 cents phone calls. I telephoned Sheriff Doherty, Fire Chief Hanley, and County Attorney Contractor Roy Vickery and told them that I had a sworn statement regarding building irregularities. Sheriff Doherty snorted and hung up. Chief Hanley yawned and told me not to bother him. And Roy Vickery just laughed. About 8 o'clock that night, I was at the home of Building Inspector Richard Hobb, a nice home in a nice part of town. The woman standing in the doorway was tall and blonde, holding a drink and smoking a cigarette. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Richard Hobb. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm Lucille Hobb. He isn't home right now. But you can come in and wait for him and talk to me. I'm not bad company. Would a drink help? Help what? Whatever's wrong with you. You look tired, Mr. Dollar. It might, but uh, I'd rather not. I just came by to talk to your husband. You said that. What do you want to talk to him about? Business. This time of night? Let's stop talking about him. What do you say? Uh, look, uh, you uh, you probably missed your dinner tonight, and you've been getting all of your nourishment out of a bottle, so I'll come back <laughs> and you're later. You're afraid and... Dick will walk in. No, no, no. I'm not afraid of that, Mrs. Hobb. He's already walked out, and you're feeling sorry for yourself. What? Well, a man, if he lives in a place, has a, an ashtray or a picture or yesterday's sports section lying around the front room... I don't see anything like that in this room. If I walked over to that closet, ten to one, I wouldn't find any of his clothes. And if I tried the drawers, I'll lay odds there wouldn't be a shirt around either. When did he leave? You're crazy. When did he leave? Yesterday. After the fire? During the fire. Where did he go? I don't know. Did he go alone? I don't know. Did Vickery tell him to get out of town? No. I'll ask that again. Did Vickery tell your husband to get out of town? I don't know. You said no the first time I asked. Vickery, a pal of your husband's? Well, they know each other, naturally. Look, Mrs. Hobb, I don't know how much you've had to drink, but if I'm reading your eyes right, you're scared. You're scared about what's happened here and what could happen here. And you know your husband's involved. Mrs. Hobb, I want your husband to help me. If he helps me, I can help this town get rid of people like Vickery and Doherty and Hanley. If you see him, if he contacts you, tell him that. Tell him I won't let anything happen to him. Tell him I have statements from two people already, and they're being protected. I'll protect your husband. You got all that? I don't know what you're talking about. Good night, Mrs. Hobb. I left her standing in the middle of the living room, drink in hand, staring vacantly at... I don't know what. Outside in the crisp mountain air, I took stock of the situation. Richard Hobb, building inspector who had passed the school building, would be the most important witness I could find to make a statement. The others, from Flory Hawkins and David Baines, would help. But Hobb's information would be essential to an investigation. I was just going into my rented car when a sleek dark limousine pulled up, and Roy Vickery leaned out the window. Come here. Why not? Pretty cold weather to be out so late at night. Yeah, but then I've got a lot to do. Uh, you've been in to see Mr. Hobb? Yeah. How's Richard these days? I wouldn't know. I only spoke to Mrs. Hobb. I see. Lovely girl, isn't she? Well, she's a little sad right now. Her husband's missing. He left town during the fire yesterday. Do tell. Yeah, I have a feeling he might have been ordered out of town. Sooner or later, people would be asking the building inspector embarrassing questions about their school. Uh-huh. Were uh, you going to ask him some some embarrassing questions, that is? Yeah, yeah, sure I was. I was going to ask him why he passed it. I was going to ask him how much he was paid to pass it. I was going to ask who paid him to pass it. And then I was going to ask him to make a statement. 
I I figured you might have had something like that in mind. Well, it's been nice talking to you, Mr. Vickery. I hope I see you real soon in jail. A dollar. What? I know you're trying to earn your money and you're working very hard. But I'd stop it if I were you. I, I admire a man like you, someone who calls a... A spade, a spade. Or a liar, a liar. Or a liar, a liar. But dollar, it, it just won't do you any good here in Clinton. Is it? Tell you what. You worry about your problems and I'll worry about mine. Have it your way. Ready with your call to New York, Mr. Dollar? Right. Go ahead, please. Hi, Johnny. Hello, Al. Hey, look, Al, it's a mess here. I've made a little headway. I mean, I'll have a couple of statements coming in, but no concrete evidence yet. Well, what do you think? The school building was a fix or something or other. Money somewhere. I haven't been able to find out. The town's sewed up tight, civically and politically. I can't expect any help from the law or the fire department here. They're in it, too. Oh, that kind of thing, huh? Afraid so. I need help. We'll be there in 24 hours. If they want to play it that way, we'll play it that way. <laughs> Twenty minutes after I hung up the phone and was in bed, I found out how much of a mess it really was. That's when my hotel door opened and a man lurched across the room toward me. Dollar, I, I've got to tell you, I wanted to get to you yesterday. He stood in front of me, swaying back and forth, his hands clutching the front of his coat. He fell before I could get to him. Three bullet holes formed a neat trio across where his tie pin should have been. I ran my fingers through his coat, pulled out his wallet. The license read, Richard Hobb, age 39, occupation, building inspector. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the town of Clinton begins to fall apart. And it takes a lot of work to pick up the pieces. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Davis, Johnny. We're on our way. What? Yeah, we're in Grand Junction now. We ought to be in Clinton in three hours. Renting a couple of cars. I brought help. I can use it, Al. There's been a murder here. What? Last night, a building inspector named Richard Hobbs staggered into my room, tried to tell me something, but died before he could get it out. He'd been shot three times. Now, look, you be careful. Don't do anything until we get there. That's an order. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. 
Expense account item 13, 60 cents breakfast. I had it sent up to my room. Right behind the bellhop appeared the tall figure of Sheriff Doherty. How about inviting me for a cup of coffee? Sure. Sit down. Help yourself, Sheriff. Uh, thank you. You know, you're a mighty lucky man. In what way? I was almost holding you for murder, boy. That hob fella. Oh, that, yeah. You're looking into it, I suppose. Yep. Yep, we're looking into it. I hesitate to ask, but are you getting anywhere? Uh, we figure he was shot sometime last night. Found his car downstairs all smeared up. Might have driven in from someplace. Where? Well, we don't know. Well, do you know he blew town when the school fire broke out? We talked to Mrs. Hobbs. I talked to her myself. Yeah. Naturally, we want to find out everything we can about this matter. Now, Hobb came up here last night and died in this room of gunshots. Why do you suppose he came here? I never knew the man, Sheriff. I talked to someone who did know him once. She said he'd been a pretty decent man at one time. If you and Chief Hanley and Vickery didn't tell him to leave town when that fire broke out, he might have told me himself. His conscience might have hurt him about passing a building that never could have stood an inspection. Go on. He might have heard that I was in town investigating it. He might have gotten sick and tired of the cheap, rotten little schemes here in Clinton and come back to help me straighten it out. You don't think much of our town, do you? Not the way it is, Sheriff. And I don't think much of you. In that case, I'll just try to keep out of your way. Do that. You do the same, Dollar. Here. Two hours later, Al Davies and a contingent of special operatives arrived in Clinton. Toby O'Brien from Continental States Insurance. Rob Schwartz and the Minx Twins from Columbia Adjustment, giving us a friendly hand. Todd Weaver, who just finished a case with the Canadian Adjusters Limited. Lou Doniger and Thad Thomas from Chicago. A pretty imposing group of expert investigators. Well, Johnny, you look okay. Yeah, <laughs> still in one piece. Hi, Thad, Lou. Fine. You want to get the door, Toby? Now, sit down there, Chuck. Now, this isn't any vacation trip, boys. We're all going to have to roll up our sleeves. All right, Johnny, you want to break it down? Yeah, all right. Well, this is a big one, fellas. If you'll all sit, I'll bring you up to date. Yeah, sure. Now, sit right there. Three days ago, I came here on a tip that building irregularities were suspected in the new school building. The man who tipped the insurance company was the janitor, name of Julian Osborne. I never talked to Osborne because he died in the fire that destroyed that building. I did talk to the man who designed the building. His name is David Baines. He claims none of his specifications were followed in the construction. So that's why it caught fire and went down so fast. His statement right here. Now, I talked to the school principal, Flory Hawkins. She supports Baines' statement. I wanted most of all to get a statement from the building inspector who passed the building, Richard Hobb. Hobb was murdered last night. Uh, no wonder you need help. All right, now, the sheriff, the fire chief, and the building contractor are all in on it. And there are too many leads for one man to follow, too many people for one man to talk to. The sheriff is making an investigation of Hobb's murder, but we'd better make our own. Now, you, Toby, and you, Thad, Hobb's your job. Find out everything about him, his bank account, his friends, his troubles, everything. Especially who killed him. His widow's Lucille Hobb. I met her last night. Leave it to him to find the woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. Rob? Yeah? Your man is the building contractor, Roy Vickery. He's big and tough and shrewd, and he talks softly. He owns and runs the whole show, if I'm guessing right. Now, take Toby and run Vickery down. Bank accounts, purchase orders, what kind of money he spends, and so on. Jim and Albinx? Uh, All right, you two, find out everything you can about Julian Osborne, the janitor who was burned to death. I want Lou Doniger to stick close to Fire Chief Hanley. Same thing. Everything and anything you can get on him. Al, you can handle Sheriff Doherty. The rest of you spread out. Start talking with anybody in town who might know anything. When you find one who's sick and tired of watching their town being run by a pack of hoodlums, send them up here to the room. We'll try to get statements from them making specific charges, Al. Yeah. I want to guarantee every one of them security. So take them down to Denver, give them protection until it's safe to walk the streets here. If that's necessary, I'll arrange it. It's necessary. All right. All right, now report back to me anytime you want. Don't push anybody around. Don't let anybody push you around. Okay, let's get to work. Eight strange men moving through Clinton, Colorado, asking questions were as conspicuous as I wanted them to be. I knew everybody in the little town would be hearing about them and watching them. And sooner or later, I hoped that would pay off. 
An hour went by before I got any action. Johnny Dollar. You the fellow with the insurance company? Yeah, that's right. Who's this? Never mind. You're taking a lot of chances around here. We're going to take lots more. Do you have anything to say? Yeah. My name's Earl Kennedy. I'd like to talk to you. Name the place. You go down and stand in front of your hotel. I'll drive by and pick you up. I went down and stood in front of the Northern Hotel. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes. And then a car drove up. Two men in the front seat, three in the back. One of them leaned out. Dollar? Yeah. Come on, get in. Kennedy, construction foreman on the school. Hi. I thought you were going to be alone. Man next to you is Frank Gibson. I'm the city editor of the Clinton Times. Those three boys in the back are Chuck Borden, Pete Geiger, and John Newton. They all worked for me on the construction. Hi. Hi. We seen the guys you brought into town. Really? Some pretty heavy boys. You know, the town's a little edgy with all that's happened. The fire, the janitor getting burned murder of Dick Hobb. None of which were caused by any of my investigators. How long are they going to be in town? As long as they have to be. We're going to get to the bottom of all this. How many did you bring in? Eight. I'll bring in 80 if I have to. Aren't you talking kind of big? This is a big job. Yeah. This far enough? Turn in here. Now what? Just want to talk to you. Well... Yeah. We're all willing to make statements, Dollar. I can charge Vickery with shortchanging the city on materials. These guys in the back seat will tell you the same thing. They came to me to ask my advice. I told them to talk to you, see what kind of man you were. I'll print anything that's the truth. Well, that'd help a lot, Mr. Ripson. The paper's at your disposal, provided it's the truth. Fair enough. All of you be willing to testify? I am. Okay. Now, a couple of other things. First... About Richard Hobb. You tell him, Frank. Hobb had big ideas, and he played ball with Vickery and the rest of them. It also looks like he was murdered because he was going to try to make it right. Now, about Roy Vickery. He was born here in Clinton, brought up here. He's built about one-third of the structures in this town. Every one of them standing today. Every one except the school. Any angle on that? Your insurance, $200,000. Okay. Where can I get a copy of the actual purchase orders used in the building? From Vickery. But I don't think he'd let you have them, if he still got them. Well, he gave me specifications that look like forgeries. I want the real thing. I'll have to have the real thing. Now, let me look around. Now, when and where do we make the statements? Let's go over to my hotel room and do it right now. Better use the newspaper office. You're probably being watched by now, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item 14, $10, legal fees. Two hours later, I hired a notary to attest the sworn statements of Earl Kennedy, Frank Gibson, Charles Borden, Peter Geiger, and John Newton. They were damaging statements that would bear considerable weight in a courtroom. But they were not enough to bring the matter before a court. Al Davies was waiting for me when I got back to my hotel room. Hi. Hi. Come here. Hmm, what is it? We've got friends. Yeah. One, two, three, seven. Mm Mm-hmm. They've been gathering around the hotel now for the last hour or two. Any of the boys run into trouble yet? No, none they couldn't handle. This could be ticklish, though, Johnny. Huh? Well, if Doe's down there uh, provoked uh, an open showdown. Yeah, that might be the idea. We aren't ready for anything like that yet. We're getting there. Come in. Well, hello, Sheriff. This is Mr. Davies, our chief inspector. Davies? Are you the man who brought these troublemakers into town? I brought eight assistants with me, Sheriff. They're troublemakers. They've been going around asking questions, upsetting folks, getting in the way. I'd hate to see any of them get hurt. Like with those out there on the street? Those men out there are a group of indignant citizens who came to see me in a body and protested this investigation and the way it's being handled. They look more like hired bully boys, Sheriff. I'm asking you and Mr. Davies to withdraw these men you have working in Clinton. I'm asking you to do that by sundown. Suppose we don't, Sheriff. Then you'll take the consequences. Now, wait a minute. 
What? Now, I don't want to keep you in a state of suspense, Sheriff. We're willing to take the consequences. What? If that crew out there shoot as well as they look, they're pretty rough people to go up against. Well, let me tell you, every man in this investigation is armed. We won't be intimidated, shoved around, or bullied by you, those bums out there, or anyone in this town. Now, you tell that to Mr. Vickery and Chief Hanley. And then you go home and stand in front of a mirror, Sheriff, and tell it to yourself. You gave us till sundown to get out. I'm giving you until sundown to resign as sheriff. Now, if you don't do that, I'll see that you're forced out of office. Now, what do you think of that? You must feel mighty strong to talk like that. You see this, and this, 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 and this. These are all sworn statements from people in this town who aren't afraid of you and Vickery and the others. You'd be surprised how many other people around here are on the verge of making statements, on the verge of not being scared of you anymore. So where are we, Sheriff? I'm going to kill you. Not now, you aren't. Come on, get out of here. I'll kill you, Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the end and the beginning of Clinton, Colorado. It all happens when the smoke clears. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Toby O'Brien, Johnny. Heard you had a run-in with Sheriff Doherty. They say you gave him a little sundown to resign his office. Yeah, I don't think he will, though. He'll have to do something close to it. I got some information on Richard Hobb, the building inspector who was murdered. Yeah? Hobb deposited $20,000 in the bank last year. What's that? Now, wait. Hobb's salary as city building inspector was 7500 per annum. The 20000 went in in four $5,000 deposits. Holy... And now wait, there's more. Those deposit dates coincide with OKs Hobb made on the school building. He was paid off after each inspection. Johnny, we got it on paper. We got some other things on paper, too, Toby. Hold on, keep digging. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Clinton, Colorado. To United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Expense account item 15, $45. For photostatic copies of deposit slips in the account of Richard Hobb, building inspector, lately murdered. 
Furnished by one of my operatives, Toby O'Brien. Here you are. Okay. I got a feeling this whole town's coming apart at the seams, Johnny. The sheriff threatened you openly. Everybody who's anybody around here is trying to cover up the school burning down and the way it was built. I think I can hurry up the process. Uh, you be careful. These people seem to play for keeps. They've got to realize we do, too. These photostats are the first real bit of presentable evidence that the building was constructed under fraudulent circumstances. Hey, take it easy. Now, you keep the originals. Mail them out to the office. The post office is still pretty honest. Yeah. Also, let it out that we have the information wherever you go. I want them to get worried and steamed up and start acting dumber than they already have been. Okay. Might scare Doherty and Hanley a little bit. That Vickery seems like a different proposition. I don't think he scares. I drove my rented car over to the home of his grieving widow. She answered the door with tears in both eyes and bourbon over the rocks in one hand. She wore a black dress, black and satin and tight, low cut. Not exactly Emily Post for mourning. But as I say, it was black. A black lace handkerchief waved in the air. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm glad you came by. I'm so unhappy and lost. Yeah, I can see that. May I come in? Why not? The sheriff hasn't done anything about Bob Richard's murder. I wouldn't rely too heavily on Sheriff Doherty, Mrs. Hobb. I don't think he will do anything. No. Well, don't look so surprised in your hour of bereavement, Mrs. Hobb. You know he won't do anything. I don't know anything of the kind. Why don't you sit down and let's talk? I want you to help me. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I can help you. I'm... I'm so broken up. Oh, now, if you're not careful, you might drown in those tears. What are you trying to... Relax, Mrs. Hobb. All right. So I can't really cry about Richard. I never have. But I thought it was expected of me. Some people might expect it. I don't. Now, look. This setup creaks from top to bottom. Your late husband made $7,500 a year and deposited $20,000 in six months. Here. Figure. I don't know anything about his money. All I know is the bank told me he had only $300 left. What did he do with it? What do you think? He spent it on other women. Then why the tragic act? I'm not very good at it, am I? Not the best. And it's funny, Johnny, because I really mean it. Oh, I know how foolish I look in these clothes. I wanted to cry because, well, I really loved him once and he loved me, but... We kicked it away because we both wanted more excitement than this town or his salary could give us. He was always out spending his money on other women, being a big shot. What about the money? He got it for falsifying the inspection papers, didn't he? Yes. Who gave it to him, Mrs. Hobb? I don't know. Probably Roy Vickery. Who do you think killed him? I don't know that either. What do you know? Johnny, he didn't leave insurance. And I have to live the best way I can. If I stay in this town, I have to keep friends. If I don't want to keep them, I have no choice but to move. And that takes money. I wonder what could possibly be going on in your mind. Your company handles insurance, doesn't it? 263 different kinds. Are you particular what kind of premiums you collect? Well, we pay off on a lot of things. Just what kind of insurance were you thinking about? $2,000 endowment. Got your pen? No, but my words go to the cashier's cage. What do you got? I'm trusting you. Richard got that $20,000 from the Clinton Gravel Company for services rendered. Know who owns the Clinton Gravel Company? Roy Vickery. That's close enough. Last night after you were here, Richard came back. I told him what you'd said to me. He said Vickery and the others were going to make a patsy out of him. So he left to see you. And got shot up. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Vickery was outside your house when I left. He might have done it himself. That's all I can tell you. Now, uh, do I get my insurance? If what you say is true, Mrs. Hobb, I'll have to check first. Oh, you'll find out. Say, where do you come from, anyhow? Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut. Say, I got an idea. What's the housing situation in Hartford? Rough. For you, Mrs. Hobb. Very rough. <laughs> I finally tore myself away from the grieving widow and headed back for the hotel. On my way down the main street of Clinton, someone with a wrinkled coat and bourbon on his breast stepped out and stopped me. David Baines, the architect. Dollar. Well, hi. I told you I was going to stick around and do something brave. Oh? I finally got up courage enough to do something decent. Decent for me, anyway. 
or anybody else, it'd be too low to talk about. Oh, I wasn't. Well, I'm not much of a lawyer, but they say there's a statute in the books that says a private citizen may commit a crime to prevent a greater crime from being committed and still go free. Is that right? I wouldn't know. Well, I committed a crime. Two crimes. Dishonor to my noble character. Disappointing the trust of a young woman. That was the first one. Then, uh, then engineering a theft. I'm a fagin. That's what I am. Under the guise of loving a young female secretary eternally, I have, well, here. The purchase orders from Roy Vickery's office. The actual purchase orders for the school. What? She stole them for me. For you. With my best regard. I looked at them. They were as advertised. Purchase orders complete down to the last ten-penny nail. Expense account item 16, 48 cents, postage. Not being a technical expert, I sent them down to Denver for perusal by the original brokers. Fourteen hours later, the verdict came back in a long telegram. The materials used in the school construction were not passable. The insurance company would never honor the claim of the city of Clinton. This text I turned over to Frank Ibsen, publisher of the Clinton Times. He promised it would be in the late afternoon edition. There were other developments. Toby O'Brien again. Yeah, Toby. We located two witnesses to the Hobb shooting. Vickery put Hobb out of the way himself. Get their statements and get them on a train to Denver right away. Right. Then you better gather up the rest of the boys and come over here. Right. Expense account item 17, 10 cents, one newspaper. The afternoon edition of the Times, which carried a complete story of the insurance investigation up to date. Naming Vickery as the perpetrator of the school fire and involving Sheriff Doherty and Chief Hanley. I phoned Frank Ibsen and explained his next edition could carry the story of Hobbs' murder by Vickery. Ibsen said he'd make up an extra for that. I'd no sooner hung up the phone than I had visitors. Want to come with us, Dollar? Not particularly. Who are you? Deputy Egan. Sheriff Doherty wants to talk to you. I've already said all I want to say to him. Get out. Guys? Come on. Take him out of here. There was strictly no contest. I walked out of the room with a deputy on each side of me and Egan behind me. We were in front of the hotel when I saw Toby O'Brien, Al Davis, and John Newton coming toward the entrance. I kicked out at the nearest man and yelled for help. A few of the local citizens joined in the fight, and Sheriff Doherty's three deputies got the worst of it. We took them all back up to my room. Now, sit down. All right, Egan. You're, you're going to be arrested for this, Dollar. Where were you going to take me? Where? Place on the edge of town. Clinton Gravel Works. Why? Doherty... Doherty said to bring you back. He... He wanted to see you. Who's there with him? I... I don't know. The Clinton Gravel Works was a large building and tall shaft set on the edge of a frozen lake. Parked near the entrance was a long black limousine, such as a well-to-do contractor might drive. A white supercharged sedan, such as a fancy western sheriff might use. And a red sedan, unmistakably belonging to the fire chief. We covered all the exits, and Toby O'Brien and I went in the front way. We were halfway up the steps when things began to happen. You all right? Yeah, come on. Wow. Hello, Dollar. (coughs) All right, lie still, Vickery. I stayed still for you too long. I should have put you out of the way. The same as you put Hob out of the way. Better. Ah, <coughs> uh, this one's gone. Who is he? Fire Chief Hanley. Vickery, where's Doherty? He's out shooting his gun some more, Dollar. I hope he gets you, too. I hope. He's back stairs, Johnny. Yeah. Stay away from me, Dollar. The place is surrounded. Throw down the gun and walk out with your hands behind your head. Toby, I'll get on the front way. Get the guys to step around through the shaft. Right. You coming out? Doherty, you coming out? No. Doherty. You ought to go over a place good before you think you got a man trapped, Dollar. You're trapped, Sheriff. The men are waiting for you. I'm okay with you when you're the one I want. I told you I'd kill you. I've still got my gun in my hand. Vickery had his gun, and so did Hanley. Look at them. Yeah, you did pretty well. Made it look like they shot each other. And now it's your turn, Dollar. No! Get back! Okay, Johnny? Yeah, just a nick. Hey, get a doctor, will you? Yes, sure. 
Well, Sheriff, uh, I guess... I guess I kind of forgot something. Yeah, what's that? The part about... about the falling out among thieves, Dollar. That was Sheriff Doherty's last statement. He died on his way to the hospital. Roy Vickery recovered and was arraigned on charges of murder, conspiracy, 28 counts all told. Chief Hanley was dead. Expense account item 18, $62, board and room. Item 19, $58, miscellaneous. Item 20, $164, transportation back to Hartford. Total expense account, $2,385.03. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week, the Jolly Roger fraud matter. And, uh, yeah, that means piracy. Of a kind that would have made Captain Kidd look like a bungling amateur. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Lucille Meredith, Carlton Young, Herb Ellis, Jack Petruzzi, Bob Bruce, Herb Butterfield, Paul Richards, Edgar Barrier, Russell Thorson, Jack Moyles, and Frank Gerstle. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment. Hello, Pat. Listen, I have something here I think may Whoa, be... Whoa, worth... hold it, boy. I've already packed. Huh? You are? Yep, taking off in about an hour. First plane out I can get. Well, how'd you know? I've been planning it for months. How could you? It only happened last Thursday. Pat. Yeah? I'm going on a vacation far, far away to Thank sunny you. Southern California. Little town of La Jolla. And to help me keep out of sight from such as you, I'm taking along all my skin-diving outfit. Bye. Well, wait, Johnny. That's right next door. Ah, uh, to what? The case I want you to handle for us in San Diego. Just change my plans, Pat. I'm going to Florida. No, listen, Johnny. There's enough commission on this case to pay for two vacations. And as long as you're going to be right there in Southern Cal anyway... Uh, look, why don't you drop in on me before you take off? <sighs> okay, sucker. Wh- what? Just talking to myself. I'll see you. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut... Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Jolly Roger fraud. Expense account item one, taxi for myself and my vacation luggage to the offices of Universal Adjustment, 436 Parley Street, Hartford, in the hope I could argue both Pat McCracken and myself out of taking on the case. The last two cases I'd handled for Pat had almost cost me my life. 
And I was beginning to be a bit superstitious about anything he had a hand in. But trying to talk him well, down is like trying to talk know. down your mother-in-law. Maybe your skin diving trick will help you crack the case. But the main thing is you're going to California anyhow. This way you can put your whole vacation on expense account. Pat. And baby, if I know you, you run down the case in about two days, come up with a swindle sheet for a couple of weeks. Pat. To say nothing of the commission I mentioned over the phone. Listen, will you? You see, the Jolly Roger was insured by Southwest Maritime Insurance and Liability for 460 G's. Bert Parker, in their San Diego office, can give you all the dope on it. Bert Parker? Sure, you remember him. Handed you the Molly Kay matter a few months ago. A very profitable case for you, wasn't it? Well, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but now look, so I'm not... Oh, you'll clean up on this, too. The Jolly Roger, you know, was one of the finest seagoing yachts on the West Coast. No, I didn't know, but Pat, Big I'm not going diesel to... diesel job, 110 feet long. Floating palace. Probably the most luxurious wooden hull job built since the... Wooden hull? 110-foot diesel job? Wooden yeah. Hull? And that, unfortunately, is why she burned to the water line before the weight of her engines carried her down to Davy Jones's locker. Mm. Total loss, huh? Total. 460,000 bucks gone. That's too bad. Well, Pat, it was nice seeing you again. Now I gotta get my plane to New York to get my plane for the coast. But I haven't even told you why we want you to look in on this thing. Pat, I am going to the coast on a vacation, remember? But I told you, I told Bert that you were on your way. You told what? Sure. Phoned him right after I talked to you. Well, you dog. Sure. He's promised to contact the Mexican authorities that you may need to help you and have Mexican. everything all... How are they involved? Oh, now, look, Pat, enough of this. I gotta get sure, over Sure, my car's right downstairs, and I can tell you the rest, I know. No, right no, no, tell it to somebody else. I'm going out there John, on a vacation. baby, you can't let me down on this one. Look, we haven't got any regular man out there, only a couple of part-timers like Bert Parker. You know, sell the policies with one hand and act as adjusters with the other. I gotta go. Sure. You see, uh, here, I'll take that back. And this one... You see, that works out all right on small accounts, but on these big ones. You... Wow, what do you got in here? A case of scotch? Pat, will you shut up a minute and let me Not tell you? Not on your life. That'd give you a chance to change your mind about taking on the... Here, here's the elevator. Oh, excuse me, lady. Sorry. Now, I still haven't told you why we smell something wrong in this whole case. It's simply and clearly this, John Boy. Yeah. It's simply and clearly this. The diesel yacht Jolly Roger was owned by one Paula Zaganian, ex-rum runner, ex-gun runner, ex-shipping magnate, suspected spy through two world wars, and generally undesirable character, despite the millions he'd made. During the last war, he cleaned up by scaring some of the smaller countries into buying a lot of obsolete military equipment that was hardly fit for the scrap pile. And in more than one place around the world, there was anything but a welcome mat waiting for him. And in a lot of places, a lot of countries, the minute he land his seagoing palace, the gendarmes would stick to him like flies to a molasses barrel just to make sure he behaved himself. Anyhow, trying to argue with Pat was useless, so I agreed to take on the case. Expense account items two, three, and four. One hundred and ninety dollars four cents. Plane fares and incidentals, Hartford to New York, New York to Los Angeles, LA to San Diego where I hoped to grab a cab to La Jolla before Bert Parker could find out I'd arrived. But I was met at the airport, but not by Bert Parker. Mr. Dollar. Uh, yeah? I thought you were by the description. Well, don't tell me they've got me on those wanted posters out here, too. Oh, silly. I'm Jan Penny, in Mr. Parker's office. You know, Southwest Insurance and Liability. Hmm, maybe I ought to take the case after all. I'm going to work with you on it. Oh, no, I'm sure I will. You see, Mr. Parker's in the hospital... When he received Mr. McCracken's wire about your time of arrival, he asked me to meet you here. Hospital? What's the matter with him? It's supposed to have been an accident. Hit and run. Well, what do you mean, supposed to be? Bert thinks they tried to run him down deliberately. Who? I think he'd better tell you about it. Yeah, I think somebody better. We picked up my luggage, dropped it off at a hotel. I phoned the place I'd made a reservation in La Jolla and told them I might be a day late. And Jan Penny and I went on over to the Queen of Mercy Hospital to talk with Bert Parker. On doctor's orders, I went into his room alone. Bert looked terrible. So, so glad you can make it, Johnny. Hey, you sure you want to be trying to talk, Bert? Look, why don't we forget it now? I have to talk. Well, well, I can, Johnny. They tried to kid me, tell me I'll be out of here in a couple of days. (laughs) That line, I saw the chart... Internal. 
Eternal bleeding. Okay, Bert. Bert, take it easy, will you? Look, the doc said you have to take it easy. Why can't your gal Jan tell me all I need to know on the kiss? She can't accept this. This getting run down. Yeah, she said she thought it wasn't an accident. She thinks? I know. Yeah? Phone calls. Threatening phone calls. Threatening? About what, Bert? Because... Because of holding up on this claim. Somehow somebody found out I'd... I called Hartford. Asked for investigation. Who? <laughs> Nagin denies that he... The owner of the Johnny Roger? Yeah. Denies knowing anything about the calls, but they weren't kidding Johnny. That's why I'm here. Then they probably know I was asked to come out here. Johnny. Yeah? Johnny better go back. Drop this one. Oh, Bert. If they do know, if they know you're here, they may try. May try to... Johnny. Yeah? Hurts. Hurts, Johnny. Nurse. Nurse. Three hours later, while Jan, Penny, and I paced the corridor, Bert Parker died. The only thing I'd learned from him was that I'd better be careful. Mighty careful. I took Jan Penny to the roughest, toughest dive I could find, Ray Kemper's Cat Club, in the hope we could both drown a sorrow or two. Why, Johnny? Why did it have to be Bert? You liked him, didn't you? I loved him. I loved Bert. No, he... Let's have another drink. Hey, Jan, don't you think maybe... Oh. Waiter. Waiter, two more, please. I know this is no way to face it, Johnny. It's all right, Jim. I came out here like everybody does. Every young female kid who's been told she's prettier than the rest. You know, you have the movies, Hollywood, glamour, all that stuff. Yeah, I know. But it was rough. It was too rough. And I couldn't play the game they seemed to want to play out here. And I was all set to go back to the farm country and settle down to the same dull. But then I met Bert. Instead of giving me just a lot of fast talk, he, he said he wanted to help me. He did, Johnny. He really did. He took me into his office here in San Diego. And we made this office, Johnny. We did. And he still didn't try to make any advances because he knew I wouldn't want that. But what he didn't know was that I loved him for it. That I loved him. Now he's gone. Hey, look, Chan. There's nothing we can do about it. Except try to finish the job he started on the case that, well, it put us here drinking too much and trying not to think of him and thinking of nothing else but him. Oh, thanks, bud. Here, keep the change. Johnny? Yeah? You're like Bert. You're straight. I'm glad. Easy, girl. Maybe you didn't know him as well as I did. But you cared about him enough to, well, to do this, and I... Jan, Jan, take it easy. Listen, Jan. Yes? Grab your coat. I'm taking you home. I'm all right. Really, I am. You've got a double job to do tomorrow, his as well as yours. How can you talk... I know, I know. I'm out here. I'm out here to knock off the Jolly Roger, make sure the payment of the claim is okay. At least that's why I came out here. Well, then how... how Now I've also got to find out who... Bert. Yeah. And I'm going to need your help. All right, Johnny. Come on, Jan. Grab your coat. I took her home to her little apartment on East Drive. I didn't go up for the usual nightcap because I didn't want to. And I knew Jan didn't want me to. I dropped into police headquarters, homicide first, and then traffic detail to see if they'd been able to dig up anything on the hit-run driver who'd killed Bert. Nothing. Apparently, the threat he'd received just before the so-called accident was something that only he and Jan had known about. The expense account? Oh, I don't know. Call it ten bucks. A couple of cabs, a couple of drinks, or maybe six or eight, or... Oh, I'm kind of tired tonight. Bert was a nice guy. Jan's a nice girl. In the morning, I'll call the hotel in La Jolla and delay my reservation there another day. Meantime, I'll get some sleep, I guess. (laughs) 
Maybe I'll even cook me up a dream or two about skin diving and sunning on the rocks at La Jolla after all this whole rotten case is cleared up. Get myself a good winter tan to take the place of this high eastern pallor I've been trying to get. Oh. Hello. Hello. Johnny. Hello. Johnny, listen. Hello, I can't. Jan? Yes, Johnny. Listen to me. Yeah. We we must have been followed tonight. Huh? Jan? I I got a phone call just a minute ago. Yeah? Uh, a man. He threatened me. What do you mean he threatened you? How? Who was it? I don't know. He said, if I help you... Yeah? There'll be another accident. To me. Jan. And to you. And to you. Listen, Jan. Oh, Johnny, I'm afraid. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, it may sound corny, but where there's smoke, there's fire. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Jan. Yes, Jan. A minute ago after you left me here at my apartment, I got a phone call. Yeah? A threat. If I help you on this case, there'll be another accident. Huh? Like the one that happened to Bert. Fatal. To me. Jan. To you. Oh, Johnny, I'm afraid. Stay right where you are. I'm on my way over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, attention Patrick McCracken. Pat, I'm addressing this to you instead of to the Southwestern Maritime Insurance and Liability because Southwestern's sole representative here in San Diego, California, Bert Parker, died yesterday in the hospital, presumably of an accident. But I don't believe it. I think it's because he knew too much about this case. The Jolly Roger fraud. Item 6270, cab fare and tip from my hotel to the little apartment of Jan Penny, who had been Bert Parker's secretary before he was killed. Johnny Dollar, you all right? Come in, Johnny, quick. Oh, Easy now. Who was it threatened you over the phone? Did you recognize the voice? Uh, yes. Well, who was it? I, I don't know. Huh? It was the same voice that called Bert at the office and warned him before he was run down by that car and killed. But you don't know who it was? No. Oh, Johnny, I'm so scared. Please hold me. All right, all no. right. I don't mean that. It sounds like I'm trying it's to... It's okay, Jan. It's okay. Just take it easy. Here we are. Come on, dear. Sit down. Sit down. Here. Have a cigarette. I'm sorry. I'm 
sorry, Johnny. I guess it's just been too much for a gal. Yeah, sure, I don't doubt it. I thought when I bought you a few drinks tonight, you'd be able to come back here and sleep and forget what's happened. Forget about Bert being killed. It's because he held up the claim on the Jolly Roger. Because he sent for you. That's why they're threatening you, too. Oh, Johnny, be careful. And you have no idea who they is? Of course I do. The same idea you have. The man who owned the Jolly Roger before she burned and sank. Paulus Zanagian. Just how much do you know about Zanagian? Only what Bert told me. He was an international crook, gun runner, spy, shipping magnate, international troublemaker. Yeah, yeah, and just about as welcome in any decent country of this world as the plague. Bert didn't want to insure the Jolly Roger. Certainly an appropriate name, all right. If ever there was an international pirate... Well, go on, Jen. Bert didn't want to insure it. $460,000 wooden hull and all, but he had to. Southwestern is a small company, Johnny, and the premium, two years premium in advance, was too much to turn down. So that was the clincher. Yes. Bert needed it so much. But then it burned and sank. Yes. When they submitted the claim, Zanagium himself. Oh? Yes, Johnny. It was Paula Zanagium himself who bought the policy and he made the claim. Demanded immediate payment. But when Bert decided to hold up until you could come out here and investigate... The warnings and the so-called accident that killed him. Yes. Now they're warning me. You. Johnny, why don't you give this up? Where's Zanagia now? Here in San Diego at the Larchmont. And you're sure it wasn't he who called you tonight, who called Bert and warned him? I'm sure. I would have known his voice, his accent. But, Johnny, I'm frightened. All right, now look, look. Go on in there into your bedroom and sleep. No, no. Take a sleeping pill, whatever you like, but get some sleep. Look, there's nothing we can do tonight, and there'll be plenty for us to do tomorrow. But after that phone call, I... I'll stay right here on the sofa. And look, I've got this. (gasps) Have you any kind of a gun? No, Johnny. Well, now, go on in there, lock your windows, close the drapes, and get some sleep. That's orders. All right. Good night, Johnny. I hope Jan slept better than I did. Expense account item 7, 90 cents, taxi to police headquarters, first thing in the morning. I spent a solid hour talking with Detective Sergeant Joe Franklin. Yes, they were working on the hit-run death of Bert Parker. No, they hadn't come up with any leads. All he knew was that Bert had left his office late, was shortcutting his way through an alley to where his car was parked, had been knocked down when he reached the end of the alley. No witness, no tire marks, nothing. They'd questioned Jan Penny about possible enemies and come up with the same answers I did, but no evidence. Item 8, taxi to the Larchmont, where the desk clerk announced my arrival to the penthouse suite. Come in, come in, sir. I've been waiting for you to call on me. Mr. Zanagian? Uh, terribly distressing news about your colleague, Mr. Parker. I feel... T- oh, sit down. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. <laughs> Tell me, sir, have the police found any clue as to who ran down and killed the poor man? Oh, you know that he died last night? Oh, yes, of course, within a few minutes of when it happened. But was Sergeant Franklin able to give you no inkling of who might have done it? Oh, do not look surprised, my boy. I not only know of your visit to police headquarters this morning, but of everything else you have done since your arrival here in San Diego. Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Sonegan. <laughs> yes, is indeed. But I, I, I'm sure the reason for it is very obvious. Yes, sir? Of course, my friend, of course. I am depending on you to see that prompt payment of my insurance on the Jolly Roger is made. After all, that is the only reason for your being sent here. Therefore, I feel it my obligation to see that nothing happens to you, that you are given, shall we say, adequate protection during the time you are here acting in my behalf. Mr. Zanagian, before you go That is why I have made a trusted man responsible for watching over you at all times during your stay. Uh Uh-huh. I suppose that's just a polite way of saying that you've had somebody taming me since I got here. Oh, oh, by the way, a lovely girl, Miss Penny, isn't she? And she was so devoted to Mr. Parker. Terrible shock to her, his death. Uh, Your solicitude to her is to be highly commended. You really keep tabs on things, don't you? But now, let us get down to the business at hand. Yeah, let's. The loss of the Jolly Roger came at a most inopportune moment. My crew were testing some new equipment in preparation for a somewhat lengthy trip abroad. When the accident occurred, they sent her to the bottom out near the Coronado Islands. Just what kind of an accident was it? What? Oh, oh forgive me, dear man. I forget you have not yet contacted the Coast Guard for the details of the whole affair. That's right, but how did But you... I am certain you will. So why should I bore you with information you will only have to hear all over again from them? 
Suffice it to say, dear sir, that the loss of my beautiful yacht was due to some mechanical failure, so to speak. Uh, something with the electrical system, I believe it was. Yes, I do. But uh, my point to you is simply that I must have settlement of my claim without delay so that I can leave the United States as soon as possible. For where? Do you mind? Oh, no, 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 no. Of course I don't mind. But why bore you with my personal affairs? So urgent is my need for immediate settlement that I can only remind you that I am a most generous person, which is to say I can assure you of ample reward for anything you may do to expedite payment to me of the four hundred... I'm sorry, my dear sir. Oh, dear me, I'm sorry. I have seemed to monopolize the conversation, haven't I? Mr. Zanagian, let's stop beating around the bush. An insurance claim for $460,000 is investigated in any event. Bert Parker seemed to think there was something wrong with his claim. He said so, and apparently it cost him his life. The same threats that were made to him have been passed on to his secretary, Jan Penny, and to me. And if that doesn't make the whole case smell to high oh, heaven... my dear all right, sir! All right, now. now you're trying to bribe me to make a quick settlement. So, mister, if I weren't suspicious of the whole thing before, you can believe me I am now. Oh, my dear Why man. anyone with your reputation for millions should be in such a hurry to get his hands on a few hundred thousand, I don't know. But if I were you, I'd sit back very quietly and prepare for a long wait to see if you get it at all. Oh, how unfortunate this attitude for you. Is that a threat? No, 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 dear boy, not at all. I, I am simply thinking of how much easier it could be for you. And, uh, of course, profitable. Now, perhaps you will change your mind. Not a chance. Uh, then, sir, since settlement of my claim seems to rest entirely on your shoulders at the moment, and since someone, I can't imagine who, has seen fit to threaten you. And please, don't forget that, dear boy. Mr. Zanagin. Yes? I don't scare easy. It was pretty obvious that Paula Zanagian was used to having his own way, would stop at nothing to get it. Bert Parker had been right. I'd have to watch my step. I checked with Jan and grabbed a taxi to pay a visit to the Coast Guard. Lieutenant John Smith, believe it or not. You can take your choice, Dollar. Read the report on the burning and sinking of the Jolly Roger here or the copy I let Bert Parker have. I take it you talked to him. Parker's dead. What? Yeah, hit and run. After he received a couple of threats to lay off this case. You locked up Zanagian yet? On what charges? Or well, who else? That's a lot to go on. If he didn't sink that boat himself, I'm a wall-eyed monkey. You find out anything to back that up? Oh, not a thing. The Jolly Roger sank in about as bad a spot out there as could have been picked. It's deep, bad current, dirty water from onshore silt. We tried to send on divers, got nowhere. Hey, wait. I thought she went down in Mexican waters off the Coronados. Yeah, she did, but we supplied the divers or tried to. International cooperation, that sort of stuff. But we got nowhere. How'd you find out about it in the first place? One of our planes on routine patrol saw the puff from the explosion out over the water. By the time it actually got there, the hull was nothing but a mass of flames. Sank 10, 15 minutes later. What about the crew? The crew were lost, except for one kid, a cabin boy. Yeah, where's he? Mexican fishing boat out of Rosarito picked him up. He was in bad shape. The explosion had blown him clear. He's in the hospital in Tijuana. Well, look, wait, hasn't anybody talked to him? He was too badly hurt at first. But I spoke with the hospital just before you got here, and they think he might be able to talk by some time this afternoon. Well, what are we waiting for? Come on, let's get down there. I can't until later. Uh, look, have you got a car? No. You want mine? Well, sure, let's go. How far is it? Even within the speed limit, you can make it in a half hour. Out this way. Right. The car's out in the lot in the back. Hey, look, you're mighty generous, Smith. I'll try to make this up to you somehow. <laughs> Forget it. I'd like to see you get the goods on Zanagin just as much as you would. I didn't like having him come into port here in the first place. And then when I learned that both Holland and Switzerland had tied up all of his funds... They what? Sure. In early last week's papers. That's why he needs the money. Oh, here's my car. And if you can learn anything down there, if I can be of any help, I'm on pretty good terms with it. Hey, Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Oh, about that. My car and excellent chauffeur Artis here would have got you to Tijuana much more rapidly and comfortably than you might drive, I am hey, sure. Now, wait, wait, just a minute. What Which is why I came to meet you here. I knew you'd want to talk with the cabin boy who survived the accident to my ill-fated Jolly Roger. Oh, you did? Yes. However, I fear it is too late. 
What do you mean? As I was leaving my hotel, I heard from one of my, shall we say, associates. He informed me that he had just learned from one of his, shall we say, contacts in Tijuana. Well? Uh, alas, the poor cabin boy died only a few minutes ago. Pity, sir, isn't it? Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a dead man talks. And what he has to say isn't very pleasant. For it all adds up to just one more good, solid thread on the life of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your call to the Corazon de Los Angeles Hospital in Tijuana, Mexico. Good, operator. One moment. Hello? Oh, this is Dr. Fernando Hernandez. I'm Johnny Dollar, investigating the wreck of the yacht, the Jolly Roger. The only survivor reported was a cabin boy, and I understand he just died in your hospital. Gee, uh, uh, yes, but... Under most unusual circumstances, Senor Dollar. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Also, Senor, there are some things he told me earlier that I think you ought to know. Doctor, I'm on my way down there to Tijuana to see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Diego, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Jolly Roger fraud. $460,000 worth of palatial yacht gone down to Davy Jones's locker. Expense account item 9, 40 cents, telephone call. To the hospital in Tijuana from a phone booth at Coast Guard headquarters here in San Diego. Because of the knack Paula Zanagian seemed to have for knowing everything I did, everyone I talked to, even on the telephone, I was afraid to let my call go through, even the Coast Guard switchboard. But before leaving for Tijuana, I checked with Jan Penny and talked briefly again with Lieutenant Smith. You mean you think Zanagian had somebody put that cabin boy out of the way before you could talk with him, Dollar? The doctor only said that he died under unusual circumstances. But yes, that's exactly what I think. What's more important right now is that apparently the lad told the doctor a thing or two before he died. So I'm going on down there. You want to use my car? Well, Zanagian seemed to know I was going to use it before. He'll probably expect me to use it now. So you better give me a rental car. Have it delivered to my hotel, service entrance, under your name. Okay. Zanagian made no bones about it when I talked to him. He's having me tailed. And he'll probably try to do the same thing to me that he did to Bert Parker, once he's sure I'm trying to block his $460,000 claim. Dollar. But me, I aim to stay alive. 
Until I can not only prove his claim of fraud, but see him sent up for murdering Parker and the lads who went down with the Jolly Roger. Dollar, why don't you get the police in on this with you? If your life's in danger... Uh, I want to do it alone. Hey, one more thing. Yeah? You're sure that Zanagian needed money? I thought from all I've ever heard that that international racketeer was loaded. According to the papers, both Holland and Switzerland locked up his bank accounts just within the last week or so. That's why he needs a pot full of cash to get over there. That's why he sank his ship so he could collect from your insurance company. Yeah. Accident. Some mechanical failure. Is that what he said? Uh Uh-huh. Something to do with the electrical system, to use his own words. But if the cabin boy was the only survivor of the explosion, and he didn't talk to anybody... Except this Dr. Hernandez I'm going to see. Right. Then how could Zanagian know what made his yacht burn and sink? What's your guess? Expense account item 10, $50. Deposit on rental car. On the way back to the hotel to pick it up, I kept looking for somebody that I could identify as the tails an Egan had put on me. But if he was there, I couldn't tag him. And as I drove the few short miles from San Diego to Tijuana, I began to wonder if maybe I was just too small fry for Paula Zanagian, shipping magnet, munition maker, international spy to bother with. Nonetheless, I still kept an eye out for a familiar face, or more to the point, for a familiar car that might be following me. Midday traffic on the big, broad highway was astonishingly sparse. A handful of tourist-type cars loaded with families on the way across the border for a quick look-see at Mexico. A handful of movers who were on their way to see how far and how long their American dollars would keep them in favorably exchanged Mexican pesos. Some smart Cadillacs, some of them towing outboard runabouts and filled with eager-eyed fishermen. And the usual run of trucks, big trucks and trailers. The boys who made a living behind the wheel, the best drivers on the road, wherever they were. Loaded with goods for transport between states or countries or what have you. I drove fast, I drove slowly. And I still didn't see any car that might have been following me. To make sure, I took off on a gravel side road, drove a mile or more and waited. Nobody followed me. So I finally gave up and went back to the main highway. At the border, I asked the guards where the Corazon de los Hongales hospital was, drove the car to it, parked in back, and asked the first nurse I could find, and I should have stopped right there because she was beautiful... Asked her where Dr. Hernandez hung out. Hernandez spoiled a beautiful romance in the budding and led me into his office. Oh, uh, please do sit down, Senor Dollar. Thanks, Dr. Hernandez. I'm so glad you've come. We here at the hospital, I must confess, were somewhat concerned when the fishermen brought in the poor young cabin boy who survived the wreck of the... What was his name? Jolly Roger? Yeah, that's right. Zanagian couldn't have picked a better one. So? Jolly Roger's the name of the flag that pirate ships used to fly, skull and crossbones. I suppose you know. See, uh, I know. He was a glorified pirate preying on the whole world. I'm a student of history, senor. Modern as well as ancient. In his small, selfish way, I realize that Paul Zanagian has looted the whole world. A dangerous man. You say you were worried when his cabin boy showed up. Because there was a man who called and wished to visit him. Insisted on it. Oh? See, si, but... Of course, because of his condition, we could not permit it. The explosion of the ship had done a great deal of damage to his small body. When he was brought in here, I could see that immediate surgery was necessary to save his life. Well, go on, Doctor. So I operated... And as I did so, realized that divine providence would permit me to save the life of this poor unfortunate. My operation was a success. But you told me over the phone that he died. We are a poor hospital, and usually we're not able to provide such things. But I appointed a special nurse to look after Doctor, him I, while I ordered that man who would not give his name but who insisted on seeing him be kept away. Doctor, you said... However, two hours ago the nurse left him only for a brief moment and only to inform me of the remarkable improvement he'd made. Look, and doctor... When I entered his room, he was dead. Look, doctor, I'm, I'm sorry if you lost your patient, of course, but you told me over the phone that there was something unusual about his death. That's why I came down here. He would have lived he would have lived, Senor Zola. Yes, I know. Except but... that someone got into the room with him during the brief moment he was left alone. Got into him and killed him with this. What? Well, what is it? A knitting needle? 
I think so. He would have been well again, senor, but he was killed, murdered. Have you told the police about this? See, si, and they are what you call uh, at a loss. Oh, brother. Well, how do you think I feel? I was going to tell them what I knew about the unfortunate boy when your telephone call came. Then I decided perhaps I'd best talk to you first. Well, just what is it you know about him? It is what he knew about the sinking of the boat. The Jolly Roger. See, si. thanks to adrenaline and other stimulants I administered even before we began the anesthetic for the operation that saved his life. Only it didn't stay so long. See. Si. He regained consciousness long enough to talk with me. He talked a great deal. Well? Well, Doctor, what did he tell you? My notes. I get very careful notes in this drawer. And... What is it, Doctor? What's the matter? The, the, the notes I had, they're gone. Gone? Here. Uh, I kept them here because I knew they'd help to solve the crime of the singing of the ship. Well, what did this boy tell you? Notes or no notes, Doctor? You must remember something of what he told you. Well, see, uh... Yes. Well, what? That he'd seen a strange device taken aboard the ship. He was young and curious, as all boys are. Yeah? Uh, that only the captain of the vessel had handled it, had taken it to the engine room. That he had inquired about it and been told to mind his own affairs. Well, what kind of a device was it? Did he tell you? Uh, like a clock, he said. A huh? clock on a large box, like an alarm clock. It was set for 2.35. 2 He hold everything. That was the time the Coast Guard patrol plane saw the explosion. I knew that. Why, go on, Doctor. That, Senor Dollar, is all. Well, I don't know about you, but it sounds to me like Zanegi and one of his men are both planted a time bomb in the engine room of that yacht. See? No. Now, wait a minute. Yes? If the captain knew about it... Hey, look, Doctor, the U.S. Coast Guard reported that the only survivor was this cabin boy. Now, surely the captain wouldn't have let himself get blown up. Well, no, he would not, except for one thing. Yeah? And I tell you only what I know from the cabin boy. Oh, yeah, what's that? This trip was a test. Before the ship, uh, the yacht was to go on a long trip. It had many new uh, de devices on it. Uh-huh. A large, tall mass for what you call a radar. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. The captain, when they reached a point of the Coronado Islands, ordered a small boat put, uh, how do you say, over the side. Yeah, that's right, go on. But in doing so, the mast, the radar mast, fell down, and the captain was struck by it. Therefore... Doctor, doctor, now listen, listen carefully. Tell no one you've talked to me. Tell your local police, if you like, what you learned from the cabin boy. Report it to your Coast Guard or whatever you have to do down here in Mexico. But don't, under any circumstances, let anyone know you've talked to me. I do not understand, senor. You wonder where your notes on the cabin boy are? Well, if you ask me, Zanagian is looking them over right now. Impossible. Nothing is impossible with a guy like him. Now, what I'm getting at is this. I'm a marked man, doctor. He's after me. And he'll be after anybody who tries to help me. I cannot believe it. Well, you'd better, if you want to stay in one piece. So take no chances. I don't think I was followed down here, but I may have been. If so, your life is in danger, same as mine. So please, watch your step. Until I can pin whatever it takes on Zanegian to send him up for life. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah, sure it is. But outside of you and a girl named Jan Penny and... Doctor, may I use that phone of yours for a call across the border? Well, of course. They're here. Thanks. Hello? Hello, operator. I want to call Coast Guard headquarters in San Diego, California. Lieutenant John Smith. You know something? Your Mexican operators speak as good English. Hello? Yes, thank you. You seem alarmed, Senor Dollar. Are you Doc, sure? Doc, I just that... hope you find no cause for alarm before this mess is over. But I say it again. Watch your step. The mere fact that you've talked with me that... Hello? Well, where can I reach him? Well, sure, I'll talk to anybody there at headquarters... Hello, I'm... I'm calling Lieutenant John... I see. Thanks. What is it, Mr. Dollar? Lieutenant Smith is dead. K what? A hit-and-run accident. About an hour after I left him. Watch your step, Doctor. 
Sí. Y tú, señor Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some real help from two close friends. You know, close enough to kill. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Franklin, San Diego Police Homicide. Oh, thanks for returning my call. What are you doing in Tijuana? Following a lead on the sinking of the Jolly Roger, what else? I still think that yacht was sunk by her owner, Paula Sanagian. You're not alone, Sergeant. Listen. Yeah? Bert Parker of the insurance company was suspicious. He held up the claim, so he was killed. Hit and run. I know. Lieutenant Smith of the Coast Guard was helping me with the case. Now he's been killed, also hit and run. We know. We're working on it. Jan Penny, who was Parker's secretary, is helping me, too. Get it? I get it. I'll assign a man to protect her immediately. Good. But Dollar... Yeah? What about you? Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Diego, California. To Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Jolly Roger fraud. The sinking of a palatial yacht of that name and a couple of murders connected therewith. I thought I was going to Southern California for a vacation. You know, a couple of easy weeks at La Jolla, sitting around in the sun, doing a bit of skin diving... Maybe even some personal investigation to see if the publicity pictures of the contents of some of those bikini bathing suits were really true. But I ran headlong into what looks like a very, very fraudulent insurance claim. $460,000 worth. Claimed by an international troublemaker named Paulus Zanagian for the loss of his yacht, the Jolly Roger. Only the crew were aboard when it headed out toward the Coronado Islands on a test run. A tryout for a lot of new radar equipment. After a big explosion that caused the Jolly Roger to burn and sink, only one man came back. I told what I knew about him to Sergeant Franklin at San Diego Police Headquarters. And then the poor lad died there in the hospital in Tijuana, huh? Yeah, but not until he told the senior medico a couple of things that make me sure than ever that the owner, this Paula Zanagian, planned the explosion and sinking. Evidently, Sergeant, the captain took a time bomb on board. And let himself get blown up with a yacht? Now look, Dollar. No, not that easy. He'd have been able to get off before the time bomb exploded. If he hadn't been hit over the head by a falling radar mast. Oh, oh, I see. But what I don't see is why Zanagian had his ship blown up in the first place. Well, if you've read the papers, you know that the Swiss and Dutch governments have put all of Zanagian's funds under lock and key. Oh? Yeah. In spite of the millions Zanagian has made off his international arms smuggling rackets, his fomenting of revolutions among the smaller countries, 
He suddenly found himself without enough money to get over there and do whatever is necessary to free his money. Somebody finally caught up with this international racketeer. That's right. His credit, of course, isn't any good anywhere. Big yacht, sure. But he didn't have enough money to pay his way back to Europe. Unless he could collect for the loss of the Jolly Roger. And when Bert Parker tried to stall on settling the claim... Parker didn't last long. Then I came into the picture. I talked to Zanagian. Yeah? He told me if I didn't see that his claim was settled immediately... Well, he casually mentioned Bert Parker's sudden demise. Dollar, I wonder if there isn't some technicality on which we can hold that hey, guy. Jan Penny, who was Parker's secretary. Yeah? Jan has been helping me on the case. Result of warning threatening both her and me. And you know what happened to Lieutenant Smith as a result of his giving me a hand. Have you got somebody keeping an eye on Jan? I'll get Tommy Golden, one of the best men on the force. Good. And he's smart enough to keep her from knowing he's watching over her. Fine. Things have happened so fast since I got here that I haven't had time to check thoroughly with her on the background of the whole case. Well, it really shouldn't be too disagreeable a job, Dollar. Huh? I've seen her. What's your next step? Well, first, what progress have you made in finding out who ran down Lieutenant Smith? Same story we got when your friend Bert Parker was run down and killed. Yeah? The few witnesses just weren't on the ball. In each case, it was a black Buick sedan, 54 or 55. Nobody saw a license plate. You mean there was none on the car? Apparently not. Traffic division's going to have something to answer for. Unless the license plates were hidden just during the time of the... Well, murders is probably the right word. Possible, probable. So forgive your traffic detail. Needless to say, we're checking every public garage in town and every car in the streets. But beyond that... Dollar, we're just as sure as you are that Zanagin himself is behind all this. He's not only a man, he's an international organization. Oh, brother, don't tell me. For all I know, you're one of his boys. Oh, now, wait a minute. He's known every move I've made since I got here, almost before I've made it. When he met me outside Coast Guard headquarters and tried to stop me from going down to Tijuana, I thought, heaven help me, that maybe Lieutenant Smith was one of his boys, until Smith was killed. He's had somebody on my tail every minute since I hit this town of yours. I'm sure of it. But I can't spot him. Dollar. Yeah? We feel the same way about Zanagian that you do. We know that wherever he goes, he has... Well, it sounds corny, but call them henchmen hanging around with him. Maybe it's just one or two, or maybe it's a dozen. And we've tried to spot him, but no luck. Certainly none of the crew of the Jolly Roger were among them, or he wouldn't have let them get blown up. Or maybe he doesn't have any little helpers. Maybe he does everything himself. You know, it's funny you should say that. It was he himself who took out the policy on the Jolly Roger. It was he who personally made the claim. It was he who drove his car around to meet me at Coast Guard headquarters. As a matter of fact, it was... Ah, that's impossible. Can you tell me why? Oh, because he alone couldn't have known about my coming out here, my every movement. He'd be crazy to drive the hit-and-run cars that killed Parker and Smith. And after all, there were a couple of husky characters standing around quietly in the corners of his penthouse suite when I called on him. One of them, six foot two, black hair and a scar from his right ear nearly to his chin. Yeah. He's been watched every minute he's been out of Zanagian's hotel room ever since they got here. A short, heavy-set, wormy little man. That's right. Him, too. We got nothing on him. Except that we know they're working for Zanagian. What's your next move, Dollar? Oh, if I had any sense, I'd do what I came out here to do. Have myself a vacation over in La Jolla. Forget this whole thing. Let the insurance company pay the claim on the Jolly Roger. Let Zanagian get out of the country and forget it. You'd be able to forget the threats on your own life, Dollar? Yeah, and I'd be able to... Hey, wait a minute. What about Jan Penny? I told you I'll have a man looking after her. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess the best thing I can do is take her over to Bert Parker's office, have her open the files, and see if I can find something there to get to work on. Incidentally, Dollar, she drives a black Buick. I hate to say it, Sergeant. Have you checked it out? <laughs> I probably shouldn't have thought what I thought about Jan when I asked that question. I was sorry I had when I reached her apartment a few minutes later. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny, I'm so glad. I was worried about you. Has something happened, Jan? I was worried about you, that's all. When you told me you were going down to Tijuana alone, well, I was worried about you. Oh, thanks. Hey, look, Jan, let's get down to business. Did you go down to the office uh, this morning? Yes, I took a cab down there right after breakfast and spent the entire day. Uh-huh. Were the files on Zanagian's policy on the Jolly Roger intact? Well, yes, why do you ask that? And nobody bothered you there? 
No, except... Except what? Johnny, it's the reason I'm so glad you're here. What is? All day I've had the feeling I'm being followed. Oh, maybe you are. Because of the warning over the phone. the, The one I told you about. And you still don't know who it was? No, but Johnny, the warning was for you, too. If you don't lay off this case... Is that the way the voice on the phone put it? Yes, and it threatened me if I helped you. Look, Jan, you want to back out while you're still in one piece? You know what happened to Bert Parker when he tried to buck Paul as an agent? I I love Bert, Johnny. He was the kind of man you are. Honest and good and... Oh, Johnny, why don't you get out of this case? Pay him off, anything. But don't risk your life on it, too. You really mean that, don't you? Oh, you're fine, and... Don't you see this madman, Zanagian, will stop at nothing to hurt the people who oppose him. And if you keep on... Even if it means forgetting about finding out who killed Bert Parker? Yes, Johnny, yes. If it means putting your own life in danger, settle his claim, anything. How about you? I'll go away. I'll go somewhere else and try to forget the whole thing. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm listening. It isn't worth it to take the risk you're taking. Jan, it's my job. Look, why should you worry about me? Because I... Even if I have only known you a few days, I... I don't know, maybe it's rebound. Maybe I'm acting like a baby, but since Bert was... Oh, Johnny, I'm so alone and I'm so... lonely. Jan was a very pretty girl. Soft, warm, lovely. We had a drink or two and talked about a lot of things. The kind of things I'd planned to talk about to some charming girl on the vacation I'd planned but wasn't having here in Southern California. I might even have forgotten about cleaning up the case and going on to La Jolla. Why don't you make the company pay them off, Johnny? Forget it. So you and I won't be in danger from this man. Suspicion. Why can't a guy relax and enjoy a situation like... Jan. Uh Come on, honey. Uh Look, old you. I gotta get out of here. Huh? Look, I've got a hunch. And in this crazy business of mine, when you get a hunch, you better act on it. Oh, no, Johnny, tomorrow. Oh, no, honey, look, I'm, I'm going down to police headquarters. Johnny. The one thing I haven't checked on, the one person who was connected with Bert Parker. But police headquarters this time of night, oh, no. Jim Franklin, he said he'd be there all night. But can't you check Sorry, me? Jan. Leave me here all alone? You come with me. We'll grab a cab and go down there together. Oh, all right. Then we'll come back here? Depends on what I find out. Then I'll wait for you. Only, why don't you take my car? It's right down in the parking place just outside the building. Okay, sure. Here, I'll get you the keys. How will I know which one is yours? It's an old black Buick in parking space five down there. Just had a new paint job. You can't mistake it. Here. Okay, thanks. Jan, didn't you say something about taking a cab down to the office this morning? Because of the fresh paint in my car. It was so foggy this morning. I wanted it looking nice in case you wanted to use it. Ah, you're a rascal. See you later. I kissed Jan goodbye for the time being and left. I hadn't the least idea in the world of contacting Sergeant Franklin at that time of night. But I had to think this thing out. Suspicions, pure and simple, about a lot of things that might explain how Zanagian had known my every move since I arrived in San Diego. Yeah, that was it. Get out on the road in the fresh air alone and think of it. The black Buick was parked in the lot in Space 5, all shiny in its new coat of paint. Yeah, new paint that might cover up any marks a hit-and-run killer made. I was about to close the door, turn the switch, and take off when I noticed that somebody, the car painter perhaps, had left the hood open. I stepped around to the front of the car to slam it down when my guardian angel, or whatever it is, told me to take a good look inside. I'm glad I did. Glad I'd noticed the hood partly open. That I hadn't turned on the key. Because wired to the ignition was a bomb that would have blown me to kingdom come. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up. 
where the obvious becomes only too obvious. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Hello? Johnny Dollar. Uh, Johnny? You sound surprised, Jan. Well, uh, yes, I am, dear. I thought you were going over to police headquarters. I changed my mind. Then you didn't need my car, after all. No. Are you coming back here to my apartment? Johnny? After I take a little walk. As I told you, I've got to think this case out, and I can't very well do it wrapped up in your arms. Oh, can I? Why don't you take a drive along the shoreline in my car? Want to come along? Jan? I'll, uh, I'll wait for you here. Yeah. See you in a little while. Much sooner than you think, baby. Tonight and every weekday night... Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Diego, California. To Universal Adjusters Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Jolly Roger fraud, including the loss of a palatial yacht and a couple of murders. Expense account item 12, phone call. And one thing I didn't tell Jan Penny was that I was calling her from a booth right on the ground floor of her own apartment building. Another was the reason I changed my mind about borrowing her car to drive to headquarters for a talk with Sergeant Franklin. Oh, I had gone out to the parking lot and climbed into her car, all right. But as I was about to insert the key to start it, I noticed the hood wasn't closed down tight. That saved my life. For wired to the ignition, I found a booby trap that would have blown me to kingdom come if I'd even turned the key. After hanging up on Jan, I hopped upstairs to her apartment and pressed an ear against the door. No, no, he didn't. Because he just phoned me from somewhere outside. But he said he's coming back here, and I tell you, you'd better come over here. No, no, he just said he's going for a walk. Of course I can handle. All right, all right. I went back to the first floor to the phone booth and called Sergeant Franklin. You think Jan Penny's in with Zanagin on this whole deal? Tell you this, I don't like what I think. Look, Sergeant, I'm going back upstairs to talk to her again. Uh, talk, did you say? Yes, talk. I'm going to lay it all out to her, tell her what I suspect and why. If I can break her down, okay. If I can't, well, I misjudged her. Lucky stiff. Huh? I've seen her, Johnny boy. What's that supposed to mean? I hope you have misjudged her, for your sake. What? Reconciliation. What a lovely way to spend the rest of the evening. Look, you dope. Go to it, boy. And happy hunting. Who is it? Johnny? Yeah. My, that was a short walk. But I'm glad. Are you? 
Or are you sorry I didn't stay away longer so you could get some help? Help? Sit down. Sit down, Jan. I want to talk to you. Oh, how masterful. Here? As you know, I didn't borrow your car after all. Sit next to me, darling, and let's continue from where we left Because off. fortunately, somebody goof left the hood partly open. Oh, sir, Johnny. That's why I discovered the booby trap that would have gone off as I turned the ignition key. Oh, sir, Johnny, I... Booby... What are you talking about? That's why you didn't hear the expected explosion right after I left you. Oh, no. Then they are after me, too. The warning over the phone. If I didn't stop helping you in this case, they... Oh, Johnny, what'll I do? Johnny... For one thing, take your arms back to yourself. What? And move over to your own corner of this couch so I can pull a gun if any of your pals... Oh, something... my dear Mr. Dollar. Tanegan. I feel it's too late. Artis here will pull the trigger if you so much as move a hand toward your gun. He's an excellent shot. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Awkward coming in the service entrance, but I was concerned lest your phone call in the lobby might have been to the police. Now, here now, permit me to take charge of your gun. Just a minute, sir, again. I right, sure. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, uh, this is Artis, the man I've had following you since your arrival here in San Diego. You don't recognize him, dear boy? Yeah, I keep him from seeing me. He never know I follow him. Oh, yeah, yeah, Artis, you've been pretty good at it. But as long as we've been introduced now, why don't we shake hands? Go back, or I shoot. Oh, and he would, my boy. And the, I believe you call it a silencer, would obviate any undue noise. Wouldn't you be happier if he did pull the triggers in again? But I wish to talk with you, dear Mr. Dahl. I don't think we have anything to talk about. Oh, but we have. You see, dear boy, I'm curious to know why you suspected Jan here of complicity in our little plan. Oh, the lovely girl, isn't she? Pretty obvious, isn't it? Now? Oh, forgive me. I realize in a situation like this, it is usually the detective, or in this case, the insurance investigator, who at the point of a gun extracts a confession from the, shall we say, criminal. <laughs> However... Okay, okay, I'll tell you. Apart from the threatening phone calls, which nobody but Jan seemed to know about... Terrible story for her to make up. You warned me what? in the beginning you'd have somebody tailing me while I was here in San Diego to make sure I didn't spoil your plan to collect some... 460,000 insurance on that yacht you burned and sank out near the Coronados? Quite right, quite right. Uh, but I must ask you to be brief in case that phone call you made was to the police. You see, with only Artis and Jan left of my staff and crew, I, I can't very well afford sure, to... Sure, that call was to the police. That's why I'm trying to stall you with a lot of talk. <laughs> Thank you. For if that were true, dear boy, you would never admit it. But do continue. All right. I've been followed before. I know, or at least I hope I do, every trick in the book for dodging a tail. Too good. Artis, you shouldn't admit he got away from you. Yeah, too good. But now I make him sorry. Artis, please. I wish to hear more from Mr. Dollar. And I wish to speak to him. As a matter of fact, dear Mr. Dollar, there is really no need for you to continue. You are a very intelligent young man. Oh, thanks. You realize that no one but our little Janet could have provided me with all the information I had. You're coming out here to investigate the sinking of the Jolly Roger. You're touching deathbed scene with Mr. Parker. Your conversations with Lieutenant Smith of the Coast Guard. And, oh, she did dispose of him quite well, didn't she? Jan? Who else, Johnny? Who else could have run down Bird Parker without leaving him? You ought to have your neck. No, no. Artis, Artis, please. I wish to talk with Mr. Dahl. No wonder you insisted I drive your booby trap car tonight. Really, darling, I'm glad that you didn't. Because if you'll listen to Yes, me, dear boy, listen to me. You are intelligent, as I said before. You even learned why I am in immediate need of funds, so that I may finance a return to Europe and free the money of mine that has been frozen there. Millions, dear boy. And as the lovely Janet will attest, those who work with me, share with me. It's true, Johnny. Regardless of his reputation, when it comes to the people who will work with him, Like he... the crew of that yacht and whoever else was working with him, he admitted that only you and this trigger-happy character here were left... Oh, tools, my dear boy. Quite unlike the, the intelligent colleagues such as yourself and Janet, whom I wish to, to keep close oh, to me. Oh, artist boy, that means you better watch your step. What do you mean? Nothing, artist, nothing, nothing. My dear Mr. Dollar. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. All I do is report that your claim should be paid 
And I'm on your team. And you will never regret it. Not only money, more than you ever dreamed of, but... Uh, Janet, Janet, my pearl. You do like our Mr. Dollar, do you now? You dirty oh, rat. Oh, that's right. You admit you sank the Jolly Roger yourselves in again. Yeah, but of course. And all the men who went down with it. Uh, what had to be done? Even a little to... cabin oh, boy. Oh, yes, yes, dear boy, yes. Both he and the crew on the Jolly Roger were in danger of upsetting my plans. They had to be eliminated. But you, dear man, please, do not stand in my way. Much as I like and respect you, if you do, you will leave me no choice but to eliminate you. Even as I had to rid myself of Parker, the Lieutenant Smith, the cabin boy... Look, son, again. What if I were to say, okay, I'll go along with you? Uh Uh-huh. To say the least, it would get me out of this present pickle I'm in. Uh Ah, and much more. I still wish that gorilla of yours would aim his gun the other way. Oh, Artis. I think you might relax a bit for the moment. But I watch him. Go on, dear boy. Okay. What kind of assurance do you think you'd have that I wouldn't double-cross you? Uh, There is the factor of fear. Fear? Oh, my dear, dear man, don't you see? The choice is as simple as this, and the choice is yours. You either accept my offer now, or you accept a bullet from Artis Gone. Now, the latter I would regret exceedingly. Not only because of you, I like you, but because it would mean temporary interruption of my plans, a quick trip across the border to avoid being found when your body is discovered, and, and the necessity of devising some other means for attaining passage to Europe. But far more formidable problems have been overcome many times. Dear Mr. Dollar, I do not wish to have to discuss this further. So tell me... again, I have good news. Yes? For me, not for you. You mean you refuse? No, dear boy... No, I mean you aren't going to have to discuss this any further. You won't be able to. But, my dear... Much as I'd like to tie up this case with a big fancy ending, a real dramatic tagline... I do not understand you, All of your long-winded confession a minute ago might just as well have been stated in court. What? As a matter of fact, you'll probably hear it in court, word for word. I do not understand. You and this homely trigger man of yours aren't the only ones who know about the service entrance to this apartment. Horace! What do you mean? You may as well give up quietly because the gentleman standing in the doorway directly behind you... is Sergeant Franklin of the San Diego... Oh, no, you don't, Artis. I don't want to do this. Do not hurt me. Help, please, please. <laughs> Thanks, Sergeant. Oh, what a mess. Better tie up this gorilla, boys. Okay. I'm glad you took the hint and came over. You know my call was being listened to. Oh, I kind of thought so. Well, no more Zanagian. Dead? Yeah. By a slug from this big monkey's gun. If I'd known he was that bad a shot, I might have tried to jump him earlier. Come on, Artis. Up. up. After the way you hit him, he'll sleep for a long time. Well. Johnny. Huh? Johnny, listen to me. Oh, shut up. Expense account item 14, 21750, hotel in San Diego, incidentals and plane fare back to New York and Hartford. Expense account subtotal 52323. I'll give you the rest when I finish my vacation in La Jolla, the one you promised me. Remarks? The fabulous crooked empire of Paulus Zanagian is kaput. The same way it happens with every man who tries to break the rules of international law and order. You might almost have called it death by his own hand. Though, of course, little Artie will be made to pay for it. Jan, same thing, I guess. Uh, Why do they do it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week, Vacation. And a beautiful romance that turned out to be a prelude to murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. 
It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Forrest Lewis, Paul Fries, Jay Novello, Harry Bartell, Don Diamond, and Victor Perrin. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, returning your call. Oh, hi, Pat. How Southern California? My vacation on expense account? I love it. Well, don't overdo it. Just because the Jolly Roger matter interfered with that vacation you'd planned is no Now, wait a minute. You promise. Full expenses. (laughs) Okay. When are you coming back to Hartford? Soon as I clear up the Lamar case. Want okay expenses on it now? Huh? Lamar? Yeah, Pat. This is a case that'll make your hair curl. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Expense account? Ah, forget it. I'm on vacation. As far from Hartford, Connecticut, center of the insurance business as I can get. Yeah, I'm in La Jolla, California. And I'm staying in a big, ritzy motel called El Crescenta. Alone. Oh, there is a girl down here. A lot of them, in fact. But one in particular. Bonnie Lamar, her name is. Sounds like somebody in show business, doesn't it? But she isn't. Tall, five feet eight, brunette, pretty as the devil. And I gave her the line that my so-called business back east consists of nothing more exciting than running a filling station. How can you afford to come all the way out here to California for a vacation? To say nothing of staying at the El Crescenta. Rich uncle, Vonnie. Died and left me a couple of thousand to do with as I see fit. This is the way I see fit. Only a couple of thousand. Mm-hmm. Gee, that's too bad. A couple of hundred thousand, I might really fall for you. Oh, Vonnie, how can you? Hmm? Well, here I thought these last three days and evenings with you were due solely to my... Overwhelming personal charms. Your charm has nothing to do with it. Kiss me again, anyhow. With money around, who needed a couple of hundred grand? Yeah, the gal was just about all anyone could ask for. And I don't mean for just a quick vacation time romance. I'd spotted her the minute I'd landed here at this hotel. More like a guest ranch by the seashore. Beautiful, modern cottages set around a big green lawn with a swimming pool in the center big enough for the Olympics. Carports beside the cottages loaded with Eldorados, Continentals, and a handful of foreign sports jobs. And a beautiful big dining room and a building set up to look like an old clipper ship. And food and service worthy of Oscar of the Waldorf. And what was I doing here? On expense account, remember? Yeah, I'd spotted Vonnie the night I arrived from San Diego after clearing up the Jolly Roger matter and set my sights for her immediately. 
Naturally, I wondered what so attractive a girl was doing alone here. She cleared that up for me at dinner the second night. I still don't understand why Daddy hasn't arrived yet. Oh? He's supposed to join you on this vacation? We always spend our vacations together. At least we have since Mother died a few years ago. You're an only child? Yes. Really, a foster child. Just as we were about to take our plane, some crisis or other arose at the plant. <clears throat> so he made me come along and wait for him. Lamar Metal Products. Lamar Metal... Oh, yeah, yeah. Aircraft components, isn't it? South Bend, Indiana? Yes. You know how crisis can arrive in a business like that. Sure, I imagine so. Government orders and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you'll probably hear from him before. Oh. Hey, waiter, would you like to get a... Senorita, a telegram for the lady. Oh? Excuse me, John. Sure. Here you are, Peter. Gracias, Oh, dear. What's the matter? It's from my father, and I don't like it. Listen. Must delay departure a few more days. Doctor's orders. Oh? Nothing to worry about. Stay there in La Jolla until I join you, love Daddy. Oh, that's too bad. But doctor's orders. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. He had a new insurance examination just a month ago. They gave him a clean bill of health. Uh, what company? Oh, Try mutual something or other, but what difference does it make? There's something wrong about this. I'm sure of it. Well, why don't you phone him? Yes. Yes, I will. My cottage is right next door here. Come on. It was none of my business, but the name of Trimutual rang an old familiar bell. Yeah, I'd handle a lot of cases for them. Anyway, she wasted no time in putting through a call to her father's private number in South Bend. Yes, operator? Thank you. I don't know why I didn't go to my own cottage to make this call. Mm, my pleasure. I guess I'm a bit upset by this wire. I don't blame you. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. There can't be. Well, maybe he just made the mistake of mixing too many oysters with too many martinis. Hello? Hello? Daddy, what's this telegram you sent me? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, well, you had me scared for a few minutes. Oh, yes, fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, if you must know the truth, I have. Johnny Dollar. Uh-huh. Very. Careful, gal. Oh, he says he runs a filling station, but I don't believe him. <laughs> I'll tell you all when you get here. And hurry, darling, please. All right, Daddy. Good night, dear. Oh, thank goodness. You don't know how close your guess was, Johnny. Oh? It was just a slight case of indigestion. Plus the fact he wanted another day at the plant. Well, good. Then let's go back to the dining room and see what kind of indigestion we can accumulate. That started it. Three days and nights of as much fun and relaxation as I've had in years. A wonderful place to stay, a private beach that I'll wager is second to none on the Pacific coast. Swimming, water skiing, skin diving, sailing, everything. Oh, this was it. Or so I thought. Oh, why make any bones about it? I'm a sucker for romance. And believe me, it wasn't hard to be serious with one. Johnny. Yeah? This is nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I... I... I don't believe in love at first sight. Do you? Uh, no. No, I, um... But it is nice, isn't it? Hey, whoa, gal. Mm hmm? It'd be much too easy to fall in love with you, Bonnie. And I mean the forever kind. Well, would that be so terrible? You've, you've got one big strike against you, you know. Johnny, what? M-O-N-E-Y, <laughs> money. <laughs> you lose. Huh? I have nothing. Except what my father gives me. You know, allowance and for clothes and things. and <laughs> You know. So you see, I'm just as poor as you are. Only you aren't. Or you wouldn't be staying at a place like this. Another thing. You know absolutely nothing about me. Oh, you know you don't make a living by running any old filling station. Johnny Dollar at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Oh, stop it. Well, for all you know, I'm a... I'm a gangster, a safecracker, a jewel thief. Mm. 
Or worse still, playboy scion of a wealthy family who never did a lick of work in his life. In other words, a worthless bum. Don't say that, Johnny, even in fun. Had you fill them, huh? Yes, and their mothers. Old dowagers trying to marry them off to another wealthy family. Add the name Lamar to their end of the social register listing. Insure the fortune with another fortune. I thought you said you were poor. Well, you know what I mean. A bunch of worthless fops, that's all they are. I've seen better men among the servants and chauffeurs, the little Mexican boy who helps one of the gardeners, and the young businessmen there in South Bend and in other cities. Maybe earning just enough to make ends meet, but but men, ambitious, hardworking, willing to get somewhere on their own merit. And... Well, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Why don't you marry one of them, Bonnie? Oh, it isn't as easy as that, Johnny. You know it. Maybe I was waiting for someone like you to... Mm. I still don't believe in love at first sight. Mm. Good. Let me snuggle again. Right before we started this horrible discussion. Mm-hmm. The sun's going down, though, honey. And this little mesh in the rocks is going to get cold. Yeah, look. Everybody else has left the beach. Come on, snuggle. I like it. <laughs> Kiss me. And I thought I'd have to ask for it. John, Johnny, what do you do? Well, hmm? well, I'll tell you. I live in Hartford, as I told you, and Wait. I'm really... Listen, he's calling you. Yeah, you too. Oh, the spoil sport. Well, maybe it's word from your dad. Here. Up you come. Oh, I hope so. Come on, Johnny. Pedro! Pedro! Over here. Here we are. Here. What's up? Oh, senor, senorita. Telegrams. Telegrams? But the one for the senor was Mark Rush. So I rush. Good boy, Pedro. Here. No, I'll tip you when we get back to the motel. Stop si, by senor. my cottage. Uh, Johnny, it, it's... What's wrong, Bonnie? It's from our family doctor. I'm afraid... Here, you read it. Sure, I'll be glad to. Regret having to inform you your father died a few hours ago. Suggest you return to South Bend immediately. Oh, Johnny! <laughs> It was a few minutes before Vonnie could pull herself together enough to walk from the beach up to her cottage where she could pack her things for the trip back to South Bend. I told her I'd make the necessary plane reservations for her. But what I didn't tell her was the contents of the wire I'd received, the one marked Rush. It was from Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. A request to call him at his home in Hartford immediately. I put through the call. Hello, Pat McCracken. Well, Killjoy, what's on your mind? Johnny? That's right. Hey, you got my wire. Why else do you think I'm calling? I tried to get you long distance all day. Your motel didn't seem to know where you were. Well, that was my doing. They might have spoiled a beautiful romance. Well, what's on your mind? Uh, Johnny, you've got to cut your vacation short. Oh, no, you don't. And you've got to come back to Hartford right away. What? Now, listen, I'm just... Yes, but plan to make a long stopover in South Bend, Indiana. South Bend? That's right. Oh, I get it. This is a gag. Or did you know I'd figured maybe on stopping over there anyhow? I don't know what you're talking about, but now listen. By a rare stroke of luck, we just got word of the death this morning of one of Trimutual's bigger policyholders. How much? A million and a half. <sighs> man named Thomas Rene Lamar. Lamar? Pat! Now listen, Johnny. The circumstances lead us to think it may be murder. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a set of circumstances arise that are enough to keep a man from trusting even himself. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. 
Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your party in Hartford, Connecticut now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Just a moment, please. Hello, McCracken, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. Johnny, are you still in La Jolla? Didn't you get my telegram? Sure did, and I'm getting ready to leave for South Bend right now. In the company of a beautiful, charming, lovely... Now look, son, your vacation is over. Charming, lovely girl named Vonnie Lamont. Okay, okay, now will you... What? That's right. Thomas Renee Lamar's daughter. Does she know her father has died? Telegram for her arrived at the same time I received yours. You didn't show her my wife. No. She doesn't know yet that you think it might be murder. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Mr. Patrick McCracken. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Or was it murder? <laughs> Expense account item one. I'm calling it item one, Pat, because it's really the first tab on the Lamar case. Previous expenses here in La Jolla were charged against the Jolly Roger case. Expenses for the vacation you promised me and have now so rudely interrupted. Item one, $9.60 for that long-distance call to Pat McCracken in Hartford. Now, what under the sun is Vonnie Lamar doing in La Jolla? Vacation? Same as I was trying to take. Now, tell me something, Pat. Uh has a claim already been filed on Lamar's million-and-a-half-dollar policy? No claim has been filed. Well, then how'd you know about his death so quickly? Look, pure and simple. The insurance company is Tri-Mutual, big office in Chicago, headed up by Lawrence Comstock. Oh, sure, known him for years, good man. Well, he's written all of Lamar's policies himself. He got to know the old man pretty well. Uh-huh. Personal friends, you know, weekend golf together, same clubs, and both nuts about two-handed pinochle. So? Well, Comstock had been Lamar's house guest the past few days, and been with him practically every minute the old man wasn't at his plant. Was he actually there when Lamar died? Yes, yes. He was the one who called the doctor when the old man keeled over. Look, you keep referring to him as the old man. Just how old was he? Oh, not too. Uh, let me see. I've got it. Uh, he was 59. The doctor's name on her telegram was Wilson. You know his first name? No, I don't know. That stuff you'll have to get from Comstock then, South Bend. Okay. Well, at any rate, Johnny, he called me the minute the doctor pronounced Lamar dead and specifically asked that you be put on the case. Yeah, well, that's flattering. Okay, it looks like I am, but tell me something. Yeah? What makes Larry think the man was murdered? I'd rather not discuss it now. He'll, he'll give it to you when you see him. Our plane leaves in about an hour. No doubt you can be of some comfort to the daughter. Hmm? Her knowing that you're handling the case. Pat, that's the one thing I don't want her to know. I hung up, leaving Pat to ponder over that last remark. Wired Larry Comstock that I was coming and finished my packing for the trip back east. When I'd finished, I paid my bill at the fancy motel. And all I can say is, thank goodness it was on expense account. And I knocked on the door of the cottage next to mine. Yes, come in. Oh, Johnny. Hi, Vonnie. Any way I can help you? More than you have. You've been wonderful. 
Arranging the flight back for me. For us. Taking care of the things here. Johnny. That's right. For us. I'm making the trip with you. But you... I thought you said Hartford, Connecticut. And your vacation. Oh, the vacation's all over. Wouldn't be any fun for me to stay around after this. Oh, darling. And South Bend is along the way. I'd feel better if I kind of took you home rather than let you make the long trip alone under the circumstances. Maybe I have some business or something to attend to there. Darling, I I don't know what... Easy. You made it so wonderful when Daddy couldn't get here these last few days. And now that this terrible thing has happened, you stick by me this way. That's the only way I'd have it. You... You're so wonderful. All right. Come on now. Come on, get your things together. I've called for a cab to the airport in San Diego. Come on, Mommy. Oh, thank you, Johnny. I love you for this. Sure. I can't say I exactly relish thoughts of the flight back east. Much as I hoped I could be of some small comfort to the girl. Much as I genuinely wanted to. Such things can be pretty rough, particularly in this instance. But I am an insurance investigator, and on a matter of this sort, a million and a half dollars at stake, the possibility of murder, well, it's up to me to suspect everyone, whether I like it or not. Yeah, I sometimes think it's a pretty rotten racket to be in. Johnny. Sleep, honey, sleep. You'll need all of it you can get before you have to face things at home. I wasn't sleeping. I was just thinking and being so thankful that you're here with me. Honey, I wired ahead for a hotel reservation. What? Yep. I'm going to stay in South Bend a few days. You wonderful one. No, no, I'm going to be honest with you. I I also wired a friend of mine, a, well, a fellow with whom I do business now and then, so I... Well, anyhow, I'll be there for, for a few days and maybe more, and as long as I can be of any help to you. It's funny. Hmm? You know, you still haven't told me what you do. Well, don't worry about that now. But I'm curious. Tell me. It'll give us something to talk about. Did you wire anyone at your home about your arrival? Yes, Harrison the butler. Johnny. Well, uh, how, how about the doctor who telegraphed you? Yes, Dr. Wilson, too. Honey. Wilson, Wilson. Edward T. Wilson. Now, tell me. No. No, no. You you stop talking and try to get some rest. But all... I'm going back to the lounge in the tail section so that you'll have nothing to do but get some sleep. Then you won't tell me. No. Tomorrow. I'll see. Thank you, Johnny. No, I... I can, maybe... Very rough. I felt like a traitor to her. Well, we landed in Chicago at 10 a.m. and took a cab from the airport to the Lamar home on the outskirts of South Bend. I'd never before realized that the big industrial city with all its huge, dirty, sprawling factories had such a wealthy residential section. And the Lamar home on Parody Lane was one of the most impressive of all, set far back in what must have been an acre of well-kept lawn. In addition to Harrison, the butler, we were met at the door by the housekeeper, cook, upstairs and downstairs, maids, and a couple of other servants. All of them, obviously, in deep sorrow over the passing of the master of the house. And may I most humbly, for all of us, express our deepest sympathy in this hour of this... <laughs> it's all... Thank you, Harrison. Thank you all. I'm going to my room, and we'll call you when... Uh, yes, miss? This is Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. He's to be admitted to the house. Any time he... I'll be here, Bonnie, as soon as possible. And you know where to reach me. Yes, Johnny. Thank you. And now to get to work, whether I liked it or not. I took the cab to the townhouse, dumped my bags, then back to Chicago in the office of Lawrence Comstock, Tri-Mutual's representative. He was waiting for me. Well, Johnny, you sure walked into something this time. Thick one, Larry? You don't know. You don't know the half of it. The million and a half of it. You gave Pat McCracken back in Hartford the idea that Lamar's death might be murder. I think it is. 
I really think it is, Johnny. Why? Tom Lamar was one of the best friends I ever had. He should have been. Your commission on the insurance he was carrying was enough to set you up for life. Oh, no, Johnny, don't talk like that. Tom was a good friend of mine, quite aside from business. I sold him his very first policy years ago, and he was just a bookkeeper for Atlas Processing Company, earning $70 a week. And when he married Delise... Delise? As his wife, who died five years ago. Oh. That policy was only for 2500 straight life. So? Well, you know how little my commission was on that. But I liked him. I saw that he had a spark about him. That with the proper kind of encouragement, he could go places. And he did. Yeah, so I understand. I understand the Lamar metal products is a really big thing. General metal fabricators just bought them out. Oh? Huh? Yes, and Tom was getting all ready to retire. Spend the rest of his days having fun. Golf, fishing, winters in California, and summers in Minnesota, that sort of thing. And taking care of Vani, his adopted daughter. Yeah. Kind of worth taking care of, too. Eh? I know her, Larry. Met her in La Jolla, California. Oh, then you... Brought her back here to face the sad fact of her father's death. Why didn't... Oh, yes, of course. The family doctor, Ed Wilson. I should have realized. He sent a telegram to Vani to the same place you were in La Jolla. She's a wonderful girl, John. You're telling me. But, Larry... Yes? Something you told Pat McCracken back in Hartford has led him to think that possibly Thomas Lamar was murdered. John. Johnny, in the years I've known Tom Lamar... Yeah? I've not only known him, but I've known his family. Well? And much of his affairs, personal as well as business. Well? His wife, Delise. I would have married her long ago if I'd been able. Oh, get to the point, Larry. Oh, yes, of course. And his daughter, Lavon, Vonnie. I wish she'd been my daughter, my child. Come on, Larry, come on, get at it. She's her. a wonderful girl. You said that. Oh, yes, of course. Well, there were things in her past, Vonnie's past, that even her mother and later her father didn't know about. But I did. For heaven's sake, man, get to the point. You too? Yes, me too. Yeah, me. The confirmed bachelor. Take him or leave him. Have fun. Forget him. Make a big... Come on, Larry. Listen, Johnny. Now, listen carefully. Dr. E.T. Wilson. Ed Wilson. An old friend of mine as well as Tom. Yes? It was Ed who made the last insurance examination. Four months ago. Thomas Rene Lamar was in better health than you are. After all, he was only 59, and he'd lived a careful life, taking good care of himself. Well, go on. We were sure of his physical condition. Sure of it. That's why I let him add to his already large policy. Larry... You've told Pat McCracken, and you've admitted to me that you think Thomas Lamar was murdered. Yes, John. Because of one man. Who? The one man who shared his confidences, business and person. Yeah? Who was closer to him than even Ed Wilson or me. Well, who? One man who alone could be sure of benefiting by Tom Lamar's death. Oh, look, Larry, that bush you're beating around is getting bigger and bigger. so simple, John, so discouragingly simple. All right, all right, Larry, all right. Take it any way you like. I'm here for two reasons. Because I'm assigned to this case, and because of Vonnie. Yes, I know. Now, who is it you suspect? The man Vonnie is really in love with. Oh. I'm sorry, John. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some stuff I didn't want to hear, but I had to. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vonnie. Oh, yes? Please, come out here to the house, right away. Is something wrong? Johnny, I... You said you came back here to South Bend to... Well, because you didn't want me to have to be alone to face the death of my father. Yes, dear, I... Johnny, you also said you have business here. Well, yes. Is it... Is it connected with my father's death? Vonnie. Please, dear, don't lie to me. He was insured for over a million dollars. Or do you know that? I... Listen. Was this business of yours connected with Daddy? Was it because you, too, think he was murdered? Johnny? I'll... I'll come out and see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. The question, was it murder? The beautiful girl, Vani Lamar, and the beautiful romance I found during my so-called vacation at La Jolla, California. Well, things really got into a bind when she received news that her foster father back in South Bend, Indiana, had suddenly died. And I received word that I was assigned to the case... Not only because of the million-and-a-half policy on Lamar's life, but because it looked as though it might be nothing more nor less than murder. From La Jolla, California to South Bend, Indiana, was only a quick flight by plane, and the first person I contacted was Lawrence Comstock of Trimutual, Chicago office, who'd issued the policies on Lamar's life. Yes, Johnny, the only two real friends Thomas Lamar had these past few years since his wife died were Dr. Ed Wilson and myself. And Wilson is the man you called in when Lamar died. Yes. You see, Tom and I used to spend a lot of time together. Weekend golf, belong to the same clubs, that sort of thing. And we used to love playing two-handed pinochle together. Uh-huh. Go on. I was with him at his house the night he died. And so unexpectedly, Johnny, as I told you, he'd had a most thorough physical examination. Only a few months before. Or I'd never have permitted him to increase his insurance to a million and a half. Must have cost him a fancy premium. It did. It did. Prohibitive. But that was the way he wanted it. For his adopted daughter. For Vani. Whom you know. And if you're half a man, having spent a few days with her in La Jolla, you're in love. Oh, shut up and tell me what you know, will you? You said murder. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Johnny. It began last weekend. As I often do, I spent the weekend with Tom. Thomas Lamar. Well, Friday night, Dr. Ed Wilson was with us. We played three-handed pinochle. Yes, yes. Tom was in perfect health. I know he was. And our evening was all fun, completely uninterrupted. Except by young Marson. Marson? Tom's confidential secretary. And he's the one. Larry, you are the one who told Pat McCracken back in Hartford that you thought Thomas Lamar was murdered. That's why you wanted me to come on out here to investigate the case. Yes, why right, now, tell me the truth. Is it because of your great friendship for Lamar? Because of the million-and-a-half policy through your company? Or because you really think he was murdered? Are you here because of the commission you can earn on a case as big as this? Or because Thomas Lamar happened to be the father of Vani Lamar? I was ordered on this case from Hartford. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, maybe I'm a silly old fuddy-duddy. Maybe I'm more worked up over this case than you are, whatever the reason. But let me tell you this thing in my own way. Go on, Larry. Well, we know, Ed Wilson and I, I, because of being so close to Tom Lamar so long, 
Ed, because of his medical knowledge, we know that Tom was in perfect health. His 59 years were nothing for a specimen like him. Ed left Friday night. I stayed on. Saturday, we played nine holes golf. Tom wanted to play 18, but I didn't feel up to it. And that night, we played Pinochle. Just the two of us. And we got to bed early. Well, Sunday, we just sat around and talked until evening when we played cards again. There was no strain, Johnny, even if the man had had a bad heart or something. I understand. Now, what about this Marson you named? We quit shortly before midnight. I was tired. My years, no doubt. And I knew Tom would have a hard day at the plan on Monday. And so I suggested we get to bed. He smiled, uh, <laughs> as only Tom could smile. A warm, tolerant, yet at the same time understanding and friendly, completely friendly smile. Go on, go on. And he said he'd probably have to take one of Ed Wilson's sleeping pills to doze off so early. <laughs> but I knew, Johnny. You knew what? Sugar pills. That's all Ed had ever given him. Sugar pills. I think Tom knew it, too. Well? I went up to my room, Tom to his. I heard the water running in his bathroom. About the same time, I was brushing my teeth. And then the crash. Crash? Yes. I ran out through the hall to his room. He was lying on the floor of the bath. Broken tumbler beside him. He left the bottle of sugar pills still open. He'd taken one of them? Yes. And he was dead. You... You mean you no, think... No, no, I called Ed Wilson. He was there in only minutes. It was he who officially said that Tom was dead. Had died instantaneously. And he was sure it was poison. Peculiar color of the lips or something. What do you mean? It was some terrible stimulant to the heart. A very rare drug that only a few researchers would know about. Even the heart of a young and healthy boy would find the influence of this drug too much, too strong. Dr. Wilson told you this? Yes. What is this? Drug? I don't know. Something very rare. But he is sure... That's what did it. Well, what did the police say? You called them in, didn't you? Ed did. They'd never heard of it either, the drug. But they've sent samples of the sugar pills to Chicago and to Washington for analysis. Well? We should hear from them shortly. Where is this Dr. Ed Wilson? Oh, here. I'll, I'll just write you his address. Good, thanks. All right now, Larry. Yes? You told me earlier there was one man you thought might be responsible for this. Who? Walter Marson. Who's Walter Marson? Walter has been Thomas Lamar's personal private secretary for some years. Go on. And Walter has been married to Levon for over a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, because I, I know how you feel about her. Well. Why should that make him want to murder Vonnie's because father? Because of Thomas's will. Tom made a will, Johnny, that left virtually everything he owned to the corporation of which he was the head, except for his life insurance. Is that why the amount of his insurance was so big? I suppose so. The sole beneficiary of the policy, as you know, is Vonnie. Well, go on, go on. Therefore, the only way in which anyone else could share in the estate is by being married to her. All right, all right. You've knocked down a couple of dream castles for me. And I'm not talking about a family fortune. I'm talking about a girl. Yes, John, I understand if she loved him enough to marry him, let him be happy. If he shares some of that million and a half bucks, so well, let him share it. He deserves to. If she wants him to. He married her, she married him, all right. It isn't as easy as that. What do you mean? You've forgotten you wanted to know why I think Walter Marson murdered Thomas Lamar. Yes. Yes, you see, I happen to know Vani did not love Walter. You just said she married him. Unknown to her foster father. What are you getting at? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, Walter Marson, shall we say, got something on Vani. What it was, I don't know. But he had a strange power over her, it seemed. Larry, what are you talking about? I don't know, Johnny. From the time Walter first started working for Thomas Lamar, I, well, I didn't trust him. And yet Tom seemed to have the most implicit faith in him. Walter was a good accountant, yes. Handled many of Tom's personal investments. And handled them very well, too. Thomas paid him very well. Rewarded him, always, when he made unusual profits. Why not? But Walter Marson made it plain from the beginning that he wanted to work his way into Thomas's shoes in the corporation. And this Thomas would not have. And the reason? Because Thomas knew that many of the stock deals Walter had made in his behalf were not completely, shall we say, legitimate. Or legally proper, perhaps. But not morally so, that is. Corporation money instead of his own, man. Yeah, that's it. Buying huge blocks in order to inflate the price and then dumping the stocks at their peak, that sort of thing. I don't know much of the details. That's out of my line. 
But Thomas knew very well that if Walter Marson were ever put into the corporation, he'd use the same slick methods for purely personal gain. At the expense of the corporation, he'd spent his life building up. How do you know about this? I was Thomas's confidant, his closest friend. All right, Larry, let me do a little summing up. Walter Marston failed to dig into Lamar's money via the corporation, so he married his daughter to be sure of latching on to the family fortune. And that's it. Yes, it's as simple as that. Therefore, you're sure this Marson poisoned Lamar. Yes, and because of the findings of Dr. Ed Wilson. Which haven't yet been verified. Well, no. And even if you do find proof that Lamar was poisoned, you have no proof that Marson was back of it. Well, no. Larry, what if Vani had something to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's a real possibility, isn't Good it? Good heavens, Johnny, you can't mean that. You... You say you know the girl. Yeah, sure. And I fell for her like a ton of bricks. Whether it's simply because I'm a sucker for such a charmer or just because she charmed me so well, I don't know. But why did she want me if she's already married? Johnny, what are you getting at? A million dollars at stake. A million and a half. How she could possibly have known I'd be staying at the La Crescenta in La Jolla, California, I don't know. But with a million and a half at stake, you could find out most anything. So she worked on me, got me on her side, even before she needed to. And when her father died, according to plan, she knew there'd be no question of settlement of a claim for the insurance because of the way she'd so successfully drawn me into a cozy little noose. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? What are you talking about, you old... <sighs> yeah, I... I guess I am. John, I've been a confirmed bachelor all my life, even before I was your age. But I know very well that if I'd ever met Vonnie Lamar, my bachelor days would have suddenly ended. Oh, you're hurt. Now that you've found out she's married, you're hurt and you're angry. You're striking out at anything you can reach, anyone. And I'm sorry. Don't let it take away your judgment. I'm... I'm sorry, too, Larry. I... I didn't mean to... I really didn't... It's all right, Johnny. But now, get hold of yourself. You have a job to do, not only for me, for the company, but for yourself. Okay, Larry, thanks. Good boy. I... I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but... I guess, whatever it is, I... I better start doing it. Yes. Good luck, Johnny. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, it doesn't take long to find out what has to be done on this case, because the turning point in the whole thing comes straight to me, and with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Edward Wilson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello, doctor. Mr. Comstock of Tri-Mutual Insurance asked me to call you. Regarding the death of Thomas Rene Lamar. Yes. I've just left the police department. The chief autopsy surgeon... Yes? There's no question about it. Thomas Lamar was poisoned. I... I see. I'd like to talk to you, doctor. I understand you were one of Mr. Lamar's closest friends. Yes. And one of the beneficiaries of his will. That's quite... Where did you learn that? I didn't. It was a shot in the dark. No, look here, young... Better stick close to your office, doctor. I'm on my way over to see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter, now proven to be murder. As the facts of this case lined up, it appeared that Thomas Rene Lamar, wealthy manufacturer of aircraft components, had only two really good friends. Lawrence Comstock, who had issued him a million and a half worth of life insurance policies, and Dr. Edward T. Wilson, and a wonderful, lovely, charming adopted daughter, Laban, whom I'd met during my brief vacation in La Jolla, California, whom I'd accompanied back here to South Bend, Indiana, when she received word of her father's sudden death. What little evidence I'd been able to pick up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, Lamar's personal secretary. Unknown to Lamar, he had married Bonnie, and therefore stood to benefit from his death. Oh, why kid about it? I'd fallen for the girl heavily. And when I found out that she was already married to a slick, smart promoter, well, let's keep personalities out of this case, especially mine. I told Vonnie that I'd come up and see her out at the family mansion, but I thought I'd better contact Dr. Wilson first. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I've heard a great deal about you from Lawrence Comstock. And please, sit down. Thanks, Doctor. You said something over the phone that's bothered me. I won't mince words. Apparently, you and Larry Comstock were Thomas Lamar's closest friend. I don't think there's any question about it, my boy. And I'm sure Lawrence will verify that. He already has. That's why I took a shot in the dark and suggested that you're a beneficiary of Lamar's will. Not his insurance. I already know that his daughter, Vonnie, gets that, but his will. Well, does that shock you? I suppose Larry's a beneficiary, too. Yes. Then... Either one of you might conceivably have had a motive for bringing about his death. What? Now, just a minute, you... Relax, doctor, relax. I make no bones about it. This is the roughest case I ever tried to handle. Unfortunately, I started out by getting myself emotionally involved with Bonnie Lamar. Uh, Go ahead, laugh if you want to. Hardly. She's a very wonderful girl. A bit mixed up at times, perhaps, because of... uh... Well... Because of what? Are you aware that unknown to her father, Vonnie was married? Is married? Yes. To some Walter Marson, Larry Comstock told me. Marson was Thomas Lamar's personal secretary. Did Lawrence tell you why she married him? I don't think he knows. It was a few short months after Thomas Lamar's wife died. A terrible blow both to Vonnie, who was completely devoted to her foster mother, and to him. By way of quenching his sorrow, Thomas drove himself in his work 16, 18 hours a day at the plant. All his waking hours, so that he would have time to think of nothing but his work. But Vonnie had no such outlet for her emotions. Her friends, a lot of rich 'er ne'er-do-wells, rich, worthless bums, if you like, got her interested in gambling. She plunged into it with a recklessness and abandon that quickly got her into debt so deeply that there was only one way out. Her father didn't know? No, no, no. But young Marson did, and he took full advantage of it. In return for her agreement to marry him... He promised to quietly obtain the necessary funds from Thomas Lamar's investments, which he, Marson, handled. And he did. And she married him. Yes. But how could she? She didn't love him. And you must realize her emotional state at that time. 
She was terribly upset over the recent death of her mother, and so was her father, of course. She knew the shock it would be if he ever knew of her gambling and the tremendous debt she'd incurred. She was beside herself, ready to do anything. So she married Marston. I could kill him. Now, let's get one thing straight, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You, too, were a bit upset when you came in here. You spoke as though you might think both Lawrence Comstock and I could have motive for wanting Thomas's death. I'm sorry, Doctor. I... It's true that we are beneficiaries of his will, at least Thomas assured us we were, but only in a very minor way. Thomas was loyal to us as he was to the servants who have been so devoted to him for so long. And whatever little he has left us and them... I'm sorry, Doctor. I... Oh, I, I guess I was just feeling hurt and angry and taking it out on anyone I could find. At least that's the way Larry Comstock put it. And he was right. Now I got a job to do. What have the police found out? Only enough to back up my immediate suspicion that Thomas was poisoned by pirate Dameron. Pirate Dameron? Yes, it's a little-known drug that produces tremendous but only momentary stimulation to the heart, causes the heart to almost literally burst, and it leaves virtually no traceable residue in the system. But you said the chief autopsy surgeon found out... No, no, no. He found only positive indication that pirate Dameron had been used. I found the first clue to it only minutes after Thomas died. A staining of the tongue that even then was rapidly disappearing. Can you tie this drug in with Walter Marston? No. No, the fact that it was available at all has stumped both the police and myself. The last known source was a small island off the coast of Greece oh, many, many years ago. And all the tiny plants from which it could be obtained as pollen were burned by the Greek government. But somebody, somewhere, must have had some seeds, planted them and obtained this pollen. Yes. How do you suppose Mr. Lamar took the stuff? Well, it could have been mixed with one of the medicines in the cabinet in his bathroom, but we found no traces. Uh Uh-huh. Larry Comstock said you used to give him harmless sugar pills as a kind of sedative. Yes. Thomas knew they were perfectly harmless, but he occasionally took them anyway. (laughs) It was a kind of joke. Could this uh, pirate stuff have been mixed with them? We found no trace in the bottle. But you would have been able to. Yes. It is only an assimilation by the human body that dissipation is so complete as to make it virtually undetectable. Uh I'm afraid I haven't been of much help to you, Mr. Dollar. I think you have, Doctor. I think you have. It was only a hunch. But in this business, you sometimes have to depend as much on hunches as on common sense. I picked out the library nearest to the Lamar residence to do my research. Pirate Dameron. You're sure that is the word? Yes. Can't you find anything on the subject? Nothing beyond what you found in the Pharmacopoeia Index. The name of the plant from which it is derived. Blepharia purpurus calandus. No common name. Yeah, no. Well, thanks. Of course, the main branch of the city library in Chicago might have something. Sure, thanks. Yes, yes, I'm sure I can find what you're looking for. You see, I myself am quite a student of rare drugs and poisons. Oh, what's that? Well, after a long, dull day here at the library, I enjoy nothing more than curling up in a big chair in my little apartment and reading detective fiction. Oh, well, uh, where's the book? I'll show you. Uh, But quietly, please, we must maintain the proper atmosphere for our readers. Oh, sure. Yes, I know the poison pyrodamron very well. It was used in that wonderful story, The Case of the Yellow-Lipped Monster. Oh, excellent book, thrilling. Oh, you should read it. Yeah, well, uh... Pyrodamron was new to me, so as usual, I had to find out all about it, and I did find out, too. The plant it's derived from, where it's grown, uh, where it was grown. You see, it's been extinct now for many years. Yeah, I understand. Oh, now, deadly thing, terribly deadly. But now, here is the book that will tell you all about it. The title is Flora Exotica Mediterranea. That means exotic flowers of the Mediterranean. Uh, hmm, Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter? I don't... Oh, good heavens, it isn't here. Are you sure? But it was. I'm sure it was only yesterday. Oh, dear. Well, here, do you see? It was taken out from right here. Well, who took it out? I don't know. Won't your records show? No, I never permit any books to be taken from this section without my knowledge. Never. Afraid somebody'd consult the stuff for ulterior motives? Oh, oh, dear, no. It's just that the only ones who want these books are the rabid whodunit fans like myself. And, uh, well, I like to talk to them. Well, isn't there some other book that might give me the information I want? Oh, not another book in the world. I know. And now, oh, tragedy. It's been stolen. Well, this was one time a hunch didn't pay off. Quite the contrary. I'd wasted a lot of time. 
Expense account item 9, 520. Taxi out to the Lamar mansion. I was almost relieved to learn that Vonnie was not home. I'm very sorry, sir, but she and Mr. Marson left shortly after noon to make the funeral arrangements. Thank you, Harrison. However, as you know, Miss Vonnie wished you to have full access to the house, and if you care to wait... How is she holding up, Harrison? Most admirably, Mr. Dollar, under the circumstances. Uh, Mr. Lamar's passing has been a terrible thing for her, for all of us. Yes, sure, of course. What will happen to the house, I don't know. Won't Miss Lamar continue to live in it? This morning she said no, that she'd travel for a while and then settle down somewhere else far away from the city. Oh? And what about you, the servants? Oh, we shall, of course, have to seek employment elsewhere. Say, tell me, Harrison, didn't Mr. Lamar provide for you in his will? I do not know, sir, and I do not particularly care. His kindness and loyalty to us during his lifetime was far more important than any provision he may have made for us. Well, I guess that takes you off the list. Uh, beg pardon? Nothing. So tell me, has Walter Marson been around much since Mr. Lamar's death? Yes, he's been most attentive to Miss Lamar, which we've all appreciated. He lives here in the house, you know. No, I didn't know. Harrison, I'd like to see his room. Sir? I'm going to lay my cards right on the table. I'm an insurance investigator. Here, my card. Why, I... Oh, I see... Miss Vonnie hadn't so informed me. Because she didn't know. Well, sir, I... Now, show me to Marson's room. Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. Do you like Walter Marson? Yes, sir, very much. Now. What does that mean? I've never spoken of this to anyone else, Mr. Dollar. For years, Walter Marson was a clever, scheming, conniving young man with overpowering ambition to take over the Lamar Corporation. So I've heard. I'm convinced that at one time he even tried to marry Miss Lamar and solely for the purpose of forcing his way into the business. Just trying to... Well, yes, sir. However, in the past year or two, Mr. Marson has changed completely. What makes you think so? Because of conversations between him and Mr. Lamar that I could not avoid overhearing from time to time. Mr. Lamar knew what Marson was attempting and faced him with his knowledge of it. Uh, here is his room. Go on. Uh, Mr. Lamar could have made it very difficult for him in view of his record. Prison record? Uh, yes, sir, for embezzlement. But instead, he gave the young man another chance. So? Go on. And Mr. Marson made the most of it. He changed completely. I say without reservation, sir, that Mr. Marson is as honorable a young man as I know. Pretty sure of that, aren't you? Yes, sir. A butler living as close to them for both for so long can in very... Pardon me, sir, but does something give you the reason to think I'm mistaken? No, no. Unless perhaps it's this book I just found lying on his desk. Book, sir. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, and a switch that will make your head spin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Larry Comstock, Johnny, at Tri-Mutual Insurance. You're out at the Lamar home. Yeah, Larry. Police crime lab, find out anything more about the stuff from here they took in for examination? Yes. Yes, they certainly did. Well? They found traces of that poison, pyrodameron, on the toothbrush that Thomas Lamar was using just before he on died. The to- 
Are you kidding? No, no. No, indeed, John. Not a bit. There's a murder weapon for you. A toothbrush. Larry, send the cops out here. I think I've just about got this case sewed up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location South Bend, Indiana. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is my final entry of expenses incurred during investigation of the Lamar murder. And murder it most certainly was. It was in La Jolla, California, during my so-called vacation, that I met, and I must admit, kind of fell for Vani Lamar. It was from La Jolla that I flew her back to South Bend, Indiana, when we both received news of her foster father's sudden death. All the clues I'd been able to dig up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, who had been Lamar's personal secretary and who lived at the Lamar mansion. At his room there in the house, I found the one book in the world that described the poison, pyridamarin, that had killed Thomas René Lamar. Poison derived from a pretty little yellow flower, once raised on an island near Greece. A flower with sudden death in its pollen. Huh? You're Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Harrison the butler said you were up here. And you must be Walter Marston. What, uh, what are you doing in my room? Let me ask the questions, Marston. Now, just a minute. Look, mister, you may as well know it. I'm an insurance investigator. So Harrison said, but I don't believe it. Right here. My credentials. Uh-huh. Oh, I... I see, but I, I thought... You thought I was just a boyfriend that Vani Lamar met in La Jolla and who just came back here with her to comfort her over the loss of her father. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, you were wrong, mister. Or partly so. The main reason I'm here is to find out who murdered Thomas Lamar and why. And I think I found out. You have? Well, well who, Mr. Dollar? Interesting book you've been reading here. Oh. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Stolen from the Central Library over in Chicago, wasn't it? Well, yes... Yes, it was. Found a poison in it, didn't you, Marston? Pirate Dameron. Deadly, quick, and hard to trace. So rare that the chances were pretty good it wouldn't even be recognized. But it was. Where'd you get it, Walter? As you said, at the library. I'm talking about the poison, the pirate Dameron that killed Thomas Lamar. Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're all wrong. Am I? Who besides Vani would benefit from the million and a half insurance on Lamar's life? Well, what makes you think that... that I know that you I'd would. Be the... Because I know you're married to Vani. No. You tried to inveigle your way into Lamar's business, but he wouldn't have it. All your chiseling and conniving and phony stock transactions got you nowhere. So you did the next thing you could think of. You got something on Vonnie and forced her to marry you. So you thought you'd at least be sure of a big hunk of the insurance money over my dead body. Oh, no, look, Dollar, maybe I was married to Vonnie, but... I found out about her big gambling debts, got her off the hook by some fancy manipulation of her foster father's investments. No doubt threatened to tell him all about it unless she did marry you and thereby guaranteed yourself a prosperous future. Oh, and you timed the whole thing beautifully when she was emotionally upset over the death of Mrs. Lamar. No, Dolly, you, you don't know but what you're got talking about. Couldn't wait for him to die a natural death. <sighs> Dolly. No, Mr. Dolly. Sure, go ahead, speak up and make it good. Well, I, uh, I was married to Vani. I'm not now. Sure. That's right. I did want a place in Lamar Metal Products, and I... I thought I could get it by showing Mr. Lamar how clever I was. <laughs> well, instead of throwing me out, he gave me another chance. I'll be forever grateful to him. It was a turning point in my life. I give you my word, Mr. Dollar, I've done nothing since that time that's been anything but completely honest and above board. Pretty speech. No, no, it, it's true. It's it's true, I swear it. Nevertheless, you married Vani in the hope We're that... We're divorced. You're... You're What? Well, it was the only honorable thing I could do. Would you like to see the final papers? Vani mailed them to me from Reno before she went to La Jolla. You mean she... Yeah, let me see them. Here. My desk. Don't try to pull a gun out of there, Marcy. You... Still don't believe me, do you? Here they are. Hmm... Then would you like to tell me who did murder Thomas Lamar? I wish to heaven I knew. That's 
why I got this book, hoping to find some clue as to where the pirate Dameron might have come from. But you sneaked this book out of the library. Because I was afraid of the very kind of suspicion that you've shown. Want to know something? I'm still showing. And I tell you, you're wrong. Ask Vani. She'll tell you. Oh, where is she? Harrison said you two had gone out together to make arrangements for the funeral. Yes, we did, and we came back together. But when Harrison told her that you were here to see her, she... Well, she she said she'd be back in a few minutes. Where did she go? Oh, she's still in the house somewhere, I I think. Marston, just what is your relationship with Vani now? Well, there never was any love between us. Our marriage was only on paper. Yeah? The foster daughter of the man to whom I owe so much, it's my duty to do what I can for her. In spite of her... Remember what? What? Oh, even to the end, we, we kept from him any knowledge of her dissipations, her drinking and gambling. I thought that was all over. Oh, no, she's more deeply in debt now than she's ever been. I'm I'm thankful Mr. Lamar died without knowing what I'll be. But with the insurance, of course, you'll be able to pay off. Marson, you're a dirty rat, and your accusation isn't very well veiled. Are you trying to say that I'm accusing Vani of the... Murder. Oh... Mr. Dollar. Yeah, go on. This book. According to this, the plant from which Pilot Dameron is derived is now extinct. Unless somebody, somewhere, managed to salvage some seeds that were yes, then planted. Yes, exactly. Refer a purpurous calendus found only on a small Grecian island. I. I wonder if Dimitri would know. About Dimitri? Him. What's this sudden switch? Who's Dimitri? He's the old gardener. He's, he's here on the estate. Come on, Marson, and bring that book. Before going out to the gardener's cottage, I asked Harrison where Vani had gone, and he told us he only knew that she was somewhere in the grounds, that her car was still in the driveway. I phoned Larry Comstock again, but he'd left his office, presumably to come out here. And I called the man I'd talked to earlier at the library. Of course I can. As I told you before, I keep a very close check on the books in that section. Uh, let me see now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Flora Exotica Mediterranea has only been out four or five times in the past several years. Once to a Mr. Thomas... Yeah? Uh, uh, Thomas Hanley. Oh. Uh, to a Mr. Ralph Cummings, Miss Lavon Lamar, and... Uh, That's enough. Thanks. I tried not to show Marston how I felt as we walked out to the cottage of Dimitri, the old gardener. Could be nothing too nice for Mr. Lamar. So I always try to keep things nice. Yeah, I can see. Uh, Dimitri, Mr. Dollar's here to, to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Lamar's death. Investigate? Oh, yes. Yeah. I hope you find who do this terrible thing to such a fine... Well, I want you to look at this book. Here. Did you ever see a flower like that? Oh, yes. Yes? Where? In old country. In Greece it used to be, but no more. You never saw it in this country? No, yes. Well, which is it? Uh, I should not say, because in all countries, against the law, I don't know why. Well, I do. Go on, Dimitri. But I keep many of my nice seeds anyway. And some of them were for this flower? Yes. You don't mind? It is very pretty flower. Did you ever plant any of them? Oh, no, no, not I. Somebody else? She was always so nice to me. Funny. Miss Lamar? <laughs> Look, sir. She even sent me gift on her trip last week. Dimitri. Look, look. You call it toilet case. See? It have soap and toothbrush and comb. Dollar. Dollar, look, look. That, that toothbrush. I am looking. The yellow stain on the bristles, the same color as the flower on this deadly plant. So, so... Pretty. She said her father one of these two. Oh, Dollar, I'm sick. You sick, poor so man? So crude, so corny, and so obvious it would never be noticed. And she was safely a couple of thousand miles away beyond any possible suspicion when the... Dimitri, yes. did she plant any of these seeds you gave her? She often planted many kinds. Where? It's... Show us. In the morning, maybe. It's getting pretty dark now. Now, now, now. Come on. Come on, Marcel. Yeah. I knew you... you... Must not tell her, I show you. She always keep her little garden secret. She not even think I know. She very sweet girl. Yeah, very. But now... Hey, oh. oh, oh, wait. Huh? She there now, cultivating. 
cultivating with a shovel? Dimitri, go back to your cottage and stay there. Oh, you want... Come on, Marson. She's, she's digging. Digging. And I think I know why. She sees us. Go back. Go away, both of you. Stay here. I want to talk to you, Vani. What are you doing? What I'm doing is... I... I'm burying the little garden that was mine for Daddy. Little personal things, Johnny, that I grew with my own hands for him alone. Now that he's gone, this would be only one more bit of memory. Please, leave me, Johnny, to finish. Wait, Bonnie. What? Before you turn under that little yellow flower. Here, I'll show you... No, Johnny, don't touch it. Here. Source of a poison called pyridamron. How did you know? Yeah, look. Oh, no, you don't. I'll kill you, too. I'll kill you. Oh, nobody knows. Oh, Walter. Walter, help me. Help you, help you. Oh, Johnny was in love with me, but I turned him down, and he, he came out here. Oh, and... good, Bonnie. I hate you. I hate you both. Everything would have been all right if you hadn't come along. I hate you. I... Listen, Johnny. Million dollars. Million and a half. You and I could... You dirty... No, Johnny, please don't! Please! <sighs> Believe me, this is one case I wish I'd never seen. Oh, sure, you, the company, are all right. You won't have to pay off a million and a half in insurance. Your gain. But me, I've lost something. Faith. Faith in... I'm sick over the whole thing. Expense account, I'll add it up later. Right now, I'm going out and get roaring... Get some flowers. Some clean flowers. And just sit and look at them. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week? Tell me, did you ever wake up from a pleasant dream to find a smoking gun in your hand and two bodies at your feet? Well, I have. Join us next week, and I'll tell you about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, Howard McNair, John Daner, Gene Tatum, Joseph Kearns, Paul Richards, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Mm-hmm.